This is Audible. The Devil's Due, an Adrian's Undead Diary novel. Loki vs. the Apocalypse, Book 3. Written by Carl Meadows. Narrated by Danielle Cohen. Dedication. He does all kinds of dedications in his own books, but I imagine rarely gets one himself. So this time, I'm going to change things up. For giving an unknown a crack of the whip and allowing me to dabble in his fictional universe, for letting Loki, Nate and Particles plant their own flag in Adrian's apocalypse, and for being just a generally all-round good human being, this one goes out to the AUD progenitor-in-chief. I'd like to dedicate this third volume of Loki's trilogy to Mr. Chris Philbrook himself. As Adrian and Loki both say, love that guy. Thanks for rolling the dice, Chris. Part 1. The Shield. December 4th, 2010. Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. Nate and Alicia came home yesterday, and I knew straight off the bat that something was off. They arrived at the school in the Humvee, and my initial happiness at seeing them hale and healthy hit the brakes when I saw Nate's expression. I don't know how to describe it. Nate isn't particularly expressive anyway, at least not to the untrained eye. I think I'm a bit more in tune with him, and I thought he looked... nervous. I've never seen him look nervous before, but he had difficulty holding eye contact with me. Usually those dark eyes bore through me like twin drills. Nate is big on eye contact, which is what usually intimidates the crap out of people when they first meet him. Nate's face tells people to fuck off more than his mouth does, and that gaze feels like he's boring into your soul as he decides your worth. Alicia just looked tired, but there was definitely something off with Nate. I thought he might be feeling guilty after the way we left things, and maybe he was, but it soon got flipped on its head the moment I greeted him. Walk with me, was all he said, as everyone came out to greet them, eager for their news. We wandered away a little so we could talk. What's up, Buttercup? I asked. Something weird happened last night. With Evil Jesus and the Resurrectionists? Still a great name for a metal band. He snorted and shook his head. No, while I was sleeping. It's probably your age, Nate. Incontinence in the old is fairly common, so you shouldn't be ashamed. No judgment here. He snorted again and seemed to relax. No, you dickhead, he chuckled before turning serious again. I had a dream last night. Of Freya. Well, that stopped my smart mouth. Nate knows I'd never joke about you. That wound is still too raw and fresh, even a couple of months on. It was just a dream, Nate. Have you dreamed of her? I thought about it and realised I haven't. Since your death, I haven't dreamed of you at all, Freya. Considering the lake of grief in which I'm forever treading water, I find that, in classic British understatement, a bit odd. I write this journal to you, so in many ways you're always on my mind. How is it that my subconscious sleeping brain doesn't conjure you at all? That seems... well, that just seems odd. Mind you, odd is something of a relative term these days, eh? Nor had I until last night, continued Nate after I answered. Erin, it was so real. I remember every sight, every scent, every word we shared in conversation, like it happened just a minute ago. You're weirding me out, Nate. Well, it's going to get weirder. This time his gaze returned to those twin drills locking to mine. Erin, 
I'm sorry I ever doubted you. It was hard for me to get my head round, but now I'll back you 100%, no question. Doubted me? The words threw me a little, and I didn't register the apology straight away. Erin, you were right. About all of it. Captain Evil, as you lovingly refer to it, is a real thing. There is an agency behind the undead, and we are being judged for all the horrors we've inflicted on each other. Freya came to me as a messenger from, well, our team. He spread his hands and shrugged, unsure how to explain it. Said there's a way to end all this, the responsibility on some group of three called the Trinity, but they need time to fix things and pass some test that'll determine whether we get our second chance. Mind blown. I was still recovering from that bombshell when he dropped another. Freya said you had a big part to play, Erin. Though the burden of all humanity didn't fall to you, there was still a role for you as part of another trio. Hey. She said everything is three, that the number has power. I went cold as Nate quoted Theodore's freaky statement of those exact words. Everything is three. Those tasked with bearing the flaming torch of hope against the darkness are many, but still come in threes. These torch bearers a people fighting the smaller battles all across the world to hold the line for this trinity and ensure humanity is still fighting, still existing, should they succeed in their task. To build shelter, safety and sanctuary for the living, paving the road to something better if the trinity succeeds. His fierce expression softened then, and his smile gentle. It was almost... Proud? And you're one of those flames, Erin. I've sat and pondered this all night long. Because, let's face it, it's quite a lot to take in. Firstly, I don't doubt a word of what he says. I've been the one advocating a supernatural or divine force behind this whole thing pretty much from the outset, so I'd be a bit of a dick to now turn around and tell Nate he was going mental. Nate believed the power of this dream, and for such a practical man to be swept away in this sudden change of direction and opinion, that dream must have punched home pretty hard. He told me it was in his old backyard, from a house twenty years ago, the garden filled with flowers. And when he woke from the dream, a white gardenia was next to his pillow. That is some freaky shit right there. Apparently, you also told him why the undead went all weird after your death. They wanted to break me in the wake of your passing, terrify me into hiding from the world in case I got any more of my friends killed, much like I mused when it all started. And, by hiding away, I couldn't be the person that our team needs me to be. When Captain Evil tried to mess things up at the builder's yard, I came anyway, and that apparently pissed on the celestial fucktards' chips a little when we all got away. The dead are crude tools, as Nate put it, and Captain Evil has countless battles to fight against humanity to ensure our destruction, so it doesn't put all its efforts into me. Small mercies, I guess. I'm still a target, but now Captain Evil is likely to change tack and try some different angle. It's extremely satisfying to know my big middle finger to Captain Evil poked it in the eye and pissed it off. But what I really can't get my head around is the question I was asking regarding the shift in undead behaviour. That question hasn't changed, even though it's now confirmed that, yes, I am indeed a personal target for the evil force directing this shit show. And that question is, why me? Nate being chosen, 
Now that I understand. He's a warrior, and if you're getting into a fight for the fate of humanity, he's your team's first pick without any hesitation. But Nate kept saying I was the flame, and he was my shield, like he's in some backup support role. No idea who the third one is. Would have been nice for you to drop that little bombshell as well, Freya. I'm no leader. The very thought is laughable. I struggle with crippling indecision about what to have for breakfast, so don't put the fate of swathes of people in my little hands. I will drop that fucking ball and blow the championship game. By all means, I'll fight the good fight, and I've said from the beginning that we have to be better, that we have to fight back against the dead, and we should ensure safety and security where we can. That's just being a decent human being, which is something humanity has been sorely lacking. It was that lack of care for each other that caused this whole fucking mess in the first place. But shit, don't make me lead anyone. We've got wiser heads here. Nate and Dean are experienced peacekeepers, and Dean is the calmest, most compassionate head there ever was. We have Maria and Nora as well, two intelligent older women with wisdom and heart. Real inspirational types. What the hell is our team doing choosing me to lead this little slice of the apocalypse rebellion? Bloody hell. Talk about handicapping your team's chances. We're starting five shots behind the enemy if you put me in the captain's role. No thanks. This coming right after Theodore speaking about the dreams, saying everything is three, just like Nate did, and drawing a picture of me holding a flaming torch. I feel like I'm suddenly going nuts. It's one thing jumping around, telling everyone your theory about Captain Evil and the Dark Force running the show. Having all these freak occurrences, like Theodore's drawing and weird statements, immediately followed by Nate's complete conviction after a dream talk with our dead friend, then finding a flower from his garden 20 years in the past beside him when he wakes up, well, it's all just so sudden. It's a lot to swallow being told that, yes, Lucky, all your theories were right, so well done for being so spot on. Having a theory is one thing, but finding out your wacky theory is right, that's a lot to digest. And then to get an, oh, by the way, you're also a pivotal figure in your own little way, so get right with that. Well, what the hell am I supposed to do with this kind of revelation? I filled him in on what happened with Theodore and showed him the drawing. Nate just nodded, as if further confirmation of everything he'd just revealed, and I asked him to avoid telling anyone else just yet. I'm having trouble coming to terms with it, so it's going to be pretty difficult for everyone else, I think. I can just imagine dropping this little bombshell to our assembled community. Oh, hi everyone. Just a quick note that I'm now chosen by Team Light as special to lead our own little pocket of humanity, holding the line while we wait for someone out there to take the big test to see if our species is allowed to continue. So, Nate and I are like the Blues Brothers on a mission from God, okay? Hey, that kinda makes me like Joan of Arc, yeah? Pfft, they'll look at me like my nose has just transformed into a penis. Joan of Arc. Joan of Snark, maybe, but I'm no leader. And by the way, Freya, where the hell is my dream with you? I miss you like crazy. I sit here writing these journals to you, and you leave me out. Not gonna lie, that stings. I thought we were BFF homegirls. Sigh. I'm all at sea here and need a little help. Nate had one other thing he wanted to talk about, which helped in bringing me back down to earth a bit. Weirdly, he wants to go back home, just me and him, as he says there's something I should know before we continue forward. I might be wrong, but Nate seemed more nervous about taking me to his house than he did about telling me about our divine selection for Team Light's frontline defence. Weird. Anyway, that's what we're doing tomorrow. We're not taking the Humvee, just me and him in the pickup. 
I've no idea what to expect, and not really sure why this is so significant. Nate is just Nate. His history is his own, and I've no need to ask him his personal business. He seems adamant in wanting to share it, though, while at the same time looking... scared. I mean, I'm not really sure what scared Nate looks like, because if the devil himself popped up in front of us, Nate would probably punch him in the balls and headbutt him as he folded over, calling him a bellend all the while. So much to take in. But the bottom line is that Captain Evil has a celestial hard-on for me, no matter what. It's a lot to digest and get right with, but I've never shied away from any fight in my life. So, great celestial darkness or not, I'll say this to the black-hearted Toss Fountain. Bring it, dickhead. December 5th, 2010. The Guilty Truth. I don't really know how to process this. I feel like punching Nate in the face and hugging him to death at the same time. The stupid thing is that the matter he thought I'd want to punch him for was not the thing that got my blood up. Okay, I'm being cryptic, so I'll just dive in. The garden from Nate's dream was not our destination. That dream abode was the house he shared 20 years ago with his ex-wife, Maggie. Nate being married was the first bombshell of the day, and when I pushed him on that, he just waved it off and said I'd have everything in good time. That house isn't up north anyway. It's apparently way down south near Plymouth, where he was based with 4-2 Commando back in the day. When he retired from his special forces stint after Sierra Leone, Nate moved up here to take a job with a company called Forge International, a private military and security contractor based somewhere in Cheshire. That explains what he's been doing since departing his run in the SAS a decade ago. He's got way too much skill and experience to just sit idle, and there's far more money in the private sector than the service. Nate owns a small flat in a tiny nearby village, just a few miles the other side of town, only a mile or two away from where he and I first met. It took a slow drive of about an hour to get there, as we had to take a number of back lanes to bypass main roads through town. Back as a power couple in our trusty pickup, the conversation died after Nate put a hold on questioning him any further, and the two of us rode in silence. I should note here a weird little factoid. In that entire journey, we didn't see a single undead. Not a sign, either in the roads or moving near isolated buildings. Nothing at all for the whole journey, like we were the only two living souls left on Earth. Eerie. Even when we trundled through the quaint little village, it was barren of both living and undead. A ghost town of silent phantoms, unseen and unheard, was all that greeted us. The only noise disturbing the picturesque stillness was the throaty rumble of our diesel engine, and once Nate killed the ignition, it was deathly silent. We parked behind a small row of local shops, with Nate's flat located above one of them. A small convenience store, a little local butcher, and a chippy. These little villages love having their own local butcher, it seems. It wasn't what I expected. For someone who must have been getting some serious bank from private security, it was a tiny place to call home. Nate's vast experience must have commanded a serious wedge of cash, especially with the long list of active service and combat experience he could reel off, but material possessions clearly weren't something high on his list of priorities. As we climbed out of the pickup, I could hear Nate sucking in breaths as if to calm his nerves. His discomfort made me nervous in turn, because I had no idea why he'd be so edgy when just coming to the tiny flat he called home. Walking up the steps, he stopped outside the first of four doors on the left and turned to me. 
He opened his mouth to say something, decided against it, then simply pushed down the handle and opened the door. It was as small as it looked. A single bedroom, small bathroom, and the living room and kitchen combined into a single open space. It was sparsely furnished, but immaculately kept, and the only sign of time's passage was the gathering dust from his absence. There was a single big armchair facing a modest size TV, with a small coffee table between the two, bare of any ornament. A narrow wooden bookshelf stood tall in one corner, laden with a variety of books, from military history and survival manuals to a selection of fiction novels, most of them appearing to be military in nature, or crime thrillers. Wouldn't you know it, the complete works of Tolkien too. I knew he was a fantasy nerd. A complete collection of Winnie the Pooh books on the bottom shelf split my stupid face in a grin. They were so out of place with all the darker, more adult titles and non-fiction books. Explaining his ability to quote Milne when he reeled off his story about Cady in Sierra Leone. It did beg the question, though. Why did he have Pooh Bear books on his shelf? I straight up asked him. They're a reminder, he said softly. Reminder of what? He paused for a long moment then and I could see he was gathering the courage to say the words aloud. Wearily, he sat down on a tall stool beside the kitchen counter. My daughter. I used to read them to her when she was tiny. Well, I nearly fainted away. He'd never mentioned his ex-wife before today, but I was amazed he'd never thought to mention a daughter. What the fuck, Nate? I blurted. Why didn't you tell me you had a kid? Because she died 20 years ago. The statement was like a punch to my heart, an audible struggle in his tone as he forced the words out. Even so long on, the pain seemed raw. But then I remembered his advice about you, Freya. Sage words that... Nobody ever gets used to grief. They only learn to manage it better with time. Nate didn't appear to be managing it, though. The grief in his voice was fresh and raw, as though his emotional wound was torn open by speaking it aloud. Shit, I'm sorry, I whispered. Can I ask how? Leukemia. She was diagnosed when she was four and died on her seventh birthday after a tough battle. Couldn't find a close enough match for a bone marrow transplant. So wit beat her. He gave a smile of such aching sadness, my heart nearly shattered at the sight of it. She was a fighter, though. Lord above, how tragic is that? Christ. I knew Nate carried some weighty burdens from his time in active service, but losing your only child to blood cancer at such a tender age, on top of everything else? Then I reminded myself of the pregnant woman behind door number nine and what Nate did so I didn't have to. And then you, Freya, again, so I didn't have to. So much pain, so much death. So much horror in one man's life, and yet he kept going. But then he revealed what he feared to tell me. I wasn't there, Erin, he said quietly, unable to look at me. His eyes were turned down to the carpet, his fists clenching and unclenching reflexively as he spoke. I can face any enemy handle bullets flying and artillery booming, power through in the face of war's many horrors. Yet, the one thing I could never face was the slow deterioration of my baby girl. I was helpless against it, frustrated there was nothing I could do and that I'd no enemy to fight. His voice dropped to an almost inaudible whisper. I ran, Erin like a coward. 
Ran. He nodded. I left Maggie to deal with it all, wanting to be anywhere else. I wanted to be somewhere I could fight and work through my grief by avoiding it. I needed control back. So I kept signing up again and again, deploying with my mates to wherever we had an enemy to fight or mission to achieve. And I left Maggie at home with our daughter to endure it all. He sighed with a shaking breath. Alone. My next whisper wasn't a question, just a simple statement. And she died while you were away. Nate nodded. The doctors said she didn't have long, and like the coward I was, I deployed again, knowing I'd never see my baby girl again. Knowing my daughter wanted her daddy there at the end to comfort her, to tell her it was okay to go now. Knowing my wife would have to deal with all that grief, all the funeral arrangements, and bury our baby in the ground without me there. He looked up finally, eyes locking to mine, red and raw from the streaming, silent tears. And I went anyway, because I wasn't strong enough. And I'm the worst kind of man there is. His voice cracked with the last statement. I've seen Nate emotional before, and the glisten of tears in his eyes. But I've never seen Nate weep, and it cut me to the bone. He's always been a tower of strength and fortitude, but seeing this incredibly strong man break down in grief and self-loathing was hard for me to see. It must have been harder for Nate to let me see it. I moved away from the bookshelf and sat on the edge of the coffee table, facing him. I didn't want to hug the big idiot straight away, as I didn't think he wanted it. I sensed his story wasn't done. It was a long time ago, Nate, I sighed. You were younger, and none of us are perfect. Shit, I'm one of the least perfect people there is. Follow Nora's advice and don't bind yourself in the things you can't change. The fact that 20 years later, you're still carrying that guilt around with you shows you're not a bad person, Nate, because bad people don't feel remorse. You made a mistake, and yeah, it was a bad one. But it was a long time ago. I felt the burn of my own tears start to sting. You've got to let it go, Nate. You've got to forgive yourself. Nate shook his head. Maggie despised me after that, and rightly so. She filed for immediate divorce and said she couldn't even bear the sound of my name in her ears, let alone ever look at my face again. I deserve this pain, Erin. Bullshit, Nate, I said, hardening my voice a little. Look at all the good you've done since. KD and what we've done here. Charlie and his dad are together because of what we did. Maria and Dean have been reunited, and those other kids saved with Dean when we stopped those nutters carting them away to their cult village. And don't forget Alicia rescued from Bancroft's torment. You've helped rebuild that woman's sense of self-worth almost single-handed. Shit, I wouldn't be here without you. If you hadn't happened upon that farm on the day we met, I'd be dead, or even worse than dead. I shook my head, refusing to let him destroy himself with self-hatred. You made a terrible mistake, Nate, but you were in pain, and you didn't know how to deal with it. But it was twenty years ago, and you've probably been spending that time trying to make up for it. He coughed a dark laugh at that. No, I haven't, Erin. I've just been doing what I do for all that time. Deploying, whether in the service or private contracting, and pulling triggers. All those people in this community of ours. That's your doing, Erin, not mine. 
I was against the risks, said those things weren't our problem, and you made me do it by force of will. He made a small, huh, sound as he gave a faint shrug and shook his head. Erin, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have done any of it. I don't believe your bullshit, Nate, I snapped back. I don't believe that for one fucking minute. A man who carries that kind of personal guilt for 20 fucking years like a heavy weight round his neck won't continue to walk away. You hate yourself, and a man with that kind of guilt wants to atone and is desperate for redemption. Desperate to set things right. The moment I said, redemption, Nate's head lifted, surprise carved into the deep lines of his face as he stared back at me. Lucky shoots, she scores. You're a good man, Nate Carter, I pushed, willing him to believe it. I'm generally a good judge of people, and there's sweet fuck all I've seen since knowing you that makes you anything else. You made a shit decision, and I agree, it was shit. I totally get why Maggie reacted as she did. But she was grieving as well, Nate. Neither of you were in your right mind. Who can be watching their little girl go through that kind of shit? It's not fair. It never is when kids are sick like that, and I can't even imagine what that does to your head and heart. I mean, for fuck's sake, I fell apart at the death of a friend I'd only known a few months. Your daughter? I blew out my cheeks and shook my head. Shit, Nate. No one could ever know how they'd react to something like that until it happened to them. That's pretty much as bad as it gets. He stared at me a while wiping the tears from reddened eyes before he spoke again in the smallest, most vulnerable voice I've ever heard from him. You don't... hate me. And I realised why he was so nervous of coming here and telling me of the wound tearing him apart inside. He was afraid I would turn on him. Jesus fucking Christ, Nate! I snorted, shaking my head. How the fuck could I ever hate you? You've saved my ass countless times. You've taught me how to survive in this messed up world. Taught me skills I can use to protect others. And you've helped save so many lives and get rid of some really bad people. You've taken on some fucking awful burdens these past five months or so, just so that I didn't have to carry them the apartment and Freya being most notable. Christ, Nate, those two things would have broken me into little fucking pieces if I'd had to do them. I just wasn't ready for that kind of shit. He stared at me, hovering in disbelief. So I dropped the nuclear emotional bomb. Hate you, Nate. Hate you. Fucking hell, you senile old twat. I could never hate you. Because I fucking love you, you big dumb bell end. You've been more of a father to me in the past five months than my stupid fucking sperm donor was in the six years he kicked me around. Between you and Dean, I've got two fathers that I'm proud of. So don't you ever dare think I could hate you. As that emotional bomb exploded, the blast of it shattered the last of Nate's defences. He wept silently again, but this time I think it was more in relief. He'd built himself up so high in readiness for my rage and disgust that when the opposite happened, it smashed the wind right out of him. I let him have his private moment of weeping relief before eventually I stood up, moved over to him, and threw my arms around his big, dumb neck. His arms circled me, and he wept himself dry before finally pulling free, bashfully unable to look up as he dried his tears away. What was a name? He went still, his body tense. Eh? Your daughter's name. I know your wife was Maggie, but you haven't told me your daughter's name. I'd like to know. I don't know why, but it felt really important, especially with Nate's sudden tautness. 
he drew in a long, deep breath, and then said it as he exhaled. Her name was Erin. Holy fucking shit, Freya. Holy fucking shit balls. His dead daughter carried my name, and I thought back to that very first day when Nate saved me from that creepy old farmer. When I introduced myself, Nate got a weird look on his face, and I'd always thought it was because I was being my usual loud-mouthed self, and he was bewildered by my weird sense of humour. Now, I can't help but think that weird expression was because I introduced myself with the name of the daughter burning a guilty hole in his heart every waking hour. She was seven when she died, twenty years ago. And I'm twenty-seven on my next birthday in May next year. I'm the age his daughter would be now. Fucking hell, I murmured without thinking. Nate chuckled ruefully. Aye. Nate has a similar look to me, with dark brown eyes, dark hair. And I had to wonder. Have you got a picture of her? He nodded. In the bedroom, on the stand next to the bed. The bedroom was immaculate as well, the bed neat and tidily made. I guess some military habits are hard-coded into the guy after so long. It was tight and flat, not a wrinkle in the bedclothes, and I sat on it as I lifted the small picture frame and stared down at the photo. Ah, oh, Freya, she was such a cutie. It was obviously from when she was smaller, about three or four, and definitely before she got sick. Her smile was wide and innocent, full of the simple joy only a child can possess, when the world is a magical place with so much possibility and completely ignorant to the grim realities of life. A dark-haired child with dark brown eyes stared back at me, her tiny face radiant with a smile of unsullied joy. My name, with dark hair, dark brown eyes, and would be my age today were she still alive. Stunned, Unable to speak or move from the bed, I stared at that picture in shaking hands. My God, I must have been a walking, talking reminder of his lost daughter all this time, and he's never said a damn thing. Nate appeared in the doorway then, moving in a hurry with a strange note of near panic on his face. His eyes weren't on me, but the stand from where I'd taken the picture, and my head slowly turned to see what had him all in a pickle. The picture frame had concealed something hidden behind it that I hadn't registered when lifting the photo, fixed as I was to the child's picture. Now, though, my eyes locked to what Nate was so afraid of me seeing. On the stand lay a small revolver, and beside it, standing on its one flat end, was a single round. I frowned at first, wondering why he'd left a usable weapon behind when leaving home on that day. The significance of it being behind his daughter's photo with a single bullet for six empty chambers soon registered, though, given the context of his panicked flight to the room. Nate, I said in a low tone, swallowing dryly as I turned to meet his gaze. What the actual fuck, Nate? He closed his eyes, crestfallen. What the fuck, Nate? I demanded again, standing. Gently laying the photo aside, I swept up the revolver in one hand and the single bullet between thumb and forefinger of the other, holding both up before me. I said nothing else, just stood there holding out the evidence before him, his head low and eyes down in shame. You weren't meant to see those he sighed. I fucking bet I wasn't, I blurted. Jesus hell, Nate, tell me you haven't been playing Russian fucking roulette all these years. Sighing, Nate slumped to the end of the bed, back turned to me, unable to look at me or the weapon. Not all the time, he murmured. Oh well, that's fine then, I choked, every word dripping with sarcasm.
While I was still in the service, I was always occupied. I had a mission and my brothers to keep alive. I had purpose. When I left the service at the end of my stint in 22 SAS a decade ago, that quiet became a heavy burden. His head lifted, but he still didn't turn around, instead staring back through the open bedroom door. It was the silence, Erin. The quiet was my worst enemy, because all it did was turn up the volume in my head. When you're used to the bullets flying, when you've always had a mission, a target, a goal, and no thought of any existential bullshit required because your only thought is how to keep you and your mates alive. How do you then live in such deafening silence? Without anything to occupy me, all I heard in that quiet was Maggie and Erin and their accusations. Jesus Christ, Nate, I huffed, angry as all hell, as I slumped down on the bed myself, staring at the gun and bullet in my hands. Why didn't you speak to someone? His shoulders moved in a shrug. This may come as a surprise to you, but I've a little problem handling my feelings, let alone talking about them, he said with wry, bleak humour. And playing dice with a loaded gun was your preferred option. I just wanted the silence to end, Erin, he said, and the despair in his words broke my fucking heart. But I was too much of a coward to do it definitively. So I left it to chance. I'd put the round in a chamber, flick it shut, and spin it a few times. Then I'd put it to my temple and squeeze once. Just once. If it was my time, then it was my time. If not, then carry on. Nate, I chided, shaking my head while still staring at the small revolver. How many fucking times? Not many. It was usually around the hardest time. Her birthday. Which is? September 18th. Dear fucking Lord above, the hits just keep on coming. On his daughter's birthday, the same day she also died, I gave a gun to Nate and pleaded with him to take your death from me, Freya. The hardest day of the year for him and I put a fucking gun in his hand and asked him to take the life of someone he'd come to regard as a daughter. Is there no fucking end to this man's suffering? Why did you leave it here when the world fell apart? Don't know, he admitted. Thought if I left the picture behind, I could leave the gun with it. On that day, something made me leave it all here, and I convinced myself I had to go, that I had somewhere else to be. In a softer voice, he added, and I'm starting to think that something was you, Erin. What does that mean? I was a complete sceptic about all your theories, and though Freya said it wasn't as clear-cut as the Christian versions of God and the devil, there is something bigger at play. That much is clear now. The change in the undead, the dream with Freya, waking up with a white flower from that dream garden next to me. It's all so... so big. Now. He blew out a long breath, his body deflating from my rear view of him. So now, I look at everything that came before. This feeling I had to leave, finding you at the farm, remembering how stunned I was to hear you say your name, and you looking like I imagined my Erin might look if she was still alive. You're so full of life, Erin. You remind me so much of her. He laughed then, as a brighter memory bloomed in his mind. She had a smart mouth too, and a goofy, uncouth sense of humour. 
She got sick a little after her fourth birthday. But just before that, I remember her loudly declaring that farts were the most hilarious thing in all existence. He chuckled again and shook his head. So, to prove a point, she forced one out and only succeeded in shitting herself. Despite everything, through my own burning eyes and anger at the gun in my hand, I snorted a laugh. In fairness, that does sound like something I'd do. Nate rumbled a genuine laugh and nodded. I didn't want to come here, he continued. I never wanted you to know any of this or put any of it on you. It wasn't fair to make you feel like you had to bear the role of a daughter I lost. Freya said the truth would set us both free, allow me to really move forward. But I couldn't bear the thought of you hating me, Erin. I like this, Nate. The one that helps people. The one that does the right thing. But that, Nate, only exists because I don't want to let you down. I climbed across the bed and knelt behind him, dropping both gun and bullet to wrap my arms around him from behind, resting my head between his shoulder blades. You're a fucking idiot, Nate Carter, I sighed. The only time I'll ever hate you is if you ever think of spinning a bullet and putting that fucking gun to your big planet-sized head again. You hear me? His hands reached up to clasp mine around his chest. Copy that, he promised in a quiet breath. We left the revolver and its single bullet in the flat. When leaving this time, however, Nate took the picture of tiny Erin Carter in its frame and brought it home. Nate seemed lighter when we returned to the school. With his burden shared and his fears put aside of being Lockie's most hated, He's now amenable to us all being one community here at Crenshaw. I can see, can feel, the change in him already. I'm still fucking furious with him for putting that gun to his big stupid head even once. I'm looking out this window now as I type and think how none of this would exist without him. I'd be dead or still strapped to that fucking awful rack in the barn. Bancroft would have grown unchecked, terrorizing Alicia and those other women still, maybe adding more captives to his kingdom. Dean and Maria would never have been reunited, and Dean, Sarah and the two boys would have been dragged off to the lair of mad end-of-the-world cultists. Nate has been the pebble in this apocalyptic pond, and every positive ripple that's rolled out from the moment he took down old McRapey on his farm has been because of him. Hate him. Never. Fucking furious with him? Massively. But I still love the guy. He might keep saying that I'm the special one. Thanks for that, Freya. But the truth is that Nate Carter, retired Royal Marine Commando and SAS operator, and father to a daughter long lost, is the real fucking hero of our story. So much pain, so many burdens, forever taking more and more on, never saying a word of complaint, and all for one simple reason. To keep us safe. To keep me safe. Now we both know the truth, and we both know that something bigger than us is at play and the stakes are super high, I guess it's time to get to work on that. I don't know how we do it, or even what the fuck it is we're meant to be doing. But tomorrow is a new and brighter day, I hope. I wonder who this Trinity are that have the entire fucking fate of the human race in their hands. Shit, I'm glad I wasn't that fucking special. This is more responsibility than I'm comfortable with. Hell, I'm the girl who goes to the shop with the specific need to buy milk and toilet roll and comes back with cake. I can't be trusted with the fate of the human race, so at least Team Light had the good sense to give the big job to three other poor bastards. Nobody waiting to be saved from the scourge of the undead will be thrilled by me entering the room, trying to remember what I was there for as I wander off eating cake. Nate said you told him that everything was three, 
just as Theodore did. All these little mini trinities exist, or minity, as I'm now calling us, because I can, holding the front line so the main men and women can get their shit done. So there's me and Nate, but who the hell is the third member of our minity? I also need to speak to Theodore and Elijah again. I need to speak to Theodore because he clearly said that everything was three and the first dreaming would start, and that's exactly what happened. Is Team Light in touch with him somehow? And I need to speak to Elijah because, well, because he's so damn pretty and I find his presence oddly calming. He's just so chill. I'm tired and I'm going the hell to sleep, Freya. I'm hoping I get a turn in the dream garden sooner or later. I'd love another chance to speak to you. Miss you so damn hard. Night, night. It's been emotional. Literally. December 9th, 2010. Worky, work, work. Busy, busy, busy. Nate, Alicia and my good self all moved to Crenshaw the last few days. It was sad leaving the lodge, because you're buried there, Freya, and I feel like I've abandoned you somehow, but I know this is for the best. With evil Jesus and his resurrectionists, rock on, out there, and now these royal fuck trumpets calling themselves the nomads as a rival for resources, it makes sense to keep everyone together, pool all the skills and resources, and safety in numbers. Alicia has taken a room in Hall Fire with most of the others, but Nate and I took one of the little staff houses across from it, a little two-up, two-down affair. It's right next door to the one Elijah and Theodore live in. And the best bit about moving to Crenshaw? I got my pug back. Particles has officially forgiven me, it seems. I swear that dog knows when things change. He's even being affectionate towards Nate, and that's... Never happened before, because Nate usually scowls at him and calls him a rodent. It's Nate's biggest character flaw. But lo and behold, like the dad who said he never wanted a dog and then won't leave the dog alone once he's got it, Nate sits in a chair in our little living room of an evening, brew or bourbon in one hand, a good book in the other, and that little dog whore is asleep in his lap. Little pug skank, just giving it up like that. Honestly, it's nice. Some of Nate's sharp edges seemed filed down a little since he opened up. And I like it. When it's time for game face, special forces Nate gets right back in the saddle and doesn't miss a beat. But on the home front, he seems to be coming round to the idea of being part of something. And that makes me so damn happy I can't even articulate it. So much to get through in this entry. After moving here, Nate and Alicia gave us a rundown of their findings from observing Ascension. In truth, there wasn't all that much, except discovering the names of this weird first disciples to... Subdisciples? What do you even call the disciple of a disciple? Disciple once removed? Shrug. The first disciple... None of us have a clue, because they talk about and to him on the radio like he really is some second coming, and they just call him First Disciple or Revered Disciple. Freaky shit. However, we did learn the other two, a Jacob Tyler and Oliver. Second name of Oliver is unknown at this time, but Nate has pieced Jacob Tyler together because he always seems to be the one moving those undead sentries from the gate every time there's a patrol in or out. Sometimes he gets called Jacob, sometimes Tyler. Thus, you get the picture. At one point, Nate observed some kind of communal gathering in the central compound but couldn't see the actual events. It seemed like a regular occurrence lots of people attended, maybe a third of their number. Some kind of religious sermon or address they do weekly, maybe. Buggered if I know. Other than that, we don't really have much to go off. The hide that Nate set up is the only viable spot in the vicinity to get any kind of wide view. 
There are a couple of other high spots where the wall can be overlooked, but they tend to be views partially obstructed by buildings or trees, so the one we have is the only useful one for clear observation. We're not really sure what to do yet, and we've only had the one chance engagement with them, though we've seen evidence of their violent tantrums by way of the executed gated community. As there's a lot of them, we can't go picking a fight. So the question really is, should we bother with them at this time? After all, we've got a more pressing matter since the discovery of these nomad wank bags terrorising any other survivors they find. This was a bittersweet discovery from the Riches and Becketts. The nomads seem to be quite young, or at least judging by the groups they've seen. Late teens and early twenties, and all they've seen out and about were males. Bad because they seem to be assholes of the worst bullying kind, reveling in this new and lawless world. But the upside is the fact there must be more survivors out there if these nomads are a scourge to them. We just need to try and find them first. The fact we faced off against a group of 20, and that's not their only group, is worrisome though. Yes, we appear to have major fire superiority over them, as only a couple of that 20 carried minor firearms, while the rest had a wicked assortment of melee weapons. Enemies that want to kill you that can think, however, are way more dangerous than the predictable shambling hunt of the undead. When we go beyond the gate to gather resources now, we'll have to roll heavy to deter them with an overwhelming show of firepower. Six of us with rifles, shotguns and semi-automatic pistols should deter a bunch of thugs with machetes and three-shell shotguns. Hell, Nate's worth twenty of those dick springs on his own even without a gun in his hand. Never mind firearms trained extras like Dean and Eli as well. I forgot to write about my conversation with Theodore. Jesus, I'm getting all boxed up because there seems to be so much going on and so much to worry and think about. Well... I probably forgot about it because that conversation was a bust. It's really hard doing that don't ask a direct question to Theodore thing, especially when all you have are questions. With Eli's more experienced hand at it, he phrased my questions in that open-ended manner, but Theodore didn't have any further weird insights or messages from beyond. It's intensely frustrating, like it was just a freakish one-time thing. We've decided to go out on a resource gather again, into the same general area where we found the Ritchie family and Brothers Beckett. Nate being Nate, he'd rather take the fight to the nomads and remove the threat, so I think part of him is hoping for a second engagement with them. The ideal situation would be to capture one of the turds alive so we can drill them for intel. None of us like the idea of roaming scourges, harrying potential new friends we could help. Our new boy, Clyde, also offered up a bright idea we're going to action as priority for now. It's damn cold of a night and will only get worse through January and February, and Clyde is aware of a small business full of propane bottles. There are a few holiday parks dotted around the area, and this small business likely supplied them with gas for caravans and whatnot. The really big bottles that Clyde called size W. But I've no idea what that means, so... Do with that information what you will. However, there are numerous smaller bottles as well for the home gas heaters, which they also sell in their shop front. The garage that employed Clyde purchased their varying welding gases like argon and acetylene from this gas wholesaler, but as they sell propane as well, it could be a good way to top up our heating needs to get through the winter and save our other power reserves. Plus, if Clyde can get some welding gas and accoutrements, maybe he can armour up our pickup into a crazy Mad Max apocalypse warthog. Holy fucking shit. I love that idea. I'm going to explore that. There's a scrapyard up by that builder's yard, so there's a metric fuck ton of metal we could take from there. Clyde will totally have the skills for that. How have I only just thought of this? I'm slacking Freya. The warthog is my new mission in life. Let's armour and spike that pickup to the balls and see how the nomads like that shit when we roll up in an armoured Humvee in my new warthog. Yeah, baby. 
We'll have to get some wood burners installed in the school halls when the weather gets better to save a drain on our solar batteries and diesel generator stocks. But this winter, we could grab a bunch of those small bottle gas heaters and a bunch of propane bottles. Seems like a sound plan as a quick fix for our first apocalypse winter. The only downside? The place is up near the builder's yard, where Nate and the others got trapped some time back, so it's likely there's still a heavy undead presence round that area. It's not past the yard, so that's a win. It's a little further on from the right turn that bears onto the road running up to the yard. The gas shop is about 50 yards or so past that turn, which is why none of us saw it, in a little fenced yard on its own, set back from the road. It does mean any noise we make could draw that horde down towards us, though. On the plus side, as Captain Evil isn't specifically dancing their strings as it was that day, they should be back to their shambling, moronic selves, so we'll see them coming in plenty of time if we post a sentry on that corner. It does mean we should travel in force, though, taking more active shooters and ammo than usual. The gas shop seems like a quality resource, and Clyde says their bottle truck might still be there, so he's going to come with us and bring some tools and good diesel in case he needs to work on it to start the bitch up. That truck has a hydraulic tail lift at the back for loading and unloading bottles, and racks built into the open back of the truck for safely strapping bottles in place for transport. Seems like a winning plan. So, tomorrow we're going to roll out prepared for war, Naturally, me and Nate will go. Eli has volunteered to come along as an experienced shooter, and the fact that he's a trained paramedic and former army combat medical technician is a huge bonus. That means Maria can stay at the school, giving us trained medical personnel at both ends. I like that we have this capability now. Sarah wants to come for more experience, and bless him, Dean is letting her do a thing. Dean is staying at the school, so we don't have all our experienced shooters out and about, and he's very much seen as the school's de facto leader. He's always so calm, authoritative, organised, really good with people, and an all-round stand-up dude. I promised Dean that Nate and I would look out for Sarah and keep her close, and he seemed happy with that. Isaac's coming, which is a pain, but we need the labour and he can shoot, Alicia is obviously coming, because that girl is now a stone-cold badass of a shooter and officially in the upper tier of experienced security now. How many is that? Me, Nate, Alicia, Isaac, Elijah, Sarah. Six shooters. Four experienced. It's still funny I'm classed as experienced. And two more novice shooters in Sarah and Isaac. Non-shooters coming are young Zane, who'll be starting his shooting lessons soon. He turned 18 a couple of days ago, so as he's now an adult, Dean is okay with him learning to shoot. For now, he's just coming as labour. Clyde is coming as our mechanic and knows what he's looking for, but doesn't have any firearms experience, which will obviously have to change. He's a big dude, and I just have this feeling he's going to be a shotgun kind of guy, which would be handy, as we've got quite a few shotguns and a shit ton of ammo for them. Surprisingly, the science teacher Graham wants to come and help out, so we're cool with that. We'll need hands just for labour, freeing up the guns a little. I think the scientist in him just fancies a nosy around a gas wholesaler, plus he's not left Crenshaw since the world shat its panties, and I think he's simply curious to see the world beyond the gate. So that's nine in total. Shit, that's our biggest mission yet. Dean, Maria, Mark and Nora have all got firearms experience, so if there are any issues on the home front, they've got enough to hold the line and we should be in radio range. Nate and I still haven't discussed the dreams with everyone yet. Our new larger community is still quite fresh, and dropping a supernatural bomb like that at the moment might just freak everyone out. So we're keeping it to ourselves. For the moment, it's business as usual. I still need to figure all that shit out, and I haven't managed it in the past few days. It's just so fucking... weird. Rest up, and tomorrow, roll out. 
December 12th, 2010. Willow Park. Shit, it's been a few days and I've got a lot to cover. I better crack on, so no time for fancy introductions. I'm all about the business tonight. We rolled out in three vehicles a couple of days back. Nate drove the Humvee, because he's basically in love with it, accompanied by Alicia, Zane and Graham. I drove at the rear of our convoy, with Sarah and Eli in the pickup for company. Isaac and Clyde were sandwiched between us in the black Astra we gave to Dean. Yes, that same black hatchback from Bancroft's crappy sniper all those many moons ago. There was at least one shooter in each vehicle, but we stuck Isaac in the middle because he's still a relative novice. I'm still getting the looks from Isaac, and now Eli is getting them as well, much to my irritation. There's clearly a streak of jealousy, though thankfully Eli seems oblivious, or is purposefully ignoring it. We really don't have time for this shit. The journey to the gas shop was relatively straightforward, with only a few easily ignored wandering undead along the way. As we arrived at the gas shop, there was a large SUV parked across the open gate and a big white van inside the fenced yard with its rear doors open. Two men stood by the SUV and looked frazzled by the approach of our convoy, considering our lead vehicle was an armoured Humvee, and they shouted to their companions loading horizontal gas bottles carefully into the van. There were five men in total. The two men by the SUV had shotguns, but the other three appeared armed only with makeshift melee weapons. Their nerves only intensified when our convoy rolled to a stop. Nate, stepping out of the Humvee with a military-grade rifle over his chest, followed by Alicia armed with the same, put them visibly on edge. They didn't overtly threaten us because, well, because they weren't stupid. As we all poured out of the vehicles carrying L-85 rifles and Glock 17s, a look of dread resignation clouded their features. We don't want any trouble said one of the men nervously, gripping the shotgun tightly, though he ensured the barrel remained down. He was around Nate's age, maybe late forties or early fifties, with a thick beard and lengthening dark hair, both streaked with silver. He was big too, about six four, broad chested, and looked like he could punch through brick. The other armed man to his left appeared mid to late twenties and obviously related, with an equal stature and similar features, just more youthful. And we're not here for any, replied Nate amiably. We're just out gathering supplies for our community, like I guess you are. Nate looked over his shoulder and waved me forward. I'm Nate Carter and this is Erin Locke. Fucking hell, I said excitedly. People who haven't tried to fuck with us. I turned to Nate. Is this a first, Nate? I think this is a first. Might be a first, he agreed with a stoic nod. Friends call me Locky, I said with a grin, stepping forward and thrusting out a hand. Doug Archer, he replied, obviously bemused by me taking the lead instead of Nate. I could tell because he took my hand, looked at me with a little confusion, then glanced at Nate for confirmation. This is my son, Finley. Finn, the younger man nodded, and I shook his hand too. Everyone relaxed as introductions were made, and it probably helped that I had a stupid, excitable grin on my face the whole time. Generally, if someone is smiling with childish happiness, they're probably not going to start a fight. Well, unless they're a really special kind of psycho. We chewed the fat for five or ten minutes, and they introduced the other three men, who I've completely forgotten the names of for the moment, because Doug seemed to be the man to talk to. He and his son both had UK legal Mossbergs, both just three shell capacity, as they're part of a shooting club, or were, down in Somerset, and were looking to try some of the ranges and events up here. Yes, Freya, Somerset. They have that awesome West Country accent that makes them sound super rural. Ooh, ah, all right, my lover. Shut up and drink your cider. I just bought you that. 
I promise that's the last time I'll attempt an overly stereotypical West Country accent in the written format. I just had to put it out there, simply because I think it's ace. Anyway, Doug and his wife, plus Finn and his wife, with their two ankle biters aged six and three, are big caravanners. They came up to lovely Cheshire for a family break to see the northern sights and arrived, if you can believe this shit look, the day before everything fell apart. Worst holiday ever. What a rectal prolapse of bad luck that is. Their second day here and everything went to absolute hell. They remained at the rural caravan park to see how things transpired because a five-hour drive of nearly 300 miles to the southwest seemed like a big risk. Boy, was that the right decision. They're part of a little community called Willow Park, about four miles from the gas shop. They were here stocking up on those big propane bottles for the park homes so they can cook and keep warm. Doug and Finn, with their hunting shotguns, are the only ones with any firearms and have essentially become the leaders of their little survivor community. There are about 30 people at that park, though about a third of that number are kids, from anywhere as young as three up to the age of 16. There are a couple of rows of about 40 fancy houses a quarter mile up from the park, which they've scavenged clean of all useful food and resources, helping them stay alive all this time, coupled with various supplies already at the park. Having put down about 40 to 50 undead over the months, they're pretty worried about food come the winter and also concerned with their dwindling ammunition. Between them, they've got around 25 shells left for the two shotguns, and after that, all they'll have are makeshift melee weapons. Those shotguns are probably the only reason they haven't been killed doing house clearances. Why haven't you taken the bottle truck? I asked, nodding towards it. Seems pretty precarious lying big bottles down in the back of a van. You work with what you got, Doug answered with a shrug. Truck won't start. Clyde is here for just that reason. I said, hiking a thumb at our big Scotsman. You'll be taking the truck then, sighed Doug in resignation. Just leave us enough gas for our people, would you? I laughed. Fucking hell, Doug. We're not here to just take everything. We don't need the big bottles. If Clyde can get that truck working, we'll load it up with everything we can, and if you're agreeable, we'll drive it back to your place with as much as we can. We only need the smaller bottles and some of the little home heaters from the shop to top us up. Oh, and any welding gas. All five men were genuinely surprised by my offer, and Doug looked to Nate for confirmation. Pfft, old guys. Don't look at me, pal, said Nate. If Erin says that's what we'll do, then that's what we'll do. Are all your people okay? I asked, basking in the glow of Nate's unequivocal support. Elijah here is a paramedic and former army combat med tech. If you've got any sick or injured, he can take a look. And Clyde is a whiz of a mechanic if your vehicles need a once-over. Eli just nodded his agreement, and I swear I saw the glisten of tears in Doug's eyes. Utter disbelief. Here we were, a bunch of highly capable and extremely well-armed strangers, just rolling up and offering help with no strings attached. You'd do that. Doug, I said, turning serious. If the living can't help each other out when the dead have taken everything else, then what's the fucking point of us being here? There don't seem to be that many of us left. If you've got 30 people at your place and kids to boot, then what kind of people would we be if we just left you to it? The deal was sealed. Clyde got that bottle truck working after about an hour's work, draining the tank and putting fresh diesel in it, doing some other fiddly stuff I don't understand, and after a few attempts, got the engine turning over and gave it a few revs. After that, we spent a couple of hours loading up all the bottles that both groups needed and loaded about six of the home heaters from the shop front in the back of my pickup. Once done, we went to Willow Park to meet our new friends. Well... Actually, that's not entirely true. Clyde revving that engine and us generally clinking and clanking about caught the attention of the mini horde at the builder's yard up the road. 
They took a while, and Alicia was watching down that long road, just in case any of that horde made their way towards the noise. Contact, said Alicia over the radio. Undead coming from the yard. Me, Nate and Eli all moved to join Alicia, forming a firing line across the end of the junction, watching the shuffling horde gradually appear and shamble their way towards us. It wasn't a dense mass, like on the night I pulled their asses out of the fire at the yard, but it was still heavily populated. We're going to have to take care of these sooner or later, Nate, I said, especially if we've got new friends a few miles away. If a couple of hundred undead get drawn over to their gate and they've only got two three-shot weapons. Nate nodded. Semi only, he instructed the three of us. With four of us and each carrying three spare magazines, we should have ammo enough for the job. Pick the shots and try not to double up. Spread out in an even line and aim for those directly ahead of you so we thin out the mass and don't try and shoot the same targets. I'll start first with the scope at extreme range to thin the herd. The rest of you wait until they're at medium range where you can put them down with iron sights. Everyone clear? There were three resounding, copy that, from us, and we did as instructed. Seriously, Nate is an incredible shot. These things were about 400 meters as they came into view, and that's pushing the boundaries of the L-85. He let them get to about half that, knelt against a low wall of the nearest house to steady the rifle, and then started firing steady and smooth. There were little puffs of distant gore from Zed heads every time Nate squeezed the trigger, and the empty vessels crumpled to the road. Every single one of the 30 rounds popped ahead. Holy fucking shit, murmured Eli, seeing Nate in action for the first time. Eli's amazed reaction made me feel super proud of Nate. I know how good the old wolf is, but seeing someone else with military experience genuinely awed by Nate's skill made me appreciate him all over again. I got lucky, Freya. So damn lucky. Nate Carter is the fucking man. Reloading, he said out of habit, switching magazines and doing the whole thing over again. Sixty shots, sixty popped undead skulls. That, my friend, is fucking skill on an epic scale. Once he switched out his second magazine, the rest were closer, within a hundred meters. Okay, the three of you start putting lead down range, he said. Let's see how far the two of you have come, and let's get a look at Eli. It's been a while, said Eli with a wry grin. Don't judge me too hard. I'm usually patching people up while bullets fly over my head. Means you can keep your wits, said Nate with a nod. Now, eyes on target, people. Less talky, more shooty. I turned my face slowly towards Nate, mouth and eyes gaping open in shock. Less talky, more shooty. That's like something I would say, not Nate. He met my gaze, one corner of his mouth quirking in a smile, before flashing me a conspiratorial wink. I have to say, this new Nate is even better than the old one. I think the three of us did okay. Not many rounds went awry, and once a few got within 50 meters or so, all three of us were pretty unerring on the headshots. It did us good and was cathartic, like a first major victory over the undead in some time. It really felt like we were making a difference in reducing the numbers, and Nate must have seen it in the three of us, because he called Isaac and Sarah to the fray as well, to give them some live trigger time with the glocks on the stragglers getting close. It was only minutes before the rest of our crew and Doug's people were all watching the five of us put down the slowly advancing scatter of undead, with Nate on overwatch, interceding from time to time when things got a little too close for comfort. He split his time between watching the undead, cleaning up any burgeoning problems, and adjusting the technique of us all, focusing a lot on Sarah and Isaac. Nate was clearly impressed with Sarah. Eighteen years old and already been through so much loss for a kid her age, she was smooth and solid like a boss. Two hands on the gun, steady and unflappable, and switching out magazines like an old pro. 
She was ten feet tall when she got words of praise from Nate, and it only spurred her to greater effort rather than letting it go to her head, which is a trait Nate likes. Talented at a piano and behind the trigger of a Glock, welcome to the new world. Isaac is improving, but he's just not a natural. He works hard, but there's something awry with his hand-eye coordination. Close up, he's okay, but at any kind of range, he has to adjust quite a bit. Lots of low shots hitting chest and neck or a high miss. I doubt Nate will want to put one of the precious rifles in his hand, as his spatial awareness and depth perception seems a little off. We've got eight L85s in total, four of them allocated to Nate, me, Alicia and Eli. The other four will be reserved for those who stand out, and I'm telling you now, it won't be long before Sarah is the next of us to have one of those in hand. Girl power runs strong in Team Nate. After we'd finished, the road was littered with corpses, and if we ever head to the builder's yard or scrappy, we'll have to do some serious clean-up down this road. There's no getting any vehicle up there without crunching over rotting bodies. You guys really know what you're doing, observed Doug when we were done, clearly impressed with the efficient victory. For us, it was good trigger time and a bit of catharsis, but to Doug's people, we must have looked like natural-born killers. We've had the best teacher, I said, hiking a thumb at Nate. This old dog is a former Royal Marine Commando and SAS operator. If they were impressed before, they were genuinely awestruck after I dropped that nugget. You only have to say SAS to a Brit, and as far as they're concerned, you don't get better than that. It's a pretty fair reaction, to be honest. If Nate is a yardstick for the elite of British Special Forces, then they must be fucking lethal in a fire team. After we dealt with the undead advance and gotten our little slice of vengeance on Captain Evil's infantry, we finished up our labour and headed over to meet Doug's people at Willow Park. Doug owns his own construction company, so he's got years in the building trade, and his son Finn works for him as a fully qualified electrician. Our luck in finding useful skilled folk seems to be unending. Doug's family is a full fifth of the 30 remaining on the park. There's him, his wife, then Finn and his wife and two kids. There are three other families with kids, two families of five and one of four. There are four couples with their caravans, as young as early thirties up to early sixties, and the final couple, who own the little park, are in their late fifties. A lot of people there made the grave mistake of breaking for home when everything started falling apart. It's a surprisingly large park, and feels empty with only thirty people gathered in one section for security. There are berths for about 40 caravans, or mobile homes, at the back of the park, and around the same number of static homes, which the owners rent out or use themselves when on a little getaway. Since the park is largely empty, the remaining residents have moved out of their mobile caravans and taken up residence in a single block of the static homes, what with the owners unlikely to return any time soon. They're larger and better for those with kids. The statics also take their gas supply from the big propane bottles for heating water, powering gas stoves and running the gas heaters. The electric supply has long since died and they don't have any solar power here, just a couple of petrol generators. They don't really have the spare juice for them though, so they've really rolled back the years here and reverted to a far simpler existence than we enjoy. Naturally, when we rolled into the park in force, there was initial fear at the sight of our Humvee and the assortment of military-grade arms we carry. When we started talking, though, and Doug started singing our praises, I nearly fucking cried for how happy they were to see friendly faces. Eli got one of the medical kits assembled by Maria and started treating some minor injuries, giving people the once-over in basic health checkups. While giving those checkups, he smiled at everyone to set them at ease, waving away the constant stream of gratitude hurled his way. We passed out clean water and any food we had with us, and I nearly had my arm jolted out of its socket from the numerous vigorous hand shakes I received, each one warm and filled with such simple relief and joy. But Freya, they looked so downtrodden. 
Fresh water is clearly an issue, and once I saw everyone together, it was clear they've been surviving hard. They don't have spare fluids beyond drinking water to keep a regular hygiene regimen, and the sight of dirty-faced kids almost broke my heart in two. I think most of their supply has been from captured rainwater or scavenged bottled water and other beverages from those nearby homes. We're lucky being able to keep clean and healthy, and because we keep clean, the smell of these people made my heart ache. They were obviously immune to it, but we weren't, and I caught Nate's expression as he watched Finn's daughter of six skipping in happiness, draped in dirty clothing as her grime-smeared face beamed with joy. I know what he's thinking. What if this was my daughter? Trust is the hardest commodity of all in this new world. But seeing these people, it was obvious they were no threat to us. Quite the opposite, in fact. They needed our help, and I'm damn well going to give it them. The following day, I was planning on going back again, taking them a shitload of crates of bottled water, food, hygiene stuff like toothpaste, toothbrushes, soap, clean clothing, and some medical supplies we'd scavenged. Nothing we couldn't afford to give, though when I announced my plan, there wasn't immediate unanimous agreement. Who were these heartless dissenting voices, you ask? Well, there was actually only one. Guess fucking who? Should we really just be handing over important supplies to a bunch of strangers? Said Isaac, right in front of everyone. I don't even know if he actually expected support. Personally, I think he just wanted to undermine me in some way, but the dickhead clearly doesn't know how to read the room. Everyone looked at him like he'd just asked if it was okay for him to have a shit in the middle of the carpet. Every other face had a, what the fuck, Isaac, expression pointed his way. You were a stranger until me and Nate cracked you out of captivity, I said, doing myself proud with how calm I stayed, considering all I wanted to do at that moment was dick punch him for being such a tosser. And you don't seem to have argued against us feeding and sheltering you. How much stuff have you collected on your dangerous missions beyond the gate, Isaac? That shut him up. I was hoping after Nate made him literally wet himself because of his shitty attitude, it might curb his stupid peak a little. But my growing friendship with Eli seems to have knocked the sense out of him again. There are kids there, Isaac, said Mark, his tone harder than I've ever heard from him. As the poster boy for single dads, he's pleasant and mild-mannered all the time, but that particular papa bear will have sharp fangs and vicious claws if you do anything that might harm his boy, and that protective paternal nature naturally extends to all children. The question isn't, should we be taking supplies to them? said Nora into the tense quiet. What we should talk about is when we move them here. We've got plenty of water, extra hands to work around here will be welcome, and yes, it'll put a drain on our food, and we might have to be a little more careful, but are we really just going to leave hungry, dirty children with no real safety or security when we have the power to do something? I'm with Nora, I said. They're exposed out there, a third of their number are kids, they're dirty, skinny, with only two shotguns and dwindling ammunition between them. Doug's a builder, his son's an electrician, and could probably maintain the solar banks and batteries. And there might be other skills in the rest of that community of major value to us. I stared daggers straight at Isaac, shrinking under the weight of popular opinion. But above and beyond whatever skills they have, they're living, breathing people who need our help. They're not the nomads, nor are they disciples of evil Jesus. They're just trying to survive in this messed up world. It's the right thing to do, agreed Dean with a nod. Anyone else against me making that offer when I take them some supplies? Every head shook in the negative. They all remember their time as captives, or struggling to survive out in the cold, until Nate and I started things off at the lodge, and Dean came to secure Crenshaw. Between the three of us, and I'll never use this against them all unless I have no other option, 
but none of this shit would be in place if it weren't for me, Nate and Dean. As long as my two dads are supporting me, everyone else can suck it. I mean, that's an oversimplification and not entirely fair, because the likes of Maria, Nora and Mark will always back our plays. But you get where I'm at. Nate and Dean's votes are worth the most in my eyes, along with Maria. The tension broke as particles waddled up to Isaac and sat, staring up at him with that expectant look of, well, human, on his little face. Isaac stared down, confused, before his face twisted in horror. Yes, particles dropped a particularly malodorous dog fart at Isaac's feet, then sauntered away from him with a puggy swagger after leaving that early Christmas present to choke him. See? My home dog knows when people are being dicks and has his own unique way of contributing to the conversation, even when it's a fart to clear the room. People half laughed and half choked as they broke for the exits to escape the farticles of particles. No further discussion was needed. Wow, this has been a long entry and I'm beat. I'll do another in the morning after I've slept and cover our chat and offer with Doug. Right now, I'm struggling to keep the little black letters from blurring on the page. Always so freaking tired now, Freya. Surviving is hard. December 13th, 2010. The Offer. Okay, so I've got a coffee and it's relatively early. I like my mornings quiet and relaxing, easing me into the hard work that inevitably follows. I want my day to romance me a little before it does its best to fuck me, and Nate is up asking his usual question. What the hell are you writing in that thing? With our scene set, I'm ready to catch you up on the offer we made to Doug and his people at Willow Park. Just four of us went in the Humvee. Me, Nate, Dean and Maria. We're the effective leadership representatives, and it was also a chance for Maria to cast her eye on any sick or injured as well. Eli has mad skills from a first aid stance, but Maria has been a senior nurse practitioner for over 20 years, and Elijah isn't too proud to bow to her superior experience. Honestly, I felt a little out of place with such senior people. An experienced police sergeant, a qualified to the eyeballs medical professional, a former Special Forces veteran, and me, a mouthy warehouse worker whose only real qualification is a diploma in writing stories. You have to chuckle when you think about it. I just seem like the complete opposite of what Team Light needs as one of their special folk. I still think Doug and his people are a little confused by this foul-mouthed woman in her mid-twenties being our community spokesperson with such older, wiser heads beside me. But them's the breaks. Apparently, Team Light has decided my role for me, so I've just got to get on with it. Not that we're dropping that bomb on anyone right now. For the moment, me and Nate are still the only ones in the know on that front. It's just more sensible that way while we figure shit out. However, rocking up with a Humvee full of water, food, medicine, and other such crucial supplies, I don't think they really cared. Doug's people hardly believed how their fortunes had turned in such a short space of time, finding well-supplied allies willing to share without any demands in return. The four of us sat down with the entire population of Willow Park in what passed for the park's on-site bar. It was big enough for everyone to congregate, and my three most favourite people in the world again deferred to me to deliver our offer. Nate has inside info on the supernatural selection, but Dean and Maria don't, so the fact that the two of them looked to me to make the offer was a real show of support. I love those two so much. So I straight up made the play. We had space for them at our location. We had power, clean water, the ability to shower, which, let me tell you, I think that sold most of them straight away. Weapons and ammunition, the skills with those weapons, our protective hedgerows and solid metal fencing that prevented undead simply wandering onto site, 
safe space for the kids to run and play, and all the other myriad benefits that their relocation would bring. Basically, they're up for it. They've been surviving alone and with such difficulty for so long, the idea of warm buildings, clean water, regular meals, security in numbers by armed people led by a former SAS operator and specialist firearms officer, and two trained medical professionals, well, why wouldn't they? There were a few questions, though. How are decisions made? asked Doug. I mean, what kind of input do we have? Everyone gets a say, Doug, I answered. We're a community, and any big decisions are put to everyone. We're not into keeping secrets, as that serves no one. Sometimes, though, we may have to pull rank. We? The four of us here will veto something if it's not in the best interests of our survival. Between myself, Nate, and Dean, we're the ones who essentially provided the safety and security for everyone now living at Crenshaw and the ones who've put our necks on the line the most in terms of resource gathering. Finally, the inevitable question I'd been waiting for was asked, as Doug had obviously been mulling it overnight. No disrespect intended, Erin, but how's a young woman like yourself the elected spokeswoman for your group? He gestured to my older companions. No offence, but here you've a military veteran, a police officer and a senior nurse, all older and more experienced. I didn't get the chance to answer. Joan of Arc led an army in her teens to victory at Orléans, Patay and Troyes, said Nate. Alexander the Great conquered two million square miles, stretching from Greece and Egypt all the way east to India before the age of 30. There's no age limit on leadership qualities, Doug. She might seem youthful at times when she speaks and appear a little unorthodox, but that's part of a charm. What you can be sure of is that when things seem at their darkest, Erin somehow finds a way to shine a light into that murk. She's been the driving force behind every good act our people have done, and everyone in our community owes their safety to her in some part, whether large or small. Including me, added Dean. Had Nate and Erin not appeared when they did, I wouldn't be here, along with three youngsters from the school. Nate kept his eyes on Doug. And she single-handedly rescued me and two others from an undead horde, in a creative manner that I doubt anyone else would have been able to pull off. Hell, she went out into the night on her own, with no idea what she might be facing, because she knew her friends needed help. He looked at me then as he added, This young woman has courage to burn, and she'll kick her way through a brick wall if it means being able to pull someone she cares about to safety. I'm very rarely speechless in my life, as you know by now, but the conviction in Nate and Dean's statements floored me. We all want to be thought of highly by those whose opinions matter to us, and the opinions of Nate, Dean and Maria are more important to me than anyone else left alive in this messed up world. Hearing them openly say such kind words in my defence really straightened my spine and lifted my spirits, as Maria sat beside us nodding at every single word to add her own show of support. Clearly the impassioned endorsement of the two men went a long way with Doug and his people, as all eyes turned towards me. Many were surprised, as you'd expect, but they all regarded me with a definite newfound interest. What can I say? I said with a dramatic sigh and a shrug, keeping my tone light. I'm a friggin' delight. A scatter of snorts and chuckles broke any lingering tension, and the atmosphere in the room relaxed again. Doug asked if we could step outside while they discussed it between them, but it was no more than five minutes before they called us back in. It's unanimous, he announced with a grateful smile. What's next? Well, I mused aloud, it'll take us a few days to get some of the other halls set up in readiness for you all, 
make sure you've got power to the other buildings and all that jazz. I guess all we really need to do is set up a day and we'll roll out in force to escort your convoy. What about the caravans? asked Finn. Dean answered first. Do you really need them? You'll have solid walls and most of the things you need. If you ever need to come back here for anything personal, it could be arranged, if important enough. It seems unnecessary trying to move them. Load up all you can into as many vehicles as can make the trip, and we'll bring our van with us for any supplies here. You've all been living in the static homes anyway, I pointed out. What date is it? asked Doug. Do you know? It's December 11th, I responded instantly. Doing this journal makes me constantly aware of the date at all times. They seemed shocked. They knew it was maybe late autumn or early winter, just because of the weather, but I think hearing that it was only a couple of weeks until Christmas really rocked them all. Okay, well, give us a few days as we figure out everything this end. Say, three days from now? The 14th? We agreed on the date, hung around a bit, and got to know some more names, which I'm not going to list, before heading back after a few hours. So now the work is going on in earnest. Yesterday and today is all about getting space ready for people, and tomorrow we're bringing them here. We've already decided on a heavy convoy. Nate will lead the way in the Humvee with Alicia and Eli as his main two guns, in case of trouble, and Eli's medical skills in case something does go wonky. Dean and Sarah will ride with me in the pickup because, yes, Freya, after Nate watched Sarah's mad pistol skills in the last couple of days, he's upgraded her to one of the L85s. The kid's a boss. I really like her. All our six active rifles, Dean uses his own G36C, will be at the front and rear of the Willow Park convoy, at the centre of which will be our white van to carry any bulk supplies back to the school. Isaac offered to drive with Clyde riding shotgun in case of any vehicular problems along the way. Also, that riding shotgun is a literal description, as it seems my prophecy tree bears fruit once more. Nate's given Clyde the shotgun basics, and he's happy to carry one. Amazing that people who'd likely shy from guns in the past are happy to carry now, especially people like Clyde with a family to protect. We've got plenty of ammo for the shotguns, and hopefully it won't be needed, but it's getting him used to carrying it, I guess. Hell, I can hardly remember what it's like to walk around without at least a Glock strapped to my hip anymore. As we go out beyond the gate all the time, I'm full up with a combat load of Glock, rifle, spare magazines for both, radio on my belt with earpiece and throat mic. I mean, shit, it's really hard to do parkour with all that stuff hanging off me in the field. Well, impossible, actually. Oh, yeah, that's one really great thing about living at the school I should have mentioned, actually. With all the open areas, crazy buildings of differing heights and spacing, fully equipped gymnasium and staircases and ledges all over the place, part of my daily exercise routine now is keeping my tracer skills honed by playing around on campus. For one hour a day, I get to take my Glock off and get my parkour on. Dean and Maria are forever shouting at me as I soar between two rooftops or transfer from one ledge to another with a cat jump. That's the parental concern there, as I'm constantly getting the be careful commands from them both. It's funny. I'm spending most of my time in the gym now, though, with crash mats, trying out new things, because the ground is pretty treacherous at the moment, with smatterings of rain and frost making rooftop runs a bit reckless. So, an influx of new people is on the way, and we're doing what I'd always hoped we would, making a safe place for the living and flipping the middle finger to Captain Evil's brainless minions. This place is going to get busy soon. Exciting stuff. I'll write again when everyone's settled in and the job is done. December 15th, 2010. Blame. Life can be unbearably hard at times in this new world. Today, life should be moving forward with all its old potential. Today, somebody should be starting their dream job. Today, 
Someone should be walking down the aisle as friends and family watch on. Today, kids should be going to the parties of school friends, carrying gifts in shiny paper with smiles as bright as the sun. Today, somebody should be gathering their courage to finally ask out that person they've been hiding feelings for. Today, somebody should be hearing, I love you, for the first time. Instead, we mourned our dead. I feel so fucking low, Freya. This guilt is tearing me apart. If I hadn't been so eager with my stupid hero complex, desperate to save everyone, then maybe this wouldn't have happened. How the hell do I look people in the eye after this? How can I possibly suggest any course of action without them questioning me, or me questioning myself? I really don't want to write this shit down, but I've made a rod for my own back with this journal. I can joke and laugh all I want with my stupid, sassy ways, but if I don't write down events like this, then I'm not doing them justice. I'm not doing it right. I chose to, need to, make this journal and chronicle everything for you to help me sort through the whirl of thoughts and emotions that batter me. And that means I've got to take the rough with the smooth. We rolled out from Willow Park with a total of 11 vehicles in our convoy. Nate led the way in the Humvee, with Alicia and Eli alongside him. After him was Doug and his wife in his SUV, along with the couple who owned Willow Park as passengers. Right behind Doug was his son Finn, with his wife and two kids in their SUV. A van owned by a couple was next, carrying a load of supplies, then a minivan with one of the five-member families. Behind them was a car with one of the couples. Isaac and Clyde in our van were next, sandwiched in the middle of the civilian convoy with the other two families, one of five and the other four, in an SUV and car respectively. The last couple in their own small vehicle came next, then right at the rear providing security was our pickup with me driving and Dean and Sarah as active guns. Eleven vehicles strung out in a line, with a total of 38 people, and 30 of those feeling good about their upturn in fortunes. And then hell opened its gates. We were about halfway done on our route home, and everything was rosy, with little undead presence other than random wanderers here and there. To get back to Crenshaw, we had to go through the area on the outskirts of town where our first contact with the nomads occurred, so naturally we were on edge. However, if they were hanging around the area, we didn't honestly think a bunch of thugs with machetes, axes and a couple of guns would dare to take on a convoy of this size. Nobody could be that stupid. We couldn't have been more wrong. I was driving up the rear, and as we moved through a street with an open park on the left, a common place for dog walkers, and a row of houses lining the road on the right, I watched in abject horror from my position as three hooded figures appeared out front of some houses. Fire bloomed in their hands and then arced through the air to smash against the fourth, sixth and eighth vehicles in our convoy. The glass molotovs shattered against the side of the Willow Park van and the car containing one couple directly in front of Isaac and Clyde. A wash of burning fuel coated the side of the vehicles, bringing them to a panicked stop as they scrambled to escape their flaming vehicles out the passenger side. Things were far worse for the poor family of five in the SUV, just three cars ahead of me. By complete freak occurrence, the man driving the vehicle had his window three quarters down, and in a million to one shot of tragic misfortune, the petrol bomb sailed through the portal hole, only smashing once inside the vehicle. God save them, wheezed Dean, as liquid flame exploded within the car, dousing the entire family, all strapped into their seats. Thick smoke roiled out of the open window, and even in the cab of the pickup, the deathly shrieks of the family jarred my bones, the three kids included. I will never forget that sound, 
and it will haunt me until the end of my days. Every drop of blood in my body was chilled by the dreadful screaming of burning children. We hardly had time to register that when around ten more figures appeared at upper windows or in the small front gardens alongside the fire bombers. A storm of gunfire erupted across our convoy. Freya. We got it horribly wrong. Those nomads only had minor weapons in our first meeting with them, but every one of these ten wielded pistols or shotguns, unleashing an absolute hellstorm of gunfire along the length of the convoy before we had a chance to react. Worst of all, one man held up a machine pistol and pulled the trigger, dumping the entire long magazine in seconds, raking it along the length of our column. The world erupted in a thunder of flames, screaming lead and violence. And then we were out and returning fire, Nate's voice firing into life across our radio channel, eerily calm in the midst of such chaos. Eli, full auto high with me. The rest of you suppress ground level. No holding back. Nate and Eli, both armed with full auto variants of the L-85, unleashed a counterstorm, dumping out a barrage of suppressing fire from the front of the column, using the armoured Humvee as cover. Glass fragmented in the upper windows, and chips of brick powdered in the air as 60 high-velocity rounds battered the upper floors where some of the attackers were positioned. A few vanished as five, five, six rounds punched into them, while others disappeared from view as they dived for cover. It was no time for single shots, and I switched to burst, just to put as many rounds as I could into the general area of the ground-level assailants, Dean and Sarah following suit, with support from Alicia beside Nate. Whether I hit them or the other three did, I can't really say. Adrenaline was high, and all that mattered was preventing another volley, especially from that damned machine pistol, so the six of us with rifles just opened the fuck up with all we had, filling the area with shrieking lead, so if anyone stupid enough were standing, they'd get a mouthful of bullets for their trouble. The heat from the flaming vehicles was intense, and even above the thunder of our weapons, the continued screaming from inside the SUV was horrific. Chilling. Can you imagine the sound of children being burned alive? soaked in petrol as their world is just filled with flames and agony. Fucking hell. I feel sick just writing this, but I can still hear them now. I didn't sleep much last night, and I don't think I will tonight. I don't know if I'll ever sleep well again after hearing that. Everything happened in a blur. After their initial assault and our counterfire, it was over just as quickly as it had started. Our ambushers were either dead, wounded, or fled, because once we started trading fire, it was glaringly evident that our fire superiority was colossal in comparison. With Eli and Nate dropping entire magazines of 30 rounds each in about three seconds, there was no way the bastards were hanging around for a head-to-head -head with three shell shotguns and six round revolvers. Their trap was sprung, They'd unleashed unholy fucking hell on us, and once they knew they were outmatched, their survivors fled in the satisfaction that they'd hurt us. And they did hurt us. Viciously. The first two petrol bombs coated one side of the van and car in burning petrol, but that was all. Alicia put those out with an extinguisher from the Humvee, so there was no chance of them blowing, but the front tires on the vehicles were compromised by the flames and wouldn't be going anywhere, and we certainly weren't hanging about to swap a tire. The third, however, murdered an entire family. A couple and their three children, ages eight, twelve, and sixteen. Freya, my heart is fucking sick. While me, Dean, Sarah, and Alicia pulled security, and kept a watch for any of the bastards thinking of taking a second shot and picking off any errant undead drawn to the noise. Nate and Eli moved along the column behind the vehicles, running triage and giving medical attention for the vehicle passengers targeted by the assaulting gunfire. The centre of the column had taken the brunt of it. It was an unholy fucking mess. The other family of five in the SUV behind the first firebombed vehicle 
were now a family of three. The driver, the family's father, had taken a round to the head, killing him instantly. His nine-year-old daughter, sitting directly behind him, was ripped up from bicep to throat by a scattering of buckshot and died on the spot. The rest of the family escaped out of the vehicle, the mother screaming as her now undead baby girl grasped towards them hungrily, her ruined face white-eyed and furious at being unable to reach them while strapped into her seat. The car behind carrying two of the childless couples now only had one pair remaining. The two guys must have been sat in the front together with the two women in the rear. The driver and his wife right behind him were shredded by the bulk of the machine pistol's rake, each taking multiple rounds. The other two people in the car had minor injuries, but alive without the threat of imminent death, and were quickly patched up. The worst of the non-fatal injuries was Finn's daughter. A bullet at one end of the rake had punched through her rear door, thankfully taking some of the sting out of the round, but it still smashed into her little thigh, and her screams, and those of Finn and his panicked wife, still ring in my head. We were lucky not to have more bad injuries or deaths, but nine of our new friends died, and three were injured, including a girl of just six. Once we were sure fire wasn't being returned, and Eli tended the injured, Nate rose like an avenging angel from behind the vehicles and waved me to him, his expression a dark cloud of icy rage. With me, he said curtly. Pistols up. Let's make sure these fuckers are down. I nodded grimly, slinging the rifle behind me, and slipped out the Glock. Nate took the lead and swept the area clean, putting down the dying or the dead for a second time with bullets to the head. There was a vengeful satisfaction in finding the dead man holding a machine pistol. At least that fucker was gone from this life. I recognised a handful of them from that first group when we rescued Eli and company, though their butt-ugly leader wasn't among the dead. Those we found alive were too messed up to question, already on a slippery slope from the mortal coil, so Nate helped them along. Most were already dead from a head wound or reanimating, getting put down for a second time. We did, however, find one on an upper floor winged by Nate or Eli in their suppressing barrage, who wasn't in any immediate danger of death. He'd been clipped in the shoulder, likely a ricochet cracking his collarbone, and as he fell, the little bastard must have banged his head and knocked himself out. When slapped awake, his day got infinitely worse when finding himself divulged of weapons and propped on his arse against the wall beneath the shattered window, with Nate and I sitting on the side of the bed opposite, both our pistols pointing at his face. His injury wasn't life-threatening, just really fucking painful, but he forgot all about that pain when Nate's tombstone voice whispered out, his rage on the cusp of detonation. Who the fuck are you? And what the fuck is your problem? Nate's words hissed through the gaps of his clenched teeth, and the guy, no older than twenty, near shat himself on the spot. I, I'm Steve, he stammered. I was just following orders, man. Mama told us to wait here, said you guys were bad news and we had to deal with you. Mama, I frowned. Your fucking mum sent you out to murder innocents. No, she's not our actual mum, he wheezed. Just the shot caller. Are you a nomad? The guy nodded. Yeah, yeah, a prospect. What? Prospects. Gotta earn the patch. No questions asked. It wasn't... What the fuck are you banging on about, you retarded toss fountain? I cut in, my own anger threatening to boil over. You've got to be fucking kidding me, muttered Nate. I looked at him, waiting for answers. Who the fuck do you think you little tosspots are? You're no hell's angels. You're a bunch of beardless pricks playing it outlaw. Hell's Angels was a name I recognised. Seriously, a biker gang? Are they even a thing round here? 
Small-time wannabes, maybe, thinking they're one-percenter outlaw MCs. The patch is the insignia they wear, their badge of honour. Prospects get told what the fuck to do, when to do it, and no questions asked if they want to be a full member. You know a lot about this. Served with a guy from a real MC family. He had good stories. Nate leaned forward menacingly, keeping the glock back from the wounded man's face, but very much in his eyeline. The threat was precise and clear. Where the fuck do you murderous cunts go home, and how many of you are there? I have never heard Nate drop the sea bomb Ever. His fury was titanic and barely held in check. The dickhead with the messed up shoulder was one wrong word away from a full magazine of 17 rounds being put into his face. They'll kill me if I tell you. The kid tried to force defiance into his voice, but it came out as little more than a wheeze. I nearly shat myself as Nate blasted around through Steve's right knee, destroying it. No word of warning, no flicker of emotion. He just lowered the barrel and squeezed the trigger, then hovered it over the left knee. Believe me, son, there are worse things than just dying. Normally, I'd rage at Nate for something like that. One, because blowing bits off people piece by piece isn't the way I like to do things, as it's messed up as fuck. And two, unexpected gunshots from two feet away indoors are fucking loud and make your goddamn heart freeze. However, Nate was in no mood for my scolding today. I could read the room well enough to see that Nate wanted vengeance for the innocent deaths, and nothing I'd say would dissuade him. I stood up to wave down at the rest of our group that we were fine, then turned back to look at Nate. No matter what it took, no matter how vile or terrible an act he might undertake to get what he wanted, Nate wasn't going to let Steve die until he sang like a scared little bird. And you know what? That fucking scared me. Steve knew it too. Nate's gaze remained fixed on him as the old wolf slowly unsheathed his monstrous knife with his left hand, gun still held in his right, letting the light glint from its polished blade. Pointedly, he tapped the curved tip against the man's uninjured knee. Crying through the agony of his ruined joint and cracked collarbone, his face waxen and eyes streaming with pain and terror, Steve started to sing. Vale College Campus, opposite the high school, he wheezed. There's about 40, most of them prospects. Mama's the old lady of the former club president, but he died. He was banged up the day before everything went to shit. She runs the show now, and there are five full nomads with her. They do what she says, so we do. The fuck are you doing with machine pistols? I don't know, choked Steve. They've got some guns, a couple more of those machine guns, but mostly shotguns and pistols. The guns only get handed out for specific jobs. We have to earn them by bringing back supplies or people using knives and clubs and shit. Ammo count. You can tell when Nate's really pissed because he drops to the barest number of words required to make his point. I don't know, man. Honest. Agonised and pleading, terrified he couldn't give Nate the answer he wanted, Steve's terror was real and convinced Nate he didn't have detailed intel. You bring back people. Somehow, Nate's voice managed to sound more dangerous as it dropped another octave. Steve's face told us both that we wouldn't like the answer he had for us. He's waiting. I urged, gesturing to his unblemished knee. Fuck, man, he wept, crying now with dread. We just do what we're told, right? Nate's hand moved too quick for the eye. The wicked sharp tip of his blade pressed between Steve's legs, eliciting a high shriek from the injured man that was more terror than the pain of his current wounds. One flick of Nate's wrist and he would be a bloody eunuch. Mama says they need people to do the menial work, he squealed, staring in horror at the blade pushing against his scrotum. And the guys need women to keep them happy. 
I took a deep breath. What the fuck is wrong with the world? What the fuck is this constant need for domination and control to make women possessions, to use and abuse as they see fit? Wasn't the fucked up situation at Bancroft's house bad enough? Somehow, this being condoned and managed by a woman made it worse. How many innocents? breathed Nate, pushing the knife deeper into Steve's shrinking sack. Exactly. And where? When they're not working, they're locked up in a couple of classrooms on the top floor of the tallest building, under guard. Maybe fifteen? All women? Steve just shook his head. And Mama, where does the bitch queen live? In the library, main building, right in the middle. Entrances. Only the main college entrance and one side fire exit are used. That comes out near the rear car park, panted Steve, still staring at the shining blade between his legs. It's where they keep all the vehicles, but they're behind a locked gate. Both entrances are guarded at all times, and all other exits are sealed or barricaded on the inside. Guarded inside or out for those two access points. Both. Time to leave, Erin. Nate's instruction was flat and lifeless. He got no argument from me, as I knew what was coming next. For what Steve and his thugs had taken from us, this time I didn't argue with Nate. Within seconds of me stepping clear of the room, another blast from the Glock closed the book on Steve's story. I didn't flinch. The convoy was a mess. Eli managed to stabilize Finn's daughter, but it was vital we got back to the school with urgency where Maria could assist. We couldn't afford to take the dead with us, as survivors had to be crammed into the vehicles still operational. It was a squeeze, but we managed it. Dean took the grim responsibility on himself of putting our reanimated dead to rest, a thoroughly unenviable task. Putting down a family of five burning undead, plus a little girl strapped into her seat, reaching hungrily for her mother and two older brothers as they wept nearby, a task's better suited for hearts far stronger than mine. We limped back to Crenshaw without further incident. Our people were waiting as Eli called ahead with the situation to Maria, and everyone turned out to help however they could. Before disappearing to check on his granddaughter, Doug approached me with a blasted expression. What kind of war have you dragged us into? He challenged. If I'd known there was going to be trouble like this, we'd have stayed where we were. We've lost friends, Erin. Many of them children. My son almost lost his little girl. I visibly winced at every accusation, a stab of guilt accompanying every word. I'm sorry this happened, Doug, but there are bad people out there that we can't control. These ones we've only recently discovered. You'd likely have clashed with them eventually. He shook his head. Within days of meeting you, nine people, all of whom I've worked and survived alongside this past half year, are dead. A third of us, Erin, and my friends. An entire family murdered, one couple dead, another family broken, and our son's baby shot in the leg. We'll talk about this more but I've other priorities right now. I wanted to argue back and fight my corner, but just didn't have the will. Every word of Doug's was like a punch to the guts, because you know what? He wasn't wrong. This all happened yesterday, and I'm writing this first thing in the morning before I go out among the people. Thankfully, Finn's little girl will be okay. But man, the archers are pissed at us. At me. This was not the happy unification of our two communities I'd hoped for. In some ways, I think things were made subconsciously worse for the Willow Park people by the fact that none of our group were killed, so we didn't even share their grief. Isaac took a scratch when a bullet shattered the window on the driver's side of the van, but it was very minor. So, while we came out virtually unscathed, Doug lost a third of his people to a fight he feels they had no part in. Nate's out for bloody vengeance. He's ready to do his one-man army thing and go after these people. 
He probably would have already if it weren't for Dean and Maria calming him down. I've never seen Nate so filled with rage. He's usually the calm strategist, but this has really got under his skin. But we have to be smart about this. Innocents can't get caught in the crossfire again. Dean raised some pointed questions, though. Dealing with all the trauma as we were, it hadn't crossed our minds until we had time to review the ambush. Why the hell were they waiting there for us? And how did they know to be there on that day? Steve said this mama character specifically told them to wait there and that we were bad news. That sounds awfully like Captain Evil's dirty fingers in the mixing bowl to me. That's a slimly travelled route for us since moving to the school from the lodge. We only went by that way as it was the best route to skirt the centre of town for access to the builder's yard area and gas shop and the vicinity of Willow Park. I doubt they've been hanging about there every day for the past two and a half weeks since our brief contact with their group. I can't see them loitering in one small area, in that kind of number, just on the off chance we might pass by. Something feels off. I can't think about this anymore at the minute. I've got to try and patch things with the Willow Park people as I'm public enemy number one right now. I need to see how they're all doing since the attack and at least have the common decency to show my face. Though all I really want to do is curl up with particles and cry for the dead. I know it's going to be a bad day today, Freya. I might not write for a few days. Doing this entry wiped me out. I hate doing sadness and misery. It really takes the wind out of me, leaving me empty and lethargic. Today will be a hard day. December 18th, 2010. Cat out of the bag. Today, Nate dropped the bomb on everyone when defending me from Willow Park, as they've been personally targeting me with all their hostility these last few days. It hasn't been a pleasant experience being the focus of so many pointed fingers, accusations by bereaved family members and friends, and generally blamed for the whole raging shit show. Nate, however, finally reached the end of his rope with it, knowing me well enough that my guilt would leave me taking it on the chin without response. Doug has been especially critical. I knew my youth would come up at some point again. He clearly thinks I wield too much influence in comparison to the older heads around me. We assembled as one large group, and the Willow Park people clustered together, separate from the rest of us with Doug at their head. Accusations started flying again, and I did my best to walk the middle ground, but then Doug snapped out the words that set Nate off. I knew something would go wrong. You're too young, and I don't know why these people think you're so damn special. Because she is, Doug, snapped Nate like a cold bite. It blew through the room like a winter wind, silencing everyone. Nate has a presence, never more so than when demanding attention. If he talks and expects you to listen, you damn well listen. Then Nate went off on a long speech and told the whole community everything. His dream with you, Freya, the stuff about this trinity entrusted with giving humanity a second chance. How I'd been chosen as this flame at the centre of our own minor trio with a small part to play. How Captain Evil, he left out the captain when he said it, had targeted me after Freya's death, trying to break me. The change in undead behaviour. And he dropped in the lunatic cult twenty-odd miles east, able to command the dead at will. Doug. People are going to die, he said at the end. The world is filled with monsters, and not all of those monsters are the dead. It's damn bad luck that your people took this hit, and we're all deeply sorry for it. But your people were dying a slow death at that park, and you fucking know it. You were almost out of ammo, and the groups managing to survive with any real success are those with access to weapons. Even your group would have been up shit creek without your two shotguns. 
He let that nugget of fact settle with them, accompanying it with a pointed stare that Doug couldn't hold, before continuing. You can't fight the hordes with axes and clubs, and that's where you were going to be in weeks, maybe days. Sooner or later, you would have crossed paths with these people, or the resurrectionists, as they start ranging out this way in larger numbers. His tone softened a little then. We're right sorry for what happened and grieve with you. But don't put all the blame on Erin and don't you dare put that blame down to her age. Your people made a choice, Doug, and take a look around. You don't seem to mind the sudden influx of food or clean water or the ability to shower, the medical expertise or the strong borders. This world is a pile of shit right now and shit happens and will carry on happening. That's just a sorry fucking fact of this life. Don't try and put the guilt you feel for taking your people into that ambush onto Erin, because that ain't fair. That last line punched home like an arrow, and Doug's visible reaction confirmed the truth of Nate's words. I don't give the old Marine enough credit for how perceptive he is at times, and he was right on the money with that observation. Doug is racked with his own guilt for taking his people away from what they knew, with his granddaughter getting hurt in the process, never mind the deaths. He wanted somewhere to put that, and I guess I was the easy target. It's that poisonous phrase of, if only, rearing its head again, and Doug must have been beating himself to death with it. Feeling the weight of it too heavily, he decided to lighten the load of that burden by hanging it round my neck instead. The special stuff was pretty hard for everyone to swallow. Nate is the most practical person in our community, I think, so him saying everything had a little more weight than if it spewed out of my mouth. If I'd said a word of it, everyone would likely assume it was me being me and pulling some kind of weird prank on them. Nate, however, possesses a gravitas that makes people listen. I still didn't think anyone believed it, but then Dean spoke above the muted conversations as I just stood there, feeling awkward in the crossfire. Have any of you dreamed of the living since all this began? You could have heard a spider squeak out a fart in the following silence. Everyone frowned, thoughtful, before sharing awkward glances at each other. Dean continued into the quiet. I've only dreamed of people who I know to be dead, or think likely are dead, since June 23rd. I never realised it until Nate spoke of his dream just now. I've no dreams of my dad, dead 15 years, but I know my mum was alive before June 23rd, living in her Manchester flat, and I've dreamed of her. Survival in the cities is unlikely at best, I imagine, and I've come to terms with the fact she's gone. He turned to Sarah. I've also dreamed of John, but not Andrea. Sarah nodded. I've dreamed of Dad too, but not Mum, even though they're both on my mind all the time. Similar stories started emerging through the room. Nobody has dreamed of any living soul and only dreamed of those likely to have fallen since the day all this started. Everyone fell silent as Nate spoke again. Freya said something in my dream that didn't make any sense at the time. He rubbed at his jaw thoughtfully. Trapped in this endless day. That's what she said. He nodded, assuring himself his recall was correct. I didn't register the meaning at the time. Like time has stopped, I murmured. And there was a really creepy moment as every set of eyes turned slowly towards me. Nervous under the silent regard of everyone, I blundered on. Like everything just stopped the day the dead started rising. Maybe that's what Freya meant. As the dead awakened, has everything else paused until these Trinity people do what they have to do? 
Like how we're dead or in purgatory, unable to move on until all this bullshit gets sorted out, or until Team Evil wins out and we're all gone. This is a bit much to swallow, huffed Doug. The dead speaking in dreams, sending messages, a trio of special people tasked with the salvation of all mankind. He threw up his hands and snorted in obvious derision. It's all a bit far-fetched. I don't know if you've noticed, Doug, but the world is currently infested with walking corpses trying to murder us. I softened my sarcastic tone before poking the bear any further. I think our benchmark for what's possible has moved a bit, wouldn't you say? You likely all saw or listened to the news before all media collapsed. This wasn't a virus or terrorist attack, as this didn't start in one place and roll out from ground zero and spread. Hell, I've been covered in zombie goop so many times that if this is a virus, I'd have been infected multiple times over. This started everywhere, all at the same time, as soon as the date ticked to June 23rd. I clicked my fingers. Just like that, every corpse, everywhere in the world, just sat up and started killing, and panic did the rest. Added to that, have you noticed yet that the walking dead don't rot? Their decomposition is frozen until you squish their brain, then the rot comes on like a rocket. Tell me how natural that is. The undead did change for a while after Freya's death, said Alicia, usually quiet in larger gatherings. A wall of undead waited for us in the middle of town and didn't react until Erin spoke. Then when me, Mark and Nate were all trapped by a horde, they largely ignored us but reacted strongly to Erin's voice over the radio. I didn't want to believe any of it myself, but I can't ignore what I've seen. She turned and met my eyes. They were targeting her, that much I believe now. Nothing about any of this is natural, so who are we to say what is or isn't happening? I gave her a nod of gratitude for the support. And let's face it, said Nora, the fact that there might be some people out there able to end all this surely gives us something we've been lacking for a long time. Hope, I finished. Nora gave me that grandmotherly smile of approval and nodded. Hope, she echoed. You're asking everyone to take a lot on faith, said Doug. For we live by faith, not by sight, declared Dean in a clear voice. Are you quoting scripture? Dean nodded. Corinthians, I'm not saying this is God or Satan, and I won't force my own beliefs on anyone. But there is wisdom and comfort to be found in the good book for those who seek it. I'm not saying you need to have faith in a deity you don't believe in, or that may be judging us. All I'm saying is that faith can be placed in those around you. You may be feeling guilty and projecting that onto Erin, but us being divided serves only the enemy seeking to hurt us. He smiled in a conciliatory manner. Don't seek to lay the blame for the recent tragedy at Erin's feet, Doug. Everything she's done since this started is encapsulated by another scripture quote, and she shouldn't be forced to carry the burden of guilt for what just happened. She'll carry enough of it on her own anyway. An accurate observation there, Dino. And what quote is that? asked Doug. Dean turned to look at me. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. He turned back to Doug after giving me a smile and a nod. My wife was saved from captivity by the actions of this young woman. Isaac, Mark, Charlie, Nora and Alicia would still be in the grasp of a madman were it not for the courage and willingness to help from Erin and Nate. And all that courage and willingness came from her, added Nate. She practically annoyed me into doing it. 
that got a few bouts of nervous laughter. We too have suffered loss, Doug, continued Dean, and none of us can promise that the loss and grief will end here. The world is a dark place to be right now. He looked over at me again, pointedly. So, we gather round the light where we find it. I was super uncomfortable under the keen regard of everyone. I think my discomfort may have helped a little, though. Had I been standing there, hands on hips, chin high, with a cape flowing behind me like I was some damn hero, a lot of those words would likely have fallen on deaf ears. They were expectant gazes, though, like they were waiting for something profound to finish it all off, to cement this idea that I was somehow this flame of hope they should all be gathering around. Shit, I'm so not comfortable with this. At all. I have the capacity to burn a fucking salad when making one, so having the faith and hopes of all these people resting on me just freaks me out. I don't want that kind of responsibility. I'll help until there's no breath left in my body. But please, for fuck's sake, don't ask me to lead you. But they wanted to hear, needed to hear something from me. I looked to Dean, Maria and Nate in turn, the three people that mean most to me in the world. All of them nodded, their support total. Then, like a fucking champ, I felt particles at my feet. He'd gone up on two legs, his front paws resting on my shin and his big eyes looking up at me. Somehow, that little puggy expression said to me, you got this. I smiled, picked my little dude up in my arms, and his presence calmed the storm of discomfort whipping about in my heart and head as he settled against me, turning his outraged expression to the crowd and daring them to give me shit. Particles fucking rules. I haven't had a profound dream like Nate has, I said at last. At least, not yet. I can believe he's chosen as one of this supposed trio to protect this little corner of our world. And as much as it makes me uncomfortable thinking I might be chosen too, Nate isn't a man given to whimsy. Fact, agreed Nate, garnering another bout of chuckles. I'm not comfortable with any kind of supernatural responsibility, nor being chosen for anything. All I want is to try and do right by people. A code given to me by Dean and Maria, who took in a messed up, smart-mouthed kid and straightened her out. I wouldn't be who I am without them. Maria's hand slipped into Dean's and gave it a squeeze. I don't pretend to be anyone special, and I never want to be treated like I am. I fart in bed, I get hormonal once a month, I'm a complete arsehole to people when I'm tired and I swear a lot. So much swearing, sighed Nate in a deadpan tone, eliciting more laughter. The old dog is getting funnier by the day. I grinned at him before turning serious again. But I'm human and I will make mistakes and I'll regret every one of them to my dying day. I'm sorry for the people you lost and sorry to those who got hurt too. But like Dean said, it won't be the last time we grieve together. It keeps me awake at night, fearing who we might lose next. And I question every decision I make, every action I seek support for. But everything I do is towards one goal. I sucked in a breath for courage, and Particles turned his head up towards me again, sensing my disquiet. Again, that look said, You got this, human. When the moment comes and I take my last breath, I'd hope to have lived for something I believed in and that I'm proud of all I stood and fought for. Of all the eyes that might judge my life, it's those I see in the mirror I fear disappointing the most and those whose opinions truly matter to me. We have a chance to do things better than before, but nothing good comes without a cost. I can't promise we won't make mistakes, and I can't promise this will be the last time we grieve for those we lose. 
I don't want you to just have faith in me. I want us all to have faith in each other. We're all responsible for how we choose to live our lives. And whatever weird forces might be at play in choosing individuals for biblical level tasks, we all have a say in how we build whatever comes next. I sighed then and spoke directly from the heart. One day, if we're lucky to leave behind anyone to remember us, all any of us will be is a memory. Given the choice, wouldn't you want to be a good one? And know that you made a difference to just one person's life when they needed it the most. A profound silence greeted the end of my little speech, and I thought I'd made a complete fucking mess of the whole thing. When I gathered the courage to look around the room, however, many stared back at me with the shine of moisture in their eyes. The open hostility has since retreated, at least for the moment, and the group parted ways to absorb the bomb Nate dropped on everyone. Hopefully our words got through to them and we can all start moving forward. I'm so tired, Freya, and after all this, I could really do with you dropping in and saying hello in my dreams. I feel like I'm wandering in the dark and entirely reliant on Nate's light to find my way. And still one question remains unanswered. If Nate and I are two of our little torchbearer trio, then who's the third? And when the hell will they make an appearance? I can't hold Nate off any longer now. We've got to put a stop to these nomads before they do any more damage, either to us or to any more innocent survivors. Tomorrow we'll start recon over at the college they reputedly call home. Who is this third person, Freya? I wonder where they are right now. Account of Three Tori watched from the bed as Jacob dressed, her eyes inevitably drawn to the handgun at his hip as the former soldier strapped on his belt. The sight of it was a constant reminder of their new reality, though mundane compared to the unnatural gift bestowed upon Jacob and Oliver by their first disciple. Got a big operation the day after tomorrow, he said absently. I'll be going outside the wire for the first time since the resurrection. I'll be glad to get out and have a change of scenery. Oh, are you getting bored of the scenery? She purred, one long leg slipping out of the blanket as she lay on her side. Jacob smiled, eyes roving up the exposed flesh, then along her bare arm and shoulder, the long length of her hair trailing down her chest like a golden waterfall. She discreetly positioned the blanket just above her breasts, teasing just enough to elicit a laugh and shake of his head. Not this particular picture, no. He leaned over the bed and kissed her. You're the reason to keep coming back. Nice save, she smirked. Laughing, Jacob continued readying himself, perching on the edge of the bed to pull on his boots. There's a big supermarket distribution center to the west, near the town where Tucker disappeared. It's a massive warehouse, so we're going out with a big crew. We expect there'll be a large undead presence there, as the place employed around 2,000 people, all told. Plus, survivors likely chanced their arm over the last half year in the hope of supplies. To save the drain on ammunition and noise, I'm going to ensure the dead behave. There'll be bottled water, dried food, canned goods, cleaning products, hygiene stuff, and plenty of other useful supplies. He pulled a lace tight. There's a lot of mouths to feed here, and the farms are great, but we've depleted our preserved food stores much more than expected. The mouths seem to be getting less, though, she observed, trying to sound nonchalant. Jacob stopped and sighed. Tori, we've talked about this, he said over his shoulder. Some things can't be avoided. There have to be sacrifices so the many can live. It's the way of things now. She nodded and affected a yawn, letting the subject drop. Jacob would not be moved on it, 
But then he was one of the triumvirate, the three men able to command the walking dead to his will. That dark gift bestowed by the first disciple was the greatest of honors in his eyes, returning a purpose and meaning lacking in his life since leaving the army. Have you seen my ankle holster? He asked, eyes moving round the room. I haven't seen it for a few days now. No, she said, pretending another casual yawn. You were quite feisty a few days ago, though, and we were tearing each other's clothes off in a hurry. It might have been kicked under some furniture. Jacob grinned in remembrance. You were particularly hot and heavy that day. Tori shrugged. Sometimes a woman wants what she wants. I'll have a look around for it. He leaned over and kissed her again. What would I do without you? I'm sure you'd find some other starry-eyed woman willing to warm the bed of the first disciple's most trusted follower. You wouldn't want for attention, I'm certain. There's only one woman's attention I need or want, he said, his face close to hers and voice a low gravel. Nice save again, soldier. Jacob grinned, retreating to finish lacing his boots before donning his tactical vest. I'll see you later, he asked. I'll check my calendar and see if I can fit you into my busy schedule. Kissing her one more time, Jacob lifted his rifle from the rack on the wall and left her alone. The moment Jacob departed, Tori shuddered and leapt from the bed, turning on the shower to scrub herself clean. It was a credit to her skills as an actress that Jacob was unaware how revolting his touch was to her. But once alone, her expert facade crumbled. She raked at her skin with the soap and cloth, desperate to wipe every particle of his scent from her body, shivering at the memory of his rough and roving hands, despite the steaming water. The cult's mentality had always fascinated and revolted Tori in equal measure, studying the subject a decade earlier for her thesis in psychology at Oxford. Mere study of the topic, however, was never enough. Driven by a need to expose the madmen and charlatans exploiting the vulnerable for their own twisted design, Tori was never content to simply examine the ashes after the cult fires had burned out. Instead, she used all that knowledge and experience to seek justice for those unwittingly subjugated, transferring her academic studies into the field of investigative journalism. Exposing the foul sects manipulating their vulnerable masses by destroying them from the inside became her life's work. After discovering the Children of the Resurrection just over a year ago, she traced the cult's expansion back to its inception, delving into the history of their prophet, John Maddock, only to discover an unremarkable man somehow making himself a revered voice for the disaffected and outliers at the edge of society. With the massive fortune of Oliver Hargrave backing the growth of his religion, Maddock was catapulted from total anonymity to the leader in a settlement of hundreds. Tory's suspicions regarding Maddox's motivations moved her to infiltrate the cult and gather intelligence from within, going undercover in the Children of the Resurrection four months before the world collapsed around them. Exposing him as the fraud she believed him to be would catapult her career into the stratosphere, with endless book deals and seminars if she cracked this case. It would transform her career into a prize-winning one, Living among the resurrection cult and pulling back the curtain to expose Maddock for the fraud she knew he was? Well, that would be the making of Victoria Cates. More than any desire for recognition, though, she wanted the people he manipulated to really see the man behind the performance. She needed him to feel the consequences of every twisted deceit. There was no doubt Maddock intended to bleed the fortune of the young and impressionable Oliver Hargrave, abandoning the people so expertly fooled once complete control of the Hargrave purse strings was his. 
Maddock was a consummate performer, charismatic and intelligent, but with a history of failed careers and crumbled attempts to make an easy fortune. Nothing of his former life suggested anything akin to spiritual or religious beliefs, or an affinity with any doomsday preparation ethos. He was a classic case of psychopathic narcissism, hell-bent on achieving adoration, control, wealth, and personal comfort. For four months, she quietly gathered intelligence, integrating herself as a loyal and devout follower, making friends among the community, and establishing herself as a popular mid-level leader. She did not rise high enough for major scrutiny by Maddock himself, but enough to give her sufficient access to observe the man in his interactions at intervals. Initially, she considered beguiling the awkward young Oliver Hargrave, as Tory was aware men found her attractive, and what a valuable weapon in her arsenal that could be. However, when she inadvertently stumbled on Oliver in a passionate tryst with another man, that option was removed from the board. Oliver had never been overt about his sexual preference, and Tory could only speculate as to his reasons. Maybe his old money family disapproved. It was impossible to say, and she would never truly know, but in the wake of this discovery, it became glaringly obvious to Tory's keen eye that Oliver was besotted with Maddock beyond the reverence of being their leader. With Hargrave off the board as an option for gathering intelligence, Tory opted to integrate herself among the masses, her goal instead to make herself popular among the people. Tory found them to be largely simple folk, many of them soft-hearted and gullible, or socially awkward individuals chewed up and spat out by life's many trials and tribulations. There were the vehement ones, of course, who ardently believed in, and wished for, the end of society, steering clear of those individuals as she identified them. Their suspicions were easily aroused, even if her manipulations to gather intelligence were subtle. The bulk of the resurrectionists, however, were the lonely, isolated, awkward, or gullible. They just wanted to be part of something. Tory made substantial progress, but then, on the 23rd of June, the world did end. The children of the resurrection now existed as both her rock and hard place, they provided safety and security against the collapse of society, with openly armed men and women, plus clean water, power, medicine, food, and shelter. Yet the day after the end of the world was announced, everything changed. Tori chanted with the rest of the followers to retain her cover, but watching Maddock speak of the Lord of the Dead coming to him in a dream had been chilling a performance to rival any Academy Award-winning actor. Claiming this dark spirit granted him a gift able to shield them from the horrors beyond their walls, his performance ended with the cutting of a dying man's throat as they all bore witness to his dark miracle. Tori had been horrified, even more so as she witnessed the reality of the rising dead for the first time, as the cancer-ridden corpse of George Watts climbed to its feet its eyes painted a sickly, glowing white. Maddox's voice boomed with power, sending a wave of ice rippling through every fiber of her being, the taste and scent of blood coating her senses, and the assembled followers watched in awed horror as the monster obeyed him. Such was the birth of Maddox's dark gift the terrifying ability extended to Oliver Hargrave, rewarded as the architect of their settlement, and Jacob Tyler, the man tasked with leading the armed security of the resurrection and Maddock's own personal militia. The black price of that gift was now all too stark. Initially, the followers reacted with joyful glee, protected thanks to George's sacrifice, a dying man's last gift to his community. But George was only the first. The dark gift was discovered to be finite and demanded regular renewal. 
For the three men to retain their unnatural command of the dead, each were required to offer a sacrifice to the monstrous force that unleashed this terrible darkness upon humanity. Every week, the blood of three living people had to be spilled in tribute for their continued protection. Maddock and his two chosen disciples, each required to cut the throat of a living sacrifice and spill blood with their own hand to retain their chilling power. Desperate people appeared at their gates, begging for shelter, initially welcomed with open arms, only to be later betrayed. Raiding parties ranged out from Ascension, looking for more captive survivors to be offered as sacrifice to this dark force and allow Ascension's people to remain sacrosanct. Maddock persuaded his followers they were the chosen of the resurrection, spared and protected, providing the lives of outsiders were offered in their place. Despite the dread price, at first the followers felt nothing but shameful relief. They were protected, they said. Smaller sacrifices must be made, they said. It was a lesser evil to protect the greater good, they said. In Tory's experience, from a career delving into the darkest corners of humanity, there was rarely anything that could be deemed a lesser evil. No matter how it might be perceived or measured to soothe a troubled soul, evil would always be evil. The people swallowed the stories Maddox spooned with little question. With hearts starved of courage by the world's end, they ingested any lie, even one to themselves. It's necessary, and though tragic, humanity has to survive. There are always casualties in war. Better others than our own. Lies. Wicked lies to justify acts of supreme cowardice. Inevitably, though, the flow of survivors outside the walls became scarce. Locating them became increasingly difficult, and then one day, six weeks earlier, their reserves of captive sinners ran dry with the day of the sacrifice at hand. With no outsiders to lie on their bloody altar, three of their community were found guilty of crimes against their own. They were thieves, declared their illustrious leader stealing from their brothers and sisters, attempting to purloin extra food for themselves at the cost of the community. Such betrayal could not be abided, according to Maddock, for it was a litany of such selfish actions that resulted in humanity's apocalyptic judgment. An example must be made. And the first three of their own people were sacrificed for the triumvirate to retain their power over the dead. Raids outside the wall became more frequent and frantic in the hunt for captives. But the second week arrived with their basement dungeon empty. Three more of their own were found guilty of fabricated crimes. Always the required three. And they paid in blood for Maddock, Hargrave and Tyler to keep their grisly power. Quiet discontent began stirring, though only behind closed doors, fearful the triumvirate would select such malcontents for their next victims. Tori had to find some way to survive and keep herself from becoming a slab of meat on their altar of sacrifice. With Maddock picking and choosing women to warm his bed, and Oliver clearly uninterested in the advances of women, Tori set her sights on Jacob. It took every ounce of her considerable performance skills to seduce him and engage in a passionate physical affair with the former soldier, knowing his hands were stained by the blood of the innocent. She put it all aside, playing the role to perfection despite her revulsion, ensnaring Jacob with all her female wiles and making him desire her, even love her so that he would kill anyone daring to suggest her for the sacrificial altar. With such newfound status, she was protected from the ritual killings and hoped to exert some of her influence to protect the downtrodden. Day by day, the ruse was harder to maintain. On the nights Jacob blooded his hands with a sacrifice, his ardor and passion were more intense, as though the act of renewing his power aroused him, 
and each night with him destroyed another little piece of her soul. The seventh night was the hardest of all, forced to mirror his fervent need, wrapping him in her web of seduction and bringing him to the height of pleasure and passion so he remained ensnared in her web of influence. Afterwards, she was left sickened and solid, as though the blood from his hands seeped into her soul as he poured at her, blotting out any light left within. Her relationship with Jacob began as a matter of simple survival, and in hope she could help the innocent population of Ascension. But her influence was too limited, and Jacob's zeal too strong. Recently, however, another option revealed itself, and now Jacob handed her a potential exit to explore it. There was another group of survivors outside their wall, as Jacob spoke often of them. There are three the first disciple declares a threat, he'd said one night as she lay in his arms after sex, continuing the skin-crawling ruse of affection. And that time draws closer when our triumvirate will overcome theirs. Apparently, the time has to be right, something about the mystic power of three. Either way, they're out there somewhere. The first disciple says if we can sacrifice even one of those three on our altar, we'll never have to make another sacrifice again. The deaths of even one of these people will satisfy the dark spirit, and we can start moving forward. Where are they, do you think? She whispered, forcing her question to sound like casual conversation. About twenty-odd miles west. Tucker and his crew went missing over that way, and the first disciple says the dark spirit told him they died at the hands of those evil ones. Evil ones. It was hard not to pour scorn on Jacob when he said such things. If another group directly opposed Maddock, Tyler and Hargrave, then they weren't the evil ones. They were the hope for them all. With Jacob's revelation regarding the resource operation into the area where Tucker went missing, this might be her only chance to escape and find sanctuary elsewhere. Only security personnel were permitted to venture outside the wall, or those with the exact required skills for a specific task, and even those selected individuals would be heavily escorted. Tori's skills fell into neither category, though she managed to convince Jacob into teaching her basic firearms operation. Naturally, he had no desire for her to join the security force, so she promised to drop the subject, providing he taught her how to defend herself properly. He agreed to the compromise if she let the other request go, and now Tori had the means and ability to protect herself at a basic level. A few days ago, in a night of pretended passion after his sacrificial ritual, she slipped the small revolver in its ankle holster beneath the mattress. When he returned to duty the following morning, Tori carried her contraband back to the small room in a dormitory building she called her own. Acquiring any more ammunition was impossible, so the six rounds would have to do, but it was better than nothing for protecting herself against the undead when she finally made her escape. The notion of being alone in a world of the murderous dead terrified her. But the thought of staying with Jacob and the monstrous living was far more chilling. The sword of Damocles hung ominously over ascension. Without intervention, the blood would continue to flow, and that sword would eventually fall. The dead were puppets of some dark force a fact impossible to deny given all she had witnessed from Maddock, Tyler, and Hargrave. The undead were killers by nature and design, but Maddock and his cronies chose their path, justifying it as some warped vision of a greater good. Power and control were their real truths, elegantly dressed in an illusion of saving humanity. Drying herself off and rubbing her skin red with the towel, Tori dressed and left Jacob's house, praying her time enduring his sickening touch was finally at an end. Later that day, 
The knock at Tori's door almost caused her heart to seize in fright. The urgent rattle came just as she was zipping up a small backpack of supplies. In readiness for her escape, she stuffed food, bottled water, spare batteries, a flashlight, and some articles of clothing into the bag. Quickly placing the ankle holster with the small revolver into the backpack, she stuffed it under her bed. The moment Tori opened the door, Catherine swept into the room in a frenzied state of distress. Almost thirty, she was a homely, dark-haired woman, overlooked and forgettable in the pre-apocalyptic world. Shy, soft-hearted and timid, she still found the strength to escape an abusive relationship with her baby son, Samuel, two years earlier. Since arriving at Ascension, she had fallen in love with Gerald, ten years her senior and a former warehouse manager who was part of the inventory management team at the settlement. Chet's broken his ankle, puffed Catherine by way of greeting, her voice hushed and frantic. Oh no, Tori closed the door. Here, sit down. Is he okay? A pallet slipped and crushed it. Tori, the doctor says they might have to amputate his foot. Tori sat the frazzled woman down, taking a can of fizzy orange from the cupboard and cracking it open. Have a sip of this and take a breath. Catherine accepted the drink and supped from it, her eyes a little wild as she turned her gaze to the taller blonde woman. Tori, Gerald's skills are easily replaced, she said with a quiver. They can easily teach someone else to manage the stores. His recovery time will be a drain on resources, and while he sits idle, I'm terrified. She left the sentence unfinished, but her fear was plain. Gerald might be seen as a burden on the community, and the triumvirate would find a way to select him in the next trio of sacrifices in a couple of days. I was wondering if you could, well, you know. Catherine was afraid of saying it aloud, but the fear for her man pushed her onwards. I was hoping you might be able to speak to Jacob, what with you two being so close. This wasn't the first time someone came with such a plea in the past few weeks. Tori's position gave her great influence with the common people of Ascension and their best hope of salvation. Being so close to one of the triumvirate gave her power in their eyes, able to influence Jacob in steering choices away from their loved ones, and she was warm-hearted and approachable with it. It was an unenviable position, though, because for all the good she might be able to achieve in staving off a sacrifice, ultimately one would still be made. Saving one person only moved the burden of sacrifice to the loved one of another. The only way to stop the madness was an end to the unholy trio empowering themselves with innocent blood. This other trio Maddox sought might be the catalyst for that change. All she had to do was escape and somehow find them. Gerald should be fine, Catherine, she assured. They can't fabricate a crime for an injured man in the infirmary without obvious suspicion, and they're all about making it look like the offending individual could have committed a crime. His injury will actually keep him safe for now, as it goes against their narrative. She took the woman's hand. But I'll do what I can, I promise you. The woman lifted Tori's hand to her lips and kissed it, an act that discomforted the journalist more than she let on. Bless you, Tori said Catherine, almost sobbing. He's so good with Samuel. You know he said, Daddy, for the first time the other day. He was so happy, Jed welled right up. Catherine shook her head, her voice little more than a breath. I can't bear the thought of losing him, Tori. A hollow chasm opened in Tori's heart as she hugged Catherine, reassuring her again to do all she could before closing the door behind the woman, leaving her alone with only despair for company. Knowing she would never have that conversation with Jacob broke Tori's heart. The day after tomorrow, the heavy convoy was heading out to this distribution center. 
Tori already located Jacob during the day, telling him she was unable to see him this evening or tomorrow evening before he went on mission. Her pretense of feeling unwell and coming down with something, and therefore not wanting to chance making him ill before such an important duty, was accepted with a loving smile from Jacob as he complimented her thoughtfulness. The moment they were back from the distribution centre, he would check in on her, he promised. More lies followed about looking forward to his visit while falsely wishing him safety and good luck. Her intention was to hide in one of their trucks the night before they moved out. Escape was her only goal, and the hope of never enduring his revolting touch again. It was the good people trapped here that pained her, like poor Catherine's little family. She might escape, but what of their fate? Many of the people were friends to her now. They weren't all blind zealots, though an unhealthy number of those did reside within Ascension's borders. Most of the people were just the forgotten of society, the timid and the gullible, or those simply lost and looking for some meaning to their lives. They didn't deserve the fate of sacrificial lambs upon a dark altar, just so some pre-apocalypse con artist and his close henchmen could maintain their control over this new world. Within their walls, humanity accelerated its own demise when they should be saving lives and rebuilding the human race. Theirs was a madness of extinction proportions, and something, or someone, had to stop Maddock, Tyler, Hargrave, and all the other zealots blindly supporting them, or the good folk just wanting peaceful lives would be the ones to inevitably suffer. It was mid-January, and Jacob alluded to some wild plan of Maddock's involving the mystical number of three. All Tory's instincts screamed the third day of the third month, only six or seven weeks away now. Escape was her only option, as her plan really was for the greater good. At least, that was what she told herself. Tori opened her eyes, breath catching as her gaze danced over the water. She instantly recognized the location, and the familiar sight eased her initial shock. Sat on the porch steps of a large log cabin, halfway up a hill overlooking the sparkling expanse of Lake Windermere, Tori released a contented sigh as the bright summer sun illuminated the shining water, while lazy white clouds drifted through a sapphire sky. Tree-scattered hills of emerald green encompassed the vast body of water, tiny white buildings dotting one border of the lake below to her left, marking the picturesque town of Bowness on Windermere, home to around 2,000 people. Many summers were spent here as a child, and she adored the Cumbrian Lake District. Being city-born and surrounded by urban sprawl, the vast swathes of green countryside and sparkling lakes were like being transported to a fantasy world as a child. Fields and woodlands were there to be explored. Wildlife never seen in the shadow of London's towering grey spires teemed all around, and crisp country air breathed deep, free of the city's choking smog. Her father was a cardiovascular surgeon at a top private hospital in London, but her mother always brought Tori and her younger brother to the Lake District for three weeks of the summer holidays, visiting Tori's auntie in the little Windermere town. She and her brother played for hours in the countryside with their two cousins, and she was never happier as a child than when staying in the large cabin overlooking the lake. Her father would steal away to join them for one of those three weeks, and they would wander the countryside on hikes of exploration, swim in the lake, or take a boat out onto the waters. It was magical. This is beautiful. Tori started at the soft voice behind her and turned. On the bench beneath the cabin's kitchen window sat a young woman of astounding beauty, almost angelic in appearance. Her hair was as black as midnight, but shimmered like dark silk as the sun's rays kissed it, eyes deep brown like a doe's hide. Draped in a simple white dress suffused with light, 
Her small feet remained bare on the polished wood of the porch. Tori estimated her somewhere in her twenties, but such was her presence she appeared somehow... ageless. Who are you? asked Tori. The woman was unknown to her, and she wondered why this vision had been conjured to her lucid dream. My name is Freya, answered the vision, her voice light and musical. Tori felt no unease at the woman's presence. In fact, she felt just the opposite. Freya's presence was as serene and calming as the spectacular vista of the lake beneath summer's blazing eye. Do I know you? Have I ever known you? Freya shook her head slightly. No, Tori, we've never met before this moment. But now is the right time for us to talk. The right time? Tori frowned her confusion at the beauty on the porch. What does that mean? Tomorrow night, you're planning to escape the place called Ascension. So this was the last time you'd sleep before then. This was the only time we could talk safely. When you sleep in the bed of that man, you're unreachable, as though shrouded in darkness. It's uncomfortable to pierce, and too great a risk, in the event we played our hand too early and brought you to the attention of the dark. Tori shivered at the last words. The dark. The name slithered through her senses, coiling around her spine and chilling her bones. It sounded aptly bleak. I don't understand. Freya turned her gaze from the scenery for the first time, and Tori felt tears well at the corner of her eyes. In Freya's eyes, she discovered pride, regret, and boundless compassion all perfectly entwined within a single glance. You've been so strong, Tori, enduring what you have, said Freya, her voice like the touch of silk upon the skin. And you've come to see the truth about many of those people at Ascension. They're not evil or dangerous zealots. They are lost lambs in the field of life, unable to find their place out in the cruel wild and need someone to help guide them. Maddock prayed on that, just as the dark prayed on him, appealing to the shadows already lurking within his selfish heart. He's a coward and betrayer, and only a true believer now because the dark appealed to that part of him craving satisfaction. Power, importance, adoration. These transient things that have no true meaning no true worth in the spectrum of human existence. Who are you? whispered Tori. Someone simply playing their part in her own small way. A part of what? Freya smiled, which only served to enhance her unearthly beauty. You've seen enough now, Tori. You know there are forces greater than our understanding, and our very existence is judged across this world for allowing its ruination. A great war rages for a chance at redemption. One final throw of the dice for salvation or our ultimate destruction. Thousands of battles are fought across our darkened world, and while some will be victorious, so many will be lost as humanity embraces the darkest aspects our kind is cursed with. Is there any hope? Freya's lips quirked in another smile. Despite the many defeats in this desperate battle for survival, still we fight, though greatly outnumbered, and our hearts heavy with loss. There are those who still hold the torch of hope aloft for us, holding it high in this darkness so others can find their way through the night. We desperately need one of those torchbearers now, Freya, sighed Tori. 
Ascension crumbles under the weight of that darkness, its foundations slowly decaying with Maddox's madness. And they exist, Tori, which is why I'm here, to reassure you. Tori's heart soared in hope that her promise to Catherine, to all those desperate for salvation, might be kept. Please, she begged, tell me. You're on the right path, Tori. Your plan for escape will bring you close to them. I'm here to reassure your faith in the path you have chosen is true. What are their names? How will I know them? Freya laughed then, a melody of such lightness and life that the colours of the vista surrounding them appeared more vivid, the air crisper and the sun a little brighter. A symphony of birdsong exploded somewhere in the distance. You'll know the flame, my dear Tori, because she's the brightest, most colourful light shining in the night. There was genuine love and affection in Freya's description, and the merest hint of a life once lived. Her shield is her shadow, an old warrior without peer, with a heart as great as his ability for war. And he loves the flame as if she was his own daughter. All weight from Tori's heart lightened at Freya's depiction of the pair, expressing such deep, heartfelt affection for these two people, and so far from the chilling zealotry of Maddock and his cronies, it shined a light into the darkness of her misery. And what of the third? It's three, isn't it? Because Maddock fears three people. Freya's gaze fixed to her. Why, Tori, that third is you. You are the faith to their flame and shield. You're the third of our torchbearers. Tori blinked for a moment, one hand sweeping through her blonde hair as she gathered her wits. I, that doesn't, I mean, what? She shook her head. That can't be right, Freya, coughed Tori in a half laugh of utter disbelief. Faith, I have no faith. I've never believed in any higher power until I saw the evidence of it when Maddock commanded poor George's corpse, moments after murdering him. Faith isn't confined to deities, Tori. The most powerful faith of all is that we have in ourselves and others. Faith in something, even if that's as simple as a different way of life. Those people in ascension, innocent in this war of ours, place their faith in you, Tori. Seeing her bemused expression, Freya continued. When the knives are being sharpened, they come to you, knowing you will listen, and knowing you'll do all you can to help their loved ones with the influence gained through acts of incredible self-sacrifice. You've seen the evil of Maddox's choices firsthand, and how they've been embraced by those closest to him. You placed your faith in those opposed to them, in the hope that your new friends can be liberated from the chains of fear binding them. Freya tilted her head a little as she regarded Tori. Your plan to escape wasn't just for you, Tori. Your plan, since hearing of the enemies that Maddock despises and fears because of the Dark's manipulation, has been to escape in the hope of finding people who can help them. You're putting yourself at risk, and all your faith, in people you don't know, to help those who need it, because you believe they will. Because you have to believe it. Tori absorbed Freya's words in silence, mind reeling and unable to form a coherent response. She opened her mouth to say something many times before words failed her again. You didn't go into the field of investigative journalism for glory, said Freya softly. You did it to expose the evil of others, 
to shine a light in the darker places where many refuse to look because it doesn't touch their lives. Freya grinned then in remembered amusement. The woman you seek, my friend, said to me once that those who say out of sight, out of mind, obviously never experienced a massive spider disappearing in their bedroom at night. Tori laughed, the joke breaking through some of her tension. She sounds wise, in an unconventional way. She is, Tori, more than you know. Heart of a lioness, a mouth as foul as a drunken sailor, and I miss her terribly. There's a reason she was selected as our flame, and that reason is because of that heart of hers I so adore. She's flawed and rough around the edges, but if there's one thing she won't do, it's go quietly into the night and let the darkness win. She really is a rough diamond. Then I guess I should go find this flame. Freya nodded, gracing her with another radiant smile, though tinged with sadness. This won't be easy, Tori. But with all you've endured so far, I have faith that you will find her, and our torchbearers will finally unite. Now, get some rest, Tori, for your fight is almost upon you. Before I go, do you appear in dreams like this to the others? Will they think me mad if I meet them and tell them I was sent to them by a woman called Freya in a dream? Freya laughed richly again. No. The shield and I have already spoken, and the flame isn't ready to see me yet. But she's always believed something greater is at play. She burns bright and hot, and with that potty mouth of hers, you'll know her when you meet her, have no doubt. Freya beamed her smile of light and life one last time. You just need to have faith, Tori. Tori winced as the truck jolted over a pothole in the road, jarring her beneath the piled tarpaulins in the rear. Her bones were cold after concealing herself in the box truck two hours before sunrise. The multiple layers of thick clothing, large puffer coat, gloves and woolen hat pulled down over her ears might stop her freezing to death, but the two hours before dawn were long and uncomfortable. Sneaking into the back of the unguarded truck with a thick blanket to wrap around her while she waited, Tori hid under the pile of coverings in the far corner of the truck, praying the militia would not examine too closely before setting off. Faith, the dream woman said. Have faith the path you have chosen is the right one. As the convoy assembled a little after sunrise, her heart thundered as activity intensified outside. Her breath froze as the box truck's rear doors rattled open and the easy banter of the men echoed in the space as they joked through their final checks. Within seconds, the truck door slammed shut, breath exploding from her lungs in relief. Within the hour, the diesel engine rumbled into life, and Tori was on her way out of ascension. Five box trucks, two Humvees, and two pickups made up the convoy, transporting a total excursion of 32. Eight sets of hands designated to do the bulk of the heavy lifting, all with forklift or warehousing experience, and the presence of 24 militia meant around a quarter of the settlement's armed force was off-site, emphasizing its importance to Ascension's agenda. With Jacob's presence, the undead were unlikely to be an issue, but the possibility of clashing with other survivors ensured Jacob brought his best, and most blindly loyal, troops on the mission. The journey was slow and jolting, but when she felt them turn and the brakes gradually applied, she looked at the watch on her wrist. 8.45 a.m. As they came to a halt, Jacob's familiar voice boomed out his commands, muffled by the thick wool of her hat and the coverings concealing her. His thundering tone brought the unnatural taste of blood to her mouth, 
signifying vocal commands for the dead to step aside. She shivered again, though this time not from the cold. The commands resounded for the next 15 minutes, over and over again, suggesting a massive number of the white-eyed walking dead. Like a shepherd of the damned whistling at his undead flock, Jacob moved them into position, pulling them from within the giant warehouse so the laborers could work without danger. Tori dared not move until the demonic creatures were shackled into position. Jacob wouldn't send them away, preferring their presence to remain long after they departed for home. An undead horde were perfect sentries for the warehouse with the resurrectionists absent, protecting the valuable supplies within so they could return at a later date for further resupply. Only when the men relaxed and the work began in earnest would she dare to make her break for freedom. Another half hour passed before Jacob was satisfied the warehouse had been whistled clear of the dead, and she froze in breathless panic as the truck's engine hummed into life again. Familiar beeps sounded as all five of the box trucks reversed to open loading doors in readiness for their cargo, and she breathed a quiet sigh of relief. The doors at the truck's rear swung open and were pinned to the sides as she waited in hidden terror, expecting someone to sweep the coverings from her at any moment and discover her treachery. Instead, the men simply got to work. After 15 minutes, enough time for everyone to settle into a working rhythm, Tori dared to take her first look outside through a small gap in the coverings. The truck's rear was backed up to a loading bay, with distant movement down the long aisles of the gargantuan warehouse. Mercifully, the coast appeared clear, as many of the armed men were inside the building escorting the workers, in the event any undead stragglers had been missed. Knowing she had little time once she started moving, Tori shifted the covers and stood, lightly stepping down the length of the truck towards the open door, careful not to shake the vehicle or have her heavy footsteps overheard by a nearby sentry. She peered out of the truck's rear to ensure the coast was clear and dropped to the concrete, quickly shifting to her belly, crawling beneath the high wheelbase truck to assess her next step. She couldn't see much to her left, except the line of trucks on consecutive bays, and the boots of some of the militia as they took a smoke break between the vehicles. Switching her gaze to the right, she clamped one gloved hand over her mouth to prevent crying out. Around sixty feet away stood a dense legion of the dead packed into a tight mass, their feet planted as though shackled to the spot. Their upper bodies and heads, however, still moved and swayed like stalks of undulating reeds in a breeze, a rippling animation of the dead as it flowed from left to right and back again. Sightless eyes stared in their listless, vacant manner as the living labored, their bloody and ruined forms a grim tapestry of the varied and violent manner of their deaths. From the ground, it was too difficult to make an accurate estimate, but at a conservative guess, Tori thought there must be more than five hundred of the creatures packed into the dense mass just standing there, swaying, waiting. Tori shivered, and the cold of the concrete started seeping through her layers. Whether her shiver was a product of the frigid ground or the sight of the rippling wave of waiting undead, she could not say. Whatever chilled her, Remaining immobile was not an option, as this was her best window of opportunity. The moment the militia and workers identified all the key items to carry home to Ascension, the trucks would become a hive of activity as the loading ensued. For the moment, they were still mapping the inside of the warehouse, trying to locate and identify all the crates and pallets in readiness for loading. In an ideal world, Tori would aim for one of the pickups or the Humvees and make her exit in a vehicle. The moment an engine fired into life, though, it would attract the attention of the armed men, and they could simply choose the safe option of lighting her up with their weapons, thinking her some random thief of opportunity. No. The sensible option 
was to break in a straight line across the open concrete and scramble up the steep grass bank connecting to the main road passing the warehouse. She could cross the carriageway and head for any nearby housing estates, losing any pursuers in a maze of small streets and gardens. She was certain they wouldn't pursue one lone stranger for any time if it put their mission at risk. Ahead of her, one of the pickups was parked at a right angle to the trucks. A quick break across the open space, hide behind the vehicle's tail, then a second sprint would see her clambering up the steep bank to freedom. Having maintained a strict physical fitness regime since the fall of the world for just such an occasion, Tori was swift on her feet and able to run for miles. She just needed to make it to the road at the top of the bank and she would be away. Anyone chasing her in a vehicle would have to leave via the main vehicle entrance and loop around the access road before joining the main carriageway. By that time, she could be across the roads, into the cover of residential estates, and the chase would be over before it began. Rolling from under the truck, she stood and edged to the rear, daring to peer round towards the entrance, almost swearing aloud when she saw a second mass of undead equal to the first. This group also faced inwards, and two walls of silent, rippling undead sandwiched the living operation, staring vacantly into space under Jacob's dark spell. Blessedly, no militia waited in that open space. Sucking in three quick breaths for courage, Tori kept low and quiet, horrendously exposed to the undead regard as she moved swiftly across the open space, not even daring to exhale at any volume as she reached the rear of the pickup. She shuddered in revulsion while crossing the open ground. In the periphery of her vision, hundreds of blank stares watched her fearful rush across the concrete, undead heads turning to follow her in a swaying mass as they silently observed her hurried progress. The bank was only twenty feet away, and she took another calming inhale before moving again. She was halfway to the bank when a command whipped across her senses. Freeze! The voice was close, too close. Hands in the air, turn around, nice and slow. Tori's heart collapsed in recognition, turning to obey his command. Jacob registered surprise as she faced him, never expecting the heavily clothed and backpack-wearing stranger to be the woman he loved. As far as he was concerned, Tori was ill in bed and waiting for him back home. Tori? His voice softened upon seeing her, the barrel of his handgun lowering for a brief moment as he processed her presence. But any sliver of hope died instantly. Realization darkened his expression as Jacob's jaw set, brow furrowed, and the gun rose with purpose once more, pointing directly at her chest. You lied to me, he hissed. All these months. And what? You were planning on fucking leaving all that time. Just waiting for this chance. There was no point denying anything. Dressed in heavy winter clothing, a stuffed backpack strapped to her body, accompanied by her attempt at stealth, all combined to damn her even as she cursed her ill fortune. She hadn't seen him, standing behind the front wheel as he was, maybe kneeling out of view while checking his bootlaces or something to that effect. It didn't matter now. She hadn't seen him and tried to run by him in full view. There was no way of reaching for the stolen revolver concealed at her ankle without Jacob emptying the whole magazine of his pistol into her. It was over. Jacob! People are being sacrificed, she sighed in resignation. How long before I'm next? I'd never let that happen to you. His tone was firm. You should know that. You say that, Jacob, but what if the first disciple orders you? What if he takes a dislike to me? Sure, I'm good with people and have plenty of friends and a decent organizer, but I'm not crucial, am I? I'm no soldier, or mechanic, nurse, farmer, or any other skill that's necessary for Ascension's survival. She shrugged, 
hands still aloft. I'll be under the knife before all of them, and there aren't any more captives in the pit waiting to be sacrificed, so now we're killing our own. If this is what it costs to be a part of this community, I can't face it. I live in constant fear, Jacob. We all do. The soldier relaxed again, though his gun remained ready. There was less menace to his stance, but he wasn't about to let her leave. Get in the car, he said, his tone softening. We'll talk about this when we get back. No. Jacob blinked at her blunt refusal. No, he repeated, hardly believing her answer. There isn't any choice here, Tory. There's always a choice, Jacob. I could go back, but I won't. That means you have a choice to make. Either shoot me now as I walk away, or don't. Either way, Jacob, I'm not coming back. He looked at her disbelieving, as though her words were somehow the ravings of a lunatic. Tory, we have safety and security. The power of the sacrifice keeps us all protected. Look around you. He gestured to the motionless walls of swaying undead. Look at what the power grants us the ability to do. We're not menaced by the dead. We're their masters. Tory's expression mirrored Jacob's disbelief, but for entirely different reasons. Shaking her head and struggling with his lack of understanding, Tory sighed. Jacob could not, would not, see it, blinded as he was in the belief of his own power. Jacob, ascension has become like any other corrupt state. She kept her tone soft and unthreatening. We, the many, suffer for the comfort of you, the privileged few. How is that any different from the world we lost? Even beyond our own people, charged with fabricating crimes to assuage your guilt over the murders, how many human lives have we sacrificed for this so-called greater good? People we could have welcomed, people we could have saved. We have resources, skilled people, a wonderful location. And yet in a world overrun with the walking dead, we add more to their dread legion every week. Do the sums, Jacob. Sooner or later, you'll have to give up that gift, and fighting the dead will be our only remaining option. Yet three of you swell those numbers weekly by cutting the throats of people we could have saved. She implored him to see reason with every fibre of her being. Sooner or later, there'll be nobody left to sacrifice. Then that gift will fail, and you'll have a thousand enemies to face, waiting at your gate. She heaved a regretful shrug. And you'll be left alone to face them. For a moment, Tory thought his armor was pierced. But that moment vanished as his features clouded with bleak and furious madness. The zealot rose from its brief slumber and awakened with black intent. There's a third choice, Tory, he hissed malevolently, moving forward. I'd take you back by force, and I'd cut your lying throat myself. Burned by the acid of his tone, Jacob closed the distance before she could react, pressing the barrel of his pistol beneath her chin. Her teeth clattered painfully together as he applied upwards pressure. Before that happens, maybe I'll have you one last time, eh? Eyes glittering with dark purpose, voice sibilant with foul amusement, something truly dark awakened in Jacob, a jarring shift as though the man was replaced by a malicious spirit. Don't worry, this time you won't have to pretend to like it, he sneered. The change in him was stark, terrifying, and for a moment Tori couldn't think as his free hand wrangled her towards the pickup, barrel still painfully beneath her jaw. Flinging open the passenger door, he shoved her into the cab. You can fight if you want, 
he mocked. In fact, I'd rather you did. There was such evil in his tone, a malice never exhibited even when performing the sacrifice, as though a long caged darkness had finally cracked the lock on its prison. It hissed into wicked life before her, a lustful and violent gleam in his eyes as he sheathed the pistol at his hip. Trapped, unable to escape, Tori's breath came in short gasps as Jacob fumbled at his belt. Don't worry about your jeans, he smirked. I'll just cut them off with my knife in a minute, then... His sentence remained unfinished as Tori snatched the small revolver from the ankle holster, pulled it free, and fired without hesitation. In the tiny confines of the pickup's cab, the gunshot was like the detonation of a bomb, leaving her ears with a painful whine. Jacob collapsed, hands clawing at his ruined throat. To avoid his tactical vest, Tori aimed for his head, but fired too early in her panic to be free, and the 38 round smashed through his larynx. Horrified by the look in Jacob's wide, disbelieving gaze, her eyes fixed to the hot blood gushing between his fingers, vainly trying to stem the torrent. Dim shouts pushed at the wine in her ears from somewhere behind, and as she scrambled from the truck, Jacob collapsed to the concrete and lay still. No more gurgling or choking sounds escaped, and Tori had only a heartbeat to process she had just killed a man before chaos erupted. The moment Jacob slipped from life, his dark enchantment of the undead died with him. Demonic life ignited in the thousand motionless monsters, cries of alarm from the living lost amid the rattling thunder of gunfire as the jaws of the undead vice closed. The two monstrous walls shielding the operation were now the fanged maw of the undead beast, closing on both flanks towards the open loading bay doors. The things moved with relentless purpose, faster than she expected, as they swarmed towards the booming weapons and panicked cries of the trapped militia and workers. The dam had broken. They were no longer shackled, and the torrent of undead gushed towards those still within the warehouse, closing the distance with a speed and murderous resolve that threatened to stop the beat of Tori's heart. Staring in mute horror, her breath coming in short gasps, Tori's mind fixed to the inevitable fate the innocent workers would suffer, trapped with no escape from the dark army advancing towards them. No matter how good a shot those soldiers were, there were simply too many of the undead swarming towards them, and too quickly. They would be pushed back into the warehouse, forced to close the loading doors, their only hope of escape out of a fire exit on foot. Their vehicles were lost to them, now a scatter of metal islands surrounded by the creeping tide of dead. The fog clouding her mind vanished as the corpse at her feet twitched violently, struck by dark lightning that snapped Jacob's eyes open, his head leering round to locate Tori with lips drawn back in a noiseless snarl. Blood that choked him only seconds earlier painted his bared teeth crimson, fingers hooking to malevolent claws as they reached up for her. Gasping, Wheezing, too frightened to possess any presence of mind to fire again, Tori retreated from Jacob's ravenous grasp and fled. With the small revolver still in hand, she crossed to the steep grass bank and began a frantic scrabble to the top. As she reached the summit and clambered to her feet, Tori turned to survey the massive concrete yard below, where the undead massed at the loading bays. Panicked by the sudden change and unexpected speed of the monstrous assault, none of the Ascension militia thought to close the loading doors, reacting instead with visceral fear, futilely trying to kill as many of the creatures as they could from unfavorable ground. Inexorably, inevitably, they were pushed back into the distribution center, and unless they found their way to another exit, the relentless, hungry sea of dead would be their end. Looking down at the corpse of Jacob, she found him standing, merely observing her. No mindless attempts at ascending the steep bank, no sign of immediate pursuit, expression as blank as a mannequin. Jacob's corpse stood motionless, 
head tilted slightly to one side in near thoughtful regard. One clenched fist slowly lifted above his head. Tori gaped in wide-eyed shock, throat raw as though swallowing shards of glass, as Jacob's dead fingers flicked out from his raised fist in a count. One, two, three. Fucking hell, she quivered into the cold air. Jacob's corpse remained unmoving as the rest of the undead swarmed the ascension party, staring up at her, utterly disinterested by the cacophony of gunfire and terror behind it. Uncertain because of the distance, just for a moment, Tori swore the corpse's mouth split into a grim, knowing smile, wanting nothing more than to be free of Jacob, either living or dead. Tori turned on her heel and set off as fast as her legs would carry her, as a storm of screaming and gunfire echoed in her wake. December 20th, 2010. Nomad HQ. Nate and I spent some time watching Nomad HQ for a couple of days. Songbird Steve's scared as shit intel was good. Both of us needed to feel like we were doing something to combat the murderous bastards. Despite Nate being ready to unleash his Samuel L. Jackson-style great vengeance and furious anger for their devastation on our new Willow Park friends, he still got the good sense to do it smart. We need all the intelligence we can gather before opening a six-pack of fuck you up on them. We also needed a little time away from campus to let everyone digest the special locky bombshell Nate dropped. They might be more comfortable discussing it between them while Nate and I aren't around, and it means I don't have to think about it either. For the last couple of days, it's just been recon for me and Nate, staying out for two days and one very fucking cold night. And I'm writing this now we're home to run over what we observed. Vail College is a sixth form college for students aged 16 to 18 and directly opposite a high school of the same name. It's a relatively large site and sits on a main thoroughfare through one part of town, so we cleared out a house on the road opposite and observed as best we could from that vantage point. We've never had to drive past this way before, as it's a different route to the centre of town that we've never bothered with, as it was always out of our way. Plus, we expected the roads to be cluttered as fuck with wreckage. I've seen myself how much of a clusterfuck school areas got on the day the world soiled itself. The nomad's presence in that immediate area shows evidence of work in clearing a path through said wreckage and putting down the undead, but they haven't done much in the way of corpse removal. We tried a few houses until we found one that didn't stink like the devil's toilet the morning after spicy curry night. Some of them were just awful, with brained corpses left to fester where they'd fallen, so it took a few attempts to find a vantage that wasn't tainted by rotting cadavers and already cleared of resources by the nomads to ensure they wouldn't return. From the upper floor window of the house we selected, we gained a good view of the vehicle entrance. We agreed it was likely the entrance they used more frequently, with a closable gate to keep out any wanderers, making it the most secure. Despite them supposedly being a motorcycle gang, even a small-time one, there was no evidence of fancy Harleys, only a handful of dirt bikes, pickups and vans. Diesel is obviously the way to go, and dirt bikes are more agile than big, sweeping Harleys for getting round fucked-up roads littered with traffic accidents, so petrol usage is confined to those noisy little wheeled hair dryers. The house also gave us a view of the three-floor building where Steve claimed the prisoners were locked up, and evidence of their presence was confirmed in some of the top-floor windows. They seemed to be split across the four classrooms facing our way, and through the scope, Nate observed what I dreaded. The far room on the left has around six women, he said quietly. All of them look to be in their twenties. Excluding present company, your gender can be real fucking bastards, Nate. Nate just nodded. 
his eyes still scanning the area through the scope. No arguments here, kid. Seen it too many times in my life than I care to say. Some of the women who survive those ordeals, like Katie in Sierra Leone, are probably the strongest people I've ever known. He pulled his head away to look at me. And Alicia. Why do I feel like you're about to waggle your finger at me? Don't think I haven't noticed your eye rolls when she backs my words or calls me sir. You need to lay off it. It's a bit weird though, Nate, I said, getting a little defensive. Come on, even you must feel uncomfortable by it. He just shook his head. Not at all. She's handling what she went through in a healthy way, Erin. She's turned her focus to something positive, and whatever she needs to keep those demons at bay, we should be supporting, not mocking. To be blunt, you're being a bit of a dick about it at times. Well, shit, Nate, I huffed. Don't mince your words. Tell me how you really feel. I won't lie. I felt a little attacked at the time. But honestly, I think it's because I knew he was right. I look back on the journal entries where I've taken the piss at her being teacher's pet and now wince at what I wrote. I'll leave the entries there as that's what I was feeling at the time, so my contrition here has the right context. We all have to keep on growing because none of us are perfect and I'm certainly not. I do feel a bit of a shithead now because of it, though. We've no idea what she's battling in her head at night, Erin. Alicia is still here, a strong and valuable member of our community, turning into a damn good shooter and top-tier security for us to boot. She's dealing with that trauma and noise by focusing her demons into protecting others. Laura ain't here because that noise got too loud. He looked at me squarely then, his voice grave. Broken things don't get healed by time alone, but by intention and positive action. Laura losing her battle meant we ended up losing Freya by proxy, don't forget. What we think might be trivial actions could have catastrophic consequences. Well, that fucking told me, eh? He sighed then, softening his cautionary tone. Just... Wind it back, okay? We don't want her feeling like what she does is trivialised, because it's the one thing keeping her sane and on point while those wounds scar over. Suitably chastised, I shut my smart mouth and just agreed. All his points were fair, and truth be told, I have been a bit of a dick about it. But it stops here. Positive reinforcement only for her now. Shit. I feel so guilty about it. She's survived horrors I can't even begin to imagine. And here I am, taking the piss because in Nate, she's found a man she looks up to and trusts with absolute certainty. Which, after her ordeal, is no small thing. I shouldn't be wailing on her for that with my stupid sense of humour. Nate moved on after that, not dwelling on it once he'd said his piece and satisfied his warnings had been heard. We never saw this mama character in our observation time, but I did see the twat I unlovingly refer to as Fugly, the guy who thrust his crotch towards me and shot me with his finger gun when we sent them packing from Eli and company. He was in a thick jacket and must have earned his patch as he was wearing the sleeveless black leather vest with the white nomad insignia on the back over his coat. Honestly, it looks stupid, because the winter jacket was thick, ballooning out where the vest was pulled over at the sleeves, so it looked partially inflated with air. abso fucking lutely ridiculous Strutting round like the king of the world, though, he was obviously loving his new improved status as he lorded it over the lesser prospects. I pointed him out to Nate, and he had a look-see through the scope. Christ, you weren't kidding, he murmured. He's so ugly, I don't even think the fucking tide would take him out. I sniggered at that because it really hit my funny bone. Nate's got a wicked dry sense of humour at times. He doesn't let loose often, but when he does, it's usually gold. 
Clearly the status to fall nomad brings a step up in arms as well, he observed. There's a semi-automatic pistol at his hip. Looks like a CZ-75. Decent nine mil weapon, and surprising to see one in this country. Glock 17 is the common sidearm for British military and law enforcement. CZ would have to be imported illegally, originating from the Czech Republic and used a lot by their military and police. Honestly, you're such a fucking nerd, Nate. A good craftsman knows his tools, he quipped back. Doesn't change the fact they seem to have firearms beyond small revolvers and low-capacity shotguns. Probably not many, seeing as it's just those with the patch that have the upgrades. But if they've a couple more of those cheap Tech 9 junk copies they hit our convoy with, it means they've had a pipeline in the past to better illegal arms. Most of their sentries walking the grounds are armed only with melee weapons. That we can see, said Nate. Maybe they've got a little junk revolver stuffed in the back of their belt in case walkers get too close in number. Either way, junk guns or not, assume every hostile met in there is armed with lead. Are we really going to assault this place? I asked. It's pretty big, and clearing that would be a nightmare. It's not like you have a spec ops team at your disposal. There's me, you, Dean is highly trained, Alicia is on point now and have no fears on her part, and Eli has had all the same basic infantry training for room clearance. That's a five-count fire team properly drilled in room and building clearance. There's about 40 of them. Strung out all over the place, with no proper training, communication or cohesion. They're thugs, Erin. I'm not worried about any assault, because if we move smart and tight, we'll mow through their thug ranks. What I am worried about is safely securing the hostages. The minute we start firing, the nomads will be alerted and will either reinforce the top of those stairs and rain lead down on us if we try to force our way up, or worse, they'll pull those people out as human shields. I stared back through my small binoculars, scanning the layout of the college buildings. What if I could get inside one of those top classrooms and hit the bell ends up the arse before you assault? Nate looked up from his scope. Come again? I'll have to scout it from some other angles, because I can't see a solid metal pipe bolted to the brick from here that'll take my weight, only that plastic shit and they can't be trusted. I lowered the binoculars and glanced his way. Schools and colleges are playgrounds for tracers, Nate. There are buildings of all differing heights and levels, and if I can get a good look around at different angles and figure out a route to the top of that building, those windows are big enough for me to swing in if someone inside opens one for me. Nate returned his gaze to the top floor again, confirming what I'd already seen. The three-floor building was older, with newer extensions bolted on at the rear as the campus expanded over time. That original building, however, contained good-sized windows that could open wide and easily let a Duchess of Hazard, like me, climb down from the roof and swing in. Those windows being open for airflow were no danger to the captives escaping, as it was a sheer drop and most of the building's face was glass. There was zero way of free climbing up or down it without falling. The overhang at the top meant someone would have to lean away from the window to reach up and grab it, releasing their foothold to hang all their weight on their fingertips before pulling themselves up. Unless you've got the skills and the right developed muscles to do that, it's pretty much setting you up for a bad case of concrete poisoning after a long fall. For your average Joe, there was no escape from those rooms. For someone with years of parkour and urban climbing, however, coming down off that roof and into an opened window should be relatively simple, if done with care. You'd be on your own up there, though, Nate said thoughtfully. At least until the four of us could get to you. We've no idea how many guards are up on that floor in the corridor, and there are multiple classrooms with hostages. I'll go in the end one with the women being used for... Well, being used. They're more likely to be receptive to a chance at salvation. 
They're right at the end of the corridor, so I'd only have to defend one way, and me being a woman will likely make them more trusting towards me. I could hit and hold them from the back before they know what's what, while you guys storm in and up at them. Depending on the number there, I might even be able to secure the staircase alone. The door will be locked and you can't pick it. I snorted. Nate, there are six women in their twenties in there. You think if they don't knock on the door and play all helpless, the arrogant chumps outside won't want to peep in and have a look at what's wrong? Like you said, these are dumb thugs with barely a beard between them, so they're inexperienced and likely naive. Plus, I doubt they're all applying for Mensa anytime soon. Guard duty is a henchman job, so likely won't be done by any senior members. And all those pretty women asking for a big strong man's help. I snorted again and shook my head. Shit, he'll swagger in like he was fucking Batman, and then I'll kick his fucking head in. Nate openly laughed at the extensively scouse manner I hacked the last sentence with. Personally, I think he gets a bit of a kick out of my accent when it cranks up. It seems to be the basis of a plan, and I still have to do some solo recon on foot to get a clear picture of the exterior layout. I'll need to work out if I can get a suitably traversable and stealthy route to the top of that building to carry out my dickhead plan, so I'm going to do that tomorrow. Nate insisted on coming to provide cover if shit goes sideways. I don't want to carry a rifle and the like if I have to do some recon climbing, so I'll need to go light, which just means my encrypted radio for comms with Nate and a sidearm in case anything goes tits up, so Nate's coming as my overwatch. We want to keep the circle small on this stuff while we're at the planning stage, keeping it to the tactical inner circle of those likely to be involved in any assault. Me, Nate, Dean, Alicia, Elijah and Maria too. When we floated this recon plan past them earlier, the friendship between our two primary warriors was finally sealed by the gift of firearms. If you're providing overwatch for Erin, you'll want a proper tool for the job, said Dean. He disappeared for a few moments, returning with a long silver case. Nate popped it open to reveal the most hardcore weapon I've seen to date. It was all black with a brown handle, with the biggest fucking scope I've seen in my life, and all kinds of fun stuff in the case. Nate got a complete eye boner when he saw it, glancing between the rifle and Dean with mouth open. Honestly, he looked like a poor kid who's just been handed a brand new Xbox, widescreen TV, and selection of the latest games for free. How long have you been sandbagging that? laughed Nate. Shit, Dean. A PSG-1. Dean grinned. Police SFO issue marksman rifle. There was one left when I cleared out the locker at the constabulary the day I left, so I took it for a rainy day. I can use one to a fair level, but marksmanship wasn't my specialty. I focused on CQB assault and tactics. Erin's mentioned you've got real sniper training, and I think we know each other well enough now, so this is my gift to you. It'll be far more effective in your hands than anyone else's. Nate handled it almost reverently, like someone had just handed him their newborn baby. It's got a bipod in the case, rangefinder and wind meter. There's a hundred rounds of 762 stashed away that I swept up with it, which is everything I have in that caliber. Nate laughed actually laughed out loud, partly in amusement and mostly in disbelief. Well, he chuckled finally, you're definitely on my Christmas card list, Sergeant Williams. Apparently, this is a really good rifle, judging by Nate's reaction. A proper marksman rifle with a stinking long range, Nate says it's possible to hit a full thousand meters in the right conditions at its top end, which, quite frankly, is a ridiculous range to what we've been operating with. With Nate's eye behind the giant scope of this beast, he's just become the most dangerous man in Apocalypse Britain, I think. He ran off almost immediately to his makeshift practice range on a backfield to sight the weapon in. Once again, 
Yay for Nate being on my team. Tomorrow, the two of us are heading back out so I can recon my route while Dead Eye Carter plays Overwatch with his new high-powered and ridiculously scoped boom toy. Tonight, though, I'm just glad to be warm again. Returning back here reminds me to be thankful for the benefits we have. Two days and one night out in that house with Nate watching Nomad HQ, and holy balls, it was cold. Even with the heavy clothing and Arctic quality sleeping bags from the surplus store. My heart aches for survivors trying to weak out an existence without the many comforts we have. One thing I'll never do is take my good fortune for granted. Hot shower, clean clothes, hot chocolate, and a warm bed. I'm so profoundly lucky, and it just makes me want to help others even more. Can't help anybody without my beauty sleep, though. Night, night. December 21st, 2010. Risk assessment. I can do it, but it won't be easy, given the treacherous winter conditions. It's bloody cold every day now with frost each morning. Plus it's wet, too, so there's one stretch of the route where I'll be seriously risking my neck. I can't see any other option, though. I'll have to go to the very rear of the long stretch of buildings and work my way right along the whole thing, going up gradually, and there are two parts where I'm badly exposed. There's a real chance I could kill myself doing this given the conditions. The first three quarters are relatively simple, until I get near my goal. The only way up to the top level height near the end, however, will be doing a split wedge climb. For the uninitiated, that would be you, Freya, the split wedge is pretty much what it says on the tin. You wedge yourself between two walls, one foot and hand on opposite walls. Using the outward pressure, you push against each surface to move up the space between them. Push and hold with your feet while you move your hands up, then push and hold with your hands as you flick your feet up. Wash, rinse, repeat, until you reach the top of the climb, transferring both hands and feet to one lip, or whatever surface you can find to finally pull yourself up. For any of these chimneys between two nearby walls, however, the move gets really dangerous the higher you go, because one slip of hand or foot and all that wedged pressure vanishes. If that happens, there's no getting it back once lost. Downsville all the way. I've never done a split wedge climb that high before, as it should only be used for heights that you're comfortable dropping from if things go awry. I've certainly never done one near the end of December. Winter parkour was something I saved for the indoor gym, or for easy runs, climbs and vaults, where there's no major threat of injury. Or death. Making that wedged wall climb of about 20 feet will take me to the same level as the roof of my target three-floor building. The only caveat once up there is that I'll need to make a running jump of about 10 feet to the same elevation. I know, it doesn't sound much for someone who's been doing this for years, but remember, I'm only 5'6 in height, and my standing precision jumps aren't the 7 and 8 feet that taller, more heavily muscled guys can pull off. 10 feet in a running jump is a fucking chasm when carrying extra weight, like the radio and sidearm on a belt, plus the rifle and spare ammo as well, as it'll mess with my speed and balance. The roofs will be wet and slippery too, I imagine, and if I fall short on the jump or slip as I launch, we're talking one less lucky in the world, because that fall is about 50 feet to solid concrete. Naturally, Nate and everyone else are entirely against this level of danger. The plan is being kept behind closed doors, with the inner circle aware of what we're planning in earnest. Others know we plan to go after the nomads at some point, but they don't know how advanced those plans are or any details. It's insanity, Erin, said Nate. It's too much risk. I agree, Dean chimed in the others adding their support to vote my plan down. And what about everyone on the top floor? I argued in return. 
What if the nomads do line them all up as human shields when the bullets start flying? No matter how much we might be hurting for what the nomads did to the Willow Park lot, this isn't a mission of vengeance we're going on. Our primary goal, our only goal, should be getting those people they keep captive out alive and safe. Culling the nomad threat is just a byproduct of that, or something we could do later if need be. I gave a nonchalant shrug, indicating I wouldn't be moved. I'm doing it, so you'll all have to suck it up. Even if I do fall and break myself in half, you can still go on with the initial plan. Erin, there's too much risk, said Nate again, shaking his head. You can't do what you need to do as the flame if you're dead. I'm still a little uncomfortable with how set Nate is now on this whole torchbearer thing. I, however, see it a little differently to him. And what good am I in that role if I'm unwilling to help others who aren't in a position to help themselves, just because I have to put my neck on the line? I can't afford overcaution, Nate. This isn't reckless. I'm not taking dumbass risks just for shits and giggles and a cheap thrill ride. I mustered all the iron resolve I could to my voice. I know I can do it. Yes, it has risk, but if I didn't think I could do it, I wouldn't even try, as a 50-foot drop to concrete isn't something I'd ever take lightly. I'm not born to be wild, Nate, but equally, I'm not born to be mild either. Nothing great ever comes easy or without risk. Nate was wavering, but I could tell he still wasn't convinced, and I suddenly realised why. It wasn't just because he cared about my safety. You can't protect me all the time, Nate, I cautioned, softening. I know you take this role as my shield, seriously, and I love you for it, but I'm a grown woman, and I'm the only one here with the appropriate skills and experience for this task. If you can tell me any other way to secure the safety of those hostages before any frontal assault, then I'm all ears. But you know there isn't. We've already tried and thrown out every other idea. Profound silence followed my statement as everyone glanced at each other. Nobody had any answer because there wasn't any other option. So the plan stays. We don't want to hit them just yet. Nate wants to run through the plan with all involved. Me, Alicia, Eli and Dean. They're the fire team breaching and entering and I'm going solo up top to secure the hostages. We'll probably bring a couple of extra in as backup closer to the time, but there'll be guns staying outside the perimeter in case things get a bit dicey and we need a QRF. Meanwhile, tomorrow there's a side quest to retrieve a load of supplies from that little hair salon Nate and I discovered in the village with the three junkies and their toy gun. Ellie wants to be useful and tidy everyone up, and I admit even my hair is getting way too long for me to be comfortable with. Sooner or later, I'll end up getting this massive ponytail trapped in something, or a Zed will hook it, and that shit will get me killed in today's world. Plus, we're all starting to look like we belong in a hippie commune with thick mops of hair and bushy beards. I have to say, though, Nate really suits a beard, mainly because it's sprinkled with silver and makes him look even more commanding. He's the definitive image of a grizzled old war leader with his salt and pepper hair and beard. Such a manly man is our Nate. This should be a relatively simple mission, Go to the salon, empty it of all supplies, and pull out one of those pump-up chairs with adjustable height. Nate was against it without any of the primary shooters being involved, as his first question was obviously who was going to lead it. Doug and Finn Archer are eager to go, and Clyde too, because it's for his wife. The first two guys are actually very experienced, considering they've been doing all the supply runs for Willow Park since it started, so we can't really argue with their inclusion. Isaac wants to go too, as does Sarah, who, let's not forget, has been upgraded to the rifle by Nate. 
The run should be relatively easy, in fairness. The area is pretty clear. They can double up and collect some more supplies that may still be in that convenience store. And I said to Nate that as our community grows, we're going to have to start trusting people. Me, Nate, or Dean can't go on every single mission, and simple resource gathering with a specific target in an area we've already been through will be good experience for everyone. It'll also help integrate our two groups a little more, having a combined mission like this, letting Doug's people know that he's a trusted member of the community. If he thinks we're always running overwatch on him when he's been leading their group of survivors for so long, it might drive a deeper wedge into our current uneasy truce. A couple of younger members like Isaac and Sarah won't feel like a threat, and Doug was present when we took all those undead down by the gas yard. He's seen Sarah in action. Grudgingly, Nate agreed. The five of us need to run a few mock-ups of what we're planning to do here on campus, and Nate needs to drill the others into his fire team. Dean's training and experience will be invaluable. Doug, Finn, Clyde, Sarah and Isaac will go on a little mission for a couple of hours to clear out the salon and cherry-pick any good supplies remaining at the convenience store next to it. Two vehicles are enough, with just our white van to carry the goods, as the Willow Park one was rendered useless after the Nomad assault, and that trusty black Astra hatchback as a following vehicle. Clyde will go in the van with the Archer boys, with Sarah and Isaac following in the hatchback. Now, I have to say, that last pairing I'm not so peachy with. I know Sarah is crushing on Isaac a bit, as all the signs are there. Little sweeps of hair behind the ear as she talks to him, coy smiles, and I've caught her staring his way numerous times when she thinks no one's looking. It's really sweet and innocent, so I can't stand the thought of him using her as some pawn in a game he thinks will make me jealous. I really like Sarah, and I think we've the potential to be good friends. She's sweet-natured with a big heart, has an enviable craft with sarcasm, which is always a winner in my book, and tough as hell. Two months on from our clash of genitals, and Isaac's still being a bit of a tool towards me, and he's pretty snide towards Eli as well, who's just so laid back he doesn't rise to it. Nothing's happened between me and Elijah, but Isaac clearly has an issue with our obvious growing friendship. Not much I can do about it, though. I'll just see how this plays out. If he does hurt her in any way, though, I will smack him in the dick. With a hammer. That's on fire. I hope the mission goes well. We could do with something to help our two groups bridge the trust gap, despite Nate and Dean's vocal support and the speech I dropped from the heart that seemed to get through to them. It's going to take time, though, and they're still grieving lost friends and family members, so I can't really put a clock on it. We're all just figuring this shit out as we go. Hopefully this little side quest will help us get the main campaign back on track and be the start of the two groups pulling together. Hope. That seems to be the word of this apocalypse. It's the only thing keeping us going some days, I think. December 22nd, 2010. The hits keep on coming. There's no avoiding it now. The bastards have forced our hand. This morning, the nomads hit our people when they went beyond the gate. Nate is like a raging volcano, blaming himself for allowing them to go out without top-tier experience. But from the sounds of what went down, it wouldn't have made a difference. It was planned. Again. I don't know how they're getting their intelligence, but it can't be anything natural. And I'm starting to get really fucking pissed at how much influence Captain Evil has for his team. Meanwhile, we're just left to our own fucking devices and have to muddle through as best we can. The rules are either stacked in their favour or our team has a shit middle manager who keeps delegating all his work to underlings who haven't been given the project briefing. 
they didn't even make it to the damn salon. Each vehicle had one of the older radios, as we keep Dean's encrypted channel ones for key operations. And within ten minutes of them setting off, it blazed into life. My blood ran cold as I heard Clyde roaring down the radio they were under fire from a small group, their vehicles disabled. Remember those police stingers I was talking about that Mark wanted to use for protecting the gate? Well, the nomads must have located a couple from police vehicles and deployed them as our people approached. All the tyres of the van were blown out and Isaac had slammed on the brakes in an attempt to stop but didn't manage in time. The front tyres rolled over those hollow spikes and that was the end of the Astra's mobility. Then the shooting started. It wasn't the thundering barrage that happened with the Willow Park convoy, and no machine pistols were involved, thankfully, but the staggered steady boom of shotguns and pistols were evident. When we ran outside, we heard the gunfire echoing in the distance. They were so damn close, which means they know where we are, and they've been waiting on one of the routes we have to take from the school as we pass through a small rural village on our way to town. All the fire came from the right side, so those who could piled out of the passenger doors, keeping low as about six or seven guns opened up on them. They all took injuries in some form, though thankfully no one died. Bloody miracle. Doug was hit in the thigh by some buckshot ripping through his door, and fragments of glass ended up in Finn's eye from shattering windows, which makes me sick even writing, because I've mentioned before my spine-chilling aversion to eye injuries. Clyde also took some errant buckshot to the chest, but only a few pellets. He's a mess, but in no danger of dying. Sarah took a thirty-eight bullet to her right shoulder, and was lucky it didn't hit an artery. It's probably cracked the bone a little as well, flattening against it. Maria had to dig the little bastard out when we got them back here. Isaac took a round to the leg. I've given him a lot of shit, even in my last entry. But to his eternal credit, he pushed Sarah out, screaming at her to get away and not wait for him. He put her before himself, and that's the bravest damn thing he's ever done. She could see the nomads advancing on the car as they reloaded, in agony and unable to lift the rifle to return fire because her right arm was useless, she fell out the far door and got to cover behind the brick wall of a garden where the others fled for concealment. The nomads kept their heads down with staggered fire. It was clear they weren't trying to kill them, only suppress, and Sarah recounted to us through her tears how she heard Isaac swearing and fighting as the nomads dragged his injured form from the car and away. Within a minute, they heard the rumble of a diesel engine, plus the rattling roars of dirt bikes, and they were gone before we arrived moments later in the biggest damn QRF we've ever had. Even Willow Park people came out unarmed to offer vehicles and aid, just as a show of numbers to drive off any remaining attackers. Eli and Nate did first aid at the scene, radioing back reports to Maria as she prepared her makeshift infirmary with the help of some Willow Park volunteers. Once they were stabilised, we rolled back in force and got them treated. One thing we are sorely lacking are IV bags for antibiotics or fluids. The small store we have will be depleted by this latest collection of serious injuries. Clyde is largely okay, and the buckshot pellets that hit his chest were deep, but mostly just superficial and painful. Doug's leg is a raw and bloody mess, but he'll survive and recover with time, providing he avoids infection, though he'll have some pretty spectacular scars. Finn is likely going to lose the sight in his right eye. I can't talk about this in detail, because I feel genuinely queasy when talking about eye trauma. Maria had to put him under as best she could, so she could tweeze all the fragments from his eyeball. Nope, gag reflex kicking in. I'm stopping there. Suffice to say, given the extent of the injury, Maria is doubtful he'll ever see out of that eye again. What a fucking shit situation that is. Sarah is away with the fairies on pain medication, but Maria and Eli got the bullet out of her arm and pumped her full of antibiotics to stave off any infection. She'll survive. 
She'll be sore for some time. But she was lucky it was in a meaty part of her arm and nothing major was damaged. It's just going to hurt for a while. Both medics surmise the bullet lacked its full punch because the small junk revolver used didn't have much of a range. So in that sense, she was quite lucky. Isaac's fate, however, is unknown. We know he was injured and we know he was taken alive by the assaulting nomads. We haven't heard anything yet, but we're expecting to. Isaac had a radio on his person when he was taken and the college where the nomads make their home base is within range. We're leaving the channel clear in case they contact us while we move forward with an alternate plan that Nate is formulating. Why an alternate plan? Well, Isaac will know we were planning some form of retribution for the Willow Park attack, but he wasn't privy to any of the details and doesn't know anything about my stupid plan to traverse the aerial highway and come in through the top floor. Small mercies, I guess. If they're ready for us now, though, it changes everything. Freya, I'm really worried about him. December 23rd. 2010. Lucky out. Last night, the radio came to life. We were clustered around it as we had been for the whole day waiting for contact. Then around 9pm, a voice crackled over the airwaves. I want to speak to the woman calling herself Lucky. It was a woman's voice. A northern accent I couldn't place, like some mangled mess of Yorkshire and Lancashire. I could tell she was older by her voice, fifties maybe, and graveled by years of heavy smoking. I looked at Nate and Dean, who both shook their head for the moment. Dean was the one who reached for the radio. She's not here right now, so you can talk to me while we locate her. My name's Dean. Carol, replied the ogre-like voice. But everyone calls me Mama. I'm listening, Carol. The woman held the mic down so we could hear her throaty, derisive laugh. <laughs> I have one of your people, a very talkative and weepy young man named Isaac Sadler. One of yours, yes? You know he is, said Dean, a hint of warning in his tone. Let's not play games, Carol. You've attacked our people without provocation twice now. Good people have already died, children among them, and other lives forever changed because of your violence. Now you're holding one of ours hostage, and our information says he's injured. Oh, he's fine, Mama said in a dismissive manner. With a doctor here, and she patched your little boy up. Is in no danger, just a little sore. Glad to hear that, Carol. He was very talkative, though. Told me all about how you planned to come and deal with us and how you all think this lucky woman of yours is special in some way. She snorted a laugh down the mic. At least, I think it was meant to be a laugh. It sounded more like a pig choking on a bucket of mucus. Of course, he resisted a little to begin with. So, one of my boys persuaded him to be a little freer with his information. Like I said, with a doctor here, so we patched him back up real nice for you. Every fist around the table bunched. Every jaw clenched tight, shared fury clouding every look. I don't much like your manner, Carol, warned Dean, the calm in his voice completely at odds with the rage etched into every line of his face. You want your boy back, then you trade him for your little messiah. This lucky woman for Isaac. One for one, and all this is over. Why do you want her? Mama made a show of sighing down the mic, as though bored of the conversation. Dean, I've me own people to protect. I've been shown things you wouldn't understand, allowing me to lead me own group to some measure of safety. 
If I want that to continue, then she's the price I have to pay. One stranger for the safety of many. Not even a contest. I waved at Dean to pass me the radio, as this was the point requiring my involvement. Dean and Nate shared a look, a shrug, a nod, and then the handset came my way. I'm here, fucknut, was my grand opening. Let me take a wild swing at the thing we wouldn't understand. Your dreams are leading you to pockets of resources and other survivors, am I right? The brief silence, rather than another smug retort, told me I'd hit the bullseye with my first shot. Eventually, she replied. Go on, she urged, some of the cocksure arrogance gone from her tone. You've been having dreams, probably somewhere dark and cold, I imagine. You see, some of our people have had similar dreams. But their dreams seem to be in bright, sunlit gardens, having conversations with dead friends who they loved in life. I bet you were alone in yours, weren't you? And I bet there wasn't a fucking daffodil in sight. Nervous laughter rippled around our table. I was mad at this ogre, and because my blood was up, my accent thickened again. I carried on, not giving her a chance to reply. Carol, Mama, Mrs. Grotbags, or whatever the fucking hell you want to call yourself. What you need to realise is that whatever you think is giving you dreams for security and protection, you are dead fucking wrong. You've pulled on the wrong colour kit and taking the field for the wrong team. I'm not the messiah, just a very naughty girl. Nor am I a spiritual leader or any other kind of bollocks. I'm simply someone trying to do right by not only my people, but by any people. In case you miss the memo, the dead are the real enemy. Killing and hurting our people puts you on the wrong side of the fence. You're a cocky one, for sure, crackled the reply. Here I am, with one of your people at my mercy, and you're insulting me. I'm letting you know that I won't take any of your twisted games. You're not baiting me with Isaac's safety, and you're not going to guilt me into giving myself up when you've already shown you're unworthy of any trust. Why give one back when you can do a two-for-one, hey? Disbelieving eyes stared at me from around the table as I charged on. If they were expecting me to play nice with this vicious ogre, they don't know me well enough by now. This twisted bitch wanted to play games, and she wasn't getting that satisfaction from me. I could kill him, here and now, warned Mama. Like fuck you will, I snapped back, because you know he's your fucking shield. Isaac's told you we're planning to come for you, and this conversation doesn't change a damn thing. You think you're okay with your junk guns and your teenage thugs who think they're fucking Mad Max apocalypse gangsters? Well, let me fucking tell you what I've got, you cunt. I've got a former Royal Marine commando that also served in the SA fucking S with fucking decades of combat experience, as well as a highly trained police firearms specialist with qualifications and training out of his arse in close quarter combat tactics and counter-terrorism response. I've also got another ex-military man who served tours in Afghanistan and been under fire from the fucking Taliban. My blood was boiling by now and I'd gone full scouse on her. The rest of us have been trained for months by these exceptional people and you've experienced up close the military-grade firepower we have. So let me ask you this, Mama. Would you be willing to bet your last menopause pill on your bunch of playtime outlaws or my real fucking warriors? The silence was profound, both across the airwaves and around the table, as all eyes stared at me in a heady mix of both shock and, I think, a little admiration for my gutsy stand. Then I got all I needed. Nate nodded, winked, and gave me that little smile of his. With Nate on board, I clicked the mic again before Mama could respond. If you've got any fucking sense left, Isaac will be alive when we come for him, and come for him we fucking will. Isaac's life is the only thing that'll stop me putting all of you in the ground, because let me make this nice and clear for you, Carol. 
If I get there and that boy isn't breathing, I'm going to go fucking biblical on your geriatric ass. Do you fucking hear me? I waited only a breath. Sleep tight, bitch. Lucky out. Then switched the radio off. Naturally, after my little outburst, my middle finger tactics raised some concerns. She might kill Isaac out of spite, cautioned Maria. Did you have to be so aggressive? Yes, I affirmed with everything I had. Yes, Maria, I did. Because that animal is a puppet of Captain Evil. And that means, in my mind, she's weak and selfish. And what she wants more than anything is to survive. She's like every other narcissistic prick in the world, in that she wants power and control. And when you take it away from them, it seriously fucks with their mojo. It was the same with Bancroft. Mess up their toy box and they end up throwing tantrums and getting sloppy. What if she uses the other captives as shields now? Asked Eli. I shrugged. I can't control every variable, Eli. How can I? On that front, what will be, will be. But I gave nothing away about them. I only mentioned Isaac and I did that for a reason. Nate chuckled. If she knows we're coming, she's actually likely to leave less of a guard on those locked rooms and direct her forces to the main entrances. He nodded again. Smart kid. Real smart. I beamed, happy he'd picked up on my on-the-fly plan. I can always trust Nate to see the bigger picture. Exactly. Fifteen or so people out in the open needs crowd control, and she doesn't know that we know about them. Isaac isn't party to that information. So, if the captives are locked up in rooms, just leave one or two monkeys to guard them, because how can anyone possibly get to them without coming up those stairs? Except you, said Eli softly, because she's no idea what you're capable of. Shit, Erin, I just thought you were going mental, he chuckled. Well, in fairness, I was going a bit mental, but it all had a purpose. Take away her control of the conversation, put the fear of the almighty up her shriveled old arsehole by laying out the level of experience and firepower that's heading her way, and warning her that Isaac's health is the only damn thing that might keep her alive. She's no crazy zealot, just a selfish prick being manipulated by Captain Shit for brains, preying on her flaws and mercenary nature. Dean blew out his cheeks, shaking his head a little with a nervous chuckle. And with her other captives locked up tight, she redirects more firepower to her personal protection, trusting locked doors to hold the prisoners. He grinned, a little bit of pride in the expression, judging by what he said next. You were way ahead of us reading and executing all that on the go. I affected a mock haughty expression, as if the compliments were merely my due, answering in a posh tone that was probably the worst impression of the Queen that has ever been voiced. And that, my dear Dean, is why I'm special, don't you know? I expected my wisecrack to get some laughter, but instead I was knocked a little off guard by the fact the rest of them just nodded, as if it were just fact and not my usual piss-taking ways. That was quite sobering. Now it's time for plan B. We can't go right this instant, and we needed to be shitting bricks for a day or so. Leave them twitchy and not sleeping well to hamper their effectiveness for when we do arrive. So that's what we're doing today. I swear, if Isaac isn't whole when I get there, Hell's Fury will have nothing on mine. Isaac may have been a dickhead of late, but he's our dickhead, and he put Sarah's welfare beyond his own when he was wounded and bullets were flying. That was an act of pure heroism. Hold on, buddy. We're coming. December 24th, 2010. The night before Christmas and all through the apocalypse. 
It's not lost on me that today is Christmas Eve. We should be wrapping presents and getting all excited, coming together as a community, if only for the kids. Instead, we're equipment checking, running through the plan again and again and setting up what we can of a QRF. With Sarah, Doug, Finn and Clyde all injured, they're out of it, and they were four of our shooters. Isaac too. Our only real backup guns are Maria and Mark. I don't really want either of them to come, but we might need Maria's skills. Plus, she's a fucking great shot. And Mark has a kid, so I don't want him in harm's way. But he straight up overruled me. Doesn't matter how much of a dick he's been of late, said Mark. Isaac's still family. Such a great guy. Loyal and noble as all hell. Some of the Willow Park people will be hanging back as well, just as drivers for the aftermath. We'll need to transport the captives back with us if successful. Ultimately, it's shit or bust with what we've got, and we've had to adapt the plan a little. Dean, Alicia and Eli will be a three-gun team. I'll be going in the top, like I planned. Nate's changed his role up a bit, but if anyone can move through that building solo and be okay, it's Nate Carter. Our most potent weapon will clear the decks for the fire team's opening assault, then follow them in. I need sleep today, because the five of us doing primary assault are moving out later to plant ourselves in that little house as an overnight operating base. The nomads won't expect us to be travelling in the dark, and then we can all position ourselves with the cover of the murky dawn. Maria, Mark and the others will leave at first light. Those two will have one of the secure channel radios, and the five of us will all be hooked up. Yes, Freya. On Christmas morning, I'll be a gender-bended Santa going up a chimney, onto a roof, and the presents we'll be dropping off won't be wrapped in shiny paper. Because we have machine guns. Ho, ho, ho. Flint and Lock, action heroes, are doing their own messed-up version of Die Hard in a college on Christmas Day. Kill the bad guys, save the hostages. What a world, Freya. What a fucking world. I'm out. Time to prepare and rest up. Merry fucking Christmas. The greatest gift of all. I'll fucking gut her boyfriend for that raged Mama, slamming the handset to the table when Lockie refused to respond. Leave him be, advised Mace, the primary source of good sense to balance the emotive fury of their matriarch. Carol, Mama, Sullivan, had always been a large woman. Not just overweight, but broad and stout, a fleshy block of anger and vitriol. Some of her excess fat had been burned off by their enforced apocalypse diet, but she was still a big woman in comparison to the forest of slimmer people surrounding her. Every eye was inevitably drawn to her when she entered the room, because her sour presence was just as intrusive as her physical size. Her once long blonde hair, now almost white, gave her a crone-like appearance to match her spiteful personality. Sparking another stale cigarette, the nomad matriarch exhaled a plume of thick smoke, adding to the choking cloud hanging in the air. Her son, Louis Junior Sullivan, nodded in agreement with Mama's desire to gut Isaac, just as he always did. Like a loyal dog, he never disagreed with his mother's words, and like an echo of her actions, he too lit a cigarette. Mama turned her flat, pudgy face towards Mace, offended by his challenge. You heard that woman, right? He continued. Carol, when that convoy was ambushed, they returned fire with some serious fucking hardware. We haven't got anything like that kind of quality. Just a couple of junk tech nines, a handful of decent pistols, and after that, we're in low-capacity shotguns and junk Saturday night specials. Plus, we're not exactly flush with ammo. The last six months have drained us down to the bare bones, and I wouldn't be surprised if even half a gunfight used up the last of it. 
our hardware isn't in the same league as theirs. If what this lucky woman says is true, with ex-military and firearms officers, plus a fucking former special forces guy, we should seriously consider trying to make peace with these people. You kill Isaac, there's no telling what they'll do. Pussy, sneered Junior from his mother's side. Shut the fuck up, puppy, snapped Mace, whirling on the younger man. The big dogs are talking. Junior might be Mama's son, but Mace was technically the senior nomad as the club's vice president, and his own nickname wasn't given just as a shortened version of his surname. Mace's reputation as a bare-knuckle brawler was near legendary, and no man in the club dared stand toe-to-toe with him, having been a promising amateur boxer before being drawn into the club life by his small-time gangster father. Mace was a natural talent, his trainers convinced he had a real shot to go pro if he'd stuck with it. But that was another time. Another life. Junior blanched and closed his mouth. He was just into his twenties, but Mace approached his mid-thirties and a patched member for fourteen years. His intention as VP was always to take the reins when Mama's husband stepped down or got too old, then shifted away from playing gangster. The Nomads weren't an outlaw one-percenter motorcycle club, and playing at being small-time criminals was just embarrassing. Low-level drugs, amateur extortion, and small-time one-off arms deals to common grassroots criminals was no kind of future for a tiny club like theirs. They weren't players, merely dipping a small toe into waters too deep. But the younger crowd had been seduced by too many movies and TV shows, fancying themselves as outlaws. Embarrassing. You might wear that VP tag on your cut, Mace, but I'm the one in charge, remember? Mace stared back defiantly at the woman. You'd never be able to sit at the head of the table before all this went down, even with these freaky dreams. Yet here I am, Thomas and the dreams are what allow us to prosper. You've seen the evidence. And what are you doing with that? He demanded. You're handing off women to the guys to be used, force others into servitude using fear, and now you're taunting a group that are way better trained and armed than we are. He threw his arm in a general direction behind him. Have you... Seen what we are, Carol. Boys playing at outlaw. Thugs. Half of them hold pistols sideways or think a shotgun can be fired in one hand for fuck's sake. That idiot bulldog is the worst of the lot. That ugly piece of shit would never have earned the patch in the old world. Shit, that streak of piss would have been chased out of our presence as soon as he rolled up with his fake fucking pimp limp. And let's not get onto your sick and twisted tower games in the gym. Times change. Thomas, she said, using his name like an errant child being scolded. This is the new world, and I'm the one granted the visions that lead us to crucial supplies and people with skills to help us survive. The other patches all support me. You are the one outvoted, Thomas. Because of the five patches left, one of them's your low IQ son and two are his fucking mates who share a single brain cell between them. So you get the three to two majority by proxy. Let's not forget that me and Dong voted against letting you lead because of some shitty dreams. Oh, I'm well aware of that, Thomas, she said in a dangerous tone. Don't think I haven't forgotten about the betrayal of you and your retarded friend. Dong isn't retarded, and you're not killing their guy. Mace's stance was firm. We're not all fucking dying for you. I'm not killing him right now, said Mama, that hint of a malicious smirk at one corner of her mouth. Disgusted and unable to deal with mother and son a moment longer, Mace stormed from the college library, slamming the door behind him. 
Is it all true? Asked Mace, passing a bottle of water to Isaac. The younger man accepted with a nod, wincing as he sipped at it. There were definitely a couple of loosened teeth from the beating Junior meted out. His face was a mass of bruising, one eye swollen to a thin slit, and his thigh tightly wrapped with the dressing Doc Emma had changed the night before. About all those boasts? Isaac snorted with a nod. I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that Nate Carter is a walking army. He's fought in the Falklands, the Gulf, Africa, and other places he likely hasn't told us. I've seen him in action. And Locke is his protege that's been with him since all this walking dead bullshit started. I mean, she's effectively been personally trained by the SAS, Mace. I don't think either of them know what fear actually is. You ever heard of Jamie Bancroft? Mace puffed out his cheeks with a nod. Shit, yeah. That guy was fucking ruthless, like his old man Harry. Not a guy to be fucked with. Nate and Lockie took them all out, Mace. All of them. Nearly 40 guys, and all the hardware they have now was taken from him. Nate and Lockie started that fight with a shotgun each and Nate's pistol. Now, they're armed to the teeth with military-grade rifles, semi-auto handguns, and ammo pissing out their asses. This isn't the first time I've been held prisoner. I was Bancroft's first, as were a few others, and Nate and Lockie went to war for us when it was just the two of them. Isaac shrugged. They're here, Jamie isn't. Mace rubbed his jaw thoughtfully. Shit, Isaac. I never wanted any of this. Is it too late? In Nate's mind, probably. Lucky, though. Isaac sighed and shook his head. She's different. She's all about saving people and hates having to fight the living. All she wants to do is fight the dead. But people like yours keep getting in her way. Mace regarded him for a moment. You've got a thing for her, he observed. Isaac laughed, wincing at the pain in his face. Is it that obvious? Mace nodded with a small grin. We had a brief thing, just one drunken night, but I've liked her from the off. Oh, Mace, she's something else. Most guys probably wouldn't give her a second glance. She's not unattractive, but most would likely say she's just average and no head-turner. He sighed wistfully and shook his head. But it's not how she looks, Mace. Shit. There's just something about her. It's like an energy that draws you in. Even before the world fell apart, I've never met anyone like her. Isaac released a heavy exhale of regret. Truth be told, since then, uh, I've been a bit of a tool to her. I think she's got a thing for one of the new guys, and in fairness, he's a decent bloke. Hasn't stopped me being an arsehole, though. Mace chuckled. The heart wants what it wants, mate. Sense doesn't get a look in. Truth, sighed Isaac. But she's so fearless. Personally trained by the scariest motherfucker I've ever seen in my life, Lockie just doesn't have any quit in her. If she says she's coming, you can bet your life she is, and Nate will be right at her shoulder. All these cocky dickheads you've got around you. Lockie would probably sweep them aside these days, never mind what Nate will do to them. Quite frankly, They'll be lucky if it's Erin who gets to them first. I would not want Nate for an enemy, he added with real feeling. I don't know how it got to this, admitted Mace, rubbing his eyes wearily. Walking murderous corpses are everywhere, and here we are doing their job for them because of some stupid fucking dreams. Something bigger than us is going on, Mace. Lockie is special. Chosen by on high or something to unite people and make a safe place for the living. 
You say your hag of a leader has dreams, but hers wants you guys to dominate and control. Lockie and Nate want to protect, want to build something better. Can you honestly say you're playing for the right team here? I don't know about all this divine bullshit, Isaac. I know something is going on. Otherwise, Carol's dreams wouldn't have led us to easily acquired resources in areas clear of the dead or pointed us to where survivors were hiding like the dock that patched you up. It's all too specific to be a complete lie. He rolled his head around his shoulders, trying to loosen the tense muscles of his neck. Then listen to your gut feeling, Mace urged Isaac. You could help stop all this shit before it goes completely west. Help us. I'll make sure Lockie and Nate listen to you and that you and your big mate aren't like the others. You've treated the other captives right. I could tell that from how different Doc Emma is around you than the others. Get us out, you and your buddy with us. Then let Nate and company do their thing. Mace sat quietly for a moment, considering the younger man's plea. I'll have a think about it and talk to Dong. It won't be easy. I wouldn't wait too long, Mace, warned Isaac. If I die, hell will seem like a good place for a holiday with the pain they'll bring. Nate and Lockie won't wait long before striking. I might have been a dick to Lockie for a while, but I'm still one of theirs. And one thing they'd never do is leave one of their own behind. A day later, on Christmas Eve, any choice was taken from Mace. Junior and his two patched buddies, Ink and Dixie, swept past Mace with wicked smiles curling their dry lips. What's going on? Junior stopped, a supreme smugness painted on his face that turned Mace's stomach. This was bad. We've just put your boy on the tower. We're taking bets on whether he'll last till his people come. May escaped at them. What the fuck? The tower was Mama's twisted creation, a test of endurance devised as malevolent entertainment for her boys and a baptism of fire for prospects hoping to rise through the ranks. In the center of the gymnasium, a solid tower of bricks had been constructed, standing about ten feet in height and six feet square. Most of the tower was thoroughly cemented and solid, with just the top layer being loose bricks lying atop the stack. Once the tower was complete, prospects rounded up nearby undead, baiting them out of houses in the immediate area. Through a single fire exit on one side of the gymnasium, the undead were ushered into the large open space, and then all the gym fire exits welded shut from the outside. The only way in and out of the gymnasium was the main double door, in from the college itself, which was constantly guarded, heavily barricaded, and chained. When a victim was selected for the tower, prospects armoured themselves head to foot, carrying long staves to push at the undead while bearing large, makeshift shields made from acrylic in imitation of police riot gear. Ten prospects would then use their shields to escort the victim to the tower. Forcing them to climb atop the bricks, the ladder was knocked away and the sentinels would finally beat their way back to the exit. Some prospects were lost to bites, adding to the number of undead. Sometimes they would get too close for comfort and need braining, the corpse left to rot in the building, creating a vile charnel house of the gym. Once clear, the doors would be sealed up again, and the twisted show would begin. The nomad bets were simple. Once the doors were closed and locked, the timer would start, and bets placed on how long the unfortunate victim would last. Able to watch from the level above through a layer of thick safety glass, they would jeer from their safe vantage, taunting the unfortunate star of their grisly show. Victims were given food and water enough for a rationed three days, but none ever lasted that long. They tried breaking for one of the doors, only to find them welded shut, take one of the loose bricks to try and fight the undead, or simply give up on life 
and throw themselves into the mass. With almost 70 undead clamoring around their precarious perch, taking them on hand to hand with a brick was suicide. Sometimes the star of the macabre show was given a small revolver with a single round. Bonus bets were placed on whether the poor bastard would use the bullet on themselves and how long it would be until they did. Are you mad? demanded Mace as he swept into the library. Didn't you hear anything I said? Mama glanced back with a smirk as she finished buttoning her shirt over her heavy cleavage. Also finishing dressing was her newly patched minion, the ugly young thug who had taken the nickname Bulldog. He thought it was a cool, tough name, not realizing Mace coined it because his face contained all the beauty of a bulldog licking piss from a nettle. Mama liked young men and how empowered it made her feel, even ones as but ugly as bulldog. If they wanted to rise through the ranks, then Mama needed her sugar. Even the thought was nightmare fuel. Next time, be a deer, a knock before entering, she chided. Who knows what private moment you could have walked in on. Mace shuddered and tried not to vomit in his mouth. What the hell, he snapped. Isaac on the tower? Mama clucked her tongue. But my dear boy... I'm not killing him, and his people are coming for him. If his confidence in his friends is so high, I'm sure they'll rush in and save him. She ended the sarcastic statement with a mockingly sweet smile. You're going to get us all killed, he warned in a tight voice. Ain't no little bitch and no granddad gonna take us down, scoffed Bulldog. Gonna see how tight that little bitch is when she comes around, just like I promised her, bruv. He grabbed his crotch and pulled a truly sickening face that involved sticking his lizard tongue out of his mouth. Mace rounded on the thug. Who left your fucking cage open, dickhead? I swear, if you don't shut your fucking mouth, the next thing to come out of it will be your teeth. Bulldog blanched, struck by the force of Mace's threat, the heat of his rage forcing an involuntary step back. It's done, Thomas, declared Mama, brushing imaginary dust from her clothing, disinterested. This is how it is. This is how the dreams want it. Fuck that and fuck you, he spat. Don't start that shit with me and lay the blame for your sadistic games on fucking dreams. Own your twisted shit, you psycho. Mama sighed. I thought this would happen. She gave a nod to the ugly man at her side, who pulled his handgun clear and pointed it at Mace. Clapping her hands, two more of Bulldog's young thugs entered the room behind Mace, one with a revolver, the other a shotgun. What the fuck are you doing? He grated through clenched teeth. I think maybe you should spend some quality time with our guests. Then, when all this is over, you and I can have a good talk about what comes next and the chain of command. Bulldog's face split into a nauseating grin. Gun out and down, real slow. Yeah, bruv? Nate watched Erin through the powerful scope as she crossed the open space at the college's rear. Dean, Alicia and Elijah remained out of sight, primed for their advance on the college entrance once Erin gave the all clear, the entire operation relying on the young woman's success. The grey pre-dawn murk of Christmas morning smeared everything, making it difficult to pick out Erin's tiny form once she disappeared from view. Movement on the low, rear roofs a few moments later quirked a smile to Nate's lips. Erin sweeping across the low rooftops, image growing ever larger in the scope as she navigated the rearmost building towards him. Leaping like a cat to grab ledges and haul herself up, the extra weight didn't seem to slow her. Far stronger than her short frame suggested, 
Erin moved with a smooth, elegant glide, always in balance as she arrived at the base of the dangerous ascent. Nate switched his sight to ground level, checking the positions of the four sentries, but their sleepy, unprofessional lack of vigilance was no danger to her, each one facing away from her as they idly chatted. Unaware of the demented squirrel above and behind them, Nate switched the scope back to Erin just as her hand pressed the mic on the radio. Her voice was low and clear, the throat mic of the police SFO radios picking up every syllable like a crystal. If I die, delete my browser history, she said, eliciting a quiet snort from Nate. Not until I've had a good look, replied Elijah in an equally soft tone. Morbid fascination says I need to know just how depraved you are. There was no answer, but Nate smirked at Erin's beaming smile through the scope as she readied herself for the treacherous climb. Elijah was a steady, calm head, and Nate considered how good he'd be for Erin. He was eminently likable. The two of them had obvious chemistry, and they complemented each other well. Erin was a wildfire, an emotional cyclone roaring with life, while Elijah contained the strength of a calmed ocean. Tranquil, at ease, but with depths of hidden power if the storm awakened. If there was one person who deserved a little joy in their life, it was Erin. If the burden of the living's defense was to hang on her slim shoulders, Nate thought the least those powers could do was give her a little personal happiness along the way. The former marine licked dry lips as Erin ascended, body facing outwards as both arms and legs alternated the pressure against opposing surfaces. Holding his breath as she shuffled upwards to the summit, Erin was past the event horizon where a safe fall was possible, and he waited in agony for this torment to end. Nate's breath hissed in a low chuckle as Erin transferred both hands to one ledge, hauled herself up, stood, threw her hands in the air in her best Rocky Balboa celebration before performing a bizarre kick and crotch thrust reminiscent of Michael Jackson. Get on with it, you bellend, muttered Nate into the mic. Erin halted, grinned in his direction, and waved happily like a small child at a parent before edging forward to assess the last part of her challenge. Her celebratory expression shifted to focused intensity as she stared down the 50-foot drop between the two classroom buildings. Shoulders rising and falling as she sucked in a breath for courage, Erin marked her approach with long, backward steps, eyes fiercely locked to her launch point. Nate's breath stopped again as Erin charged with sweeping, graceful strides towards the edge, her body tucking in perfect balance as she soared over the gap, landing on the balls of her feet and dispersing the impact across her body by using her hands to spread the force. This time, there was no pause for any victory dance, instead moving directly to the edge of the roof. Holding her rifle by the barrel's tip, she leaned over the edge and used the stock to knock on the window below her. Here we go, people, said Nate into the radio. Stand by. As a cruel joke, Mama interred Mace with the six captive women. Naturally, they shied from him, clustering together in one corner of the room. But over the course of the previous day and night, an uneasy truce formed. Mace had never been party to their torment and spent his time apologizing profusely, his inability to protect them from the nomad savagery clearly a weight on him. Gradually they relaxed, though they remained separate. A light knocking on the window startled him from miserable thoughts, and he blinked twice in disbelief. Holding the barrel of a rifle, leaning over the roof so her head and torso were visible, was a dark-haired woman, her long locks tied back in a tight ponytail which hung below her upturned head. What the fuck? he muttered to himself. How the fuck did you get up there? Moving to the window, he opened it. Well, said the woman in a soft tone, 
this is a turn up for the books. Do the nomads like to swing both ways? I thought there were only women in here. Mace was not really sure how to answer such a bizarre opening. Um, no. Who are you and how the... Shh, she said, finger to her lips. Less talky, more opening the window and backing the fuck up. There's a good dickhead. Still bewildered by the odd woman's appearance and manner of speech, he obeyed, opening the window wide and stepping back. A moment later, the small woman, rifle now strapped tightly to her back, lowered herself from the roof's overhang until dangling from only her fingertips. With fluid grace, she swung her legs forward and back to gain momentum, then swung forward once more, releasing her grip to fling herself feet first through the open window, landing deftly inside the classroom with hardly a sound. Jesus, you've got some balls, observed Mace, leaning out the window to gape at the concrete fifty feet below. Ovaries of stone, homeboy. She shrugged, accent clipped by a hint of Liverpool dialect that sparked recognition. Now, who the fuck are you? Her voice remained low. He's one of them, said one woman in a small voice. Like a gunslinger of the Old West, the glock at the woman's hip was out in a flash as she moved two paces back, his eyes inevitably drawn to the yawning barrel staring back at him. Her once cheery disposition was replaced by a bleak menace. Whoa, he hissed, hands up and out to placate her. There's a fucking reason I'm in here. You're lucky, right? The dark-haired woman nodded. Physically, she wasn't classically attractive, maybe even a little plain in Mace's estimation. But there was a quality to her presence that made her attractive, just like Isaac said. Dark brown eyes regarding him beneath a furrowed brow demanded answers. Look, I'm here because I've been trying to help your buddy, Isaac. They've set him up in their twisted tower game. So he's a lifer now. I know what you might think of me, but honestly, me and my buddy are outnumbered and Carol's got all the little shits wrapped around her finger. Me and Dong have never touched any of these women. They can at least confirm that, right? He looked to the six women, begging for their mercy. In fairness, he's telling the truth, Lucy confirmed, the strongest and de facto leader of the six women. He and his big friend never touched us, and I have heard Mace here arguing against it. The doctor, Emma, said as much as well. He and his friend are the only two with any good in them, I reckon. Lockie remained staring for a moment, her expression still hard. Still could have done something, she said. Mace shrugged. Mate, there's about 35 of the little scrotums, and there's me and Dong. There's only so much two men can do. So we've done what we can. She stared at him for a moment longer, then holstered the pistol, snorting a quiet laugh. When all this is over, you're going to tell me why your mate is called Dong. That sounds like a story. Mace blew out his cheeks in relief. Deal, but I warn you, it's pretty fucking boring. Lockie hit him with a genuine smile then, and Mace instantly understood why Isaac was so taken with her. When she smiled, her whole being illuminated. Her features were no longer plain, but fierce and striking. You get all that, she said, the question catching Mace off guard. All what? asked Mace. Lockie held a finger up to her lips, shushing him, and he noticed the earpiece for the first time. Hot mic, said Lockie eventually, just so my people know what's what and can hear this conversation. Okay, how many are outside the door? Only two in the corridor. Two stairwells lead down from the long corridor on this floor, one dickhead stationed at each. Carol's pulled most of the guard to the entrances, her quarters at the library, and guarding the ways to your mate in the gymnasium where the tower is. Lockie frowned. Tower? What tower? Mace gave her a brief explanation of Carol's twisted game to entertain her minions, and Lockie's obvious disgust poured out. What kind of fucked up shit is that? She hissed in horrified disbelief. 
Jesus fucking Christ, pal. That is some twisted shit. Mace spread his hands apologetically. Oh no. When I found out they'd put Isaac on the tower, my challenge to Carol was hard. And here I am. Lockie listened to her radio for a second, nodding. If we got all the captives unlocked up here and took out those two fuck nuggets, could you get everyone out of the building? Mace nodded. There's a fire exit at the bottom of the stairs nearest our door. It leads out this side of the building, he said, pointing to the front-facing window Lockie entered through. It'll only take a second to clear the internal barricade with so many hands. Hear that, Nate? You'll be able to see them come out. She listened to the response, nodding at the instructions before looking back to Mace. I'm putting serious faith in you, buddy. We're going to take out your Bert and Ernie outside the doors. Then you're going to get all the hostages out and head straight across there to that house. She pointed at a semi-detached house facing the college. Number 83 that has the top window open a smidge. The house is safe, so you keep everyone there till we're done, yeah? Understood. I swear, you pull a fast one and betray us. Hell hath no fury like a lucky lied to. I'll give you a gunpowder vasectomy. I like my balls where they are, so no worries there from me. Lucky grinned again, and Mace once more was struck by the illuminating smile. So, let's seal this unholy alliance. I'm Erin Locke, and as you know, my friends call me Lucky. Tommy Mason. Friends call me Mace. yippee ki yay Mace, she said, her smile infectious. Let's fuck some shit up. Mace knocked urgently on the door. Denny, he called. Denny, one of the girls has collapsed. Denny! You better not be fucking about, Mace warned a voice beyond the door. For fuck's sake, Denny, come and check and then get Doc Emma. I'll back up right away from the door. We all will. Hands on show. Back up, cautioned Denny, his warning accompanied by the audible jangle of keys. The lock clicked, the door creaking open, Denny's small pistol peeking ahead of him through the gap. Satisfied Mace and the other five women were sufficiently backed up, his eyes moved to the motionless woman, face down in the middle of the floor. Ah, oh, shit, he muttered, stepping into the room. Denny froze as the barrel of a Glock appeared from behind the door, the weapon cold against the skin of his neck. Welcome to the party, pal, whispered a woman's voice. Mace grinned as he relieved Denny of his revolver. Call your buddy ordered Mace quietly. And don't try anything, as I don't fancy that woman painting me with your brains. Ho, 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 breathed Lockie with quiet menace. Lenny, shouted the prisoner. Give us a hand in here, would you? Fuck's sake, Den, came the huffed response. Lockie leaned out from behind Denny and raised an eyebrow at Mace, childish amusement painted on her features. Denny and Lenny, she snorted. Are you having a laugh? Denny and Lenny, really? Mace spread his hands. Don't fucking ask, okay? He stepped past the terrified Denny to wait just inside the door. I've got this one, he said, switching the revolver to his left hand. The voice was almost to the door. Seriously, Den, what the fu- Lenny's sentence remained unfinished. As he appeared in the doorway, Mace took a giant step forward as he came into sight, unleashing a ferocious right jab that smashed Delenny's jaw and teeth like a battering ram. He hit the ground faster than a brained zombie and lay still. As he grabbed Delenny's ankles and dragged the unconscious man into the room, Lucky's mouth dropped open. Holy shit, she coughed. Not just Mace from your surname then. His face is all wonky like a Picasso. Shit, man, he looks like he's been kicked in the face by a horse. What about him? Asked Mace, gesturing to Denny. Ah, Lucky slipped the gun into its holster and took a step back. By all means, age before beauty. After you. Denny tried to throw his hands up and beg for mercy, 
but Mace's right hand hit him in a sweeping hook with an audible crack. Denny spun a full circle before his unconscious body slammed into the floor. I could watch that shit all day, murmured Lockie. Okay then, game face on. You get their keys and get everyone out of the locked rooms. She clicked the mic. Stand by, Nate. Give us two minutes from now, then start the show. Nate counted steadily down, scope fixed to his first target, and opened the mic at the end of the count. Firing in three, two, one, fire. The rifle boomed in the confines of the bedroom, the round smashing through the first target's sternum. The second round was already screaming down range as the guards blanched at the sudden thunder. A second man folded before they could even voice their fear, crumpling as the high-velocity round smashed a fist-sized hole in his back as it ravaged his body. The semi-automatic rifle reaped another soul as the two survivors started to run, obliterating a man's spine. As the last survivor reached cover from Nate's wrath, the fire exit facing the Marine opened and a stream of people rushed from the building. Simultaneously, Alicia and Elijah flanked Dean in a narrow wedge as they advanced towards the entrance at an oblique angle to the quivering sentry. His precious cover was useless against the three rifles advancing on him at his flank, and Dean's rifle barked twice, double tapping the exposed guard in chest and head. Nate nodded in approval as Dean expertly guided his two other fire team members over the comms. Even as contact was called on entering the building and gunfire exchanged, Dean's voice never wavered, calmly issuing orders to the others in a clear, steady tone. Nate's respect for the police sergeant soared as the three disappeared from view inside the building. With no other external targets, Nate collapsed the bipod, placed the rifle back in its case, and closed the lid. Sweeping up the L-85, he flung the strap over his shoulder, rifle ready across his chest, and exited the house to meet the first refugees outside. In the house now, he ordered, waving them past. Heads down and wait for us. Go, go, go. Nate grabbed the man he assumed was Mace by the arm as he passed. He had an eye for spotting fighters. Touch the rifle in there. Mace raised his hand. I'll sit on my hands, big man. Just go help your girl. Nate smirked and moved towards the college, gunfire echoing inside the building from two locations. Dean's fire team didn't need Nate's support. He was Erin's shield, so the old Marine sprinted across the road and into the campus, heading straight for the open fire door at the front. Nate followed the echo of Erin's rifle exchanging fire with booming shotguns somewhere in one of the corridors. The number of doors on the walls sent his senses into overdrive, but there was no time for door-to-door -door clearance. According to Mace's expectation, the nomads would cluster in groups defending key points with numbers, rather than spread out in ambush. With no time to clear every room and door, he stalked centrally through corridors, rifle up as he followed the thunder of Erin's exchange. He found her crouched at a corner, swapping out a magazine as plaster puffed off the wall opposite her. She grinned as he appeared, pleased to see him. Situation, he asked. There's five of them blocking the other end of this hallway. According to Mace, this is the only way to the sports building and gym, she replied. I need to get to Isaac as a priority. A wicked grin of satisfaction split her youthful features. There were seven to begin with. Nate winked. That's my girl. How are they shooting? Staggered. Erin shook her head. Like the amateurs they are, all unloading in a panicked frenzy. Most of them are clicking dry about the same time. Capacity three weapons and small six shooters. I bet they're slow reloaders too. You full? Lucky and loaded, she replied with a grin. Fingers and ears then. Get ready to advance and put them down. I've got one left. Nate held up a flashbang with a grin. Erin beamed. Yeah, baby, bring the thunder. Nate chuckled and peered round the corner to check distance. 
The corridor ended in a junction with hallways leading left and right, shooters hiding behind each corner. With a wall directly behind them, there was no chance of the flashbang overshooting. Ready in three, two, one. Nate wrenched the pin and skidded the flashbang across the corridor's smooth floor to thump against the back wall. Cries of panic barely started as the monstrous detonation rattled the hallway, a thick cloud of dense smoke accompanying the explosion to fill the corridor's junction. Senses addled and overwhelmed by light and noise, the defenders struggled to focus, staggering half-blind in the confusion, coughing and spluttering as two vengeful figures, their steps in perfect harmony, phased through the clearing smoke with rifles up. Stalking down the hallway side by side, Nate and Erin squeezed off singular rounds in steady cracks, and all five remaining defenders were down in seconds. The two previously killed by Erin must have reanimated, forcing the remaining five to put them down. They lay in ragged ruin, heads devastated by point-blank shotgun blasts. The pair fired extra rounds into the heads of the fallen, ensuring no reanimating corpses were left in their wake, and Nate stayed close to Erin as she followed the directions given by Mace. As they entered the top viewing floor of the gymnasium, both stopped in horror as they absorbed Isaac's plight. Sat atop a ten-foot brick tower, his leg was bandaged with crimson stains showing through the dressing and looked like he'd suffered a ferocious beating. His face was awash with bruising, one eye almost swollen shut. Surrounding him on all sides were undead, arms hungrily grasping in silence towards him as he stared down into their mass. Isaac, shouted Erin, banging on the safety glass. His eyes lifted at the noise, the mass of undead turning to them, and his face lit up with hope. Fucking hell, Nate, there's shitloads of them, she cursed. Mace says the only way in and out is ahead, then down some stairs to a barricaded double door. We've got to get down there, bait the undead to us and gun them down. Copy that. They moved further along the upper level, spying the stairs down. But just as Erin neared, Nate's hand snaked out and dragged her aside. The crackling rattle of a machine pistol exploded from the base of the stairs, shredding the air where Erin stood only a second earlier. As they moved back to their cover, shotguns boomed in unison. Fuck, roared Erin as they backed up to their first position by the safety glass, a jutting wall for cover. Fuckity, fuck, fuck. No grenades left, Erin. Looks like they've put a heavier guard on the door, knowing we'll go for it. I'm gonna fuck this bitch up when I get my hands on her, promised Erin, her fury impotent and helpless. Let's at least try and thin the herd for Isaac. Without waiting for Nate to respond, Erin switched her rifle to burst and punched three rounds into the safety glass, then smashed the weakened panel out with the barrel of her rifle. Even in the midst of this awful situation, Nate twitched a proud grin at the move as she resisted the natural inclination to reverse the weapon and use the wider stock to break the glass. Always keep the barrel forward, just in case of any surprises, he taught her. No lesson he had to teach ever went unheeded. Well, this is a bit of a pickle you've got yourself in, she shouted to Isaac, voice echoing in the wide space of the gymnasium. He laughed, wincing at a stab of pain in his face. Did you get lost? I've been waiting for ages. Traffic was a nightmare. Total gridlock. Her relief at finding him alive was palpable. Hang fire. We're going to thin the herd. Isaac nodded, and Erin started firing single rounds down into the undead. With the glass safety panel removed, Isaac heard the conversation between the two as their voices carried in the space between Erin's shots. This is too slow, warned Nate, rifle pointing down the corridor to cover. And too fucking exposed. I'm not leaving here until he's safe warned Erin with stubborn finality. Those words lifted him more than she would ever know. Despite all his petulance and childish jealousy, she still came for him, point-blank refusing to leave without him. 
Just that single small exchange encapsulated Lockie and Nate's partnership. The old Marine urged caution, reason and logic driving him to protect her. Erin, however, was led by her heart, not her head. The flame burned hot and fierce, pushing back at the darkness and refusing to leave anyone in shadow, no matter the cost or risk to herself. From his vantage, Isaac saw how exposed she was shooting from that position, but she refused to let Nate dissuade her. She wouldn't leave until the undead threat around him was neutralized, then return in force with the rest of her team to clear out the living, blocking her path to him. From his vantage in the gymnasium, Isaac's attention was caught by the group of eight nomads creeping up the stairs, one with a machine pistol, the others with semi-automatic handguns and shotguns, edging to where they could shoot at Erin from cover. Incoming, he roared, pointing. Nate snatched Erin from the open panel in one strong arm, dragging her to cover just as a staggered barrage of fire whipped through the space Erin had been standing just a second earlier. No, she roared in defiance. Nate, we need to clear the undead. I'm not leaving him. Erin, we can circle back with Dean's team. Let's secure the rest of the building, deal with the others, then come back here in force. No, they'll kill him to spite us, screeched Erin. If we leave him now, that's it, Nate. We need to do something here and now. We're pinned, Erin. Our only way is back for now. You step to that open panel and you're a sitting duck. I'm not leaving. For the first time in all his life, Isaac felt no fear, a blanket of peace draping across his senses. For a moment, through the rotting slaughterhouse of the gymnasium, he swore he caught a brief scent of flowers. Erin didn't know just how right she was. The nomads had no intention of letting him live. One advantage to the undead's eerie silence was the nomad voices carrying beyond the door they were stationed behind while waiting for Erin's arrival. Brash and arrogant in everything they did, the thugs unwittingly revealed their strategy a day earlier as they postured. Mama says take the girl out when she comes for him. But if it looks like she's gonna get her little boyfriend out, then put him down. Either she goes down, or the geek does, to fuck her shit up. The following laughter, spite-filled and hateful, cut him deep and resigned him to his end. In his heart of hearts, however, he still clung to the hope Nate and Lockie might find a way. They always found a way. It's what they did. Now, though, Pinned, outgunned, and with no options left to push through the attackers, Lockie couldn't get to him. Worse, her overpowering need to save him would get her killed. Nate was right. There was no way she could take down the undead or the nomads guarding the staircase without exposing herself. Her impassioned refusal to abandon Isaac would be her end, as the nomads had no intention of letting her take Isaac alive. If they couldn't kill her, then they would kill him to spite her and break her spirit. With so many lives resting on hers, there was only one way to keep her safe. Picking up the small revolver and aligning the round with the barrel, Isaac stood. There was no pain from his injuries anymore. No fear. Just peace. She might not be able to save him, but just for once, he could save her. Lucky, he cried, his voice a booming echo in the gym. The crowd of undead turned their attention back to him, shuffling silently in his direction. She popped up on her toes, face barely peering from her covered position, set back from the window. For just a moment, her incessant struggle with Nate's immovable strength ceased. Save yourself and everyone else, he pleaded. There's no time. That face he loved creased into a frown, twisting in horror as she realized his intent as he raised the revolver. Isaac, don't you fucking dare, she screamed, struggling with Nate's iron grip. 
The old warrior was the only thing keeping her from leaping into a hailstorm of gunfire. I'm so sorry, he said, heartbroken, the barrel of the gun pressed to his temple. Again, for a moment, the brief scent of flowers touched his senses. Peace. It's the only way to keep you safe. Isaac, no, she screeched. Then, darkness. Nate's heart was hollow as the single gunshot echoed in the cavernous space of the gym. Erin's wild scream of grief shattered the following silence as Isaac toppled from the platform, his lifeless corpse tumbling into the mass of undead. With no life to take, the shambling monsters ignored the heavy thump of Isaac's body as it crashed limp to the bloodstained floor. No! Isaac! No! No! Erin shrieked and struggled in one strong arm, still desperate to get Isaac as the hurricane of her grief swept every shred of logic away, eyes streaming and throat raw from horrified screaming. He's gone, kid, Nate grunted, tight and breathless, as he struggled with the writhing woman. I'm sorry, but we've got to get out. Don't make his sacrifice in vain. Isaac! She cried again, her screaming collapsing into sobs. Isaac! Nate backed out through the doors, dragging Erin with him into the corridor beyond and safe from the sights of nomads waiting to gun them down. With Isaac's body no longer in her vision, Erin's heaving sobs dried, her grief mutating into white, hot rage. I'm going to kill that bitch! She hissed through her teeth, more venom and wrath in her voice than Nate had ever heard in his long life. From anyone. Eyes red and her cheeks streaked with tears, she swung her rifle up and thumbed the mic. Status Dean, she demanded, her usual light tone heavy with dark purpose. Mostly clear. Last group of about ten have barricaded the corridor in front of the library door. We've got them pinned but could use a little support. Alicia took a bullet from a revolver, but she's okay. Hit the vest, but might have cracked a rib. She's struggling a little. We're coming. We just have to find a route. Don't start the party without us. Copy that, acknowledged Dean. Split up, said Erin. I don't know the way to the library from here. One of us might be able to find it if we take these two corridors. We're not splitting up, said Nate firmly. You're not thinking straight. We go back out the fire exit I entered, work our way round outside to the main entrance where the others breached, and follow the brass breadcrumbs. Erin rounded on him. A gale of screams and shouts threatened to howl from her, but Nate was a silent mountain, unyielding and immovable. His defiant stance and granite expression blunted her rage, knowing it was one battle impossible to win. Nate was her shield and protector, and he wasn't letting her go anywhere alone while consumed by a bloody need for vengeance. She stared for a moment before releasing a shuddering breath as some of her heat cooled. Lead on. There's about ten of them behind the barricades, said Dean, as the two groups linked up, stacked at the end of a hallway junction. Round this corner to the right, the corridor runs for about 25 feet to a dead end, and the library door is on the right-hand wall. Erin nodded, and without a word, snatched one of the two flashbangs hanging from Dean's IOTV. Before anyone could react, she wrenched the pin free, stepped into the corridor, and launched the flashbang with all her might, smoothly stepping back behind the wall with fingers in her ears. Nate ground his teeth at her reckless exposure, fortunate they were little more than amateur thugs. Treading the waters of her stormy sea of grief, only vengeance could calm those crashing waves, and woe to those who stood in her path. A heartbeat after the detonation, Erin swung her rifle up, a bold combat walk stalking the center of the hall, single rounds whipping down the corridor like she was born to the trigger, squeezing with repeated tight control and discipline as she cut through the hapless defenders. Ruthless, efficient, never once hesitating in her advance, Erin blasted the thugs as they floundered. What the hell? 
huffed Dean, bewildered by Erin's furious lone assault. He looked to Nate for answers. Isaac didn't make it, he grunted. Stepping out behind Erin and gliding in her wake, Nate added his own fire in support as the two of them scythed through the helpless nomads. Oh, murmured Dean. Oh, God, no. With the battered defenders crushed beneath the weight of Erin's towering fury, the pair reached the barricade and pulled the makeshift blockade apart. Drawing her glock, Erin coldly put rounds into the head of every downed nomad, whether dead or dying. The lack of emotion, usually animating her features, her concern to Nate. Erin was not in her right mind. We're here, you fucking cunt, bellowed Erin through the door. I told you I was gonna get biblical on you, so make your peace with the devil, because I'm taking an eye for an eye, bitch. I take it your little boyfriend didn't make it then. Mama's graveled voice lacked any fear. If anything, she sounded amused. Nate's hand snaked to Erin's shoulder as she moved to burst through the door. No, kid, he whispered. That's what she wants. There'll be guns trained on the door waiting for it to twitch. I'm not fucking waiting, Nate. She grated, shoulders heaving with a desperate desire to avenge their fallen friend. Only Mama's blood could cool her boiling rage. They're amateurs, he said, twitchy. As soon as this door moves an inch, they'll all start blasting, mark my words. Now, stay to one side. Nate beckoned the others down the corridor. Give me that other flashbang. Dean complied. Stack up and be ready. Alicia, sit the fuck down, you look done. Everyone else against the wall and plug your ears. He fixed Erin with a cautionary gaze. You don't fucking move till I give the go order, you hear me? She nodded once. Erin, do you fucking hear me? Reason returned to her eyes, expression clearing as the force of his question broke through the gates of her rage. I hear you, Nate, she said softly, her voice calmer. I hear you. He stared at her for a moment, ensuring the armor of grief and fury was pierced, and nodded once. Weapons check. Everyone sounded they were good to go. Cover your ears, and nobody moves until my go signal. Copy? They all acknowledged the instruction, Erin included. Dropping to one knee beside one of the library's double doors, Nate placed his right hand low and gave the door a hard shove, pushing it inwards as he moved back behind the wall. As he expected, a wild barrage of fire sprayed the twitched doors. The blast of a machine pistol on full auto riddled the wood, and combined with multiple shotgun blasts, the cheap doors were virtually obliterated by the panicked deluge, as the thunder inside the library ceased, Nate primed the flashbang and tossed it unseen through a ragged hole in the doorway, hearing it bounce once on the hard floor before discharging. Go, 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 urged Nate, a second after the detonation, his rifle up. Plowing into the room with Erin alongside, Dean and Elijah followed as they formed a firing line inside the library, covering every angle as they advanced inwards, just as they had practiced. Stupefied by the flashbang's detonation, the nomads were shredded by gunfire as they stumbled and staggered, unable to defend against the furious assault. The eight men went down in seconds as the four shooters cut through them with consummate ease. Only Mama remained, still stunned by the blast, and Erin prowled towards the huge, white-haired matriarch with menacing intent, pressing the barrel of her rifle against the woman's temple. I told you I'd come for you, bitch, hissed Erin, little more than a breath. Still dazed, Mama barely registered Erin's words, but there was no mistaking the press of a hot barrel against her head, and she froze. Erin, Nate's voice echoed in the large open space of the library. You're not an executioner. This isn't you. She's unarmed, on her knees. The guys out there were enemy combatants that you had to put down, as they'd have died from their injuries anyway. This is different, Erin. This isn't you. 
She needs to fucking die, Nate. Erin's voice trembled, grief leaking back through the cracks in her rage. All her twisted fucking shit, everything she's done, what she made Isaac do. She's got to go, Nate. She's got to. Aye, he agreed in a soothing voice. But not like this, Erin. You pull that trigger like this, you'll lose something. And it's something you'll never get back, trust me on that. Don't let her win like this. Not like this, Erin. Tears streamed down her cheeks, bottom lip quivering, shoulders rising and falling as Erin struggled with the assault of sorrow and wrath battering her heart. Tension gripped the air, all eyes on the diminutive woman standing above the kneeling elder, rifle barrel pressed to the white-haired head beneath her, finger quivering over the trigger. Nate released a slow exhale of relief as Erin sagged, stepping away and moving the barrel from Mama's temple. I won't be like them, she said, likely for herself rather than anyone in the room. I can't be like them. I have to be better. Nate nodded and slung his rifle behind him. Stepping beside her, he placed a reassuring hand on Erin's shoulder and squeezed gently. Yes, kid, you do, he smiled. And that's why you have me. In one smooth draw and fire, Nate smashed around from the Glock through Mama's skull before anyone could react. Cold-blooded murder would lessen her light, but him? Just one more black mark in a life of violence, but one to save Erin's soul. He could live with it. I don't just watch your back, Erin, he said as she stared in shock at the woman's corpse. I'll protect you from more than just the living and the dead. Sometimes you need protecting from this. He tapped his left fist above her heart as the right holstered the Glock once more. It's your greatest strength and your most potent weakness that the dark will target. As soon as you start killing in cold blood, you'll lose what light you've got left. I couldn't bear to see that. I won't let that happen. We need that light, Erin. We all need it. Erin stared with red eyes, the quiver in her lip greater with each word he spoke. I stopped fighting my demons when you let them in, showing me how much stronger than them I could be. He twitched a wry grin. Now my demons are on our side. Erin snorted, a coughing sound that was half laugh, half sob, before the dam finally broke. Wrapping his arm around her, Nate drew the small woman to his chest as her tears flowed in earnest, grieving for another fallen friend. December 25th, 2010. Fuck Christmas. I'm drunk, Freya. Not a one eye north, one eye south level of drunk, but enough to take the edge off. Edge off what, you ask? Why, that would be my grief, my lovely Freya. Isaac died today. No, wait. That's not right. That doesn't sound right. It's too mundane, too ordinary. It was more than that. No. Today, Isaac sacrificed himself. For me. I can't write this yet. I thought I could, but I'm just not ready. I'm burned out, empty, hollow, again. Hey, lucky, how would you like a dead friend that all you did was talk shit about for the last few weeks? Here's an extra sack of guilt as a bonus gift. Merry fucking Christmas. December 28th. 2010. The Raid. 
I'm going to have to power through this. It won't be as stylishly detailed as I usually do, as it's just so fucking raw right now. The last few days have been blurred by tears and grief and sorrow and... Sigh. I need to get this down now before the details start getting hazy. Sometimes having such a good memory is a curse, though, because you remember pain in all its agonizing detail. In the early hours of Christmas morning, Nate set up his new sniper rifle back from the upper floor window of our little operating base, while I made a circuitous route through a housing estate to reach the rear of the college. Dean, Alicia and Eli were escort for part of the way until they reached their staging point. Then I was off on my own. The early part was easy, and I soon made it to the chimney between buildings, sucked up my courage and split-wedged my way to the top without fault. After a little victory dance of relief and a stern warning to get a move on from Nate over the radio, I gave him a wave and then made the jump to the roof of the building I intended to infiltrate. When I leaned over the edge and tapped on the window with my rifle, what I wasn't expecting to see was a man. I'd specifically gone for the room with the six pretty women provided as unwilling entertainment for the nomad wankers. Turns out the guy's name is Tommy Mason, but everyone calls him Mace and was a rebel against Mama's rule. He was an original patched member of the nomads before the apocalypse rained its shit down on us all and not one of the chavs playing gangster. In his early thirties, maybe, Mace is tall, has a sort of dirty blonde hair and beard, and quite a rugged looker now I've seen him showered and tidied up. He punches like a fucking jackhammer as well, with something of a history in boxing. Once the girls confirmed he hadn't been involved in their ill treatment, I got the lowdown on the situation from Mace, and we devised a plan to get all the captives out. One less thing to worry about, and let us concentrate on finding Isaac. Writing his name set me off just now. You don't notice any difference, Freya. No time passed for you reading this. But the truth is, I wrote his name and had to stop for 20 minutes while I sobbed my fucking heart out again and worked to pull my shit together. Mace baited the first sentry in, with one of the girls lying face down, feigning a collapse. And as the sentry entered the room, I slid from behind the door and pressed my glock against the back of his neck. When the guard appeared at the door, I witnessed the reason for Mace's twofold name firsthand. He straight-armed the guy, Lenny, in the face, with the most ferocious fucking punch I have ever witnessed. Bone and teeth just smashed, and Lenny went down like he'd been hit by a runaway train. I've done mixed martial arts for many years, as you know, but only to an amateur personal defense level. But holy mother of mercy, the technique and power in Mace's jab was off the fucking chart. I wouldn't be surprised if he could brain a zombie with a punch like that. Unbelievable. It was like Mickey One Punch O'Neill the character from Snatch played by Brad Pitt. Bang. Night, night. He did it again when we needed to put the second guard's lights out on the quiet, and I stepped back to let Mace have the honors. This time he whipped round a short right hook from the hip. Even with a short swing, the poor dickhead spun a full 360 before he hit the ground like a sack of shit. Honestly, Mace's punch is like a magic trick. You're awake. Abracadabra, and now you're not. I gave Nate two minutes before starting the show as Mace took the keys, unlocking the other three classrooms, ushering everyone out and down some stairs to the fire exit we cleared. We left the two unconscious bellends locked up in the classroom. Honestly, they might even still be there. I can't remember anyone dealing with them. Some things are hazy as hell at the minute. Mace gave me directions to the gymnasium, and then as Nate's final count came over the radio, I wished everyone luck. Three booms from Nate sounded in rapid succession. 
At the first shot, Mace pushed down the bar and everyone flooded towards the house. As Mace left, he asked me to look out for his mate, Dong, who wasn't an enemy. We couldn't miss him, he said, as he was over six and a half feet in height. Once they were gone, I started my walk through the corridors, rifle up, listening to Dean's smooth instructions to Alicia and Elijah in my earpiece. Man, he's so damn calm when under fire. We're lucky to have him. I got to the end of a corridor where Mace warned there would likely be resistance, and his intel was spot on. Peering round a corner, I managed to get the jump on a group waiting at the end of the corridor. I sent one round down the hall into a thug's ribs before they reacted, then had to dive behind my wall as return fire came in a hurricane. The dumb shits were all unloading, so I flicked my rifle to burst and leaned round as they all clicked dry. The first three-round burst raked up one moron, but the next few just suppressed them. I needed them to know I had some serious firepower, because I knew as soon as Dean's team breached, Nate would enter via the open fire exit and just follow the thunder until he found me. When he did, I was just swapping out my first magazine. Remember those two flashbangs Nate possessed when we assaulted Bancroft? He only used one. He'd brought the other one with him and slid it down the hall where it detonated, allowing the two of us to just walk through the idiots and put them down. Then, we arrived at the gym. Mace had already prepared me, but it was still fucking twisted to see it. Isaac sat on top of a brick tower in the middle of the big open space, about ten feet up, with about seventy or eighty zombies grasping at him. Other bodies were scattered throughout the gym, having been put to final rest for whatever reason, but they were in varying states of decomposition. Dried blood and gore smeared the walls and floor. Horrific, like something out of a horror movie. And Isaac had been sitting in that festering charnel house for over a day. He lit up when he saw us. But when we tried to get to the gym's only viable entrance, eight heavily armed goons at the base of the steps opened up on us, with my fuck for brains mate fugly at their head. With no other explosives left, trying to walk down those steps would have been suicide. If it wasn't for Nate's quick reaction, I might have been perforated by one of those damn machine pistols from the off. Unable to get down the stairs, I shot out one of the clear safety panels on the viewing level so I could talk to Isaac and start popping undead melons. Nate didn't like it one bit, saying we were too exposed and we could circle and come back. I, however, was convinced if we left Isaac then, they'd have killed him just to spite us, or for some twisted fun. That's the kind of fuck-up Mama was. Isaac called out a warning we had incoming, his vantage of the whole level much wider, and again Nate reacted to save my bacon, dragging me back just as more fire came down the corridor at us. I don't know what happened to me. I just lost it. I was so convinced that we had to get Isaac out now that I wasn't listening to Nate's life-saving logic. I was defiant, refusing to leave Isaac alone in that gym, surrounded by undead. I'd be dead for sure without his vigilance. Then, Isaac called out my name. I peered up, stopping my struggle with Nate's arm of granite coiled round my waist for a moment, and went up on my toes, so I could see him. Save yourself, there's no time, or something like that. Like I said, hazy. I frowned and was about to pour scorn over his noble intentions, then saw the rising revolver in his hand. Some of the victims forced to play the twisted endurance game were given a 38 with a single round, apparently. The nomads bet on whether the poor fucker on the tower would use the bullet on themselves. Isaac was standing on the tower, a really strange look on his face. Never a truly courageous man, Isaac did his best, but lost his cool easily in stressful situations. Some of us just aren't cut out for high stress levels, 
though he was off the chart heroic in pushing Sarah to safety at his own expense. We all deal with it in our own way. But there was no fear on his face at all. He seemed... I don't know. He seemed like he was resolved to it. At peace with it. I fucking wasn't, though. Don't you fucking dare, I screamed, realising his intent. Panic and terror clouded everything else as he pressed that gun to his temple. I'm sorry, he said with a smile of such heart-shattering regret. But it's the only way to keep you safe. God damn him. But he didn't even hesitate, and I screamed in horror as his lifeless body toppled from the tower and thumped to the floor, ignored by the shambling dead. I don't remember a great deal of what happened for a time then. Horror, disbelief and grief blinded me, and I just remember screaming and struggling, Nate trying to calm me, his grip like iron preventing me from wandering out into the nomad cone of fire. He eventually managed to manhandle me through the doors and out of the gym building. Once Isaac's body was out of my sight, the crushing fist of grief in my guts opened, the emptiness inside filling with rage as hot as the heart of a star. Frightening, now I look back and reflect. I'm an emotional sod, but it was like every emotion I've ever felt in my entire life, all forged into one blinding streak of fury. It was like I was detached from my body and I'd just become an elemental of pure, undiluted rage. The only thought in my head was the bitch responsible as I demanded an update from Dean. Nate cut through that rage after I demanded we split up to find a route. He wouldn't be moved and I can get a lot around Nate most days, but in that moment, even blinded by fury, he was a rock and a hard place at the same time, and I didn't fancy getting caught in the middle. Never split the party. Golden rule. When we finally located them, Alicia's vest was off and cast aside, her face twisted in pain. On their advance through the college, she'd taken a thirty-eight to the torso. The vest stopped the bullet killing her, but Eli says it's cracked a rib for sure. She's okay, but she's been sore as hell these past few days. Cracked ribs are a royal bummer. I've had a couple in my time from falls or fights. There's nothing you can do except be careful, strap them up and wait them out. Every breath is agony, never mind trying any form of activity. God help you if you need to sneeze. It's like getting hit in the torso with a sledgehammer. Dean gave us the quick lowdown on the situation. Makeshift barricades made from metal cupboards and heavy wooden tables were erected at the end of the corridor in front of the library door. Without any clear thought or good sense, I unhooked one of the two flashbangs attached to Dean's heavy tactical vest and stepped brazenly out as I wrenched the pin and launched the grenade like I was hurling a cricket ball back from the boundary. I was lucky the amateurs weren't really prepared or expecting someone to be so bloody stupid. Luck is clearly one of my things, because I should be dead. Anyone with any kind of sense would have fired, not gaped, at the woman with no raised weapon stepping into the corridor. They didn't fire, though, and I stepped back round the corner, ramming my fingers in my ears. The moment it detonated, my rifle was up, and I just started walking and firing. Nate joined me seconds later, and between the two of us, we put them all down. Unsighted, unhearing, and utterly defenceless, it was just too damn easy. I drew my Glock as we tore the barricade open, putting a round in the head of every one of them, whether dead or dying. I didn't want any rising undead getting in the way of my vengeance. I was ready to breach like an enraged lunatic when Mama baited me with Isaac's demise through the door. But once again, Nate stopped me, taking calm control. He switched it round, baiting them with a twitch of the door. On edge, the armed thugs blasted everything they had while we waited either side of the door, 
Then Nate tossed Dean's second flashbang through a splintered hole, disabling any further defense. Alicia remained outside, struggling as she was, but the four of us breached like avenging angels and gunned the last eight nomad defenders down, ensuring all of them were headshot to prevent reanimation. Mama was on her knees, overwhelmed by the flashbang and subsequent violence of action as the four of us stormed into the room and blasted her defenders to meet. You don't see many obese people six months into an apocalypse. So far, I've only known five chubby apocalypse folk, and Mama was all five of them. She was the stereotype for every yo mama joke ever conceived. Seriously, with her white witchy hair and a face like a smashed crab, she resembled something that should be living under a bridge, demanding answers to riddles for those wanting to cross. I was ready to execute her. She deserved to die, and I pressed the barrel of my rifle against her head. Even though dazed and confused, when that hot metal pressed against her, she froze solid. I told you I'd come for you, bitch. It didn't even sound like my voice. It was like I was hearing someone else say the words. Someone harder. Someone meaner. I was lost, Freya. Adrift on a sea of grief and rage and heartbreak with no sight of land. The only thing that stopped me was Nate's calming voice, though I can't remember everything he said. I think I trembled about her having to go, and Nate said something like, don't let her win like this, or something. I know he said, this isn't you, Erin. I was on the verge of just saying, fuck you all, and squeezing that trigger. It would have been so easy. But Isaac's words haunted me. Save yourself. If I pulled the trigger then, if I executed the bitch in cold blood, even despite all the awful shit she's done to people, how can I say I want something better? I'll kill to defend those I care about, and to defend those who can't defend themselves. But if I just stand here and execute this evil bitch in cold blood, does the flame die with me? Is this a test that shithead hoped I'd fail? Would I give Captain Evil his final satisfaction in dousing that flame of hope with yet more guilt and remorse? Would it be the first step out of the light and into the dark? Then, Nate's words. This isn't you, Erin. The one person beside me since all this began who feared I'd hate him for his past mistakes. He's a new man now. He's better, stronger, more caring and more open. With his darkest truth accepted and forgiven, he's started on the road to forgiving himself. I couldn't disappoint Nate. Anyone but Nate. Hallow with the rifle, taking a step back. I won't be like them, I said for myself and for Nate. I can't be like them. I have to be better. Nate's hand reached to my shoulder, squeezing it in reassurance. Yes, kid, you do. And that's why you have me. I jumped as Nate's pistol appeared in his hand, and without hesitation, he executed Mama for her crimes. Once again, Nate took away my burden and did what had to be done. He didn't do it because Mama deserved it, though. He did it, so I didn't have to. I remember everything that he said next, though, as the gunshot shocked me back into focus. I don't just watch your back, Erin. I'll protect you from more than just the living and the dead. Sometimes you need protecting from this. He tapped a lightly clenched fist over my heart. It's your biggest strength and your most potent weakness. 
As soon as you start killing in cold blood, you'll lose what light you've got left. I couldn't bear to see that. I won't let that happen. His voice turned iron then. We need that light, Erin. We all need it. That did it. I broke. The grief came flooding back, yet at the same time, those tears were of gratitude. Gratitude for Nate. He understands me like nobody else, stands right at my shoulder through everything, for good or ill. Whether it's dragging me out of a bullet-riddled hallway or stopping me becoming a cold-blooded killer, Nate is there, protecting me from everything. Protecting me even from myself. I love that big dumb planet head so much. Stick a fork in me, I'm done. This was hard writing, hard to relive in the telling. I'll loop back round when I can and talk about the new people and the aftermath of the raid. I'm a royal fucking mess at the moment and struggling to function. I hope you find peace, Isaac. I'm sorry I was such a dick to you. What you did was unbelievably selfless, because I know you gave your life to protect mine, and a debt like that can never be repaid. I'll just have to try, in everything I do, to ensure your heroic sacrifice was not in vain. I'll try to be worthy of the gift you gave me. Shit. I really am done now. Part Two The Faith December 29th, 2010 Sanctuary I was a mess yesterday. After I finished writing, I tried to numb the pain with bourbon again. Instead, all I managed to achieve was make myself spectacularly maudlin. I found myself going next door to the small staff house where Elijah and Theodore live. It was dark and cold, and I didn't know what the hell I was even doing there as I knocked. Even as Elijah opened the door, rubbing at his eyes, I said nothing, just stood there. He knew something was off, saying nothing and just taking my hand to draw me inside. A half bottle of booze swung limply in the other hand, and Eli took it gently from me, setting it down, and led me upstairs to his room. I didn't resist. I was just numb. Grief, guilt, and anger had burned me dry. I was a dazed, empty vessel, with no fucking clue as to why I was knocking at his door, barefoot in the dark winter night, wearing only an old tee and the three-quarter length shorts I slept in. Elijah guided me into his bed, and I lay down on my side, staring at the wall, not seeing him at all. Still without a word spoken, he slid in beside me, covered us both, then his arm wrapped over me from behind and pulled me into him, warming my shivering form with his body. Nothing else, Freya. No advances, no whispered honeyed words. Recognizing I was lost, cold, and feeling terribly alone in a procession of simplest, wordless actions, Elijah gave me sanctuary, gave me his warmth, and showed me I wasn't alone. He was just there. I didn't know what I wanted when I knocked on his door. I know it wasn't sex. I didn't feel the need to reaffirm life as some might when grieving traumatic loss. This morning, now my head's a little clearer, I guess I was just scared to be alone with my guilt. The tragedy of the Willow Park deaths, the injuries to our people when Isaac was taken, and the tipping point of Isaac's sacrifice were finally too much weight to bear. For just one night, I wanted someone to take it from me, to feel safe, protected. On some deep subconscious level, Elijah was the one I was drawn to. 
People look to me now, with all this flame of hope business, and I can feel that pressure building. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with it. There's no clear instruction of what comes next. I'm making it all up on the fly. What I do know, however, is that people have expectations now. Even if they're not fully convinced by the whole weird notion, it still feels like they expect me to confirm it somehow through words or actions, like it's my role to convince them of the truth and the burden of proof is mine. I haven't got a damn clue what I'm supposed to do or say. It feels like I can't let anyone see me weak and only strength is allowed in the light. If I want tears to fall, they have to be spilled in the dark. It's a lonely place to be, and a scary one. Eli just seemed to know what I needed last night. No words, no need to talk, just a comforting presence holding me until I fell asleep. Seriously, it was the best night of sleep I've had in a long fucking time. When I awoke this morning, Eli remained unobtrusive. He didn't mention the previous night or press me for any reasons. Instead, he just made me a coffee in the morning and we sat at his little table chatting comfortable small talk while Theodore scribbled away on one of his drawings. He's just so easy to be around. Just as I was about to leave, I turned and hugged him, whispering a quiet, thank you, before disappearing out the door. There's nothing quite as powerful as the gift of someone's presence when you need it the most, without expectation and freely given. Maybe that's what Nora and Maria meant when they bestowed their worldly advice on me. Relationships should be a sanctuary, not a battlefield, to quote Nora. And Maria's sage wisdom? In those times when one can't bear all the weight, the other carries their share for a while. Most importantly of all is that you never, ever keep score. Eli asked for nothing, expects nothing, and gave me more than he'll ever really know by being a sanctuary for me when I needed it the most. Nora said I'd just know. I'll never be sure, because I guard my heart like a lioness guards a cubs. But hell, as first auditions go, Eli smashed it. He didn't even make the morning after awkward. He's just so... calm. I don't know if you've noticed, Freya, but calm is not something I do very well. I'm not exaggerating when I say I'm all or nothing, laugh or cry. Honestly, I must be a nightmare to be in any kind of relationship with, which is probably why I've never found anything I'd consider worth holding on to. I imagine I'm a lot of effort. For the first time, though, I'm starting to think it's possible. December 31st, 2010 New Year, New Beginning Today marks the end of a truly shitty year. I'm not in a party mood at all, and nor is anyone else. Too much to do, too much fallout, too many new people to integrate and settle. And many of us are grieving, whether that's the Willow Park people or those of us who knew Isaac well. All I want this new year is for my friends to stop dying and the living to stop being fucking wankers to each other. I'm sick of the living killing each other. I'm sick of having to fight my fellow humans. The dead are everywhere, yet they've been relegated to little more than environmental hazards when we go beyond the gate, and just something we need to be vigilant of should one of our people keel over from natural causes. It's exhausting. I just want people to be safe and be decent human beings to each other. But it feels like we're always waiting for the next human threat instead of planning a war against the undead. That is the real fight. 
We've still got evil Jesus and his resurrectionists out there, and I just fucking know there's something coming with them. I just know it. I can't face an all-out war with them right now. They've got hundreds of people and probably a hundred active shooters. Any war would be costly as fuck for both sides, but mostly for us. Most of our experienced fighters are injured at the moment in some form, so we need to find a better way with those people. I can't face mass casualties in a costly and bloody war that will end up a Pyrrhic victory, where the cost of success is so high that we end up dying out anyway. Remember Fugly, the nomad bell end that thrust his crotch at me? Yeah, that little shit must have bailed. He's still out there, and I don't like that at all. When we went back to the gymnasium to clear out those eight nomads, they'd already scarpered. I'm thinking Fugly, who Mace tells me calls himself Bulldog, he is now truly nomadic with his little crew of shitheads from the gymnasium. I hope he gets fucking eaten by the dead, and I don't really wish that on anyone, as it adds to their number. I'm not saying I hate him, as I try not to hate. Hate is a road that leads to Captain Evil's dark place. I'm just saying I wouldn't be averse to Wolverine doing Fugly's prostate exam. Fuck Bulldog. I'm keeping Fugly. It suits him better. I like dogs, and I don't like Fugly one little bit. In the aftermath, we also found Mace's other good nomad friend that goes by the handle of Dong. When shit got real, Dong simply sequestered himself away in a classroom, and when it was all over, he surrendered with hands in the air and completely unarmed. Now, I expected the story of his nickname to be something spectacular. Mace warned me it was boring, and he wasn't wrong. Dong's real name is Richard Biggs. Dick Biggs. Thus, Big Dick. And finally, we arrive at Dong. It's still a hilarious name, and I have to try and not laugh every time I hear someone say, Dong's a big one, isn't he? I'll take whatever smiles I can get. Naturally, there's still a bit of suspicion around the two of them, especially as Dong is massive. Not gonna lie, I just sniggered writing that. At about six and a half feet, with the proportional width to go with it, Dong has an imposing presence. That time I straight up laughed aloud. I need to get past this. Twelve-year-old Lockie is in residence. Maybe my New Year resolution should be resisting all this immature sexual innuendo, but it's so hard. Okay, I really am done now. That was definitely the last one. The two of them are hovering on the fringes at the minute, but don't seem bitter about it. If anything, they expected it, so they're taking it in their stride. My instincts say these two aren't bad eggs, but they'll have to work to earn everyone's trust, with more visible effort than other new people might. I kind of like them. When Mace gave me the story of Dong's nickname, I blurted out, I've always wondered, how do you get Dick from Richard? Without missing a beat, Mace answered, Maybe ask him nicely. Damn it, but I needed a laugh at that moment. I like the guy. There's one major boon to liberating the 15 captives, other than actually saving them, obviously. Emma Newham is mid-forties and a fully qualified doctor. The amazing thing was a real small world moment. Doc Emma and our very own Maria Williams are friends. Emma often acted as the on-site consultant at Vale Infirmary where Maria worked, so the two know each other really well. Maria waxes lyrical about her, saying she's a top-draw medical professional and has worked in emergency rooms and able to perform life-saving surgeries when required. I can't tell you how happy that's made everyone. With a senior nurse practitioner, a trained first response combat medic, and now Doc Emma as a qualified trauma surgeon, we are stacked with medical skills. Crenshaw is a busy place now, and food is swiftly going to become an issue. 
Nora is planting ready for next year after turning some of the fields, but in the interim, we need to do some serious clearance over the next month or so. We're going to need two or more teams beyond the gate, acquire some larger vehicles, and load up with as much as we can put our hands on. With the 17 people from the Nomad Liberation, 15 captives plus Mace and Dong, the 21 survivors from Willow Park, and the 20 that already resided here at Crenshaw, well, count them up. That's 58 people here now. Crazy to think that it all started out with just the three of us, Freya. You, me, Nate, and of course my little dude, Particles. He's been awesome this past week, as my emotional support pug again. I feel shitty, because I withdraw when grief hits like this, and other people carry the weight. I should be more visible, but when I'm this low, I'm just terrible to be around. It's also compounded by being that time of the month and I feel rotten. My insides are cramping like a vice is crushing them, and my emotions, which aren't stable in the best of times, are absolutely all over the fucking place. Sometimes, my alone time is generally for the safety of others. It's a new year tomorrow. Hopefully a better one. I'll probably be writing at more distant intervals for a while. For the next few weeks, we're going to have to start on major resource acquisition to ensure this many people are fed, kept clean and healthy. With so many of our main shooters healing injuries, a lot of the responsibility for security is going to fall to the likes of me, Nate, Dean and Eli. Alicia's torso looks like it's been run over by a truck with all the bruising from being shot. Mace and Dong are keen to help, and both can shoot. Also, Dong is probably as strong as three people and will make short work of any physical labour. He was a bouncer before all the bullshit started, and I can't imagine many people carried on causing shit with Big Dong thrusting towards them. I'm getting my laughs where I can, Freya, no matter how childish. Definitely the last one, I promise. A lot of people are still nervous about them, but even the doc says the two were always respectful, with Mace forever apologising for all the shit while she was there. I think they're good, and will let them play for my acquisition team. My instincts are usually on point about people, and these two guys don't set off any alarms in my head. Our first point of call, however, needs to be Vale Infirmary, where Maria and our new doctor worked. It'll be an unholy mess of undead without doubt. Medical centres must have been ground zero for so much horror. Vale Infirmary isn't a hospital, more like a minor injuries clinic. The nearest hospitals are a good 15 miles away minimum, and there's no way we're going near Chester or Warrington. Way too heavily populated areas. The hospital over at Leighton is just a hell no. The place is massive, and I bet it's a special mini-apocalypse all of its own. Nope. No way. Vale Infirmary, however, Maria assures, will have plenty of medicine, dressings, supplies, equipment, and remember the desperate need for IV bags in the case of serious injuries. Uh-huh. With so many people here, we're going to have to take the ammo hit and clear it out. It's not a huge building, but I bet it got crowded as fuck on that day as people turned up with minor bite injuries. Shit, I bet it went to hell in no time at all. Maybe taking out a load of the undead instead of shooting asshole humans will help me work through my grief. Shit, I really hope so. Helping people instead of bloody fighting them is good for the soul and what we should be focused on. But Isaac's loss tainted it because we had to kill so many of those dickheads to do it. It was a very bloody Christmas, lacking goodwill to all men. For once, I'd like to feel I'm gaining a little victory over Captain Evil's bullshit, no matter how small that win might be. So I'm going on an undead hunt at Vale Infirmary in a day or two. A new year approaches. I hate all the new year, new me bullshit people used to say in those heady days before the dead were trying to kill us. The truth is, if you've got any real commitment to personal growth, we renew ourselves in little increments every day, 
as our experiences shape us. So, here's my New Year speech. Will I use my head instead of listening to my heart? Will I rein in my potty mouth? Will I stop sniggering at innuendo like a 12-year-old boy? Tune in next year for the new season of No, I probably fucking won't. January 2nd, 2011 Most heinous Today was a long day, Freya. We went to the infirmary, and holy shit, I said I wanted some catharsis, and boy did we get some. It was just good sense to take virtually every able-bodied shooter we could. Me, Nate, Dean, Elijah, Mark, Mace, Dong, and Maria. We needed Elijah and Maria because they're both combat-effective medics, so we could leave Doc Emma back at the school in case of any medical problems, and Maria knows Vale Infirmary intimately. On top of those solid shooters, Clyde came along to get more firing time with the shotgun, as he's sufficiently healed from his superficial buckshot wounds. Dean also brought along young Zane, who's been working with the pistol for about a month since his birthday, so our newly minted adult came along for live firing experience. Young Alex came along as well, not for firearms, but because he's apparently some kind of youth county champion archer. This caught me by surprise, so I asked him for a demo yesterday after the team was finalised. Holy shit, that kid is fire. He turned 16 a month ago and is a level-headed kid. Dean thought it would be good for him to get experience using the bow against actual undead, but in a safe environment surrounded by solid people. The school was big on archery in the old world and has loads of equipment, so he's not short of arrows, and it'll likely be a target-rich environment, as Nate puts it. Alicia tried to say she was fine and she'd just use the pistol, but Doc Emma completely overruled her. She's lovely as our new doctor, but Jesus, if you risk your health against medical advice, she is not shy of ripping you a new one. Alicia decided the battle of wills wasn't worth it. With 11 of us and a mix of weaponry, we opted to keep just the four of us on rifles. Me, Nate, Dean and Eli. We're absolutely stacked with shotgun ammo and don't use it much. While we're okay on 5.56 and 9mm for now, if we can control the environment and use up a massive 12-gauge we have, that's way better for our stores. Two big crates of 5.56 were stashed in Castle Bancroftstein, which gave us an initial haul of about 3,000 rounds. But we've burned through a bit of it, and quite frankly, we don't know if we'll ever be able to locate any more. 12-gauge will be easier to locate over time, I think, though easier is a relative term in the UK when it comes to anything firearms-related, but 5.56 and 9mm will be rarer than rocking horse shit in our little northern paradise. We rolled out in a number of vehicles, Humvee, Pickup, which I still want Clyde to pimp with armour so I can call it the Warthog, a couple of diesel SUVs from the Willow Park people, and the loader crane truck in the event we wanted to load any medical devices that could be useful back home. The infirmary is on a standard road through a part of town, away from the centre, and surrounded by a six-foot-high brick wall. We pulled all the vehicles aside to let Mark drive the loader truck towards the car park entrance, while the four of us with rifles cleared the immediate area of wandering undead outside the entrance. Once clear, we parked the loader truck across the open space to create a barrier, allowing us to contain and control the undead mass within the car park. It was fucking heaving with undead, well over a hundred just outside. Using the truck bed as an elevated firing position, we set to work. The undead shambled towards us and we set ourselves in a couple of lines along the truck's bed, firing staggered. When one line of shotguns was out, they stepped back and reloaded, while the next line of shooters moved forward to take their turn. Me and Eli pulled security at ground level behind the truck, keeping eyes on both directions of the road and the line of houses opposite the infirmary, 
ensuring we weren't prowled by sneaky undead outside the containment. With that much fire going off to clear the car park, we made a serious amount of noise and naturally drew other nearby undead. While me and Eli kept watch and took down any of those trying to sneak up, our two master mentors, Nate and Dean, did overwatch on the novice shooters to assess, help and tweak the technique of those on the truck bed. It was good experience for everyone and will help the group as a whole moving forward. Mace and Dong are solid shooters, as are Mark and Maria. Zane got solid time with the pistol and took it very seriously, as one should, and his confidence has notably increased. He did get a little too confident at one point until Nate spotted it and scared the shit out of his ass with that drill sergeant voice. You don't play at guns when Nate is nearby, because in verbal terms, he will rip you a new asshole, sew it up, and then rip it again until you start acting sensibly. Alex might get upgraded to a firearm, even though he's 16. Nate was seriously impressed with his level of composure, even going so far as to say, that kid has ice in his veins. Trust me on this, from Nate, that's praise of the highest magnitude. Even with the jarring thunder of all the guns going off around him, he was like Hawkeye with that bow of his. Smooth, unhurried, and accurate. When he's using that bow, he must zone out, seeing only the target. I don't think he can train that level of focus into someone, and probably explains why he was two-time youth champion in his age groups. He's one of those people who just has it, whatever it is. To use a firearm in the field, though, he'll have to learn awareness. You can't afford to zone out in a live situation because you'll have a zombie biting at your ass cheeks before you can say, Oh, matron. With the car park clear, I volunteered for the shitty job of opening the infirmary front door. I'm the fastest and most agile, a fact not up for debate. All the noise pulled the undead inside the building to the front door, drawn to the shattering thunder outside. The wooden entry doors push inwards, and the undead pressed from the opposite side against it, pushing out. There was no way those double doors were getting opened from my side, with so much undead press against them. So Nate suggested taking one of the six shell shotguns inside the little entry porch before those doors, and blast the frame from close range, optimizing the damage of the buckshots spread into tight areas. If I fired twice on where each hinge was, and twice where the door closer was screwed to the top above it, the heavy press of undead should just force through one side of the double doors, and then walk out into the car park in a nice, steady stream. It worked like a charm. I'm not as green as I used to be, so when I took a shotgun into that little corridor from the main external doors, about 12 feet in length, I plugged my ears. Shotguns are fucking monstrously loud anyway, but in tight confines like that entrance corridor, it's like sticking your head in a thundercloud. The door frame was utterly ruined by the time I fired the sixth blast. I got my motor running when it started collapsing, and the first undead stumbled through and hit the deck as the immovable door gave way. The urgent press of bloody bodies briefly stalled as they tangled with those at the front and fell on their face. Zombies don't put their hands out to arrest falls. They just fall, and I'm sick to my stomach from hearing them bite hard floors as they smash down. Breaking teeth at speed on hard surfaces is a truly awful sound, and one you can't escape when you have regular contact with the undead. It keeps resurfacing to haunt your memories. Gah, I'm shivering just writing about it again. That initial tangle did give me the chance to clear out safely, though. Tossing the shotgun back to Mace for reloading, I climbed up on the truck bed in readiness for the swarm. They started streaming out in a little line. Very British zombies, you see, as they'd all waited patiently in a queue to get out of that one collapsed doorway. Nate held everyone from firing immediately, ever teaching as he answered a few queries. Because if you shoot them all as they come out the door, they'll stack up in a small area and eventually the rear of the pack will get trapped again. 
We want them all out that can come out, so we've only got stragglers in rooms to deal with. Let them come to us as the others did and spread the fallen out over the larger space. Doesn't miss a trick, our Nate. It was a good two hours from our initial arrival before we were satisfied that no more undead were going to shuffle out of the main lobby, which Maria confirmed is the single communal space. Anything else inside the building would be trapped in rooms or corridors sealed by doors. The car park was a horror show. When you have to headshot everything to kill it, and you've mostly been using buckshot from close range, the area is like someone's gone mental in a slaughterhouse. Out came the gloves and face masks, and we all had to put our backs to moving a lot of ruined bodies so we could get the vehicles in for loading. Honestly, that job is way worse than actually putting down about 250 undead, which was the rough estimate. Breaking stuff is always an easier job than picking up the scattered pieces, but when those pieces are bloody chunks of former people, nasty doesn't even begin to cover it. PTSD incoming for some people, I bet. There were numerous vomits by many people, including myself. Let's not forget how odious the undead are, Freya. These are corpses that mostly pissed and shit themselves upon dying as bladders and bowels relax, and half of them had spent the summer months baking inside a building with other cadavers that were fully dead. All those head trauma corpses inside the infirmary had been rotting all this time. The smell and vileness of moving so many bodies was fucking gross. I thought that was bad enough. But once we moved inside the infirmary to clear it, Jesus, Mary and fucking Joseph. It was... Well, I'm not even sure... I can articulate the horror of that lobby's stench. Putrid, festering, and worst of all, old. Some people who didn't become undead after their demise had been rotting for half a year, and the battalion of undead had infused their miasma of death, decay, and outright taint into every square inch of that waiting room. The odour was so rank, it didn't just make your eyes water from the smell. It was a cloud of horror hanging in the air, assaulting the eyes like millions of tiny needles. The smell was so acrid, acidic and absolutely fucking rotten, it felt like it touched you. Icky. I'm overly dwelling on this point to try and give you some sense of how terrible it was in that infirmary. I mean... If that's what this minor injury clinic in a small town is like, can you imagine what a holocaust a major hospital must be? The emergency rooms on that first day must have been carnage on an epic scale. Nobody really had a clue what was happening. It was accelerating at ridiculous speed, everyone turning up with bites for treatment, mass triage, people dying from toxic bites in corridors, only to sit back up and start killing... Recently deceased people in wards reanimating and causing mayhem, and only God knows what other horrors. I am profoundly thankful it was Maria's day off on the 23rd of June. Doc Emma proved fortunate because of a dental checkup first thing in the morning, so was also off the rotor that day. Survivors escaping medical centres must have been few and far between if this minor infirmary is a yardstick to measure it by. Scaling it up to a major hospital, even to a smaller one, is a terrifying notion. After taking care of the masses and piling the human wreckage in a gory mound, clearing the rest of the small building was next on our to-do list. We had to pull masks and cloths round our faces just to move through the reception waiting area. That smell is embedded into the walls for all time, I think. We'd need a tsunami of bleach to clean that area, and stomachs of iron. The inner corridors beyond the main entrance were less traumatic. Pockets of undead still needed handling, but were easily managed with care and vigilance. The younger kids and green shooters didn't get involved in that bit, only those with some training or experience in building clearance. Moving into teams of three through separate double doors behind the waiting area, 
Me, Nate and Mace went one way, while Dean, Maria and Eli went the other. Mace isn't fully trained per se, so was just back up to the familiar machine of me and Nate, but he proved to be a steady shooter outside, and we needed to split our four most experienced shooters with one clearance novice each. Plus, I think Nate sees something in him and wanted to run a little test. The clearance was largely without serious incident as we moved solidly through the corridors, except for one eerie experience that I feel requires noting for historical purposes. Vale Infirmary is mostly one floor. There's no top level, but it does have a basement area. We cleared the whole corridor before the steps to the basement, then had Mace stand by the stairs down so Nate and I could go back to the end of the corridor and work through each closed door one at a time and clear the rooms. Zombies, after all, are secure if they're in a room with a closed door. Right? Mace was facing back down the corridor towards us, just as I emerged from clearing a room with Nate a step behind me. A door to Mace's right fucking opened, a rotted hand clasping the door's edge and pulling it open, just inches away from the former nomad. I screamed out a warning just as Mace caught the Zed in his peripheral vision and almost lost my shit as the thing lunged out of the room like a savage predator. Mace couldn't raise his pistol in time to fire, but his boxing reactions saved his bacon, just managing to get a meaty hand on the creature's throat and prevent it biting a chunk out of him. The momentum of its predatory lunge slammed Mace into the wall, though, knocking his balance to shit. Then both man and monster disappeared from view as they tumbled in a heap down the basement steps. I think I hit a decibel level of scream rarely achieved by humans. After all the recent injuries and deaths and Isaac's sacrifice still a raw and open wound, I couldn't face another loss so soon, especially in a situation we thought under control. Both Nate and I swept up the corridor as the blast of Mace's pistol cracked in the stairwell. As we reached the top, Mace was sat up on the small space halfway down the stairs, pushing the zombie off him and wincing. Are you okay? I panted, eyes on the gore covering him. Mace nodded, groaning, and put one hand to his side. I'm okay, he wheezed. Luckily, I think my bones broke my fall. A relieved laugh exploded out of me. Partly in relief he was okay, but mostly because I thought that was a fucking funny thing to say, given the situation. No bites, I urged, offering a hand to help him stand. Mace shook his head as he stood with a grunt. Nope. Kept my grip on its neck and when we landed, I managed to get my gun hand free and pop its noggin. I feel like I've been kicked by a racehorse, though. We escorted him back out and continued the clearance with just the two of us. Here's the weird thing, though, obviously apart from the door being opened. When Nate had a look at it, it wasn't even a proper door handle that could be pushed down by accident. It was a round doorknob that needed twisting. There's still the chance the thing reflexively gripped the knob and turned it. Yet when the door clicked, it clearly slid its fingers into the space between door and frame to actively pull it open. Even if twisting the doorknob was by accident, its natural brainless push forward should have pushed the door closed again. Those are two distinct and separate actions required to open a door. Both happening in sequence, by chance, are pretty fucking long odds. Zombies that can open doors. Well, that's a whole lot of fucking nope, thank you very much. It only happened that once. Dean's team reported nothing of the kind, despite finding other undead stragglers in the building. And Nate and I didn't experience anything like it after that. But even just happening once by a freak chance is too worrying for me. These days, I'm suspicious of anything being attributed to mere chance where these rotting, murderous monsters are concerned. Knowing Captain Evil played them as pawns before makes me all kinds of paranoid. Strange things are afoot at the Circle K, Freya. Most heinous. Other than Mace having the shit knocked out of him and needing a change of underpants, nobody else was injured and the building successfully cleared. We've used a serious amount of ammunition for this operation. 
but it was worth it. The place was full of good shit. I don't know what any of it is, but Maria and Elijah were like pigs in a poo trench once the place was cleared. Dressings, IV bags, consumables, medicines galore, syringes, sterile equipment, defibrillators, blood pressure and heart monitoring equipment. Just loads of stuff to set up a real clinic on campus. It took the second half of the day just to get it all packed up and loaded across the vehicles. Whatever equipment we could uninstall that wasn't too ridiculous, we loaded up on the truck. It was just going dark as we got back, and I'm absolutely bone-weary. Shower, write, and sleep is the order of this evening. Two of them are done, so it's just dreamland left to go. Tomorrow it's back to standard resource gathering, now the medical situation is vastly improved. There's a fuel run to a petrol station going on, and one team is finally clearing out that convenience store and the hair salon we intended to empty, the day Isaac was abducted. I think Ellie transforming us from a bunch of shaggy wookies into human-looking folk again might do everyone some good. I know I'll feel better once my manky hair has been trimmed much shorter. It'll certainly be easier to clean. It's way too long now, reaching three quarters down my back once I untie it. I've never had it this long, and sooner or later, I'm going to get it trapped in something, or a zombie's going to get a fistful of it. What's that, Freya? Talking about my hair is not a historical event worth noting in this apocalypse chronicle. We'll have to agree to disagree on that one, my lovely. I feel like shit, and if a tiny thing like tidying me up can give me a lift, then I'm taking it. Anyway... I'm too bloody tired to argue with a phantom. I'm going to bed. Still love you, though. January 7th, 2011. Lockie calling Earth. Please open up and swallow me. Busy few days. A fuel run, getting our new clinic and hair salon set up, building works and all that fun stuff. Too much to write in here, and I've said repeatedly I'm not a day-by-day -day detail person. I'm recording interesting events, not things I now class as business as usual. What I will say, however, is that surviving in a world without modern convenience is a metric fuckton of work on a daily basis. Everyone is doing their part, though, even the kids. I am bone-fucking-weary every night now. We aren't night owls here, Freya. There's too much to be done while the sun is up in these short winter days. So, once it's been dark a couple of hours, and we've had some wind-down time, it's lights out. I can't stay awake. However, the byproduct of work and a much leaner diet means those of us working are starting to get pretty ripped. I've always stayed physically fit with fight training and parkour, but holy shit, I'm the leanest, meanest, most ass-kicking machine I've ever been in my life. I've got two tickets to the gun show, baby. So, what fabulous event have I chosen to record in tonight's thrilling instalment, you ask? I'm glad you brought that up. Today, I got my hair cut. Okay, so you're probably thinking that's a bit of an anticlimax, but I can't tell you how much it's improved my mood. It's gone from three quarters down my back to rest lightly on my shoulders, and Ellie has thinned and lightened it to the point it feels like air. Good sense would say I should probably get it even shorter in a pixie cut or something, just because having long hair is a pain in the arse. But it's not me. Maybe in the future. We took everything out of that salon, including a shitload of hair dyes. So now I have shoulder-length hair again and, drum roll, please, my hair is fucking red. Not auburn or slight hint of red. I'm talking fire engine red. The colour of Liverpool Football Club kind of red. It's not just red. It's fucking red. I love it. So now I have flaming red shoulder-length hair twisted into a single tight braid for good sense. And I feel like a million dollars. Amazing what something so simple can do for you. 
It'll take Ellie a few days of work to get through everyone, but those she managed today already makes us look more civilised. Nate has gone short and close-cropped, as you'd expect, but I'm happy he decided to keep his cool salt and pepper beard. Ellie just trimmed and tied it that for him, and he's been turning the heads of some of the older women on site, let me tell you. Nate Carter, elder apocalypse bachelor, wouldn't you know? Work that booty, Nate. I just weirded myself out with that last bit. That's like telling your dad to get his freak on. I feel unclean, so we'll move swiftly onwards. Elijah looks knockout now. He's also kept his dark beard, but trimmed and tidy, with a similar close crop to Nate. Must be a military thing. With all those shaggy locks gone now, though, those sparkling emerald eyes contrasted against his dark skin, and coupled with damn good bone structure, I went all stupid and teenage again when I first saw his new look. What do you think? he asked, posing with overly dramatic flair as he showed off his new image. To which I proceeded to make strange noises that were one part giggle and two parts gurgle. I ended that shit show with a shameful flourish, quivering out a lopsided grin that was accompanied by a double thumbs up. Jesus, what an absolute fucking moron. I couldn't even manage a polite, yeah, looks good man. It would have probably been less weird if I'd just wandered up and licked his face like some weirdo stalker. Even that couldn't match my brainless, awkward reaction as I suffered a complete collapse of social competence. I came, I saw, I made it awkward. Okay, maybe the face-licking thing would have been weirder, but you get the picture. I felt like an absolute fucking tool. Swiftly making the decision to disappear by claiming errands to run, the chuckling behind me as I fled indicated Elijah caught every last bit of my awkwardness. I'm glad he found it funny, though. That's more reassuring than awkward silence, or hearing footsteps disappearing in the opposite direction, scarpering as fast as roadrunner away from the crazy lady. Meep, meep. One thing I didn't consider when choosing my fiery new look was Nate. I rocked up at the house we share. He took one glance and gave an approving nod. Really taking this flame thing serious, eh? Nobody will miss you with her the colour of fire. Ah, oh, damn it, Nate. I just wanted to look awesome to cheer myself up. Now he's made out it was some conscious choice for me to stand out as the flaming torch. Bah. So yeah, that was my big news. Hopefully, I'll wake in the morning and the memory of my awkward meltdown in front of Eli will have been erased for both of us. Judging by how funny he found it, I'm not holding my breath. I expect piss-taking. January 11th, 2011. Two is two. Theodore did it again this afternoon. This time without any eerie sketch. Fully recovered from my mental and verbal collapse, I was sat on Eli's couch, sharing a hot and comforting beverage with him, taking a day off after the strain of the infirmary. Nobody went out today, and we've got a meeting later about our next task. Elijah's just so easy to be around, and I find myself gravitating towards him more as time goes by. I don't know why, but I just feel calmer when around him, and that's no easy feat. I'm a hyperactive pain in the butt most days. Theodore was scribbling away again at the table, as he always does. Suddenly, he stopped, turned fully in his chair, and locked eyes with me directly for the second time. Remember me saying he doesn't do that with anyone. It took Eli by surprise the first time, the night Nate had his dream with you, and everything changed. Everything is three, said Theodore in his odd, dispassionate voice. The dreaming. One is one. Now two is two. One of three and two of three. Shield and faith. His eyes looked right into my damn soul then. 
his voice almost a whisper, his gaze penetrating. Just the flame remains. Then just like that, all the intensity switches off and he turns back to his drawings. Cryptic and creepy as all hell. Even Elijah is weirded out by it. The change in his younger brother is so stark and intense, it really seems to have rattled him. My own sea of calm was once more tossed by the winds of chaos, and I excused myself, heading straight back here to tap on this keyboard and record it. Nate is the shield. One of three. I'm the flame. Three of three. Which means whoever is designated as this faith, the middle of our weird little trio of chosen, is getting a dream tonight for a proverbial sword tapping on both shoulders as they get anointed into their newfound role. I'm creeped out by Theodore's eerie statement, but now a little bit excited about what tomorrow might bring. More accurately, I'm excited about who might be revealed tomorrow. With a title like The Faith, I half expect it to be Dean, but the other half of me thinks that's a little too obvious. After all, if it was Dean, why wait this long to reveal him when he's been here all this time? Sigh. More waiting ahead. January 12th, 2011. The Faith. And so, the faith is revealed. You and I really need to have words, Freya. Now you appear to a complete stranger, and still I'm sat here waiting. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's do this right and recount the tale in its proper order. With the massive increase in headcount, and therefore food consumption, our resident science teacher came up with a bonanza idea last night while discussing plans for today. What about that supermarket distribution centre, just off the dual carriageway on the big roundabout running past the edge of town? Graham seemed excited by the thought, pushing up his perfectly positioned glasses again. It's absolutely huge, and I imagine, even if looting has started there, there's no way it would be empty with everything going on. It's a national distribution centre and the size of a small village. We all slapped our heads for not thinking of it before. Well, everyone except Nate. That place was running 24-7, he cautioned. I'm willing to make a wager that when things started getting out of hand, they did so quickly. Employees with the exact same thought as us. Look at all these supplies just sitting here, I'll take what I can. Then, security tries to stop them, people start fighting over certain goods, things get out of hand on a large scale. I'll leave the rest to your imagination. Sobering. As usual, Nate's right. That place is massive. Other workers off Rota could have feasibly headed to their workplace with the intent to stack up on supplies, given their knowledge of its contents and access to the building. They'd also be aware of just how quickly the world around them was devolving. With no police responding to ever-increasing food riots as things spiralled into violent panic, just one accidental death in there would be like a match to gunpowder. Well, shit. We'll roll light, said Nate then, surprising me. Given his cautionary tone, I thought a veto of the mission was incoming, Instead, he bought into the idea and was just exercising his usual pragmatic approach to the problem so people didn't get carried away. Light? I queried. Aye. Me, you, and Elijah. We'll take the Humvee in case things get bad and we need to exfil a hostile situation. We'll do a recon on the area and the warehouse itself to get a lay of the land. Graham's idea is a good one, as there'll not only be a serious amount of readily available supplies there of all kinds, but likely freight trucks too for mass transport of goods. We'll scout it out, see what's what with the place, identify any vehicles Clyde could potentially get running, and then make a proper plan based on our findings. So that's what we did, heading out early this morning around 8.30am. 
Alicia is almost ready to come back out beyond the gate again, and she's absolutely bursting to do something. That time I hurt my back after the builder's yard, I felt stir-crazy all cooped up in the lodge, and Alicia has been stuck inside longer because of her more serious injury. So I think she's going a little do-lally now after nearly three weeks. Not just yet, though. As the three of us edged towards the area of the warehouse, my sense of expectation increased in equal measure. I was waiting for something to happen, someone to reveal themselves, just as Nate stopped the Humvee in the road. Hear that? We rolled down the windows, and sure as shit, we heard the echoing blast of gunfire coming from the direction of the warehouse, with shouts of alarm interspersed into the gaps. Someone needs help, I blurted, already making my move to exit the vehicle. Hold up, said Nate, his hand gripping my arm. Look. A single figure, wrapped heavy against the cold winter morning, scrambled into view from the direction of the warehouse. Turning, they peered down the bank into the massive warehouse yard, which was hidden from our vantage, then spun on their heel and started running. Right towards us. As they neared, it was a woman frantically waving her arms. Elijah popped out of the top of the Humvee, training his rifle downrange at her, while Nate slid out and did the same. On the far side of the Humvee, I muttered obscenities and slid out my door to move around the vehicle, just as Nate barked out a command. Halt! Identify yourself! The woman stopped dead, terrified by the hostile weapons pointing her way. She failed to say anything, shocked to fearful silence. I sidled next to Nate, now able to see just how frazzled the poor woman was. With her fair complexion reddened by the cold air and strands of blonde hair peeking out the bottom of her beanie, one of the woman's raised hands clutched a small thirty-eight. Before I could say anything, Nate's command sliced the air like a knife. Drop the weapon, on your knees, hands where I can see them. When Nate unloads his don't fuck with me voice, one does not fuck with him. The small revolver clattered to the road, hands shot towards the clouds, and the woman dropped to her knees before finally finding her voice. Don't shoot, please, I'm no threat, I'm just trying to get away from that. She gestured backwards with her head, not daring to test Nate by moving her hands even an inch. Who are you? Still that commanding growl. My name is Tori Cates, please, I need help. There was a wildness to her eyes and such desperation in that plea that I was compelled to intervene before Elijah's gentle voice stopped me. Um, guys, you might want to take a look at this. We both glanced up to him, then followed the direction of his gaze. Despite his darker skin, he somehow managed to look pale. One of the undead awkwardly clambered up to the same spot Tori appeared, but there was something off about it. As it climbed to its feet, it raised one arm as it ambled towards us with a ferocious lack of speed. Nate lowered his eye to his scope, moving his gaze from Tori for the first time. What the... As his words trailed off, I lifted the small pair of binoculars I'd brought for our recon mission and stared at the singular zombie plodding towards us. Its clenched, upraised fist popped out three fingers, one by one. One, two, three. Then its fist clenched again and it repeated the count. Wash, rinse, repeat. Holy fucking batshit, Robin! I muttered without thinking. I'll be a monkey's bare-arsed uncle. You know when those moments when you can feel people looking at you? I sensed it in the quiet following my outburst and lowered the binoculars a little to find both Eli and Nate staring at me with almost identical expressions of singular raised eyebrows. Even Tori's panic was arrested for a moment, reddened face peering my way. What? I demanded. I'm surprised, okay? At least I didn't ask you to butter my butt and call me a biscuit. Elijah snorted a, huh, at that one, while Nate just shook his head. Too many drugs or just not enough, he sighed, the twitch of a smile at one corner of his mouth. 
you're her, aren't you? Said Tori, eyes dancing between me and Nate. And you're him. That stopped all of us dead. Say again, I asked. You're her, the flame, and you're her shield. Freya said I'd know you, a flame that burned bright and an old warrior that shielded her. You even have red hair. I'm starting to regret this fucking hair dye. Actually, no, fuck that. I look awesome. When Tori mentioned your name, Freya, all three of us knew she was legit. So, you are... I wanted her to finish the name of our little minity. The Faith, though I don't know why. Nate and I shared one look before he nodded and put his eye back down the scope. Wait, is that... He looked up again at Tori. Is that Jacob Tyler? Surprised, Tori nodded. How do you know him? I've watched your odd little community for a while, answered Nate. Threat assessment. Tori shook her head vehemently. No, I'm no threat, and nor are most of the people there. That's why I came to find you, and why Freya sent me to you. Most of the people there just need help. You don't know how bad things are. Did you shoot him in the neck? Asked Nate, his eye on the undead as it inched ever closer. Tori nodded. He discovered me making my escape. He was going to take me back, but not before he tried to... assault me. I'll let you fill in the gap before changing her choice of words. Surprised? No. Saddened yet again? Definitely. He didn't know about the revolver I stole in an ankle holster, continued Tori. I shot him and when he died, all the undead went insane. There's close to a thousand down there and about 30 live people from Ascension. They're lost, said Nate bluntly. If they make it out, good luck to them. Tori blanched as Nate squeezed the trigger and put Jacob Tyler's undead husk to final rest. Come on, I said, helping her to her feet. Let's take you home. I think we've got a lot to discuss. And we did. I'm tired now after listening to it all, and none of it was great. We were going to put Tori in one of the dorm buildings, but she virtually begged to stay with me and Nate, at least for this first night. We put her on the couch in the front room and she's out like a light as I write this. You know what makes me trust her more than anything? When she and Particles met, the little dude's tongue lolled out happily as he sought her affection. He likes her, and Particles is yet to judge anyone wrong. I think she's the real deal, and I like the fact that she's just asking, why me? Just as I am. It reassures me she's on the level and not getting carried away with all this mystical mojo. Anyway, sleep now. Long day. Lots to think about. And I'll loop back to Tori's horrific revelations in the morning when I've rested and I'm sat with a brew. It sickened me hearing those folks at Ascension have milk from dairy cows. I would bite a zombie for a good cup of tea with milk right now. January 13th, 2011. Expectation. I don't feel much better after a night's rest. Tori's tale was too disturbing to get off my mind, and my night was pretty restless. It's 7 a.m. and I'm already on my third black coffee. Today I will be a creature animated entirely by caffeine. Conversely, Tori said she had the best night's sleep in a long time. For the first time in months, she slept feeling safe. After hearing a tale, I can see why. Victoria Cates, or Tori, as we know her, was an investigative journalist before the world's end, going undercover trying to expose those who preyed on the innocent or naive, and The Children of the Resurrection was her latest project. With a degree in psychology employed to good effect when inserting herself into these dark and gloomy worlds, this woman is as tough and as daring as they come. 
I can't imagine what went through her head the day the world ended, when the cult she sought to expose was now her permanent refuge. She survived by being a popular member of society, a confidant to many, and a friend to all who weren't completely loopy for the shit this first disciple spoon-fed them. Most of Ascension's people are those who slipped through the cracks of normal society or paranoid about the state of the world, wanting to be prepared if everything went to shit. Many just want to be part of something and have a sense of community denied to them in their everyday lives. Jacob Tyler was one of the triumvirate we heard about, as we already knew from Nate's recon. Now we have names for the other two as well. One of them we only knew as Oliver, who we now know is Oliver Hargrave, the sole inheritor of close to half a billion in property wealth. Hargrave funded the whole construction of Ascension about three years ago, stacked their supplies, offered paid jobs to ex-veterans at odds with a world that chewed them up and spat them out, and brought in all the skills needed to make a fully functioning, post-apocalypse, self-sustaining settlement. According to Tory, Hargrave is a socially awkward and deeply closeted gay man, likely forced to conceal his sexuality because of the outdated, old money principles of upper society, though she admits that's mostly speculation on her part. Hargrave wanted to be a part of something greater than himself, and Tory's convinced he's infatuated with their revered leader in both a reverent and romantic fashion, though his secret crush isn't reciprocated by their first disciple. Or, as the world used to know him, John Maddock. Tory spent months digging into Maddock's life before finally going undercover in the cult. Finding only a thoroughly unremarkable life, despite possessing intelligence and charisma, Tory suspects he latched on to Hargrave in order to fulfil his personal wishes for wealth and comfort. She expected the cult leader to disappear with Hargrave's fortune once he got bored of the charade, as nothing about Maddock's life was remarkable. The only remarkable aspect of his life was rising from a dingy one-bedroom flat on the outskirts of London, with a history of failed careers, to a cult leader with hundreds of followers in a short space of time. Cults feed on uncertainty, insecurity and social isolation, Tory explained. A charismatic individual creates their own version of reality, maintaining the illusion by keeping members separate from the outside world, Ascension was just such a place, with its high walls, armed guards for protection from the evil beyond their border, and everyone kept constantly busy so they don't think too long and hard about their situation. That leader ensures he's the only one with the keys to their promised kingdom, with a tight inner circle of trust to enforce his will. Demands start small, as Maddox did, like taking donations to help sustain his religion. But eventually those demands result in the poor, disaffected souls standing in an orderly queue to hand over all their possessions and, ultimately, their freedoms. It's hard to imagine so many people duped by such obvious tactics, observed Nate. Just like fascism, cults feed by harvesting the bitter crops of discontent answered Tory with a spread of her hands. The world can be an unforgiving place, and it was far too easy to be alone in the world we left behind, even though everywhere you looked there were people all around. Humans are social animals by nature, Nate. We need to be connected, need to be a part of something. Look at all of you. Tory gestured to the assembled room, We'd brought everyone we could to the school assembly hall to hear her tale. I didn't want anyone to miss this, and only a handful of people were missing taking care of the younger children. They didn't need their dreams tormented by Tory's dark tales of ascension. You've all come together, binding yourselves into a community, because that's what people do. We're communal creatures, and when it's lacking, that sense of isolation can be soul-crushing. If you felt alone while standing in the middle of a crowd, invisible in the mass, and just a single hand reached out for yours, 
wouldn't you reach for it in turn? That's how many of the Ascension people felt, and Maddox sold them a dream, offering his hand into the dark of their isolation. That's the real crux of a cult's ethos. The carrot, I said. Tori nodded. The big payoff is always just over the horizon, always just around that last corner, and they, the chosen, will be the ones to benefit for their belief and commitment to whatever cause they've been sold. The clouds will part, the sun will shine, and the rapture will begin, I muttered, contempt hanging from every word. What cause did he sell? Tory blew a bitter snort of disgust. That's just it. Maddock was never specific. He just said the world was crumbling under its own weight, the pillars of society corrupted beyond repair, and eventually the world would fall. Of course, his children, the chosen ones, would resurrect humanity. Dean sighed. I think it's safe to say that anyone could predict such an ambiguous fall. Maddock was seen as a revered figure at first because he predicted the end before last year was out. Personally, I just think he was nearing the final stage of his plan and was readying his exit strategy. From what I gathered while there, he gave them until the end of the year before his prophecy came to fruition. To my mind, his intention with such specifics was just to renew their excitement, keeping everyone distracted with their preparations, while he worked on Hargrave to sign over his wealth in its entirety. Well, I bet the world actually ending really pissed on his chips, I purred, feeling just a little satisfied he never got to betray everyone and get away with it. His supervillain plan suddenly became the illegitimate love child of a dumpster fire and a train wreck. He'd have gotten away with it too if it wasn't for those pesky zombies. The Scooby reference got a laugh from the room. Tori gave a faint smile, but it's quizzical at the moment, as though she's still trying to figure me out. I guess that's the psychology degree playing out. Good luck with that, though, love. I haven't got a fucking clue what I'm doing from one minute to the next, so if you figure me out, let me know, yeah? Um, quite, said Tori with a nervous half-laugh. Succinctly put, but yes... He was forced to be a real leader. With his prophecy coming true, coupled with the fortuitous name he'd chosen in referencing a resurrection, the people elevated him to near messianic status, like he really had predicted the end of all things. Then, the day after the dead awakened, that reverence was sealed as he performed his dark miracle in front of everyone. Hands snapped to mouths with shocked whispering as Tory described a man named George, dying of cancer, offer himself as a sacrifice. With his own hand, Maddock cut the man's throat, and when he reanimated, everyone witnessed the newly risen undead man obey Maddock's every command. The inner circle revealed itself as head of security Jacob Tyler and Oliver Hargrave as Maddock's right hand, were both given the same gift. Here's the kicker. Their twisted little trio have to sacrifice a living person with their own hand. Not a gun, but an actual throat cut with a blade. To retain their command of the dead in order to protect their little society. And each of them had to do this. Every week. Three people sacrificed to Captain Evil every week for almost seven months. At an approximate of 30 weeks for that time, that's 90 murdered people, just so that little inner circle could retain their power. That's about 30 more than our entire community. Their security people raided outside their walls, dragging people back alive as prisoners to keep in a basement dungeon called The Pit until needed the strange event that Nate couldn't see when he was observing them. That was the seventh day sacrifice, because these nutters do it publicly. 
Captain Evil has been getting humans to sacrifice humans under the pretense of protecting them from the dead, preying on Maddox's thirst for power and control. In turn, he preyed on the fears of his people. Scared beyond measure, the people allowed this to continue, more fearful of protecting their own from the ravages of the dead than putting a stop to this primitive and savage practice. That was, of course, until survivors became scarce. Around a month ago, their pit finally ran dry, and three residents of Ascension were found guilty of crimes offered as sacrifice to the Lord of the Dead to keep their community safe and as an example to others. Now, however, they're the architects of their own downfall. Their illusory discontent is now very real once this twisted little trio started killing their own. The community at large don't consist of fighters and were mostly timid people in life, so they're now trapped by fear. Against the loyal believers of Maddock, the real lunatics reveling in their perceived chosen status of this new world, they're powerless. Tori resorted to seducing Tyler, making him fall head over heels for her to protect herself from the blade and to try and exert some influence to protect the innocence of Ascension. Shit, Freya, that's some real sacrifice, requiring a tremendous level of fortitude and strength on a scale I can't even comprehend. The haunted look of her eyes when she talked about how violating and unclean his touch was to her made me shiver, yet she endured it anyway. Give that woman all the Oscars, because I wouldn't be able to pull that performance off. Nuh-uh. Tori finally made plans to escape after Tyler mentioned another group of three that Maddock was on a collision course with, when the time is right. He calls us the evil ones, which is fucking rich considering they're the bastards cutting innocent throats. The night before making her escape in the convoy heading to the supermarket warehouse, up pops you, Freya. When she described you perfectly, the core of us who lived with you before you were taken sat there utterly gobsmacked. Maria, Nora, Mark, Alicia, and even little Charlie all shared amazed looks between them and towards me and Nate. Everything changed here with Tori's tale. All the doubters seemed to be swayed, and I found myself extremely uncomfortable under the keen regard of the fifty or so people in the hall. Practical Nate dropping the dream bomb a while ago got people asking questions and talking because he's not a whimsical chap. But this complete stranger turning up based on a dream from our dead friend, uncomfortable herself with the title of the faith, describing our deceased friend in perfect detail and witnessing the raw reactions of those who knew you. Well, Captain Evil's existence is getting harder to deny as hard as the celestial boner he seems to have for me. I hate this, Freya. I'm not comfortable with it. I don't want to be revered like Maddock does, and I certainly don't want to be treated like some bullshit icon for everyone to hang their hopes on. Hold the front line, Lucky. It's your job and you've been chosen. You've got to keep things going so this trinity can get on with fixing shit, Lucky. Hey, Lucky, these innocent people are trapped by a dark, mad bunch of cultists that command the dead. So what should we do? How can you save them? I have no fucking idea. None. Don't get me wrong. I want to help and feel I have to. But that's not because of some bullshit destiny ordained for me. I want to do it because it's right and the number of living people is dwindling day by day. But how to do it? I just don't know. And now I'm starting to feel a weight of expectation as people's opinions swing towards me as the keystone of this little trio. God, I fucking hate this shit. I'm not cut out to be a leader and I'm sure as shit not cut out to be a spiritual figure for anyone. I swear a lot, quote movies for laughs, and titter like a child at farts. Does that sound like the spiritual icon of a community to you? Didn't think so. I know we have to do something, though. 
Maddock was a fraud that's now just a vessel for Captain Evil's bullshit, and it sounds like Maddock was a colossal turd gulper before the world collapsed. He's a bad egg, but most of his people aren't. They're just a flock in need of a shepherd, but one that puts them safely behind fences at night and protects them from the wolves, not a shepherd that calls them friend and then slaughters them for meat. For now, we'll have to carry on as we are. We still have to look after our people, and from what Tori says, Maddock has a hard-on for the number three. She thinks the auspicious time for this final clash he intends to have with us evildoers will be March 3rd, the third day of the third month. If that's right, then we have some time to figure out how to deal with a community ten times our size with ten times the armed combatants. Raining fire down on them will just get lots of people killed. I don't want innocents caught in the crossfire, and I sure as hell don't want any more of my friends to die. I don't do personal grief well at all, as yours and Isaac's deaths have shown. It fucks my shit right up and adds another little crack to my heart. Too many cracks, and I think it might break. Lots to do, lots to think about, but mainly lots to do. I just want some sense of routine for a while, doing something productive for the community while we figure all this bullshit out. January 15th. 2011. Unity. The last couple of days have been spent settling Tory in and trying to bind the disparate factions together. There are three distinct groups that make up our community now. We've got our original group, made up from the combined forces of the lodge and school, when ours and Dean's two groups merged. We've been a solid community, and that original group includes the latest arrivals of the Beckett brothers and the Ritchie family. There are 20 of us. The Willow Park refugees are all closely knit, even more so since their terrible losses when the nomads assaulted the convoy. There are 21 of them. Now we have the nomad refugees, the 15 we liberated, plus the two nomads of Mace and Dong that abandoned that former life. So that's 17. Three groups, similar in size, all of whom are closing ranks, I feel. Some of them are integrating well, like Doc Emma, because of her personal attachment to Maria. Mace and Dong are eager to help, so that's great. However, these barriers need to be broken down, and what's the best British way to do that? Stuff your face and get drunk. It was time to go back to the deer park, so Nate and I did that today. Just me and him. And it was great, because I learned about real marksmanship. Oh yes, Nate let me fire the PSG-1 and take down a deer. I learned about range finding, using the wind meter, adjusting the scope for these factors and all that good stuff. He called all that information the dope of the shot. I like that. I'm never going to have all the training he's had, and we don't have bundles of spare 7.62 for hours of shooting, but learning the theory will stand me in good stead for distance shooting in general, I think. All fascinating stuff. Dope interests me. When we came back with the deer, we took it to Nora, who's organised one of the smaller sheds in the maintenance area as a little butchery and smokehouse. At the moment, it's just for when we head over to the deer park to bag one, but it's also an exercise in optimism. There have to be some farms still operating in this area, with people living still. We can't be the only survivors, and we're actually planning on sending some teams out to try and find them. Simple scouting missions to try and locate farms still operating, and hopefully someone will locate one that still has cows, chickens or pigs, so we can open trade. I am craving meat, dairy and bread so fucking much. I would trade anything for a bacon and egg butty right now. I'm like some weird version of Pavlov's dog. Write the words, bacon and egg butty, and I immediately start salivating in response. We decided on announcing a winter feast tomorrow, and honestly, just the concept seemed to cheer people up considerably. 
We'll hold the big buffet event in the school hall, lay out some tables to put the food on, and Nora asked for some volunteers to help her in the kitchens. There was no shortage of hands in the air from all three groups, so Nora ensured she took aid from our people, Willow Park and the nomad refugees. I want to get away from having to refer to our people as these three distinct factions and try and bring everyone together properly. The notion of freshly cooked venison certainly cheered many glum faces, including my own. We haven't had it for some time, mainly because we haven't been able to make the time to bag one. It feels like we've been moving from one crisis to the next, and I think we all just need to kick back and take a breath. Making our new community a single entity is important, now more than ever with the looming threat of Maddox cult gearing up for what they feel is some kind of predestined showdown in around six weeks. We'll have to start planning for that, but not right now. For the moment, we need to concentrate on getting our own house in order. The good news is that Alicia is ready to be put back in rotation and Sarah's arm has healed a treat. Doc Emma reckons she's only a week or two away from full flexibility again. Having a couple of solid shooters back on the rotor will make me feel a lot better, though it still doesn't change the fact that we can't go in a full head-to-head with the resurrectionists. We're outnumbered and outgunned, so we need to find a different way. I've got an idea that I'll get Nate's thoughts on, and I hate myself a little for even thinking it, but I can't see any other way. For now, it's time to try and unify our community. If we don't get our own house in order first, we don't stand a chance against Maddox Fruit Loops. Still waiting for that dream, Freya? You've done the other two. Where's mine? January 17th, 2011. Winter Feast. Yesterday went down an absolute storm, and today the positive effect on everyone is plain to see. New friendships formed across faction boundaries, all through the simple fact of coming together to share food and a few drinks. Our booze stash has taken a hit, as has the fresh food, but without doubt, the payoff was worth it. The fresh cooked venison went down a treat, With everyone spending so much time surviving on dry goods, canned food and vegetables from Nora's ever-growing garden, the introduction of piping hot, fresh, juicy venison had the same effect on everyone as it did on me the first time I had a bite. It's been a long time since any of these people have felt bloated after gorging on food, and its effect on everyone's mental state was evident. No fancy dress this time, just a good old cookout and social mingling. Also, I didn't make any drunken bad decisions and sleep with anyone, actually holding back on the booze so I could keep my wits about me, because I was expecting a number of people to finally drum up the alcohol-assisted courage to ask me direct questions about being chosen. The fact that I'm obviously uncomfortable with it reassured those who did, I think. Tori and Nate too, for that matter. Our little trio of torchbearers are all unnerved by the whole thing, even baffled by whatever force decided to tap its celestial sword on our shoulders. And this fact has probably helped people accept the situation a little easier. If we were all standing with hands on hips and crowing about how we're here to lead them all through the darkness, we'd likely slam headlong into a massive wall of suspicion. That me, Nate and Tori are all shrugging our shoulders and looking distinctly discomforted by the questions gives us a bit of validity in everyone's eyes, I think. I hope. The six women held by the nomads have all gravitated towards Alicia, and I have to give her a shitload of credit. She approached them, shared her story, and immediately forged a bond with the women. Alicia seems to have taken Nate's story about Katie to heart and reached out to them as support, showing them there's another way and that they don't have to live in fear with us. Having those women all see that Alicia is now a stone-cold badass, fully firearms trained and part of our top-tier security force, has really lit a fire under them. 
A woman named Lucy, who the others seem to defer to, has already expressed interest in following in Alicia's footsteps, as have two of the others. I have to give a special mention to our single father poster boy, Mark. Naturally, he and Charlie, along with the riches, did great work integrating himself with the other new faces with children. Those with kids all gravitated towards each other, mainly because younger children have fewer reservations about socialising, so naturally the parents end up greeting each other and talking about their various stories prior to the end of the world. Children are a great common ground for opening dialogue. By chance, a group were sitting at a table near the entrance door to the hall. I'd just nipped to the toilet and on my way back in, but stopped just before passing through the wedged open double doors. Why did I stop? Well, I heard my name mentioned, and when you suddenly have the opportunity to listen what's said about you, when no one in the conversation knows you're there, you can't help but be curious and listen in for as long as you can. Human nature, eh? Why are Erin and Nate doing all this? One woman asked. I didn't recognize her voice. Doing all what? asked Mark. Why, start all this. What's their agenda? Agenda, Leanne? What makes you think that? People don't do something for nothing in my experience, she answered, especially since the world changed. What do they want? Power? Control? Mark's voice hardened a fraction, but enough to let Leanne know he wasn't thrilled by her assumptions. That's where you're wrong, Leanne. Erin and Nate, just the two of them, took on a local criminal with a large group of armed men over the course of a month and whittled them down before finally hitting Bancroft's home to free us. You know why? For no other reason than we were held against our will. That's it. Those of us that make up their original group, the time before we found Dean and this place, are here now because of those two, and all of us have had a say in our futures. Everything is for the common good. Look around you, Leanne. You see the smiles. See the safety and security people have. The relief that your children are protected by walls and people who care about their well-being. That is the agenda. That's not my experience. People are generally selfish and rarely do something for nothing. Then you've been hanging out with the wrong people. He sighed, his chair creaking as he leaned back. I'll tell you a story to make my point. When Charlie's mum died, he was only a baby. It was rough and I was struggling. I'd just lost my wife after a short battle with an aggressive cancer and had no clue how to be a dad. I was all on my own, as Nia's family were all in Kenya, and I'm an only child. My dad died when I was in my twenties, and my mum was over in Manchester and getting on in years, as they had me pretty late. I went out for lunch one afternoon with some friends eager to get me out, but naturally Charlie had to come with me, as I didn't have anyone else. I had to change him, and in the men's room, there are never baby changing tables. So as a middle-aged woman was leaving the ladies' room, I asked her to check if it was empty. She did so, and gave me the okay. While sorting the bag, she offered to change him. I said, it's okay, I've got it. But she insisted, and without warning, just put her arm round me. I don't know how, but that woman saw me teetering on the edge of a breakdown that even I didn't know was coming, seeing right to the heart of it in one brief interaction. While in that bathroom, I cried hard and ugly for a solid minute while this complete stranger changed Charlie's nappy. When I returned to my friends five minutes later, with my clean and changed son, the weight I'd been carrying on my chest and shoulders was that little bit lighter. I never got her name, had no clue who she was, and never saw her again. For those five minutes, though, while she took care of my son and I vented the pressure of my grief and sense of being overwhelmed, it let me hit a reset button of sorts. 
I took a few steps back from the edge of that incoming breakdown, getting my focus back and clearing the fog from my brain. I listened in hiding, wrapped by Mark's tail, the people at his table equally invested and silent. Simple acts of kindness can have a profound effect on someone's life, more than you might ever realize. There are people in this world who do things not for praise or credit or profit, Leanne. There are people who do these things because the only reward is the act itself, in the hope it makes someone else's day a little brighter. That, my new friends, is exactly who Erin Locke is. I had to clamp my hand over my mouth to prevent a sob escaping and give away my listening post, a struggle that only intensified as Charlie enthusiastically chimed in about his birthday party, waxing lyrical as Mark got emotional again, explaining again my reasoning was simply to let Charlie be a normal kid for just one day. Mark got emotional at the time back in October, but I didn't realize how much that birthday party meant to him until now. It had a far more profound and lasting effect on Mark than I'd given credit for. No act of kindness, however small it might be, is ever wasted. It's a gift anyone can afford to give. I had to depart my secret spot then, returning to the bathroom to scrub my face and have a little cry before going back into the main hall. Hearing Mark's high opinion overwhelmed me, and it took a little while to get my shit back together. When I returned to the room and gave a nod and smile to their table, every one of them waved and smiled back. I think Mark did more for bringing people into the fold with that one deeply personal story than I ever could. I should make him my new director of marketing. Inevitably, I ended up in conversation with Elijah on a number of occasions throughout the day. We find ourselves orbiting each other more frequently, and there's definite chemistry between the two of us, though both of us are being cautious. We get on really well, shooting the shit and laughing about silly things, and the thing I enjoy the most is there's never any awkward silences. That's not to say there aren't moments of quiet as we're sitting together, just that when we are quiet, it doesn't feel awkward. It feels comfortable like we're both okay just being there. As you can imagine, Freya, silence is not something I'm overly familiar with. I'm generally a mouthy little sod, always cracking a joke, taking the piss, or saying something dumb. I've always found silences uncomfortable, and when they happen, I'm gripped by a compulsion to bullshit my way through them. I don't feel like that with Eli. That aura of calm surrounding him is like a warm blanket. It's comfortable, and I like that. Being a bundle of nervous energy, rarely do I take the time to simply relax, and yet in his presence, I feel like I can. I'd like to see where this goes, I think, but I can't right now, not until we've dealt with the impending threat of the resurrectionists. I can't be distracted, and I'm afraid I'd get too comfortable if things developed between me and Elijah, I can't afford any blunted edges. I decided on chatting to Maria about it. Her opinion is important, and she's spent lots of time with Elijah, what with them being our only medical people, until Doc Emma's arrival. Maria and Eli have formed a pretty solid friendship, and I know he thinks the world of her, as does everyone. I've never taken the time to get her opinion of him, though. So while we were all eating, drinking, and being merry... I decided this was the opportune moment and asked Dean and Maria for their thoughts when I sat with them for a while. Finally, laughed Maria, Dean shaking his head and rattling a chuckle of his own. What? I asked with a shrug. Oh, Erin, that boy's absolutely smitten, she snorted. And it's obvious you are too. Don't think we all haven't noticed the way you two are around each other, Plus, whenever we're working together in the infirmary, all he does is talk about two people. His brother Theodore, and you. Well, what does he ask? What doesn't he? 
what you were like when you were younger, stories since the world changed and we've been reunited, things you like, things you don't like. Maria laughed again. Honestly, Erin, it's sweet. He's so eager to make a good impression on you. It's like he's building a file for him to study at night so he can hit all the right notes. Taken aback, I'm not too proud to admit this revelation is a little bit exciting. No man has ever gone to these lengths before, and it made me feel pretty darn good. He would have been a hell of a catch even in the world we've left behind, Erin, said Maria. In this new world? Well, that boy is solid gold. Smart, funny, sweet, a big heart, and he's not too shabby in the old looks department either. Careful now, warned Dean playfully. I'm sat right here. Don't you go planning on trading me in for a younger model. Maria laughed and her hand dropped to Dean's on the table, one thumb affectionately rubbing the back of his hand without thought. Dean grinned and absently returned the gesture with his own thumb. That is the kind of thing I want, that unthinking affection and intimacy and the simple joy each other's presence brings. That one moment between Maria and Dean made me thankful I'd found them both and been able to reunite them. After more than two decades together, they were still so in love with each other. That's a powerful bond. I don't think I can right now, though. I admitted, stopping both dead as they turned questioning looks my way. Why ever not? asked Dean. There's too much to do. The threat of Maddock and that tiny group of nomad thugs are still out there. Their arse-faced little captain strikes me as the vengeful type, and I don't think we've seen the last of him. Until those threats are neutralized and we can think about moving forward, I can't afford to be distracted. If you hadn't already noticed, I'm currently in a committed relationship with guilt and bad decisions. Maria's hand switched from Dean's to mine. Erin, stop breaking yourself trying to hold everyone else together. Let the rest of us carry some weight. I shrugged. You can't, Maria. Not in everything. Not in this. There's something coming that I'm supposed to do and I've no bloody clue what it is. I've been chosen for some weird reason I can't figure out, but that burden is mine and mine alone. Until I figure it out, I can't be distracted. You deserve love too, Erin, said Dean softly. You deserve to be happy, just like everyone else. Right now, Dino, I don't have time for me. My life is the equivalent of trying to stand up in a hammock. It's a confusing clusterfuck. I can't figure it out, and I feel like I'm about to slam my face into the ground any second. Starting anything now wouldn't be fair on Elijah, because I wouldn't be all in. My mind's always somewhere else. Dean smiled, tinged with a hint of sadness. Sometimes I have to pinch myself. It's hard to believe that this woman sitting before me is the same mouthy little tearaway that caused me all kinds of headaches back in the day. Yet here you are, a selfless leader, putting everyone else above yourself. I snorted a laugh. I'm no leader, Dean. You two and Nate are the real leaders around here. Dean shook his head. Not so, Erin. Maybe for all the daily administrative headaches, but whenever something of note rises, everyone looks to you, even Nate. Eh, Nate? Dean nodded. Nate might be the one who makes your crazy plans work, Erin, but they're your plans, and he finds a way to make what you want a reality. He takes his lead from you, and the pair of you make such a great team. You're the heart that drives you on, wanting to do the right thing, and he's the sensible head who finds a way to make it work. I think I've written something similar to that somewhere in this journal. It was nice to hear Dean say it as well. It validates my opinion. And a leader isn't just someone who makes decisions about crop rotation or food distribution or fuel consumption. Leaders stand as examples to others. 
You don't stand by while others suffer, and you don't ask anyone to do anything you wouldn't do yourself, often taking the lion's share of the risk on yourself so others don't have to. Whatever self-deprecating opinion you might have, that is leadership, my young Joan of Arc. Deal with it, he added with a wink. All in all, yesterday was a resounding success, I feel. A lot of the barriers have broken down, and there's a definite sense of pulling closer together as a whole. The next few days we'll spend replenishing our stores, but today everyone is recovering from their gluttony, and some are nursing hangovers. The winter feast was definitely a good idea, so I'm giving myself a big pat on the head for that one. Alicia has been shown a great deal of trust by Nate in that she's being allowed to act as training officer for the three women who want firearms training. Shotguns are the way to go. We've plenty of both weapons and ammo after acquiring more from the Nomad clearout. Nate will ultimately clear them for active duty, but Alicia has formed a bond with them and trusted by Nate to be sensible. Delegation isn't easy for Nate with all of us non-military folk, and Alicia knows it, so she's taking it very seriously. We're going in a small team to hit some little convenience stores. Two vehicles, a pair in each. Me, Nate, Elijah and Mace. He's a pretty solid guy, and a good addition, always eager to contribute. Another two teams are heading out just in pairs, but purely for scouting purposes, trying to locate any signs of life on local working farms. We really need to up our game on food production, and having access to dairy and other varieties of meat would be awesome. Two pairs of people, formerly of Willow Park, will do that, as we need to start trusting others. We'll take big hitters for clearance, but we can use non-shooters for recon. Okay, I'm going to use the opportunity to relax with my boy Particles and sketch out some plans for the Resurrectionists. We can't win this one by force of arms, and after Tory's revelations, I think a hearts and minds approach might be the way to go. A long chat with Tory over coffee is the next brick in that road, I think. I bid you adieu. January 20th, 2011 12 cats. Doing store clearance yesterday, I nearly killed Elijah. Not in a bad way, I'll just clarify. I hit his funny bone, hard, and he got the giggles so maniacally he could hardly breathe. While Mason and Nate were loading up supplies left in a small corner shop, Eli and I decided to check out the flats above them, just in case there was anything of interest, and found the weirdest thing. Prepared for the worst after popping a door open and being greeted by the hell stench of the undead, a late middle-aged woman shambled towards us as we waited outside her door. Wrapped in winter clothing, she must have survived until quite recently in her little flat. There were no visible wounds on her, so whether she died from the cold or other natural causes, we couldn't say. Either way, she had moved on from this mortal coil, and we let her shuffle outside before putting a halligan spike through her brain. The flat inside stunk to high heaven, but it wasn't just from the rank odor of the dead and undead. This time, it was mixed with the stench of dirty cats. You see, this little lonely cat lady possessed twelve, yes, count them, twelve cats. Litter boxes unattended since her death, repeatedly pissed and shat in, only added to the uniquely vile aroma clinging to every particle of air in the little apartment. Opened tins of cat food littered the kitchen counter, and we all know how lovely cat food smells, right? The place was repulsive. Here's the really weird bit, though. All twelve of her cats were black. All of them. Not a range of colours and breeds, but twelve identical-looking cats. And Elijah commented on the strange scene as we entered and found these dozen cats in various states around the living room. Cat Lady must have died only recently, as none of them looked particularly malnourished, but all were matted 
and filthy. Who the fuck has this many identical cats? Said Elijah, one arm across his mouth and nose to shield against the thick stench. How many are there? Well, I mused aloud. There are either twelve different cats, or she's got one that moves really fast. Elijah lost it. It was a throwaway comment, but for some reason it really hit him in the funnies. I've never seen him full on belly laugh like that, struggling for breath, and there's nothing purer than someone unable to control their laughter. He had to leave the flat because sucking on air polluted by zombie stench and cat anus wasn't good for his health. I didn't even find my own joke that funny, but you know how it is. When someone starts laughing that hard and uncontrollable, it becomes contagious. I started laughing as well, and we headed downstairs to the vehicles so Elijah could catch his breath. When Nate and Mace asked what was so funny, neither of us could tell them. Eli kept breaking out in new fits as he tried to explain, and his choking snorts and wheezes for breath set me off, so I couldn't tell the joke either. Both of us were pissing our sides, trying to gather ourselves, and failing in spectacular fashion, the pair of us laughing like teenagers with the weed giggles. With us two now in stupid fits, Nate and Mace just laughed at the pair of us trying to get our shit together. It's that gallows humour thing again. Here was a sad and tragic tale of a lonely woman with only her cats for company for the last half a year, finally dying miserable and alone, her brained corpse rapidly rotting upstairs. But one simple throwaway comment, and now four of us were laughing like we'd all taken a hit on a bong. I have to say, though, it improved all our moods for the rest of the day. Even last night, all I had to do was lock eyes with Elijah as I passed him, and boom, it set us both off again. You take your laughs where you can, no matter how ridiculous and no matter how dark things might appear. If you don't, all you'll fucking do is cry. Laughter is the windscreen wiper of life. It doesn't stop the rain from falling, but at least it lets you keep moving forward. No regrets. January 21st, 2011. Three of three. I'm nervous, Freya. Nervous and excited. Theodore finally did it. I was hanging with Elijah earlier. I know it's getting obvious now, hey? And Theodore turned ominously in his chair, drawings forgotten, looked me in the eye and said what I'd been both waiting and dreading to hear. Three of three, he said out of the blue. First shield, then faith, now flame. Tonight, the third dreaming. Tonight, three is three, and all revealed. Then, without further ceremony, turned back around and started scribbling again. That was it, done, message delivered. I'm excited to see you again, Freya. You've appeared to both Nate and Tori, and finally it's my chance to see you again to tell you I'm sorry, to, I don't know, close the book on that September day last year. But I'm also shitting myself. All is revealed. I mean, that's not ominous at all, is it? I'm buzzing with anticipation. Shit, I'm not even sure I can get to sleep, but I'll have to try. See you on the other side. Um, literally, I think. January 22nd, 2011. Epiphany. I finally had my mystical dream last night, and it breaks my heart a little that it wasn't you, Freya. Nate got to speak to you, as did Tori, a complete stranger. But me? Who writes this whole journal in your name? Nope, nada. That stings a bit. It was a strange sensation, waking up within the dream, yet fully aware my body was sleeping. Back in the lodge, 
I sat at the kitchen island as I was in those early days with the sun shining and the big glass doors open to let the morning air in. Those moments were when I was most at peace, when you and Nate were still sleeping, and it was just me, writing in this journal with the world still and quiet, before we started our war with Bancroft. Sitting opposite me was Isaac. The sight of him knocked the wind out of me, my first instinct to babble tearful apologies, but he just raised one hand and shook his head. No, Lucky, he said. There was nothing you could do. I knew they were going to kill me anyway because I'd heard them discussing it. I was there just as bait to taunt you. The moment you retreated, they were going to put a bullet in me anyway. You wouldn't leave without me, and I love you for that. But it was either I died or we both did. It wasn't even a choice. There's too much at stake. His words took away some of the guilt's heavy weight, allowing me to breathe again. Why are you here? I asked. Why not Freya, like with Nate and Tori? Isaac smiled like he knew something but couldn't tell me. You'll see her again when the time's right. For the moment, you need to be ready. Ready for what? When Tori killed Jacob, it changed things. Like a stone thrown into still waters. One of our trio killed one of theirs, and the power of such momentous acts are magnified on this other side. Ripples over here force the dark to react. Tori struck the first blow of real power. As a name, the dark gives me chills. I much prefer Captain Evil, as it sounds less ominous and menacing. Captain Evil I can deal with, but the dark sounds fucking dreadful. React how? Maddox lost one of his three, and whatever rules are in play in this celestial chess game means he can't be replaced. Now they only have two left commanding the dead. Well, this is good news. Knowing they can't just replace their third member with sacrifices and pass Jacob's dormant power on to someone else is the first fucking win we've had in an age. It means one less person gets sacrificed every week, but also means the grim plan I was hatching might have some real value, no matter how unclean it makes me feel. So, what does that mean for us? I asked. It means... Maddox willing to risk going against his auspicious date with no other available options. I felt cold to the core of my bones with that statement. Does he know where we are? I asked, a knot of fear tightening in my gut. Isaac nodded. Being the flame means you burn bright and hot on this side of the divide, he said. You're like a beacon for the souls that died around here, as we all wait for the Trinity to end this. Until they do, you're the only nearby light in the dim fog of our endless purgatory, Erin, and souls flock to you for warmth and light. Well, doesn't that sound lovely? It gives me a little fuzzy feeling inside. But that means the dark can see you too. You can't hide from it, so you have to face it. If our trinity should ever pass this way during their own crucible, the dark won't abide the thought of any potential sanctuary or safe zone where they might find shelter. So you have to be dealt with. Ah, oh, shit. There's always a bloody catch. It's used others, though, I said. The undead behavior changing after Freya's death and the dreams to the nomads. All just lesser options, Erin. Nudges and manipulations, rooks and knights and inferior pieces in the game. Maddock is its king this round. Other gambits have failed, so now it brings its most lethal weapon to bear. And you have to be ready. We can't face a firefight of that magnitude, I whispered in a shaking breath. Isaac just shook his head. It won't be a battery of guns you'll face, Erin. Of all the living warriors both sides have in play, none of them can match Nate in cunning or downright skill. That brought a smile to my face. But the dark has its own weapons, remember? I didn't register the implication immediately. 
but when I did, my chest felt like it was struck by a sledgehammer. The dead. The dead, he agreed gravely. How long do I have? Isaac shrugged and breathed a regretful sigh. That much, I don't know. Days, maybe? Not long. Tory's escape and Jacob's death accelerated things. Maddock now knows Tory is one of our torchbearers, and he's raging at having one so close for so long. Narcissists don't react well to realising they've been duped all this time. So this is it. This is my role. Just to defend our home. Isaac shook his head, his eyes never leaving mine. This is what Nate does, Erin, and what he does better than anyone. No, you and Tori have to find an end. The shield protects, but faith and flame must find a way to end it on the right side of humanity. You're not being very helpful, Isaac, I huffed. All this cryptic bullshit is really starting to make my teeth itch. He laughed then, and the sunshine outside suddenly appeared brighter, the birds song clear and melodious, the scent of summer flowers filled the kitchen. I'm sorry, but I'm only permitted to give you so much. There are rules. You're the ones being tested after all. It's hardly a test if I pass you the sheet with all the answers circled. Our team hasn't really done much for us, though, I grumbled, just leaving us to largely fend for ourselves. Isaac rubbed at his jaw and raised an eyebrow. Really? he said with a knowing grin. No help at all. Nate found you, the two of you found Freya, then you found us with Maria in our number, in the hands of a man in possession of weapons able to help you fight the dead and liberate others. Then you find Dean, just when he needs you the most, someone else important in your life. With him is a highly intelligent physics and chemistry teacher, qualified to the eyeballs. He chuckled and shook his head. In our first group, you find an engineer who can do most things, a medical professional and a wise old woman in Nora that has all the necessary skills to survive in a simpler world. You find the Becketts, one a combat medic, the other a conduit for the other side, as well as the Riches, who include an expert mechanic and welder. The Willow Park people have an experienced builder and his electrician's son. When you get to know some of the others, you'll find there are those with carpentry and engineering skills. When you go against the nomads, you find two allies within it that have firearms and combat experience, plus a fully qualified consultant and trauma surgeon. And now, here I am, warning you of impending attack, giving you the time to prepare. He gave me a pointed stare, inviting my response with one final question. Are you sure our team hasn't been batting for you all along? Freya, my head nearly exploded. All the evidence was right there. I've been pissing and whining about how our team isn't anywhere near as involved as Captain Evil, while at the same time saying how lucky we were to have found such good people with a diverse array of skills needed for us to thrive. Holy fucking shit. The test is ours. We're the ones tasked with holding the line so humanity might have a second chance. And to hold said line, our team has crossed paths with all kinds of people we need to do that. Yes, there's been conflict and tragedy, but ultimately, the people we need to succeed are the ones with us today. I feel like an idiot. We've been given the tools to do the job, but it's up to us to deploy those tools into building something better, to make something better. A second chance. Bloody hell. I woke up just as that realisation smacked me in my dream face. As the penny dropped, my eyes flicked open as I bolted upright in epiphany. Now I've recorded this, I need to gather everyone and we need to ready ourselves. If Isaac is right, we need to be prepared. Our worst nightmare is about to come true. The dead are coming. In force. January 24th, 2011. Fortification.
Last couple of days, we've been working round the clock. Funnily enough, it didn't take much persuading to get everyone on board. All I had to do was dangle the threat of an undead horde coming to the gate, and everyone moved like their arse was burning. A few questioned running around like panicked dickheads based on me having a dream of a dead friend, but those questions were like piss in the wind once Nate kicked everything into motion. He didn't even flinch at my revelation. He just went into protector mode, and everyone snapped to obey that drill sergeant voice of his. Nate, of course, already had a defense plan. God, I love that guy. He's so fucking prepared, it's ridiculous. He's been assessing weaknesses, tactical choke points, and Lord knows what else since his first day here, and he got right to it. First priority is the non-combatants, the men, women, and, most importantly, the children, who will only get involved if things go to shit. This isn't a time to be putting firearms in the hands of people without even rudimentary safety training. That's liable to get someone killed by accident, and in truth, if it comes down to needing those people in the mayhem, then we're probably already fucked. As soon as the horde is sighted, every non-combatant will transfer to the upper floor of either Hall Fire or Hall Earth, pushing themselves to the rear. We don't want everyone all in one place, unless things go wrong and we retreat to the gymnasium as a fallback position, and we need to spread the shooters out across the two dorm buildings that face the open space between the gate and the main yard. Anyone who can shoot will have to be spread at tactical points in those two buildings, allowing an L-shaped angle of fire. One thing we know is they'll have to come through the front gate, because the thick bramble hedgerows with the high, solid metal fence behind it is difficult for anyone to traverse. It'll be much easier for them to come down the lane, plough through the gates to breach it, and then just let the dead run amok. We never got a chance to do Mark's fancy plan for a gate defence, but we did get a couple of police stingers. After the nomads used them to cripple the vehicles in Isaac's abduction, we swept them up. If we put them outside the gate, they'll get seen and moved. However, if we put them a few feet back from the gate on the inside and the fuckers choose to plough through with a vehicle, it should disable all its tyres. I should probably mention here why we're expecting a vehicle. That was Tory's insight. To march a horde that far and keep them together, it's going to need Maddock or Hargrave to shepherd them here. The dead only follow simple vocal instructions, so one of them have to play Pied Piper to get a horde here, drawing scattered groups in as they go. Honestly, I think they're likely to pick up that horde outside the supermarket warehouse rather than waste time picking up stragglers. There's a ready-made army just waiting there. Likely it will be Oliver, as Maddock is all about self-preservation. Oliver Hargrave worships him and would do anything for him, and Maddock will exploit that to keep himself safe. Nate's eyes lit up at that news. Then he'll come in one of their up-armoured Humvees with a protection detail. If I can take him out, then Maddock will be alone. I nodded my agreement. Remember me saying how I had a plan I wasn't comfortable with, but might be necessary? It was along those lines, charging Nate with returning to his sniper hide, this time with a weapon comfortable with the range, and sanction the assassination of Oliver Hargrave in cold blood, for no other reason than it made tactical sense. Honestly, Captain Evil sending the dead our way via Maddock is a relief in one sense. Using Hargrave as his proxy, it frees me of that burden. Now it's not premeditated murder, but defense of our realm. Can we take him out on the way? I asked. Nate shook his head. Too many variables. We don't know his timing or definitive routes, and he'll be encased in an armoured vehicle with potential decoys. There's a chance we could miss him, or the fire team outside the wire gets trapped out there as the assault starts. No, here we can prepare and have some element of control with the advantage of ground and cover. They could be on the way right now for all we know, and we've only got a limited number of experienced shooters to help guide the novices. 
he gave a rueful half-smile. Some of those novices are gonna get a serious baptism of fire. Nate locked eyes with me, his deep voice ending that discussion any further. Control the variables we can, Erin. It's easier to defend a fortified position with the gate as a primary choke point. If we were fighting the living, this place would be a nightmare to defend against experienced and mobile fire teams. But with the limits of the undead, we have some elements under our control. He's so smart. Dean was in complete agreement. If our two people trained in tactical thinking with their vast number of years of experience say it's the best option, then it's safe to say the rest of us should shut up and listen. This also means the stinger is a super good idea. Without question, they'll have to breach the gate to let the undead in. It's a weak point a charging Humvee or box truck could easily bust through, as it's just a fancy wrought iron gate more for aesthetics. This is a rural private school, after all, and not a bastion of defence. Every time I hear the word bastion, I get a little shiver. It just happened again. We've got some surprises if they come barreling through that gate in vehicular assault. Reinforcing it with bits of metal found around the place, Clyde has turned his welding skills to the gates and made them opaque and can't be seen through, as any planned surprises would be easily spotted through the bars. Now concealed, we'll place stingers about 10 or 15 feet back for if and when a vehicle does plough through. But even then, Nate has no intention of making it an easy ride. The admissions building looks straight down the long lane. The old original Victorian structure has a lovely little spot for a sniper to look right down that road from an upstairs window. So Nate's made himself a nice little perch to fire from. Anyone edging too close to the gate for any kind of inspection will be gargling with a 762 round. When I asked why we didn't just barricade the gate with the loader truck or other vehicles, Nate shrugged that they could move it eventually. Plus, we don't want to get boxed in as it's the only way in and out for vehicles. Better to let them in so we can kill the undead horde on ground favourable for us. We can't bring all the guns we have to bear on them in that approaching lane unless we send people outside the wall. The trees and hedgerows are a great defence, but they also narrow our own outward field of fire. Barricaded in the two dorm buildings with the exits reinforced, we can fire from our fortified positions down on their heads from multiple angles and clear the bastards as soon as we can. Maximum effect in a target-rich environment. If we don't let them into the open spaces of the school for us to fire on, trapped outside the dead might be, but the living will be sealed within. Sooner or later we'll have to deal with that horde, so better to let them come in when we're in fortified positions than having to risk letting them in at a later date when everybody's nerves are frayed to hell. Nobody likes a protracted siege. Plus, Nate's primary target is Hargrave. If he can locate Maddox number one fan and take him down, then Maddox is all alone back at Resurrection HQ. If he wants the dead moved away from his gate then, he'll have to do it himself. While Dean and Nate organised defences, it was time for that chat with Tori. The two of us had a sit down to discuss, as Isaac put it, ending this on the right side of humanity. I asked Tori what she thought that meant. Honestly, she gave a little shrug. I'm not sure. I'll tell you what I do know, however. There's plenty of ill feeling towards Maddox since he started finding excuses to murder his own people. He's gone from revered messiah to a tyrant despot in their eyes because of it. They live in fear, and his blindly loyal base will have taken a beating after the losses at the warehouse. How so? The distribution centre was a key operation, explained Tory. Jacob took the bulk of his most loyal fighters bound to him, men and women he trusted implicitly that knew by staying loyal to him, they and those close to them would be exempt from the lottery of the sacrifice. I can't see many of them making it out of there. Oliver will be given an escort of more loyalists to gather the horde of that, I'm sure, which will leave Maddock painfully exposed. 
I toyed with my crimson braid as I mused aloud. So, you think we might be able to sway his people? Tori spread her hands. Honestly, who can say for sure? His power was built on the adoration and reverence those people had for him, and that adulation has taken a severe beating. They considered him untouchable, an icon. He protected their community from the walking dead, and fear is a powerful motivator. Jacob's death and the loss of so many of their security force in that failed operation, coupled with the murder of his own people, has affected them, I'm certain. Can't we just have Nate gun him down when he next opens the gate? Tori shook her head. We could, Erin, but don't you think that will just make them fearful of us? They know me. I've spent months with these people, building relationships and earning their trust. But I don't even think me standing beside you will help all that much if our first act of trying to persuade them is to go all gung-ho and gun down Maddock from afar. We might make him a martyr, underpinning his spouted rhetoric that we are the evil ones. If the warehouse was anything to go by, the moment Maddox's life is snuffed out, all the undead at the gate will revert back to their original nature, so we'll be putting them at risk of the thing they fear the most. I doubt that will go well for us in trying to persuade them we're friends, as they're not party to the information from this other side that we are. Plus, if we start a firefight, innocents will inevitably get caught in the crossfire, even children. They might think they're just trading one despot for another. Do you want to win them over willingly, or win them by fear? Well, he's hardly going to agree to a public debate, is he? I huffed and slumped in my chair a little. How the hell am I supposed to reach these people, how am I supposed to be this damn flame everyone's expecting me to be? Without exception, everyone fails at who they think they're supposed to be, Erin, said Tori softly. Just be who you are, and that will give you the best chance of success. I've seen the faith Nate and Dean have in you, and so many of the others. A faint smile of remembrance touched her lips. Freya has faith in you, Erin, with a certainty I could feel in that dream. Not in who you think you're meant to be, but who you are. Trust your instincts. I chuckled and shook my head. You sound like Dean banging on about faith. I don't know what I'm doing, Tori. I tend to put my faith in others, competent and experienced people, like Dee, Nate and Maria. You seem to have your head screwed on right. Having faith in myself when I haven't got a fucking clue what I'm doing with this responsibility is pretty damn hard. Then she really did sound like Dean. Faith only makes things possible, Erin, she said with a shrug. I didn't say it makes them easy. I made us both a brew and sat back down at the small table, having spent a few minutes rolling things around the empty cavern of my head. These people don't know me, Tori, but they know you. Shouldn't you be the one to address them? My faith is in you, Erin, she grinned, almost mischievously. That's my role, apparently. I'll stand beside you so they can see me, but I persuade with logic and reason. I use facts and data. That's just my way. I might understand the psychology and use that to my advantage. But these are disaffected people, Erin. They slipped into society's cracks before the world ended and just wanted to be part of something. They've been isolated and found a common bond with each other and no reasoned argument will sway them. They need to feel something change. Tori's mischievous smile remained in place. After that one lucid dream conversation with Freya, she's clearly convinced that high emotion is something of a specialty of yours. I barked a laugh. The cheeky cow! 
In all seriousness, Erin, the relationships I've built with those people have been through hard work and patience, but they need rapport and connection, a spark of hope. A flame, you might say. And they need to see another way, feel it in their bones, and I can't reach that place in an instant. You've been chosen because whatever ordained this terrible curse on the world, judging us for all our sins, thinks that you can. I'll stand by your side throughout, and I'll support you all the way. But you're the one that has to connect and show them another way. You and Nate built all this, she said, gesturing vaguely towards the activity outside the house. Others helped, but it exists because the two of you started it all. Nate does what he does best. And I'm here, I think, to save all those innocents and previously forgotten people from being caught in the crossfire of a bitter war. Because I have faith they can be turned to a better path if we show them some empathy and compassion. She took my hand then. But you, Erin have the power to unite both our communities and show them there's an alternative to the death and terror and violence. I just have to figure it out, huh? Tori smiled and gave a little shrug. I guess you'll just need to have faith. I like Tori. She's a smart cookie and knows how people think. I can tell she's still a bit uncomfortable with the role she's been assigned, but then, aren't we all? Actually, that's not true. Nate is completely in his comfort zone. Despite her misgivings, though, you clearly had an effect on her, Freya. I think Tori sees what we've built here, and continue to build, and that drives a desire for change for those she left behind in Ascension. Those relationships started with clever manipulation to improve her cover while she investigated Maddock. But when the world fell apart, she began seeing those people for who they really are. She has faith they can be shown a different path, and now has faith in me to lead them there. They just want to be part of something, always denied that sense of belonging by a society that shunned them, and Maddock exploited them as pawns in his own dark game. In turn, he's just a puppet too, that Captain Evil's using to royally buttfuck humanity with a sandpaper-wrapped cactus. By the way, that doesn't excuse Maddock in any way, at all. He fucking chose to murder people for his own ends, and that choice damns him in my eyes. He could have opted for a different path and elected not to. Find another way? Hmm... I just want to kick him in the dick until he dies in tears for all he's done. But, apparently, I have to be better than that. Our team can be such a fun sponge at times. This isn't easy. At all. I think it was Mark Twain who said something like, It's easier to fool people than it is to convince them they've been fooled. Spot on there, Mr. Twain. Haven't a frigging Scooby-Doo how I'm supposed to pull this one off. I'll think on it, but for now, I better get my head in the game. The dead could literally arrive at any moment. January 25th, 2011. The ram has touched the gate. They're here. In less than a couple of hours, the enemy will be at our gate. We placed a watch on the roads, and they've just sent a message over the radio that they're heading home. Our sentry, Pete, says the road is filled shoulder to shoulder with the dead, all following behind a crawling Humvee. He saw another couple of vehicles further down the chain. About a thousand, Pete estimates. Maybe more. More than a thousand. What the fuck? We're going to burn through most of our remaining ammunition if that's the case. Fucking hell. I hope I get to write again, Freya. I hope I can sit here and say all went well and nobody on our side died. 
but I just don't think I'm that lucky. Freya. I'm scared for our friends. Not for me, never for me, but for these people I've come to care about. They're my people, my friends, my family. It's time to go. I'm needed. The ram has touched the gate. February 1st, 2011. Acts of Valour. It's been a long time since I wrote. This is the first time I've had the time, energy and the will to write in a week of hell. I'm just empty, exhausted, hollowed out by grief. Again. People died, though I'm amazed we lost so few. Nate deserves pretty much all the credit, and I'll get to that. But holy shit, Freya, he still finds ways to leave me dumb with awe. No matter what plans we make, Nate forever chants the old military maxim that no plan survives first contact with the enemy. You can plan as much as you want for any contingency you can think of, but ultimately, the universe will find new and exciting ways to fuck with you. Adapt, evolve, overcome. I'm getting ahead of myself. Everything's a bit of a blur, so I'll try and recount the horror of the past week as best I can. I don't want to relive it all, but this is my purpose. My burden. A few of us clustered around one of the laptops wired to the security system Isaac relocated from the lodge, eyes fixed to the camera feed pointing down the road. The camera was at the end of the lane that leads to the gate, and the first thing we saw appear was a Humvee. It crawled around a gentle bend, and then the undead came into sight. Densely packed, they filled the entire width of the road. As the vehicle drew nearer to the camera and more of them shuffled into sight, there were muted curses from those of us watching the screen. It's one thing for someone to say they estimate a thousand, but it's an entirely different experience to see the horde appear. They just kept coming. And coming. And coming. Places, was all Nate said, sensing the fear in the room his calm authority dragging everyone from the screen. Nothing has changed. We knew a horde was coming, and the plan remains the same. I'm getting to my perch. The rest of you, take up position. I sat with Nate in his sniping room on the upper floor of the admissions building, watching the Humvee crawl down the approach road, letting the lane fill with the packed undead. Shit. There were just so many. What's he doing? I asked Nate as the vehicle halted halfway down. Preparing a run at the gate, he murmured in response, his eye lowering to the scope of the rifle resting on a table. His prophecy came true as the Humvee suddenly accelerated into life, thundering towards the gate at speed. The flimsy metal barricade didn't stand a chance, torn from the hinges as the up-armoured Humvee smashed straight through them at about 50, bursting into the school grounds to run right over the police stingers. They didn't even slow it. Military tyres, I guess. Some fancy pants ability to run flat or something. After all, what use is a military transport if it's easily fucked by a flat in a hot zone? Here's where we did. Get lucky, however. The vehicle should have had an armoured windscreen, but its original one must have been damaged while in service and, before being sold at a surplus auction, replaced with a regular one when getting ready for resale. The cheap and cheerful option was a horrifying surprise for the vehicle's driver when Nate's rifle boomed in the little room. His first round penetrated the windscreen and punctured the driver's chest. A second round followed swiftly and punched the passenger's ticket. 
The vehicle continued forward for some time before finally coming to rest about 20 metres from our perch. Anyone trying to get in the front would be a sitting duck. That'll ruin the day of anyone in the back when those guys reanimate, I shouted. Despite protecting my ears from the two shots, they still rang from the rifle's thundering echo in that tiny room. We'll see. As usual, Nate was proved correct. When the two dead men reanimated, started to turn back to those in the vehicle, then simply turned and faced forward again, sitting silently. Nate smirked in satisfaction. Got you, he whispered triumphantly. Hargrave's in that vehicle. He was right. The undead had followed their Pied Piper all the way here. It stands to reason he would be in what they thought was their safest vehicle, but that standard windscreen ruined their party. Now they were trapped and unable to move, knowing a sniper had them in their sights if they attempted to bail. I had a brainwave and told Nate to be ready for my call, setting off at a sprint through the school's corridors and out into the open space beneath Dean's position in Hall Fire's upper window. I called out what I needed and he threw it down without hesitation after locating it. Complete faith, no questions asked. I love my people. One eye on the approaching horde down the lane, I gave Nate the call on the radio to suppress with his L85 through that shitty windscreen and keep everyone's head down. Again, without question, bursts of automatic fire rained down on the stationary Humvee, shattering the windscreen into pieces, and as I neared the vehicle, Nate ceased fire. Pulling the pin, I hurled one of Dean's few remaining flashbangs in through that open space, and right before I dived aside with fingers in ears, I heard the panicked cry of, Grenade! inside. I would hate to have been in that tiny space when that blast went off. The interior of the vehicle lit up like a crack of lightning had erupted inside, and seconds later, a couple of men fell out of the Humvee on each side from the rear doors, coughing and choking through the plumes of smoke billowing out from the vehicle. Even as the dense smoke dispersed in the winter breeze, Nate didn't hesitate, switching back to semi and hitting both dazed men in the head with a round from his perch. Glock up, I moved to the back seat and found Oliver Hargrave with his hands clasped to bleeding ears, spluttering and disoriented, blinking rapidly as if the futile action would clear his sight. He was younger than I imagined, maybe about my age, and didn't hear my demands to get out of the vehicle. He was unarmed, so I just leaned in, grabbed him by the top of the military vest he'd been garbed in, and yanked him out into the open. Erin, you need to move. Nate said through the radio. The dead are starting to come through the gate. I glanced up as I manhandled the dazed Hargrave away from the Humvee. The long column of the dead started separating out once there was available space, like liquid leaking from the neck of an upturned bottle into a basin. Glock pressed to Hargrave's skull. I roared at him. Call them off! Call them all off or I fucking swear I'll paint the floor with your brains! As Hargrave's sense slowly returned, he saw me for the first time through watering eyes, glancing at my red hair and furious expression. Turning, he regarded the dead spreading into the school grounds and filling the open space. And laughed. You think I'm scared of death? He coughed, a wild grin splitting his lips. Death itself is our patron. He is our dark light and lord of the dead. I will not betray my first disciple's decree given unto him by our dark lord in his dreams. Even if I die here, I will rise and my soul will be rewarded in the void beyond this life. I knew Hargrave was Maddox's most loyal dog, but fucking hell... He really did believe it all. He thought they were blessed, not pawns of a force hungering for humanity's extinction. As I gaped at him in open-mouthed disbelief, Hargrave raised his voice to a shout. Come to me, my guardians! Come to my voice! The strangest thing happened when he called out to the dead. 
My skin went deathly cold, a shiver of revulsion slithering along every nerve, swamping me with a cloying nausea. The foul odor of rotting decay invaded my senses, but the most telling effect of his dark siren's call was the thick, metallic taste filling my mouth. I had to check for injury, because I tasted blood on my tongue and palate as though a ragged wound leaked inside my mouth. I released Hargrave and took a step away from him, spitting to try and clear the phantom vileness from my tongue. He continued calling out, arms aloft, face turned upwards to the heavens. Lost in his dark rapture and completely unmindful of me and the pistol in my hand, the unnatural power of his commands beckoned the horde of undead to him. Towards me. Erin, said Nate, calm as ice in my earpiece. Fucking move. Now. Then Hargrave's head disintegrated in a spray of gore as Nate switched back to the ferocious power of the PSG-1 and executed him. From such close range, the trauma to the zealot's skull was spectacular, utterly destroying it and ending Hargrave's dark call to arms. I left his headless corpse on the schoolyard, and the bloodiest days of my young life began in earnest. It took two full days to put all the dead down. The estimate of a thousand undead was conservative, because when we carried out the horror of cleaning up the school grounds of all those corpses, Nate reckons it was closer to 1,200. That's a major win in terms of putting down the dead, but holy fucking shit, we paid for it in both resources and blood. We are criminally low on ammunition now because we burned through most of the huge stash of 9mm and 5.56 amassed from our raids on Bancroft and Dean's acquisition from the locker at his HQ. We rotated shifts firing down on the dead that first day as the rifles and pistols needed constantly cleaning and cooling as did the stash of shotguns in use. As of now, we have zero shotgun shells left. Zero. We burned through all of them over the last two days, with all the shotguns firing. We've used up a lot of the random calibers found along the journey as well, such as the small stash of 357 for the couple of revolvers we took from Bancroft and the arsehole cult soldier Tucker. We've used up the 22 LR in the Ruger we acquired in that same rescue. All the little random bits of shit we've come across have all been used up as we tried to conserve as much of the 5.56 and 9mm as we could. But ultimately, we burned through a shitload of that as well. We've avoided going too heavily into the precious 7.62 for Nate's big PSG-1 toy, and still have extras in the six magazines for the couple of AK-47s we got from Bancroft's stash that have never been used. We'll need those rounds, if only for hunting. I'm painfully aware as I write how much I'm hesitating in talking of our own dead. One is too many, but I wish it were only one we lost. I'll get to them, I will because those we lost deserve to be remembered for their acts of valour. History demands we memorialise our heroes as inspiration for those who come after. One bleakly satisfying thing is what happened in the wake of Nate silencing Hargrave's zealous rant. Two other escort vehicles trundled in the mass of undead, and when Maddox groupie toppled off the mortal coil, the dead returned to their instinctive savagery towards any living human. As soon as Hargrave's dark light was extinguished, they reverted to their natural predatory instincts and closed on the vehicles in their midst. It saved us a few rounds by those two vehicles trying to accelerate through the horde, crushing a number of them as they fired from those vehicles, but spikes of bone puncturing tires, or just the sheer number of dead piling up beneath them, jammed those vehicles solid. Rendered immobile, those inside the vehicle panicked and tried to open windows a crack so they could fire on the dead, trying to clear the path in some insane notion that they could somehow escape. 
there was no escape. The two vehicles were tiny islands submerged by an ocean of the dead. Within 20 minutes of being unable to move, those men and women were dead, torn apart to join the legions or silently snapping their jaws at the air while strapped into their seats. Pete, our observer on the monitor, thinks one or two of them may have even turned their weapons on themselves just to end the nightmare. Rather than being torn apart by a hundred grinding jaws, choosing to leave this life quick and painless is probably the option I'd take in their position if I'm honest. Shredded by the teeth of the dead is a horrific end. You know, on reflection, saying I'm satisfied by this outcome is actually incorrect. More loyal soldiers of Maddock put to the sword is a tactical boon to us if I look at it coldly, but I still hate the thought of anyone dying unnecessarily if there was a chance of redemption. Tori is adamant that most of the truly loyal were with Jacob when she shot his throat out, sending the undead at the warehouse mental, and she knows the situation there better than any of us. I can't help but feel that some of those torn apart by the dead could have been turned to a better path if we'd just had a little more time. Sigh. This whole situation is just a steaming pile of shit. I hate it. I've delayed this long enough. It's time to honour the dead and their acts of valour. Looking down from the upper windows of our firing positions, at times it was hard not to feel hopeless. We had to allow the dead between the small staff houses where me, Nate and the Becketts resided, and the two dorm halls that formed the L-shape of our firing positions, filling that space so even novice shooters would find it hard to miss. With so many targets early on, it felt like a mechanical exercise. Fire until empty, reload, start firing again. Even as a brain-dead zombie was executed, its fall was simply swallowed into the thick mass of rippling monsters. There was no sense of victory and no sense of achievement or progression. At times, it felt like trying to keep the ocean at bay with a bucket. A thousand faces filled with hate leered up as we rained hell down on them, all blooded and ragged as the clack of their snapping jaws punctuated the quiet between volleys of fire. Glittering up at us like a field of sickly stars, that mass of milky white eyes chilled the blood. Without being able to see their irises, coated as they were in that demonic film, everyone felt every hateful glare as though it was solely for them. The stench of so many packed undead was invasive and violating, and I feel like I need to shower for a solid week just to scrub that corrupt odour out of every pore. Blast after blast filled the air, rattling the senses, jarring the teeth in my jaw each time, and pounding on eardrums like a sledgehammer. I've had a headache for a week that won't shift, and a whistling whine in my ears I'm terrified might never go away. My arms, shoulders, neck and back are battered beyond belief from the consistent thump of weapon recoil, pounding the same areas over and over, and the muscle-ravaging labour of moving so many corpses. My entire body feels like one giant, swollen bruise. I've forgotten what it feels like to be without some form of pain. I need to sleep and heal for a week, and it's not just my body that needs healing. My heart is fucking broken. We'd reinforced the lower doors and windows of each of our buildings, ensuring sufficient protection against weight of numbers crushing through the dorm entrances. We made a terrible miscalculation, though, and it cost us dearly. This was one of those moments that Nate referred to, and how no plan survives first contact with the enemy. About three quarters of the first day done, just as the sun was going down and the grey murk of twilight started to descend, we all made a terrible realisation. The sheer mass of undead we'd been firing down on was stacking up around the base of the buildings. 
corpse after corpse piled on top of each other, and they were gradually forming a ramp of ravaged cadavers that the walking dead started climbing. Yes, climbing, like a conscious athletic action, rather than a gradual ascent formed by the fall of so many corpses. They were using their hands to balance as they clambered up the ramp of their fallen brethren. Suddenly, these creatures had more purpose, more coordination, and it fucking terrified me. All along the ground floor, the undead ascended to the height of the lower windows, pressing against the thin timbers placed across the bottom of the windows, intended to protect the glass at normal head height. Now, though, the undead pressed directly against the panes from their higher vantage, bodies pushing from behind in greater numbers, increasing the pressure against the thin glass. The plywood panels against the lower part of the windows splintered, and the glass cracked. Urgently, I bellowed this out over the radio, and the fire resumed with ferocity, targeting the undead pressing against the windows from their higher vantage. But there were just too many. The first shattering glass from the floor below me resulted in one of the monsters disappearing from sight as it fell into the building. The dam broke and from Hall Earth across the yard, I saw the first undead topple through broken windows, lumps of bloody flesh left hanging like cloth from jagged shards of glass as the monsters climbed awkwardly to their feet inside the dorm. Breach! I screamed down the radio. Both buildings breached! With everyone split across the two dorms, we were so deep in shit it was running into our proverbial ears. The undead poured through the breached portals, ever increasing in number, and no amount of fire could stem the tide. We just didn't have the necessary firepower to hold back the surge. Each dorm had one main entrance, thoroughly barricaded against the press, but it didn't matter anymore. Like water following the path of least resistance, once that undead pressure vented through the broken windows, the monsters began toppling into both dorm buildings across the outward faces. As panic started erupting across the airwaves in a flurry of tangled voices, and the fear started to take hold, Nate's voice came across the radio like a cooling breeze to soothe the stifling heat of panic. Fire exits to the rear of both buildings are clear. Strong, true, clear, and calm. Every other voice fell quiet as Nate started speaking. That, Freya, is how real authority is measured. No shouting, no raging, no threats. He just started speaking, and everyone else zipped it. Fire exit stairwells are at the rear, and breaches are at the front. Two to three shooters remain in each dorm on the main stairwell. Keep firing down on the undead now in the building, and draw them with your fire. Stack them up and clog those stairwells with corpses. While distraction is in place, all other fire teams escort non-combatants down emergency stairwells to the fire exits and open those doors while defending teams make noise. Make sure everyone exiting the building remains quiet. I know everyone's scared, but you go slow, you stay together and make no sound. Do the best with the kids as you can and move the civilians to the gymnasium fallback position as planned. Jesus, when everyone is losing their shit, there's no sweeter sound or feeling than someone taking complete control. Nate adjusted on the fly without a hint of panic in his tone, and the effect it had on everyone was visible. In Hall Fire, I urged Dean to lead the civilians. He's the best shooter after Nate without a doubt, and he's equally calm in stressful situations. Me and my two new nomad buddies, Mace and Dong, would hold the line in Hall Fire. Elijah was tasked with leading the civilians out of Hall Earth's fire exit, while Nate, Alicia and Finn Archer held their stairwell to keep the dead occupied. Even with Finn's one eye affecting his ranged depth perception, he could still fire a shotgun into a mass from close quarters without issue. When they started pouring into the base of the stairwell, the three of us started unleashing hell down the stairs at the massing undead. Zombies are usually idiots when it comes to traversing stairs. Usually. Something has changed, though, considering the climbing action outside the dorms I'd witnessed. 
My mind inevitably flashes back now to the undead, opening that infirmary door to attack Mace. Now, here we were, with a distinct and obvious evolution from the early days of mindless shambling. We thought it would be easy pickings, but the ravenous legions clambered up the stairs with hardly a pause. What the fuck? The three of us muttered almost simultaneously when the first undead unerringly stepped onto the staircase. It got up three stairs without fault before we got our shit together, blasted it, then started firing down in earnest. They came so fast, it was hard to keep up solid batteries of fire against the mass. There was more purpose to them, more thrust. The staircase should have been a barrier to make life a bit easier, but instead their ease with the ascent only served to make our downward assault more frantic. Something was different about this horde. Whether it was some lingering command given to them by Hargrave, I don't know. But these Zeds had more of an agency to them. Maybe not intelligence, but definitely in coordination, like their instincts had received a tune-up. A series of catastrophic failures hit us then. In a million to one chance, all three of us found ourselves with jams or misfires. The weapons had been working overtime and in need of some TLC, but the people outside making the gymnasium run needed more time. I pulled out my Glock and started firing, as did the two nomads, but we'd soon run out of magazines and the undead corpses were already piling near the top of the short stairwell, with more still filling in below to clamber over their fallen brethren. We needed time to get new weapons and refill empty magazines with fresh rounds, the civilians had carried the stash of backup weapons, ammo and cleaning supplies with them to the gym, so they weren't lost to us when the undead eventually overpowered the building. We've got to go, I said, clicking in my last magazine. They'll follow us, said Mace with a shake of his head. We'll lead them to the exit and out into the space towards the gym. We need to keep them contained. We're about to run dry, Mace, I yelled. We can't hold them off with dick kicks, eye pokes and some stern finger wagging. Dong bellowed a laugh, his amusement changing pitch to a pained roar. The carpet of undead reaching to the top of the stairs weren't all dead. One monster had been shot in the face, but the brain hadn't been touched, instead just having its lower jaw smashed at one side. Slithering from the mass piled atop the steps, one emaciated arm reached out, clasped Dong's ankle, then catapulted itself forward in a single motion. Despite being unable to close a full bite, the monster rammed its upper teeth into Dong's shin like a mountaineer slamming a pick into rock, then scraped those teeth down the front of his leg, peeling cloth and flesh away like wet wallpaper scoured from a surface, exposing the white glisten of bone. Dong wrenched his leg back with a curse, slamming his heel down on the creature's skull, crushing it like rotten fruit. Without a word, he handed over his pistol and overheated shotgun, then drew the wicked machete sheathed at his hip. Against his massive frame, it looked like little more than a large kitchen knife. Go, was all he said. Mace started protesting, and though my heart broke, I pulled him away. The doomsday clock was ticking with the undead teeth peeling his leg, and we all knew it. I shared a final look with Dong, who just nodded grim acceptance before kicking away some of the corpses to advance down four of the stairs and fill the narrow passage like a human barricade. He rolled his head, loosening the muscles of his neck, and waited for the next undead advance. In the clean-up later the following day, we found his undead form and put him to rest. He was covered in bite wounds, so many it was hard to count. The dead stop biting when a victim falls, so Dong must have stayed on his feet for a hellish amount of time to sustain that many separate injuries. By all the hells of all the religions, that boy did not go down easy. 
There were at least 20 fallen undead in that stairwell, with skulls split by a machete, stamped on by his massive boot, or heads smashed against the walls of the stairwell, evidenced by the crimson smears on those whitewashed surfaces. Bitten and torn to all hell, bleeding from God knows how many wounds, Richard Dong Biggs went down like the valiant last stand of a hero from an epic fantasy novel. There was no ignoble death for our nomad refugee. He went out with the blaze of a dying star. As Elijah escorted his wards from Hall Earth, Nate's team defended their stairwell. One of the smaller kids from Willow Park's group panicked as they were running across the open space towards the back of our building. The kid was about six or seven, his tiny mind blinded by the chaos and noise, the dark only ramping his fear, and he ran off in the wrong direction. His dad slipped as he reached out, yelping as he twisted his ankle. Crying out his son's name in horror drew the attention of undead from the mass, a contingent peeling away from the edge of the horde. The kid was hurtling towards them, crying and sobbing, in full flight mode and blind to the danger he scampered towards. Elijah urged everyone else on, raising his rifle and firing as he chased after the child, trying to drop those closest in the boy's path, but knowing deep in his soul he wouldn't get there in time. Enter the smallest hero of the battle. Joseph Evans was just 14 years old. I learned a few days ago from his friend, Daniel, that Joseph was something of an athlete, a promising sprinter at the 100 and 200 meter distances. Without the burden of weighty weapons and ammo, he whipped past Elijah like the wind at full pace, reaching the small boy just as the nearest monster was about to fall upon the child and fucking shielded the kid with his own body. Yanking the child violently away and stopping the youngster dead, he virtually hurled the little boy back towards the advancing Elijah, even as Joseph's momentum carried him into the mass of undead. Not just carried him, though. Elijah said it was almost like he accelerated, throwing himself at the creatures, slamming into them and making just enough time for Eli to reach the small kid and sweep him up from the floor in one arm. Joseph disappeared under the ravenous mass of undead, and Elijah said his screaming was mercifully short, though I can see the memory haunts him. It's a strange paradox. On one hand, the incredible courage in the face of knowing he was going to die a horrific death, yet still throwing himself headlong into that demonic mass to save the life of a child he didn't know is inspiring beyond anything you can imagine. That incredible bravery, that sacrifice, from a boy of just 14 years old, is phenomenal. And I'll forever be in awe of that kid's monumental courage. The other side of that bleak coin, however, is that Elijah watched a child swallowed up by the hateful mass, helpless as his dying wails of agony echoed in the night as he backed away with the small boy under one arm. Joseph Evans was small for 14. He was smaller than all the other boys his age here, and smaller even than some of the girls. But for what he did, for what he gave, Joseph will always be a giant to us. Once the civilians were all located in the gymnasium, then came the hardest graft of all. We shivered in the gym while the undead still rampaged out in the growing darkness, forced to remain as quiet and still as we could. It was a harrowing night of getting our weapons operational again, desperately trying to keep scared children from making noise and seeing the looks of hopeless terror carved into every shadowed face as we worked by flashlight. We couldn't go out into the night and fight the dead. There was too much peril stumbling about in the dark, We'd likely shoot each other or get ambushed by wandering undead. I mean, what kind of madman would go into the darkness to take on the legions of the damned? Nathaniel James Carter, that's who. 
Taking Dean's G36C with suppressor, loading up every magazine he had for it, filling every pocket with magazines of 9mm for his Glock and even a shotgun slung over his back, Nate painted his face black, strapped on his NVGs and went out into the cold winter night. Alone. For nigh on eight hours, in the biting darkness, Nate pulled the horde to and fro. His only goal was to give all of us rest, give us a chance to maintain the weapons and reload magazines, and keep the monsters from the gym doors so they didn't hear our desperate attempts to keep the children quiet. He switched between the three weapons, using the suppressed rifle to pick off targets edging around the dorm building that might head towards the gym. And when it started to look like a group might be drawn towards where all our people were hiding, he'd go ultra loud. Switching to the shotgun and unleashing a storm of buckshot at the rogue group, he'd draw the attention of the whole horde towards the thunder of his weapon, ensuring he was their sole focus and drawing them away from investigating the gym any further. For eight fucking hours. I thought I'd mention that again. He moved like a vengeful wraith through the night, toying with the horde, not a soul watching his six, tactically moving the dark host this way and that, using every inch of the terrain to his advantage, for no other reason than to let the rest of us gather our wits and courage. He must have put down a couple of hundred undead single-handed during that first night, which is fucking staggering. He played Overwatch for that whole night, keeping the demons from our door and Captain Evil's personal scourge. When the sun finally started wiping the darkness from the sky, we formed up in fire teams of three, each led by an experienced shooter with two novices, and went out into the frost-coated dawn. It was a long fucking day. A long day. We moved around in our little trios, harrying the undead flanks, peeling them off in groups in different directions, funneling them into choke points, or dragging them out into open space where we could fire while moving backwards into safe space. We'd taken care of a good chunk of the mass the previous day, when just blasting down from first floor windows into the sea of dead, so there was a bit more space to bob and weave, providing we watched our footing and didn't go arse over tit on all the corpses. It's all a blur, in truth. I fired, reloaded, and checked on my two novices constantly. Lucy and Kate were two of the women liberated from the nomads, and they are hard women. There's no giving them, Lucy especially. She reminds me a little of Alicia in some ways, but not heated and vengeful as Alicia was at the start. Lucy has adapted swiftly with an intensity of simmering heat. It's always bubbling away, always burning, but acutely under control. Like a trio of gun-toting Amazons, we battered the shit out of our bodies with recoil, unmindful of the blistering cold as we dragged a breakaway group from the horde into the open space in front of the admissions building, near Hargrave's corpse. With a constant, steady backwards walk, we staggered our fire, leaving a scatter of ruined undead in our wake, spreading the death out over a wide area. The two of them were solid, in control, and complete fucking heroes. Until Kate ran dry. I need a resupply, was all she said, and set off at a run back for the gym. She didn't heed the calls of me or Lucy, consumed by a need to get back in the fight. Rather than thinking clearly and letting us walk her back safely for a reload, she acted on impulse, thinking to replenish and get back to us in a couple of quick sprints. Just like Dong's demise, there was a corpse on the frosty earth that wasn't dead. Lucy and Kate don't hit the head every time, and some low shots with their shotguns took out legs or hips, leaving a crippled corpse. I can't keep my eye on everything. I don't have Nate's innate and ridiculously perceptive combat sense. And the two of them were novices. I'm still a novice if you really think about it, but I've had the benefit of Nate all this time and absorbed many of his good habits. Whoever took that zombie down initially probably put it out of their mind as it crumpled, focusing attention on those still upright and ambling towards us. There were corpses everywhere, so it was easy to miss a grounded one if you're not paying attention. 
When you're fighting hordes of the walking dead, though, you can never afford to be lax in your vigilance. In her eagerness for resupply and rejoining the effort, Kate ran too close to the crippled zombie, yelping as a rotten hand landed on her instep as she was running, throwing her gait completely off. She hit the frost-hardened grass face first. The zombie's hand still on her foot, and now with a solid grip, the crippled undead dragged itself to her and smashed its gaping jaws into the fleshy meat of her calf. Kate screamed as the creature's head tore back, ripping a sickening chunk of tissue and muscle from the limb, visible steam rising from the hot exposed flesh and blood in the frigid winter air. Before either of us could put a round in the monster's skull, Kate wrenched her leg free of its grip, climbed to her feet with a grimace, then screamed obscenities at the thing and fucking pounded that zombie's skull to pulp with the butt of her shotgun. Why do I tell you this? Kate went and got her resupply, got Doc Emma to dress her wound, came back to the fight limping on her ruined leg and fought for another hour before the sickness poisoning her stole the last vestiges of her strength. With the darkness rising up to swallow her, eyes starting to sicken to that nauseating white, she simply turned to us and said just three words. I'm done, girls. Without further ceremony, she turned the shotgun on herself and pulled the trigger. Kate fought until she could fight no more, and before the sickness turned her into another enemy inside our gate, she took herself off the board. Fucking hero. There were two other deaths in a couple of other groups, one formerly of Willow Park, one from the nomad refugees. Both were just unlucky, Zeds getting too close or breaking formation and getting themselves cornered to be pounced on by the dead. Kevin Proctor and Nick Dillon did their part. They fought for their families, for our community. But weight of numbers and lack of experience took them down. They're still heroes to us, though. They did their part and will be forever grateful. There was one more death to come, the hardest of all to take. Kevin, Nick, Dong, Joseph and Kate all went out like the heroes they are. The sixth and final death, however, was just pure tragedy. While Elijah was out with the fire teams taking down Zeds, Theodore's pen ran dry. He carried a small sketchbook and pen around with him at all times, as that was how Elijah kept him calm when always on the move and changing locations prior to us finding them. Routine was inherently important to him, and the only way Elijah could keep Theodore quiet and away from the attention of the undead when in an unfamiliar location was by him having the means to draw. When his pen ran dry... Theodore started losing it, becoming aggressive and constantly repeating, no more lines, no more lines, over and over. Maria and Doc Emma didn't know what he meant, and he started smashing fists into his temples with ferocity, slipping further into a disturbing tantrum edging towards complete loss of control. Worried he might genuinely do himself harm, Others made the grave mistake of trying to physically restrain him, which pushed him over the precipice. With Theodore getting more unruly, Doc Emma feared the restraint was aggravating his panic and demanded everyone release their hold. The moment those restraining him backed off, Theodore bolted before anyone could react, through the gymnasium door and out into the afternoon in mere seconds. Once outside, he bellowed for Elijah, but his brother was on the far side of campus with his team and didn't hear his shouts. I was the nearest at the time, recognizing his voice, dread rising from my guts like bile. If I could hear him between the blasts of gunfire, then so could the predatory dead. Seeking the art supplies from home, scattered dead still wandered the open space between the dorm buildings and staff housing. Theodore just didn't, see them. His mind was fixed on relieving his need for a pen. 
In helpless horror, I watched as he appeared a hundred yards away and ran in a perfect straight line towards his house, the threats all around him unseen. Already running towards him, I screamed as the first undead hand caught his shoulder. It ruined his balance, causing him to stumble and plunge forward, crashing to the blood-soaked asphalt on hands and knees. He started crying, staring at his skinned palms, not hearing me as I sprinted towards him, screaming his name over and over, firing as fast as I could to keep the closing stragglers from him. But there were too many. I wasn't fast enough. The first one reached him, dropping to its knees and driving its teeth into his shoulder, grinding through flesh and muscle as Theodore shrieked in response. Jesus, the sound of his terror and pain still haunts me. Despite being in his early twenties, it was a childlike shriek of agony, not the roar of an adult man. And he just sat there, screaming. There was no fight or attempt to get away. He just screamed without understanding what was happening to him, or why. Another one fell to its knees on his other side, its rotten jaw falling into the meat of his thigh, and the shrieking rose further in pitch, punctuated by sobs. At full sprint, the rifle slung round my back and the glock out, a third undead dropped beside him, its maw grinding against the side of his head, ripping his right ear away in a single bloody bite. All the while, Theodore sat there, shrieking and motionless. Now and again, I heard him cry, No more lines, through his terrified agony. When I finally reached him, I dragged the monsters off by the scruff of their neck, blasting their skulls from point blank with the pistol until it was just me standing over the blooded, sobbing Theodore still on his knees, staring at the blood on his palms from his tumble to the asphalt, repeating that same phrase. No more lines. No more lines. Someone must have called Elijah on the radio as he appeared as I was stood over the sobbing Theodore with Lucy beside me, kicking and blasting any monster daring to come near. As his two fire team partners added their guns to mine and Lucy's, we formed a square around the crying man, and Elijah kneeled next to his little brother, pulling a small ballpoint pen from a pocket and handing it to Theodore. Like magic, Theodore calmed as he grasped it. Despite the awful wounds to his leg and shoulder and the ear completely torn away, he sighed in near contentment as he hugged the small pen to him. We've got to move, Eli, I said, little more than a choked sob. Come on, Theodore, he urged softly, his voice gentle as he helped his brother to his feet. Let's get you some paper. We haven't got time for this, said one of Eli's comrades in frustration. We're going to get surrounded. I've since found out his name is Aubrey, and I don't like the twat one little bit. This was the beginning of a mutual dislike, and his words pushed my heartache aside for a moment, filling the hollow space with fury. That's his fucking brother, you shit-sucking twat, I snarled. He's dead anyway, retorted Aubrey with a huff. Let's just get it done and get out of here. Remember how I've described my lack of impulse control? At that moment, all thought of consequence left me. That shitty, heartless comment while Elijah was right next to him sent me into a cyclone of blind rage. For a moment, I stopped firing, took two frenzied steps towards Aubrey, and smacked a right hook to his sour mouth. Doc Emma had to take two of his teeth out under pain medication hours later because they were barely hanging in his bloody mouth by a thread. This girl knows how to punch, remember? I regret nothing. He hit the ground, and I returned back to firing on the closing crowd of undead. Aubrey didn't respond, picking himself up and spitting blood, returning to the job at hand without further comment, but giving me a look of absolute hatred. I won't lose any sleep over it. We moved away, and other fire teams joined us, Nate included. 
his strong hand alighted on my shoulder. Eli needs you right now, he said. I got this. Christ. Nate looked exhausted. Dark smudges were painted below his eyes, and he looked like he might topple any moment. Despite fighting all day, then solo all night to keep the wolves from our door, the old warrior carried right on through the second day. Somehow, Nate finds new ways for me to be in awe of him. I didn't argue, and if Aubrey thought of making any further dumb comments, Nate's presence and commanding authority over the combined teams silenced any intended bullshit. I helped Eli move Theodore to the side of their house, knowing what the dying man needed. I quickly stepped inside, grabbed the nearest pad of paper from the kitchen table, and passed it into Theodore's hands when I returned to them. Elijah's eyes were wet with tears, and I don't know how he kept his voice so calm and soothing for Theodore. His brother smiled happily, despite the angry wounds sucking the life from him, blood running down his neck from his severed ear, his clothing drenched in blood from the other two monstrous bites. He just started to draw. Eli looked up, the pain in his eyes almost too much for me to bear. We couldn't let Theodore go down hard, poisoned by the dark force of evil. I knew Eli wanted Theodore's end to be painless and serene, but the thought of pulling the trigger on his own brother was too much in the stress of the moment, guns still thundering all around us. It was plain in his haunted, blasted stare. Full circle, Freya. I couldn't do it for you. I wasn't ready and needed an eight to carry the weight. Back then, it was too much. I could carry it now. I could do it for Theodore. And I could do it for Elijah. This was hard enough for him, and putting down his own little brother was a weight I couldn't bear to see him carry. I drew my Glock, slid the chamber to check for a round, and locked eyes with Elijah. I've got this, Eli, I said. The sound of gunfire a storm in the air around us, Nate's commanding voice in absolute control. Our shield was giving us this moment, this calm eye of the storm as chaos raged everywhere else, so fuck the plan for this short time. Just this once. Eli said nothing, a combination of grief, gratitude and shame rolling out from him. Grief for Theodore's loss, gratitude for me taking the responsibility, and shame because he didn't have the strength to do it. I know that sickening mix all too well, eh, Freya? He kneeled next to his little brother, kissing the crown of his head, before ruffling his hair as only a big brother could. You draw me a picture, Theodore, he said, thick and heavy. Okay, chimed the dying man, eyes fixed to the page. Eli nodded and turned away, rifle shouldered and up, vigilant for any encroaching undead. Theodore didn't react to me sliding behind him, lost as he was in his art. Despite his awful injuries, he didn't appear to feel them. Once more in his happy place, he felt safe, calm. This time there was no hesitation. This wasn't for me. This was for Theodore, and above all, for Elijah. Elijah's entire body tightened with the gunshot, and I moved beside him, placing a hand on his forearm. We'll come back for him, I promised. He nodded, pushing his personal grief down for the moment, hiding it in the darkest, dustiest corners of his heart, and we went back to work. Thank you, he wheezed. Nothing else needed saying. As dusk fell on the second day, we were done. Once the grounds were cleared, we baited out those undead trapped in dorm buildings and took them out like a firing squad. 
campus was a blood-drenched massacre. The past five days, we've scrubbed every inch of campus clean. Mark worked diligently on the asphalt with a pressure washer found in the maintenance area to blast it clean of blood and gore. Over the next week, we'll be putting everything back together, like acquiring new windows from a glass store in town. Moving so many bodies was horrific, transporting them all to one far corner of the playing field. A team went out and located a small, tracked excavator from a construction site, and Doug Archer used the equipment to scoop a mass grave for all the corpses of the undead. It was miserable, back-breaking work that will haunt us all until the end of time, and only the small children were spared the disturbing horror of that grim labour. Yesterday we held a funeral and memorial for our six fallen in a designated cemetery. When we brought Isaac's body back from the college, this is where we decided to bury and honour our dead. Our heroes. I stayed with Elijah last night, returning the favour he once gave me. He couldn't be alone after burying his little brother, so I lay with him, holding him until he fell asleep when the grief finally burned him out. I don't know where we go from here. I do know that Maddock and his dark command of the dead has to go. All my efforts have to be directed towards ending his black reign, showing his people there's another way. Kevin Proctor, Nick Dillon, Richard Dong Biggs, Joseph Evans, Kate Alderman and Theodore Beckett were lost to us. Five heroic deaths and lives sacrificed so that others may live. And one heartbreaking tragedy, dealt by a world too cruel for such a gentle soul. We preserved many lives with this victory, and the acts of valour from five of our fallen will never be forgotten. But we didn't save everyone, and I doubt my heart will ever be whole again. Everyone fought heroically did their part, but if I had a medal to pin on anyone's chest, it would be Nate. What he did that night, alone in the dark, keeping us all safe just to let us all breathe for a little while, was an act of singular selfless courage and raw fortitude I doubt I'll ever see the likes of again. He really is our shield, protecting us from the darkness, and I'm forever thankful he came into my life. Peace, Freya. All I want is peace. If we're ever to find it, then this final confrontation is unavoidable. It's time to end this. Part 3 The Flame February 10th, 2011 To plan B or not to plan B? That is the question. I've got the beginnings of a plan. Yes, I know it's been nine days since I last wrote anything, but it's been nothing but rebuilding here of late. We had to build new gates, which needed metal and timber, so clearing those bodies up by the gas shop and builder's yard was necessary to get timber from the building wholesaler and metal from the nearby scrapyard. I made sure we got enough extra metal and put in my order for an armoured pickup from Clyde. Damn it, if it's the last thing I do on this earth, I'll have my bloody warthog. We've had to replace all those lower windows, so a trip to the glass shop was needed. And wouldn't you know it, one of those Willow Park people was a glazier. So thank you, Team Light, for setting that up. We've had to acquire new bedding and furniture for the dorm buildings, because everything the dead touched is tainted. So we've burned everything and disinfected those buildings ten times over, therefore needing to acquire a metric ton of industrial cleaning supplies. You get the picture. We've been busy as all hell. In the meantime, Tori and I discussed how to take on Maddock and sway hearts and minds away from him. We've got a safe plan A, and I floated a mentally risky plan B past Tori. She sees the logic, but hates it. And if she hates it, because of the danger it poses to me and Tori personally, then Nate will lose his fucking mind if I tell him. 
I'm going to keep that one close to my chest for now and hope I don't need it. If I do, though, Nate's going to have to suck it up as he's an integral part of it. I'm keeping Plan B out of my journal for the moment. You never know if Captain Evil is peering over your shoulder. If you are reading this, you evil shit licker, just know I'm typing all these words with the middle finger of my right hand. Plan A is using the radio. We'll go to Nate's undiscovered sniper hide and have a conversation with this first disciple. There are few in this life that can annoy people better than me, and I'm a narcissist's worst nightmare. I will give you zero respect and be so mockingly childish there's no chance of having a reasonable adult conversation with me. It worked with Bancroft, and I'm hoping it'll work with this murderous twat as well. Hopefully, the radio traffic will be heard by everyone near a handset in Ascension. All the guards have one, and with the creeping dread pervading the whole settlement and eyes on everyone should they try to escape as Tory did, it's likely a large chunk of the population will get to hear their lord and master for who he really is. If that doesn't work, then it's on to plan B. I'll tell Nate plan B when it's the only viable option. He will just give me a flat, fuck off Erin, no chance, if I tell him now, and he'll try to dissuade me. Sorry, Nate. I love you to bits, but I can't take your nagging for the next week or two. These entries will be few and far between now, I think. At least until this is resolved, or there are no more entries because I'm dead. I don't want to lay out all my plans in this journal. I just want to get shit done and put an end to this threat. I'd really like to make some new friends instead of having to kill people. Killing that undead horde was hard, miserable work, especially as I lost friends to the monstrous bastards. But it was also a reminder of what we should be doing. Putting that many undead to rest felt like a colossal victory in many ways, despite the tragic cost. We, the living, should be uniting against the demons that have invaded our world, we should be exorcising those undead demons, not going to war with each other. I can feel it coming, Freya. I don't know how to describe it. It's a shit or bust moment, all in with the chips in the middle of the table and only the river card to turn. A convergence of forces. The flame and the disciple, playing for it all. Not long now. First, though. I'm going to annoy the living shit out of Maddock. February 17th, 2011. Three little things. More hard work for a week. I'll not list everything because you know how bored I am by mundane details. We're rebuilding, dealing with the grief of our losses, and panicking like hell about our major dearth of ammunition. We've been so comfortable for so long with the massive stash we got from ours and Dean's halls that it's now a genuine concern. We have to be careful with every round, making my plan even more important. We can't afford a major gunfight in either people or ammunition. So now I have to go with the hearts and minds approach. Even if plan A doesn't work on its own, it will plant seeds for plan B. Tomorrow, we three torchbearers are heading to Nate's hidey hole near Ascension, and I'm going to have me a nice chat with evil Jesus. It's time to put plan A into motion, which I've decided to name Operation Cockwomble, because it makes me laugh, and Lord knows I need a fucking laugh. Plan B will be Operation Shit or Bust, because it really is an all-or-nothing gamble. I'll be victorious, or I'll be dead. Today's entry can be summed up by three positive things from the past week. Positives are difficult to find of late, so I'm taking the wins where I can. Firstly, we now have new gates. Mark and Clyde have put together a beast out of wood and metal. Hinged braces are fixed to the inner face, from which posts fold out and slot into small grooves we smashed into the asphalt of the road to really jam them in. 
Next time anyone attempts to drive at speed through our new fortress gates, they'll get a nasty surprise. Velocity, meet the immovable object. Secondly, we've had no further incursions of living or dead. Maddock must be bricking it now, because his little worshipper Hargrave hasn't returned in two weeks, and neither have any of his people. There's no way that coward will come crawling outside his protective walls, and if he tries to push anyone else out to assault us, he could meet resistance. After all, their last two big operations have resulted in a big chunk of their security forces not returning home. The warehouse when Tori escaped was a huge blow, losing Tyler and the most loyal and experienced of their security force. Now they've lost Hargrave and another chunk of shooters. I doubt anyone will be rushing to volunteer. Last, and most certainly not least, is that I've achieved my dream. Well, Mark and Clyde achieved that dream for me. Oh yes, Freya. Lucky has her warthog. The pickup is a damn sight heavier and slower now, but it has an angled blade like a plow fixed to the front, which can be unhitched so maintenance can be carried out on the engine. This will let me crunch through the undead in a pinch and keep them from going under my tires. The doors have armored plates welded to them, and in a pinch, there's now a metal shutter on the inside of the windscreen that can be pulled down with a narrow slit to see out of. The changes aren't much, and I can't have the Mad Max vehicle of spiky doom that I wanted because of stupid physics. Apparently it will be too heavy if they put any more on. But still, Lockie has her warthog, and such a stupid thing has made me way happier than it has any right to. Tomorrow is Operation Cockwomble, and I'll report back on our return. There's no danger in this one, as we'll be hidden a quarter mile away. So expect my bardic recounting of my first conversation with evil Jesus forthwith. February 18th, 2011. A different threat. I thought I was going to roll in and fuck shit up, just like I did with Bancroft when I got under his skin. Maddock, however, is an entirely different personality to our fallen king shit of Turd Mountain. We rolled up to the farmhouse Nate and Alicia used as a forward operating base when observing Ascension. After parking up, Nate went off with his big rifle to his sniper hide to watch Resurrection HQ while Tori and I moved the radio into the farmhouse. As soon as Nate signalled over our encrypted radio he was set and watching the place through his scope, I punched in the radio code and passed the handset to Tori. Me? I nodded. The people in there should hear your voice first, Tori. If they hear one of their own, they'll listen. Don't worry, I reassured with a mischievous grin. I'll take over soon enough. Tori nodded and blew out a calming breath as she took the handset. Hello, John, she said by way of opening. It was about a minute before we got any response. Who is this? The male voice was clear, his diction perfect and tone commanding, overly dramatic even. It's Tori Cates, John. Remember me? I remember a traitor by that name, was the hissed response. One who abandoned all she believed in and fled to the arms of our enemies. I never swallowed your fabricated mythology, John. I was never a believer. The truth is, I intended to expose you for the fraud you are before everything went to hell. You see, I am, was, a journalist. I know all about your unremarkable life, all your get-rich-quick schemes, and all your failed careers because of your arrogance. I know you planned to steal Oliver's fortune and abandon all those good people who put their faith in you, John. Nate's voice came softly over our radio. People are crowding to those with handsets. Even the guards have stopped to listen. 
Maddox's response was venomous. Jacob is dead because of you. A good man died because of your treachery, and with his death, so many more were taken by the dead. Only three made it back, exhausted, bedraggled, forced to walk all the way home. A good man, scoffed Tory. A good man, John. Between you, Jacob, and Oliver, how many innocent people did you murder? And where's it got you? War is never without cost, even for the righteous. Righteous? Tory openly laughed down the mic, hard and bitter. Righteous, John. You murdered people for your own ends, to hold on to your transient power, allying yourself with a dark force that wants to destroy us all. You're deluded, John. You've been duped and made a pawn, doing the work of the dark by killing what's left of the living. With no more survivors to feed your evil pact, you've turned on your own. How do you think all the people listening to this feel, John? How do they feel when you steal their loved ones away so you can execute them and wash your hands in their blood? Sacrifice is necessary if the greater good is to be achieved. My turn, I said, holding out my hand. Tori smiled, nodding as she handed it over. Clicking the mic, I put on my cheeriest, most irritating voice. Hello, is this customer service? I chimed happily. I'd like to place an order for my creepy hooded robe in time for the next ritual sacrifice. Tell me, do you have it in a small? Silence for a moment. I have that effect on people. To whom am I speaking? My name's Erin, Johnny Boy, Erin Locke. You might have dreamed about me when Captain Evil's been running its mouth off. I'm the flame you've got a hard on for. Silence again for a moment. The Lord of the Dead has spoken truth again, it would appear, purred Maddock. The auspicious day draws ever nearer, and you come to me seeking salvation. Fucking hell, Voldemort, I huffed. Your wheel might be turning, but your hamster's definitely dead. Why all the creepy villain talk? This isn't sword and sorcery, John. I haven't come to fulfill any dark prophecy or any of that bullshit. Stop all this dark god and destiny turd talk and be real for a minute, yeah? Your disrespect does not go unnoticed. Do not test the limits of my patience. Can I skip this tutorial if I press the X button? Do I need to turn you off and on again? Would a reboot help? Stop with all this fucking grandiose and dramatic speech, Johnny, and speak proper, like which I does. Tory stifled a snigger. Let's be real here, John. You're a fucking con man who got caught with his hand in the cookie jar when the world shat itself in June, and you've had to adapt to a new narrative. Since then, Captain Evil has had its hand shoved up your ass like the Muppet you are, and you've been singing his song ever since, dancing away to his murderous tune. Where's it got you, Johnny? Your two lackeys are dead. You've murdered countless innocents. You've killed some good friends of mine with the horde Oliver brought with him and you've fallen so low that you've turned to cutting the throats of your own. Quite frankly, I'm amazed the people haven't risen up to depose you. You're not a chosen one or an icon to be revered and adored. You're a false prophet being played into flushing humanity down the cosmic toilet after you've taken your own personal dump on their heads. You're a fucking tyrant, Johnny. The dead stand watch at our gates as a reminder, hissed Maddock. A stark signal to all of what awaits should we stray from the path the dark spirit laid out for us. Without sacrifice, the dead would destroy us all. Some must die, so the rest may live in peace. His voice seemed to gather power as he spoke his next line. I am the only thing that stands between humanity and its ultimate destruction. 
what an absolute crock of curried elephant turd that is, I snorted. Have you heard yourself, Darth Maddock? Do you practice these lines in front of the mirror? It may have worked before, but your people are seeing you for what you are. My voice hardened. Your little lovebird brought a horde of more than a thousand undead to my home, to my people, and we killed them all, Joffrey. All of them, including your pathetic minion. I lost six people to that horde, and one of them was too many. Yet you've happily killed three people every fucking week since all this began, and for what? to prevent a handful of dead outside your gate from writing some disgruntled letters. With all the guns you've got in there, you could have taken them down easily. Even though he couldn't see me, I still shook my head in disgust. No, Sauron. You're not saving humanity. You're imprisoning it with fear and killing it piece by piece. This has to end. There's only one way this ends. Evil one, said Maddock, his voice low and cold through the airwaves. And that is with your blood. The dark spirit swears your blood will end the need for sacrifice. You can end all of this, Erin Locke. All you have to do is the noble act of sacrifice to save the humanity you profess to protect. I could almost hear his smug smile of satisfaction through the radio. If you truly wish to protect the last souls of humanity, then give yourself freely. One little cut, and all these people will be free, Erinlock. The dead will leave our gates, and we can rebuild, once more living in peace and prosperity. Your blood and the blood of the traitor beside you. Until your souls are set free, all will suffer for your selfishness. This is the Lord of the Dead's decree, and who am I to question a power so great that it can make the dead walk? What an absolute shithead, huh? It's not an act anymore, said Tori, shaking her head. He really believes it, Erin. He's lied to himself for so long that all he has left is the lie. It's now his only truth. I sighed and clicked the radio again. And that's what it'll take to prevent any more deaths. To halt the inevitable war between our people that will only see more bodies in the ground for your crazy belief. That, and only that, Erin Locke. I hated the way he kept using my full name. It is the only way to appease the dark spirit's wrath. Two souls for all of what is left of humanity. Remember, Erin Locke, that the horde Oliver brought to your door was only a drop in the ocean of undead out beyond our walls. How long can you survive, wave after wave, night after night, week after week? He laughed then, a bleak and soulless rumble of black humor. If you kill me, the dark spirit's chosen son, then his wrath will be endless and mighty, so do not think one bullet from a cowardly assassin could end this today. You are wrong. Nate, are you safe? Hissed Tori into our radio. All good, he answered immediately, leading us both to blow out a relieved breath. There are no other choices, Erin Locke, continued Maddock, now feeling completely in control. You say you want humanity to survive and have the opportunity to prove the truth of your words. I will part the dead at our gate, ready for the auspicious day. The third day of the third month and the third hour, you could free everyone. Think on it 
and when ready to accept this immutable truth, I shall receive you. Until then, there are no more words to be said, Erin Locke. Words alone no longer suffice. Now, only a single action can redeem humanity for its second chance. And I will be waiting. That was the end of the communication. I turned to Tori and sighed. Well then, operation shit or bust it is. Nate is going to fucking hate this. February 21st, 2011. I knew he'd hate it. You've got to be fucking kidding me, stormed Nate. Absolutely not. That's fucking suicide. I decided to open this entry with Nate's response to plan B. I knew he'd hate it. It's the only way, Nate. We can't take the chance that popping his melon with a sniper round won't trigger another horde in response. We need to take away his power, and this is the only way to do it. I sighed. Look, if you had one shot or one opportunity to seize everything you ever wanted in one moment, would you capture it or let it slip? Nate paused for a moment, staring at me. Erin, did you really just quote Eminem at me? I did my own thoughtful pause. Let's call it inspired by him, shall we? He shook his head and sighed. And you're on board with this, he asked Tori. Her response was more measured. It's the only way, she agreed. The only way to take Maddox's power from him is by taking away his menacing mystique. They fear his power more than they trust us right now. And if you do assassinate him from afar, and it does trigger a response from the undead, we'll have lost them forever. We might even doom them. Nate pinched the bridge of his nose, taking slow breaths to calm himself. How can I protect you both if you walk into the lion's den without me? Because, I said, the only way you can protect us is by not being with us. No sense, Erin. That makes no sense. I told Nate my whole plan then. I'm not writing it in here because, well, you never know. I'll tell it as history if I survive this thing. Me, Tori, and you, I said finally. It has to be us three. Dean can play Overwatch with your big gun if needed, and if necessary, we can have a QRF at the farmhouse ready to rock when all is done and dusted. But this, Nate, this has to be done by the three of us. This is what we've been building towards. Tori's faith in us and in the people of Ascension is what gets us here, that this is the right path. I've no fucking clue what I'll say if this comes off, but it's my role to convince them there is another way. And you, you big dolt, make sure we get that chance. Everything is three, I added, remembering poor Theodore's favourite phrase. I hate it, repeated Nate. I simply moved to him, threw my arms around his waist, and crushed myself to him in a squeezing hug. I know. The plan is set in stone now. Pretty much everyone we brought in on it hates it as well. Maria near lost her fucking mind when she found out. Dean was clearly concerned, but his faith in me has never wavered, and I love him for it. Everyone is on edge and nervous as the whispers spread around, hardly believing what Tori and I plan to do. We're going to hand ourselves over to Maddock, just like he wants. Little does he realise, however, that Operation Shit or Bust depends on us being under his knife. I'm going to write Little now. My head has to be in the game. Maddock loves his auspicious day, so I'm going to hand myself over the day before. Until then, I'll be going dark. Hope to see you soon. March 1st, 
2011. Promises. Damn it. One last entry before Operation Shit or Bust, as it needs recording. Largely because I feel as giddy as a schoolgirl. Elijah knocked on my door this afternoon. Nate was out and about on campus, drilling the novices in weapons training, so I made Eli a brew. I was just about to sit down and eat a bowl of canned chicken soup I'd heated up and seasoned. I offered to share it with him, though he politely declined. Who decided chicken soup was a thing, by the way? What culinary pioneer woke up one day and thought, you know what we should do? We should drink a chicken. Not disturbing you, am I? He asked. I shook my head as I tasted my meal and twisted my face. No, I was going to eat this soup, but I think I got a little carried away seasoning it. I added so much salt and pepper, I'm fairly certain I heard the soup singing, ah, push it. Eli snorted a snotty chuckle. It was nice to see him laugh again. Theodore's loss has been hard on him. Hell, it's cut me to the heart of my heart, so only the powers know how heartbroken he is. This plan of yours is madness, Erin, he said finally. There was no accusation in his tone, just a statement of fact. I know, but it's shit or bust time, Eli. This needs to end. We win and hold the line that little longer and get some new friends. Or we lose everything. I'm aware what's at stake. Elijah shook his head. I don't mean all the big stuff, Erin. I mean you. Bemused, I kind of gave him a Scooby-Doo-esque. Huh? I want you to come home, he said softly those pretty green eyes never leaving mine. You have to come home. I intend to, but we don't always get what we want in life. Well, I want this, he said. With his eyes still fixed to mine, he added, I want you to come home. To me. This should have been so cinematic and romantic, a story for the ages. Instead, Elijah delivered his passionate plea with all his smouldering intensity right when I was sipping at my coffee. It took me by such surprise, I snorted my hot brew out of my nose, dribbling a load of it down my top and onto the couch, then proceeded to have a choking fit as I tried to expel coffee from my lungs and nostrils. Not my finest hour, Freya. He chuckled again, grabbed a tea towel to clean myself with, and sat down opposite. I want you to make me a promise, Erin, he continued, reaching out a hand to take mine. No ifs, ands, or buts. I want your oath. If you go down on one knee, I swear I'll punch you in the nose. Another chortle before shaking his head. No. It's a lot less dramatic and nowhere near as weird. I mean, I hardly know you. Says the man who's been in bed with me twice all snugly like. Yeah, you should know something, Erin. He affected a mock expression of pained regret. You should be aware that you snore. It sounds like the bones of your face are breaking. I snorted a laugh. Yeah, well, if a guy really is into me, he'd be all, oh yeah, you rumble like that sexy diesel engine you are, baby. So maybe you should take a good look at yourself. Eli laughed openly, and it was the first time I'd seen him laugh like that since losing Theodore. A little bit of light pushed at the shadows trailing him in that brief moment. When he finally stopped, he shook his head and sighed. Erin. I want you to promise me that you won't go off half-cocked and do something reckless that gets you killed. I know you want to save everyone, but I believe you can do what you need to do without sacrificing yourself. So whatever you've got to do in this mad plan of yours, I know you have to do it. But promise me you'll stick to the plan, yeah? Do everything you can to walk out of there and come home. To me.
He smiled then. That stupid, dazzling smile that made me so giddy the first time I met him. I'll be waiting. He leaned over, placed a soft kiss on my forehead, then left. I haven't stopped smiling all night. Particles is giving me some extra attention tonight. Again, it's like my little pooch knows something big is coming and is being hyper-affectionate this evening. He doesn't seem happy until he's back in my lap and snuggling into me. This really is it now, Freya. Tomorrow, it's time for Operation Shit or Bust. And now, it seems like I've got an extra reason to live. The Devil's Due Maddox smirked at the two women as the gates creaked open. Glancing down at his watch, the first disciple permitted himself a contented sigh. 3.33 p.m. A good omen. He held back a sneer at the traitor, Tory, conscious of retaining his poise before those witnessing the surrender. Tory looked nervously to either side at the silent undead guardians, parted a day earlier in readiness. Fearful they might fall upon her any moment, her eyes darted between the dead and their master. His gaze shifted to the smaller woman, unremarkable in appearance, save for hair dyed a deep crimson and tied back in a single braid. She seemed too weak to threaten his dark lord's design. But the woman stared defiantly back with deep brown eyes, gaze unflinching, despite the dead only feet away from her. Erin Locke's gaze was hard and challenging, no ounce of fear to be found. If anything, she regarded him with contempt. Finally, you accept the futility of resistance he declared in a loud voice, spreading his arms in dramatic fashion for the assembled witnesses. Many flocked to see the fabled sacrifice, promised to free them from the threat of the dead, and Maddock intended to give them a performance. I'm not scared of a gibbering bellend like you, Johnny B. Cunt, answered Erin with a scornful grin. I'm here for them. She gestured to the crowd. I do give a shit about them, as does Tory. So wind your neck in and cut the theatrical bullshit, eh, Voldemort? You'll get no civility from me, and you damn well won't get any reverence or respect. I've got a whole litany of creative insults to show how little I think of you and your savagery, but I've decided to go old school. She winked. You're a wanker and you'll get no validation from me, you prick. Maddock fought for poise as muted conversations whispered into life among the crowd, some even covering sniggers. Seeking to wrest her control away, he raised his voice in proclamation as he turned towards the people of Ascension. Tomorrow, on the third day of the third month, at the third hour, our troubles will be no more. My children, the gift of these women will be the last blood we will be asked to spill, and we can finally live in safety. Nobody asked us to spill blood, shouted a woman's voice from somewhere in the crowd. Who speaks treason, demanded Maddock, frustration visibly leaking out for the first time. The situation wasn't proceeding to his plan, and he turned to one of the armed men nearby. Find the traitor. The crowd pulled tighter, not one person offering indication as to who spoke against him, despite their obvious fear of reprisal. The guard looked to Maddock helplessly with a shrug. Looks like you're not as loved as you think, Darth Maddock, chuckled Erin. Funny that, eh? Who'd have thought that turning to the dark side and murdering your own people might turn them against you? Every word dripped with sarcasm, shaking her head in mock sadness at the turn of events. What a world we live in, so ungrateful. 
Are you always so childish, Erin Locke? He grated, increasingly irked by her easy mockery. She simply blew out her cheeks, lifting her chin and affecting a look of mock outrage. You know, with rude comments like that, you've just earned yourself a lifetime ban from my blanket fort. More muted sniggers evaporated the last of Maddox's tight control. Take these two to the pit, he snapped. The pit was little more than a large basement in the grand house, dominating the center of ascension. Sealed by a cell door of iron bars, a staircase led down to the cold stone space below. As Tori and the woman with red hair stepped through the portal, Jake closed the barred doorway and locked it with a sigh. I'm sorry, he said quietly, meaning every word as he withdrew the key. You could just open it again, said Erin, winking a mischievous grin. I won't tell a soul. Jake couldn't say why, but there was something about the woman he couldn't articulate. A presence or an energy that drew the eye. She certainly did not look special, save for the loud red of her hair. But there was an aura about her. Similar to the first disciple's presence in many ways at commanding attention, but unlike Maddox's aura of fear and intimidation, Erin's was an easy warmth. I wish I could, I really do. She mimed, putting a key in the lock. Key go in, key turn, Erin come out. Easy peasy. Jake shook his head. I wish it was. You know this is all wrong, Jake, said Tori softly, moving to the bars. You're not a bad person. Most here aren't. I know the army let you go because of your injured knee, and you fell into the cracks, so I understand why you're here. I get why you feel the world we lost failed you. But did you join the army, proudly serving your country, just to watch innocent people butchered for one maniac's tyranny? Maddox, the type of person you fought against, Jake, Yet here we are. It hurt that she was right. Jake despised what they had become. This was meant to be a new start, a new purpose in life. With no skills other than those learned in the infantry, the IED shrapnel to his knee in Afghanistan resulted in a medical discharge at the age of just 23. Lacking any other employable skills, no permanent home and no job, Anger at the injustice of it all pushed him towards the resurrection almost four years ago. Here he found meaning again, his skills of value once more, and never more so when the dead rose to conquer the old world. But while residing within Ascension's walls, he found a new meaning in his life, one he hadn't seen coming. I've got Cheryl and Will to think of now, he sighed. Will's just turned two. I can't risk them, Tori. Do you really think that bleeding us dry is the way to save everyone, Jakey? Asked Erin. That this is where the madness ends? She snorted in derision and shook her head. Maddox Puppet Master wants us all dead, Jake. There are three people out there, a trinity, with a chance to end all of this psychotic weirdness, but that chance is no good if there's no one left to save. Erin sighed, resting her forehead against the bar. Don't you see, Jake? Maddock was a con man before the world shat its panties, planning to run off with Hargrave's fortune and leave you all teeth deep in shit. When the world actually died, his plans went down the shitter, and the thing pulling his strings is preying on that self-serving jizz fountain's need for power and control. Honestly, killing people, is that really the way we save everyone? Seems like some grand cosmic dumb fuckery if you ask me. Erin's easy manner only increased the ex-soldier's unease. Maddock was dramatic and imposing, but Erin was relaxed and warm, her casual foul mouth only serving to humanize her all the more. Reconciling the small woman with dyed red hair and easy vulgarity with these 
evil ones Maddock crowed about in his sermons, well, it just didn't fit. Everything was backward. He keeps the dead away, shrugged Jake, the argument sounding weaker by the moment. Yeah, for now, shrugged Erin, to keep you all shitting yourselves about how mighty and dreadful he is. But if me and Tori die tomorrow, then a week later Maddock announces Captain Evil needs a new sacrifice. What then, Jakey? Can you really trust the promise of something wiping out humanity and asking for sacrifices? Bit of a plot hole in his story then, eh? Half a year ago, Jake, and many others, would have died for Maddock. But when fabricated reasons to execute his own people reared their ugly head, opinions soon shifted. Most of them endured guilty discomfort when strangers went under the knife for the weekly tribute, but once their own started dying for the triumvirate's power, those feelings shifted starkly to a heady mix of fear, fury, and shame. Fear for their own loved ones, fury for the betrayal, and shame for the relief once felt as innocent strangers were sacrificed before them. Now, aware of the terror those unfortunates endured, that shame burned them. But fear of the dead was the most potent weapon of all. I can't take the chance. I'm sorry, he whispered. Erin regarded him keenly for a moment, arriving at some decision in her mind. A convergence of all this shit is coming, Jake, she warned. You seem like a half-decent guy, stuck in a shitty situation because you fear for your family. And I get that. Family is important to me too. But ask yourself this, Jake. If your little boy manages to reach an age in this world where he asks you about the before times, what will you say to him? Hey, son, you're here because we allowed a madman to murder countless people and daddy stood by and did sweet fuck all about it. Oh, and by the way, the dead are still here, killing everything that breathes. Is that the legacy you want your boy to know? that when good and honest people needed protecting, you stood by and allowed them to die. Is that the shattered world you want him to inherit? How will you look your son in the eye and be the hero father every little boy wants? She sniffed and shrugged. Think on it, Jakey. You seem like a decent egg, so let me give you fair warning. When this convergence comes, let it play out. Let me show you there's another way. And how will you do that? I guess you'll find out, she said with a mysterious smile. Just don't get in his way before I get the chance. Whose way? he asked. But the two women were already heading down the stairs. Without understanding why, Jake shook out a foreboding shiver, gripped by a sudden and powerful urge to hold his wife and son. Two hours after midnight, Lucas and Bradley both stifled yawns. Nothing ever happened on perimeter duty. Forced to walk a long section of Ascension's wall for their shift, both were tired of discussing the two arrivals earlier that day, or what the future would be like once Maddock cut their throats. They would all be safe, promised the first disciple. Hopefully, these pointless duties would end. After losing so many in the failed warehouse operation and further losses from those accompanying Hargrave to attack the red-haired woman's people, the shifts on perimeter patrol had been doubled and arduous. Even though it was early March, the last teeth of winter still bit fiercely at night. Both men were bored, tired, miserable and cold. They just wanted it to end. Lucas was just about to say something when the rustle of a bush ahead caught their attention. You hear that? whispered Bradley. Lucas nodded. Drawing his handgun, he flicked on the small flashlight mounted on the underside, passing his larger torch to Bradley. Over there, he urged, and Bradley pointed the larger flashlight at the indicated bush. Heart beating wildly, Lucas advanced ahead with handgun up, directing his own beam at the foliage, the rustling intensifying as he advanced. 
Who's there? He demanded. It's not a good time to be dicking about, mate. Show yourself now and nobody needs to get hurt. A badger erupted from the undergrowth, eliciting a yelp from Lucas as it ran away into the night. He fumbled the pistol, startled by the animal's explosive appearance, and the beam caught his eyes as it dropped to the grass, blinding him for a moment. Laughing awkwardly as he bent to collect it, he waited for Bradley's inevitable mockery. Go on, lap it up, dickhead, he sighed as he retrieved the pistol. Silence. Darkness. Bradley's beam had been extinguished, and Lucas tried to make his friend out in the dark, his night vision ruined by the gun's flashlight. You're a funny fucker, aren't you? He muttered, pointing the gun's beam where he thought Bradley stood. Nothing. Brad? Huffed Lucas. Seriously? Dude, this isn't primary school. Jesus Christ, you dickhead, quit the bullshit. Stillness. Stop fucking about, Brad. Let's just get to the end of the shift, yeah? Then you can tell everyone how Badger made me shit bricks. Nothing. Lucas moved the gun's small light in the darkness, searching for any sign of Bradley, unaware of the black silhouette phasing through the gloom behind him. Face painted black and a dark set of night vision optics concealing a grim expression, the figure ghosted to Lucas's rear until his breath was almost on the man's neck. One iron hand clamped his mouth, a giant blade flashed past his eyes before thrusting upwards through his diaphragm, powering up towards the heart. In a single, terrified breath, Lucas died in silent darkness. Punching his knife through the eye to destroy the brain, Nate dragged the corpse to the bushes near the wall, concealing it next to Bradley's body, before wiping his blade on the fallen. With a quick scan to take his bearings, Nate moved on through the darkness like a wraith. The night's work was not yet done. Following the map committed to memory, Nate moved with careful precision through the night, lifting up the NVGs as he approached the one lights casting their sickly glow around the main compound. Thick tallow candles burned in glass boxes serving as streetlights, echoes of an age gone by their dim light enhanced by angled mirrors within the small glass box atop the pole. Despite their banks of solar panels and multitude of huge batteries in series, power was still conserved where possible for the community's primary needs, and the small streetlights were not deemed a priority. Larger spotlights were arrayed around the compound in the event of emergency, but with no need to be on alert after Erin and Tori's apparent surrender, the soft glow of the large candle lights was enough for those abroad in the night. Dropping to one knee in the darkness, far beyond the limited glow of the lights, Nate thumbed his throat mic. Situation, Dean. They've set up some kind of stage in front of the main house, replied Dean softly. Despite being over 400 meters from the settlement in Nate's sniper hide, the former police sergeant's words were gentle. Stage. Rows of wooden benches arranged, a higher platform everyone can see, and people are starting to arrive. The whole thing is lit by those eerie candle streetlights, like Maddox constructing some macabre ritual. There was tangible distaste in Dean's tone. They're going to make a dark spectacle of this, Nate. What's your progress? Outside rear of the main compound. Next, over the wall, through the interior alleys and into the main house. Tori's directions are spot on. Two hostiles down, bodies concealed with zero reanimation chance. Once in the house, conceal near the basement where Erin and Tori are held. It's a dark night for such business. It's the business that's dark, Dean, replied Nate with feeling. I'll leave the mic open once targets are secured so you can real-time update. Once the mic goes hot, QRF roll out on the quiet and edge closer to ascension. Lights off, halt away back. We don't want engine noise drawing the attention of the dead at the gates. 
Copy that, answered Dean. QRF copy, added Alicia from the farmhouse. Nate nodded to himself in the darkness. Good people. Going dark until target's secured. Stand by for hot mic. I'm going to get our girls. God bless and good luck, said Dean, just before the former Marine switched off his radio. If God had been watching that night, no blessings were to be found. With any observing deity's gaze turned from ascension, Nate moved through the compound like a murderous phantom. Erin desperately wanted to avoid death where possible, but for Nate to facilitate the final act of her plan, then discovery must be avoided at all costs. The lives of Erin and Tori depended on him. After scaling the inner compound wall with a makeshift grapple, Nate waited in the gloom as a pair of guards patrolled the interior. As they stopped to frown up at the metal prongs of his grapple, weapons unready and slung over shoulders, he ghosted from the shadows in ominous silence. One man died as the giant blade slammed into the base of his neck, a vertical drive that pierced the heart in imitation of a Roman execution. Releasing his grip, he placed one large hand against the second man's head as he turned, smashing his skull into the brick wall with sickening force, leaving a crimson stain smeared on the stone. Retrieving his blade from the first man, and ensuring no reanimation from either, Nate dragged both bodies into the shadows. Another pair of guards died in silence as Nate whispered like an angel of death from the darkness, edging ever closer to the main house. Activity bustled on the far side of the building as people arrived to fill seats, the buzz of their conversations echoing in the night air. Erin would have her audience. Sweeping across the compound in the shadows, Nate made his way to an old servant's entrance from days gone by, withdrawing his lockpicks as he glanced around to ensure privacy, before smoothly flicking open the barrel and drifting inside. The manor house was dark, the flickering lights from Maddox's theatrical scene unable to pierce the shadowed hallways, and he lowered the MVGs once more. With a deep breath and a knife in hand, Nate moved through the corridors, following Tory's directions, counting doors as he went. He glanced down at his watch. 2.47 a.m. Almost time. It's time, declared Maddock, hands clasped behind his back as the red-haired woman stared balefully through the bars. You're going to regret this, she sighed. Enjoy this moment while you can, you smarmy wanker, because it's about to go to the dogs. Still with the bravado, Miss Locke, chuckled Maddock, shaking his head in disdain. Moments away from feeling the bite of my knife, from the darkness rising to swallow the last fragments of your wicked soul, and you think to bait me. I have all the power here, and you are bereft of options. There is no escape, Erin Locke. None. Tonight, your story ends. Yeah, well, I've got one more story for you, Johnny boy. Once upon a time, there was a twat. It was you. The end. She aimed a toothy grin at him. It's my finest work, don't you think? Maddock rolled his eyes at the insult, affecting a bored expression to conceal his frustration at the woman's blatant disregard. Used to the reverence and fear of Ascension's populace, Erin's dismissal of his menace was infuriating. He wanted her, needed her, to beg for mercy. But her casual scorn slashed at his ego like a blade. Enough of this tiresome bravado, he sighed theatrically, motioning to one of the four armed guards. Open the gate and let us escort the prisoners before our people. The auspicious event is at hand. It is time for our celebration. As chill as a cemetery wind, a question whispered at his ear. Am I invited?
With all eyes facing the cell door and the guards positioning themselves in front of Maddock, ready to escort the prisoners, no one saw the black-clad figure melt from the shadows in the corner. The first disciple froze as the cold barrel of a Glock 17 pressed to the back of his skull, a strong hand crushing to his left shoulder and drawing him back a single pace as Nate whispered his question into Maddock's ear. Erin barked a triumphant laugh as the four guards spun, lifting weapons to the source of the voice, but Maddock was neatly positioned between them. Weapons down, boys, ordered Nate in a controlled voice, no hint of fear at the four handguns pointed in his direction. Did you not hear me? asked Maddock, attempting bravado, but the quiver of fear audible in the shake of his words. If you kill me, then the dead will rage. You'll be torn from this life. Everything will be over. Well, said Nate, a matter of fact, as I've got fuck all to lose right now, then you'd best tell your lackeys to put their guns down. Trust me, Mr. Maddock, I can kill you the moment a finger twitches on a trigger. And are you really willing to bet they're good enough shots to put me down with you in the way? Either way, the monsters outside the gate won't be a worry for you any longer. Nate gave Erin a playful wink before whispering to Maddock. So, you've got to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? Erin barked a ha and punched the air before turning to one of the guards. Now's the time, Jakey she said. Here's the convergence, and I told you not to get in his way. This is the fork in the road, and there's only two choices open to you. I'm trusting you to make the right one. Have faith, Jake, urged Tori beside her. Have faith there's a better path than this one, for all of us, for William. One of the guards, a man in his late twenties, paused only a moment, then lowered his weapon. Put them down, lads, he sighed, casting his towards Nate. Without waiting to see if the others responded, he turned and unlocked the barred door. As the pistols clattered at Nate's feet, he nodded, slipping a cable tie over Maddox's wrists behind him and pulling it tight. Erin stepped through the doorway, slapping the guard on the shoulder in a congratulatory manner. You made the right choice, Jakey, she said. I hope so. I hope you know what you're doing. Me, snorted Erin. No, Jakey, I'm winging it. It's shit or bust tonight, buddy. Win or lose, all or nothing. She grinned at his horrified expression as she turned to Nate. Nice to see you, to see you nice, she winked. Shall we? Absolutely nodded Nate, pushing Maddock forward, the Glock's barrel pressed menacingly against the back of his head. Erin turned back to the guard. We're all in, Jakey. Chips in the middle, river card to come. So let's go see how it falls, eh? Shocked exclamations greeted them as Maddock was bundled ahead of Nate, his grip firm on the man's bound wrists. 3.02 a.m., his watch said. Most of Ascension were assembled, sat upon rows of wooden benches before the makeshift stage, eyes watching in disbelief as their feared leader was manhandled unceremoniously to the side of the raised platform by an old warrior with a black painted face. Tori and Erin followed. Immediately guns of nearby guards raised in their direction. Any of you even think about it? bellowed Nate, pressing the Glock hard against Maddox's skull. And your glorious leader is no more. Put the weapons down, cried Maddox, all zealous bravado now stripped away. Faced with the reality of his own demise, no matter how much he might believe the Dark's promise of power, Maddox was still the same self-absorbed narcissist at his core, and the threat of imminent execution pulled back the veil of his performance, revealing his true colours. It was easy to say he was willing to die and let the Dark Lord avenge him, but he craved his hold on life, just as they all did. 
Stripped of his menace, he was as frail as them all, screeching in near tears for guns to be lowered. One overly zealous man refused, even as all other weapons dropped. Standing in the open, rifle still raised in the flickering glare of the lights, the man's face twisted in fury. You'll bring the dead down on all of us, he roared, eyes wild and voice raw. Let him go, or I swear I'll fucking shoot him myself and let the world burn. Dean? The man looked confused for a moment, disarmed by Nate's address. My name isn't, he started. The zealot collapsed, rifle falling from lifeless hands as a high-velocity round smashed through his sternum, exiting from his back in a bloody eruption. The thunder of a rifle echoed somewhere in the night. Anyone else? asked Nate with a raised eyebrow. Hundreds of fearful eyes peered out into the blackness of the night, futilely seeking the distant sniper, wondering if they were next in the hidden assassin's scope. Weapons clattered to the earth, and Nate nodded in satisfaction, commanding someone prevent the dead man's reanimation with a knife thrust before turning to Tori and Erin. Your turn, I think, he said, pushing Maddock to his knees. Tori climbed the stage, standing before the fearful populace, letting them see her in the pooled light upon the stage. Her blonde hair illuminated like strands of sunlight as the flickering flames reflected from it, her upper body surrounded by a corona of radiant light, remaining still and silent until all eyes were on her and no voices stirred the night. You all know me, she said, raising her voice. I've lived with you all before the world fell and endured alongside you while this man and his two cronies terrorized us all. If you thought I abandoned you, then I'm truly sorry, but nothing was further from the truth. I left not for personal survival, but for help, in hope they could free us from the murdering grasp of Maddock, Hargrave, and Tyler. World's most evil law practice, muttered Erin beside Nate and he stifled a snort. Maddock has been speaking to a force in his dreams, but it's no force to redeem us. It's the very thing seeking to destroy us, to extinguish the last light of humanity from the world, and Maddock is its unwitting pawn. His selfish nature and desire for power made him the perfect mouthpiece for its dark design to speed our end. Friends, let me tell you the truth of John Maddock. For a good ten minutes, Nate and Erin surveyed the crowd's reactions as Tori revealed all she knew of Maddock's unremarkable life in the world before its collapse. As every failed scheme was laid out, every former disparaging manager's assessment of his character given voice, Maddock listened in grim silence his ego battered by the mocking talk of his arrogance and ineptitude. Tory eviscerated him with a damning litany of character indictments and failures. Those who once revered, then feared, him for his power over the dead, hearing every word. Disbelief and anger were thick in the air, overcast by the heavy cloud of fear still looming over the people of Ascension. No matter their fury at Maddox's alleged betrayal, still their fear of the dead beyond the gate was king. What are we supposed to do with this, Tory? called out Jake, the guard from earlier, as he threw his hands in the air. Many of us have families, children. Even if everything you say is true, and I'm not denying it is, Maddox still chosen by this thing ruling the dead. Kill him or cast him out, it'll still doom us all to the wrath of those monsters outside. What hope is there? What good is this information to us? Isn't it better the devil we know rather than fear of the unknown? Shit, good question, murmured Erin. Nate nodded, cuffing Maddock as the dark disciple chuckled. The terror of endless undead was his ace in the hole and the dread of Ascension's timid population, the one thing that might save him. Shut it, dickhead, ordered Nate, silencing the madman. Tory turned to indicate the two of them. 
This is Erin Locke and Nate Carter. They began this journey together, just the two of them. They've faced the dead and the violent living and are still here fighting for the likes of you and me. They first liberated others from a warlord of our old world, two against more than 40, and they're still here. They merged with another group led by a former police officer, someone close to Erin, and bound their two communities as one. They've taken in yet another group discovered these past months and liberated more captives from a group manipulated by the same force speaking through Maddock. And they're still here. Once, they were two. Now their community is almost 60. They've lost friends along the way too, but sacrificed their own to a dark force pulling the strings of the dead? Tori shook her head. No, I've seen the grief they carry with the loss of just a single life, how it cuts them to the core and how they fight every day in the hope of protecting any life within their power to save. What path would you rather walk? The path leading to fear of your loved ones under a madman's knife for his own power? Or the one leading to open arms, waiting to receive you? To warm you when the night is cold? She's going to do this on her own, whispered Erin. No idea why I'm bloody needed. How are girls killing it out there? Hush, urged Nate with a shake of his head. Then let's hear from them, cried a woman's voice from the crowd. Tori nodded and gestured. Nate shook his head. You don't need to hear anything from me, he said. I'm a sword and a shield, no speaker of fancy words to get your blood up. He gestured to Erin beside him. Nothing Tori's told you would have happened without this young woman. Oh, you fucking betrayer of worlds, she hissed, rolling her eyes and shaking her head. That's a little harsh for bigging you up, he murmured back, eliciting a snort from her. Then let us speak, cried another voice, raising a clamor of agreement from the crowd. Well, shit, she muttered. See what you did, Nate. Tori stepped to her, taking both her hands. This is it, Erin, she said. This is your chance. This is the moment. I've still got no fucking idea what to say, answered Erin. For the first time Nate could remember, she looked nervous as her eyes darted around the crowd. Tori smiled wryly. Don't think about it, Erin. You've never put your head above your heart before, so why start now? Erin snorted a laugh. Great pep talk, girlfriend. I mean it, Erin. Don't think about it. You were chosen for a reason. You weren't selected for the Trinity because the one to end this must be an everyman, someone plucked from the masses to be special because they aren't special. They represent all of us in some capacity. Tori's smile then was radiant, as though party to information kept secret until now. You, Erin, have never being regular. You've always been special, so that's why you're needed now. This, she said, tapping two fingers over Erin's heart, is what makes you special. So forget what you think you should say, and just speak whatever your heart tells you. Nate leaned next to Erin's ear. Now that was a good pep talk. Both women chuckled. Faith, Erin, urged Tori. Have faith in yourself, and faith these people will hear you, will see you, and all that you hope for. Don't think. Just act. Erin nodded and sucked in a deep breath, reaching out her hands to take Tori's in one and Nate's in the other. This feels like a moment where I should say something really profound before beginning. She paused in thought for a moment, then shrugged. Nope, nothing comes to mind. She grinned. 
Let's do this shit. Releasing their hands, Erin walked to the center of the platform and faced the crowd, eyes closing as every voice fell silent in anticipation. I've never considered myself special, unlike your inglorious leader, Erin began, gesturing at the kneeling Maddock. I laugh, cry, eat, sleep, fart, piss and shit, just like all of you. Nervous laughter rippled through the crowd. I was nobody of note in the world before the dead sat up. And I'm still struggling with the fact I seem to be chosen for the other team to be special. Unlike your dickhead mate here, she added, flicking a hand towards Maddock again. Erin scanned the crowd, meeting the eyes of everyone staring back as she searched for the right words. Nate worried she'd frozen, until the sound of her voice filled the night again. It sounded different, clearer, stronger. For a moment, he was certain he could smell gardenias. We all lost our way. Technology gave us everything we ever wanted, yet it distanced us from the things we need as people. Real connection, real human interaction. Millions projecting the illusion of a false life, Smoke and mirrors, making you question why your lives were so miserable, making you dream and want for things you could never have, because they simply weren't real. They weren't important. 90% of songs on the radio about sex. Corporations targeting marketing campaigns at young girls with brainwashing crusades to make them believe they had to look a certain way, be a certain shape, Act in a certain manner, just to get them clamouring for the makeup, their beauty products, skin lotions, hair products, and their size zero clothing. Men told they can't feel, told to man up and swallow everything down and lock it in a box until the pressure got too great. I read somewhere that three quarters of all suicides in this country were male, and still nothing changed. People hiding behind digital walls and keyboards, spouting hate and contempt because their own lives felt so meaningless, dragging others into their pool of spite and malice because it was all that was left to them. Just so little hope. You're reaching them, thought Nate, every face wrapped, hanging on her every word. In that one opening statement, the young woman touched their unified alienation from their fallen society at its core. Disaffection, disenfranchised, disillusionment, detachment. Intolerance and bigotry were met with counter-strikes of fierce accusation and more counter-strikes back across the divide until hatred and judgment became a yawning chasm between us. Nations, cities, towns, neighborhoods, friends and even families, all divided by foolish grudges or driven by greed, pride and selfishness at an all-time high, humility and respect, the simple love of others, never lower. Our world was growing more brittle, weaker in heart and spirit with each passing year. Gone was the courage to unify, until only cowardice and division remained. Erin had not moved from her place on the stage. Despite her usual boundless energy, she stood motionless, fists bunched as her voice began to shake, intense emotion leaking through in every word. Yet there were, and still are, so many kind and good people in the world. I was fortunate two of them found me. Dean and Maria Williams, a police officer and a nurse, took a wild stray into their care and brought that stray to life. They showed me the power that caring for others can have on someone, how the simple act of give a shit can change a life. I'll forever love them for it and count my blessings they're both still with me, despite the world's collapse. I got luckier than most.
but good people like Dean and Maria were too few. The acts of kindness and love and generosity were swallowed by a storm of hatred and intolerance, judgment, prejudice and greed. Why do you think all this is happening? She demanded, casting her arms out wide. We've ruined this chance. We've taken a world filled with magic and wonder and turned it into a charnel house of hatred, division and violence. Remember the joy you felt as a child when everything was new and magical and wondrous. We've poisoned the air, ravaged the natural world, and all we do is consume without thought for anyone but ourselves. Is it any wonder that whatever power exists beyond the pale decided to hit the delete button on their great cosmic keyboard? Then what do we do? cried a woman's voice from the crowd. If there's no hope, why even try? There is hope, though, Erin said, smashing one fist into the open palm of her other hand. There is a second chance. Somewhere out there, three people are tasked with bringing this horror to an end. A trinity to be tested, and our hope with it. One day, the dead could fall again and lie still. But what if they don't, cried a man. But what if they do, roared Erin fiercely, voice filled with wild passion. What if they do? Are you going to take your second chance by saying what if and searching for all that could go wrong? That's why we're here, in this shitty existence, because we've lost the ability to look for the light because your first instinct is looking into the dark for the monsters lurking there and worry how to protect yourself. She fought for calm, sucking in a few deep breaths, then gave Nate a knowing look. We can't bind ourselves in the chains of things we cannot change. Erin had always loved that advice from Nora, and hearing it now brought a smile to Nate's lips. We can't change what the Trinity will or won't do, and we don't know if and when they might succeed. So we must go on living, because we can control how we act, how we choose to survive. If the Trinity are ever to succeed in freeing us from the curse of the dead, then what use is that second chance if all we do is destroy each other or butcher innocence week by week? How long before this man has one of your children under his knife, all in the name of protecting what you had? Would it be worth it then? Eyes glittering under the light of the flames, Erin raised her voice higher still. Cruelty has to become kindness. Hatred must be compassion. Division must be unity. We have to change ourselves and make an example for all who come after. You can't force changes on another. But if you lead by example, if you change yourself, others will surely follow. I have to believe that. I have to. I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'll say something I regret that makes me look like a complete tosser. I'm bound to piss somebody off when I'm tired and say something I don't mean. I'll make mistakes. I'll have regrets. I'll never do anything perfectly. And neither will any of you. But that's what it means to be human. We're all just one big, beautiful mess. But if we're going to survive the end of the old world and build something new, we need to do that together. And it'll be hard. It'll be messy. We'll lose people along the way. We'll fight and disagree. We'll sulk and say things that hurt. But we'll also work together. We'll build and create. We'll love those close to us and laugh with friends. When one of us struggles, another will stand beside them, raising them up and taking that weight for a little while because none of us can get through this without each other. We can't do this alone. And we can't do this giving in to the dead. 
If we don't unite and work together, then we'll all die divided and alone. Stop putting all your faith in people like Maddock and put that faith in yourselves and each other. Her voice hardened with fury, casting her gaze to the kneeling Maddock. No more sacrifices, no more needless death, no more dark manipulations. We bind as one and the living unite to fight the dead because they're the real enemy, unnatural things brought to dark life by a force bent on our destruction. Then Erin poured out her plea to the people of Ascension, repeating a line first spoken to the Willow Park refugees. One day, if we're lucky to leave behind anyone who will remember us, all any of us will be is a memory. Given the choice, wouldn't you want to be a good one? Burned out from her emotive speech, Erin finally brought the people of Ascension full circle. Against the dead, we either stand united or fall united. But I promise you this, that if we choose to stand together, then we will rise. Like a flame to gunpowder, those words sent fire racing through the crowd. We will rise, they roared in a singular voice. Oh, you clever girl, murmured Tori, shaking her head with a smile. Completely subverted the meaning. Sometimes she's just too lazy to show us how clever she is, chuckled Nate, remembering one of the earliest things she said to him so long ago. As Tori and Nate shared a laugh, a stirring in the air carried the scent of flowers to their senses. Startled, Nate looked to the crowd, confused looks revealing they all noticed it too. The scent was intensely familiar to him, more so than anyone else. Gardenias. As the crowd chanted their mantra, the celebration turned to gasps of awe, and Nate felt Tori's hand snap to his forearm in shock as she sucked in a breath. Behind Erin, a phantom figure appeared, barefoot in a long white dress. Her dark hair swept back from angelic features, with a single gardenia perched behind one ear. Phasing from the shadows, solid and real, the figure of Freya shimmered into existence in a burst of radiance. Sensing the change, Erin turned slowly, locking eyes with Freya, unabashed tears of joy streaming as she locked eyes with her fallen friend. Behind her, as though straining at the edge of the shadows, ghostly faces hovered at the edge of Freya's light, unable to pass into the living realm as the young woman had. Isaac, Theodore, Kate, young Joseph, Dong, Laura, all of them shimmered at the edge of existence, barely defined features straining to see from whatever dark place they inhabited. Who are they all? Whispered Nate in awe at some unknown faces hovering at the edge of darkness. Some sacrificed by Maddock, breathed Tori in equal wonder. George, the first, and, and... Tori's voice trailed away, drinking in the sight, not daring to miss a single moment of the miracle. Freya's phantom plucked the gardenia from behind her ear and held it out to Erin. In a shaking hand, the flame reached out, gasping as her fingers clasped on the flower, as real and solid as the bones in her hand. As the crowd watched in awed silence, Freya's musical voice sang out into the night. Never has the flame burned brighter than this moment, she said, voice rippling with warmth and power, the musical tone felt by everyone witnessing the event. It was a warm embrace, wrapping around them to shield them from the cold breath of the March night air. All of us were drawn this night to the fierce burn of your light, Erin. A bonfire, a great flame in the dark to us all, 
pulling us all to this one place, for this one moment, as you burn brighter than a star to warm our endless night. We're all so enormously proud of you. I miss you, sobbed Erin, not daring to take her eyes from her friend's wraith. Freya reached out, drifting the back of her hand across Erin's cheek in affection, before turning her gaze to Nate and Tori. With a heavenly smile, she graced them both with a nod of approval, as one by one the smiling phantom faces faded back to darkness, tears rolling freely in the crowd, until only Freya remained. With the end of one journey, so another begins, said Freya to Erin, every word absorbed by the hushed onlookers. Keep the flame of hope burning, Erin, for we're all still with you. Hold the line for the Trinity, because they will come this way as the front of the battle moves. I love you, and will see you again. The radiant light dimmed, the angelic smile of Freya's phantom fading with her to be swallowed by the night, until only the living remained. Nate glanced down at his watch. 3.33 a.m. Well, he murmured to himself, would you look at that? Maddock gaped in disbelief as the angel faded from sight, and Erin dropped to her knees in a flood of tears. Tori ran to her side, embracing her and lifting her to her feet. The crowd buzzed in breathless whispers, the awe in their faces choking the first disciple. They were lost to him, their reverence stolen by the small weeping woman with the red hair touched by the other side, and a knot of fury tightened in his belly. It was almost within his grasp, everlasting power, and a king, no, an emperor of the new world, and once again cruelly stolen away. The cruel, fickle twists of fate laughed once more. Up, said Nate, yanking on his bound wrists and all but dragging him to his feet. So, what now, mighty warrior? hissed Maddock, his earlier show of weakness still burning. In desperation, he gathered an air of bravado about him as he stood, head raised in defiance. I guess we'll find out answered Nate, nodding towards the approaching women. The crowd fell silent again as the chosen of light and dark faced each other. Despite being much taller than the small woman, she was undeterred. The people were hers now, not his, and he was powerless. So what now, Erin Locke? He sneered in a loud voice. You show this great power of love you speak of by ending my life, a promise broken so soon. You're done, Johnny boy, she sighed, visibly exhausted by the experience. Best you just shut your cake hole. You've no concept of the force pitted against you, child, he scoffed. Whatever you think possible is doomed to fail. Ghosts and flowers will avail you nothing against the Lord of the Dead. I'm not so sure, you murderous smear of shit, she replied. After all, you set yourself the personal goal of being the wettest splash of shit you could possibly be, and yet here you are, having knocked that goal right out of the park. The crowd's open laughter, no hint of nervous fear, cut him to the bone as a final insult. No reverence or fear remained. Worse, they didn't even respect him. Now he was little more than a scorned afterthought, where once he had been a titan. Erin's voice hardened from her jovial manner. I know exactly what I'm up against, Dick Splash. I know exactly what Captain Evil wanted from me and from you, and that was to cause another war between our peoples. To
to have all these innocents caught in a crossfire while you bled their throats to hold on to the illusion of your gift. And even now, I know what it wants from me as you stand defeated and at my mercy. And that is? It wants me to execute you before everyone, to make me the evil murderer you sold me as. It wants me to show all these people I'm no better than you, make them fear they've swapped one tyrant for another, despite the miracle witnessed tonight. She smiled then, and the satisfaction in her expression gave Maddock pause. What did she know? Well, guess what, fuck nugget? I'm going to shit on his dinner with my secret weapon he won't see coming. What weapon? Erin folded her arms. Mercy. A brief flare of hope bloomed in Maddox's heart. Mercy. He was going to survive. Despite his inward rejoicing, he pushed back, desperate for some modicum of victory in their public battle of wills. Shakespeare said that nothing emboldens sin so much as mercy, he sneered. Shakespeare also said that sweet mercy is nobility's true badge. She grinned back, wiping the pretentious smile from his face. Titus Andronicus, Act One, Scene One. Everything's just a question of perspective, smart ass. Even the warrior Nate seemed impressed by her response. I'm going to show these people that we aren't wanton killers, Darth Fucknut, she continued. I'm going to walk you out of that gate to all your undead friends, and we'll see what happens, shall we? Security personnel, retrieve your weapons, commanded Nate, and Maddock almost choked at their instant response. Lost. All lost. Be ready for when the gate opens. If one of those stinking corpses takes a step towards the gate, you open up with everything you have. Every man and woman responded to the authority in Nate's command, and the entire crowd followed in nervous anticipation as they marched Maddock towards the gate. Dean? asked Nate down the mic, the earpiece unplugged so everyone could hear the response. They're still in formation, standing either side, answered the voice over the radio. Having watched the display through the scope and hearing every word spoken through Nate's open mic, his voice contained the same breathless awe as the crowd. The gates swung open, revealing the silent rows of the dead staring across at each other, and Erin gave Nate the nod. Cutting the cable tie binding Maddox's wrists, the old warrior pushed him through the exit. The first disciple stared at the motionless undead before turning to face the crowd, laughing as his confidence returned. <laughs> you should have killed me when you had the chance, Erin Locke, he gloated. See? He gestured to the waiting dead. I am still the chosen of the dark spirit, and the dead are mine to command. His wrath will be biblical, and I will return with a horde unlike anything you can imagine. Surprisingly, as the gates started closing, the woman just smiled. In all this excitement, I guess you forgot to check your calendar, Johnny boy. You see, Tori told me that your first sacrifice was the day after the world fell, so that would be Thursday, 24th of June, 2010. Every seven days, you've killed another to top up this power of yours. She sighed theatrically, a faint twitch of a shrug from her shoulders. I guess with the hard-on you've had for the number three, and being so focused on the big sacrifice, you haven't realized that today isn't just March 3rd. She winked. It's also Thursday. Today is day seven, my dear Thundercunt, and we're not cutting throats in Ascension anymore. Her smile of savage delight stopped the breath in his lungs as her voice dropped to a foreboding tone. But I reckon the devil still wants his due.
She gave him another cheerful wink as the gates of ascension closed. Maddox swallowed a dry lump as he turned to face the rows of undead either side of him, flinching as one of the monsters took a single step forward from the silent ranks. Opening its mouth, the monster awkwardly sucked at the air, filling long dead lungs to fuel its speech. Your power over the humans has waned, John Maddock. The unnatural grating hiss from the cadaver shivered along his spine, the taste of blood filling his mouth, sickness roiling in his guts as the white-eyed corpse addressed him with that voice of unearthly power pervading every atom of his being. You have failed. The flame wins this battle, and so tactics must evolve. You are of no consequence anymore, John Maddock. No, my lord, quailed Maddock, raising his hands as the spark of demonic life rippled through the lines of undead sentries. No, I command you all to halt. I command you. His words went unheeded, and the corpse spoke one final time as the ranks closed on him. John Maddock, you are judged. His blood-curdling cries were mercifully short. March 5th. 2011. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Well, fuck a duck. We won. I'm here. I don't even know why I'm writing this to you, Freya, because you know everything. You came to me, finally, when I needed you the most. Love you, girl. It's all a bit of a blur, so I'll do the best I can from memory. It was an emotional night. Tori and I presented ourselves to Maddock, and let me tell you, walking between those silent rows of undead outside Ascension's gate as they faced inwards like some creepy guard of honour was pant-shitting. I did my best not to let Maddock see it, though. I wasn't giving that spunk trumpet one iota of satisfaction from me. I can't remember much of what I said to him, but I'm sure it was witty and hilarious, as some of his people tried to stifle giggles. I think I went for a classic and just called him a wanker and a prick. Hey, sometimes the oldies are the besties. The pit is the basement in Ascension's big fancy mansion that must have been the main house on the land before Hargrave bought it and converted the acres into an apocalypse settlement. Tori and I turned the charm on to a guy about my age named Jake, who seemed to hate the whole situation. I mean, he apologised to us as he was locking the cell door, so straight away I knew we had something to work with. Jake was someone who slipped through the cracks, injured in the service, returning to a world with no skills and no hope. Turns out, though, since being at Ascension, he's met someone and had a kid, that need to protect his family was something of a pattern for many in the settlement, I think. They were more fearful of going against Maddock out of sheer terror of the dead. Fair enough, I suppose. It didn't matter anyway, because the main component of our plan was kicking into gear in the middle of the night. Yep, you guessed it. Nate. Tori made Nate various maps in the days leading up to it, and he committed them all to memory. There are none better at stealth and recon behind enemy lines than the Special Air Service. It's their shtick. He figured out the best way to infiltrate, and as Tori was familiar with the patrol patterns, he entered unseen at one of the most distant points, about two miles northeast of the main compound, on the very edge of the farmsteads, near a place called Mottram Hall. The deadly old bastard killed six of the guards on his way in. All regrettable, but it was never going to be an entirely bloodless night, and we didn't know who was or wasn't a loyal zealot of Maddock. That's just a sad fact. 
If all in Ascension were to be freed of Maddock's influence, we couldn't afford an alarm being raised and Maddock locking himself down or just sending someone to finish us off. We needed his spectacle. And shit, he was planning a big one. Out front of the main compound, he directed a damn stage with rows of wooden seating for everyone to watch, hearkening back to medieval times when the family outing was popping down to the town square for a good public hanging or beheading. Grim as fuck. Nate got there first, though. One image that will live with me until my dying day is when Maddock had his four guards readying to drag me and Tori out. We'd been sat in the basement prior to that, and I had no idea Nate was already in the room above, skulking in the shadows. It is time for our celebration, Maddock declared, all puffed up and feeling chuffed with himself. Everyone was facing us, and I watched the dark glimmer of a glock melt out of the shadows, the barrel touching the back of Maddock's head as Nate's other hand grabbed his left shoulder. Then, like the cold breath of the dead hissing out the darkness, Nate just whispered, Am I invited? Into his ear. Chills, baby. Chills. It was epic. Maddock almost shat a brick right there on the carpet. Maddock tried to get all courageous, squeaking about how if he died, then the undead would descend upon us in the greatest horde we could ever imagine, and blah da fucking blah. Honestly, he speaks like the arch-villain in a cheesy sword and sorcery epic. The guy seriously believed his own hype. Nate then dropped his second pearl of our rescue, giving a little speech about not giving a shit and whether his guys were a good enough shot to take Nate out before he put a bullet in Maddox's skull. Then he gave me a wink and with his best Clint Eastwood impression rolled out this beauty. You've got to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? I fucking punched the air in joy at that. Nate unveils a Dirty Harry quote, entirely for my benefit. Love that guy. Jake was in those four guards, and he came through. He was the first to throw his pistol at Nate's feet, and the others soon followed. After marching Maddock and the guards out to the assembled crowd, Nate barked an order for everyone to put weapons down. Maddock showed his true colours for the first time. The slithering little narcissist, desperate with self-preservation, cried out for everyone to throw down. Nate already proved at the basement door he meant every word he said, so Maddock was under no illusions he'd be the first to get a bullet if things went to shit. The guards wavered, but looked ready to obey his whiny validation of Nate's command. Well, except one. Tori told me since that this guy, Eddie, was one of the few true believers remaining. He had a rifle up, screaming that he'd put Maddock down himself if Nate didn't let him go, and was happy to let the world burn. With his hot mic open, Nate just said a single query. Dean? It threw the guy for a moment as he got all ting-tings and started saying, that's not my name. But Dean was on point. Peering down the scope of the PSG-1, he squeezed a round off at the lunatic and punched his ticket. Nate's query of, anyone else? Was met with a load of weapons being thrown to the floor. Perched up in Nate's sniper hide 400 meters away with a gargantuan rifle sighted in by Nate's craft on a windless night, Dean was playing Overwatch, and there's very few things people fear more than a hidden sniper when you're standing in open ground. After someone made sure Eddie McDeddy wouldn't stand back up again and try to bite anyone, Tori took to the stage. This was our plan all along, because they knew her and she knew them. Honestly, she did an amazing job, and I thought I wasn't going to be needed. After all, they weren't particularly fond of Maddock anymore since he ordered the sacrifice of his own people, and Tori knew exactly what buttons to press with them. She laid out all of her investigations into Maddock, 
absolutely destroying his personality and character with all the research she'd done on him. He came out of that looking a right twat, and honestly, I was starting to wonder why I was even there. Tori was nailing it. Inevitably, questions came about what they were meant to do with all this information, as they were still fearful of the dead, and that's when she turned to me and Nate. Both of us were a little uncomfortable, as Tori did quite a spectacular job of making us both sound awesome, until eventually one voice demanded to hear from us. Nate, the big planet head, threw me under the bus by declaring he was just following my lead and everything was my idea. Treachery. Tori took my hands and said this was it. The moment. I still had zero idea what to say, though. Don't think about it, Erin. You've never put your head above your heart before. So why start now? I laughed. But then she said, in all seriousness, not to think about it. I can't remember everything she said, but the last bit really resonated. You've always been special, so that's why you're needed now. This, she said, tapping two fingers over my heart, is what makes you special. So forget what you think you should say and just speak whatever your heart tells you. Seriously, Tori should be the one doing the talking. She is so articulate. Faith, Erin, urged Tori. Have faith in yourself, and faith these people will hear you, will see you, and all that you hope for. Don't think. Just act. And that's what I did. I wish I could remember it all for posterity here, but I can't. It was a fucking long speech that just poured out as it came to me. The world before, and how broken it was, and the world now, and how we should be rebuilding together. I talked about Dean and Maria, and how they redeemed a lost girl with love and care. I shot down some negativity by using Nora's timeless quote of not being bound in the chains of things we can't change. The longer I went on, the more emotional I got, and the tears started to fall as I remembered those we'd lost. You, Freya, Laura, Isaac, the Willow Park people, Dong, Kate, little Joseph, and Theodore. I held their images in my mind as I spoke, drawing strength from them all, while still feeling their loss all over again. It was all my pain, but this time, there was a healthy dose of hope mixed in. Hope that we could find a better way forward, together. We're all just a hot mess of humanity, and we'll make mistakes along the way, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to be better every single day. As my penultimate line, I do remember voicing the same phrase I'd said to the Willow Park people when we dropped the torchbearer bomb on them. One day, if we're lucky to leave behind anyone who will remember us, all any of us will be is a memory. Given the choice, wouldn't you want to be a good one? and then I'll forever remember the last thing I said. I don't know why, but it felt right. We'd heard the mantra of the Ascension people, and the context was far different then, but for what I was trying to achieve, it felt right flipping it on its head. Against the dead, we either stand united or we fall united. But I promise you this, that if we stand together, then we will rise. And the crowd responded by roaring it back at me in a single, unified voice. I'd done it. They were with me. But there was one final twist in the tale that nobody could have foreseen.
Something shifted. I don't know how to explain it. I felt a chill. No, that's not it. It was like a cooling sea breeze on a hot day. A soothing balm carrying with it the scent of flowers. Everyone else felt it, could smell that floral aroma. It was obvious in every face. Then the chants died as a collective gasp of awe sucked the air from around me. I turned, and there you were, Freya. Beautiful, angelic, a long flowing white dress and your feet bare. You were always beautiful, but bloody hell, as an ethereal phantom, you seemed otherworldly. Were otherworldly. A being of the divine, with a single white flower behind your ear. I started crying in joy at seeing you again, at seeing that smile radiate and fill up the darkness. Behind you, pushing at the dark and distant, unable to reach out like you did, there were a sea of faces clustering to the edge of your light, hazy and just distinct enough to make some out. Isaac's smiling approval. Heroic little Joseph. Big Dong. Couldn't resist a snigger there. The Willow Park people, and a multitude of others I didn't know. Even the Fruit Loops from the lodge way back in the beginning hovered somewhere in that mass. Faith and Sky, Hope and Jericho, Grace and her toothy bollock Theo, and even poor broken Ariel and her buffalo Barkley. Even Zion was in the back there with his fluffy potato head. Yeah, you're still a bellend though, Nigel. And Theodore. Sweet, smiling Theodore Beckett in front of them all. He looked so happy. Always so expressionless. But here, a misty face at the edge of your light, he smiled with such joy, I thought my heart might burst. When I told Elijah of it later, a weight seemed to lift from him, and he straight up wept in relief. I felt like Luke Skywalker seeing the ghosts of the Fallen on Endor at the end of Return of the Jedi, though not quite as stark and obvious. All those unknown to me were the sacrifices from Ascension, the earlier strangers that went under Maddox's knife, and their own people when the initial victims dried up. You plucked that white gardenia from your hair and held it towards me. And holy shit, it was solid, real. I still have that flower in my room. Never has the flame burned brighter than this moment, you said. Somehow your voice was felt like a soothing caress on my aching heart. All of us were drawn this night to the fierce burn of your light, Erin. A bonfire, a great flame in the dark to us all, pulling us all to this one place, for this one moment, as you burn brighter than a star to warm our endless night. We're all so enormously proud of you. I miss you was all I managed to sob. You reached out, though I was unable to feel any touch against the tear-streaked skin of my cheek. The crowd of faces hovering in the dark faded from sight, until only you, Freya, remained. With the end of one journey, so another begins, you said to me alone, though the awed crowd heard every word. Keep the flame of hope burning, Erin, for we are all still with you. Hold the line for the Trinity, because they will come this way as the front of the battle moves. I love you and will see you again. Then you faded from sight. All that was left 
were the living. I don't know why it happened, though Tory theorised from the subtext of your words, that as the flame of hope burned and everyone started believing what I had to say, she thinks I lit up on the other side, drawing everyone in from where they were trapped. That brief flare let you pass over for a little moment, everyone else straining at the edge of darkness to see beyond the veil between our world and theirs. You've obviously got a bit more mojo than the rest of them as our dream guide, eh? God, I don't know. Why it happened, how it happened, I honestly don't care. I'm just grateful it did. You don't get second chances to say goodbye to a dead friend. I did. And that makes me profoundly fortunate. All that was left to resolve was Maddock himself. I knew exactly what to do with him. We walked him to the gates, cut his bonds, and let him stand amongst the silent, motionless dead. You should have killed me when you had the chance, Erin Locke. I still command. Yeah, blah, blah, evil monologue, blah, whatever, knobhead. Maddox's idiotic need to gloat ended up biting him on the arse, and that's probably the first time that can be used literally and not just figuratively. With my mercy, he thought he'd gotten away with it. And jinkies, he might have, were it not for this one pesky kid who figured out a detail he'd likely forgotten about in all the fuss. You see, Tory told me that the first sacrifice Maddock made was the day after the dead began to walk. I know that to be the 24th of June. Using my laptop's calendar, I worked forwards to see when the 3rd of March would be, the date Maddock had a raging boner for. Imagine my cackle when discovering that was also a Thursday. Every seven days, Johnny boy, someone had to go under your knife. This particular Thursday was the seventh day, and that devil wanted its due. I dropped that nugget at his feet, gave him a wink, and closed the gates. It was only a short breath before the screaming started. Didn't last long, though. March 6, 2011. Dawn of a new day. I'm almost done with this journal for now, I think. The compulsion to write isn't as strong. It's like I've done what I need to do, for now at least. There will be shitloads of work ahead, and I don't think I'll have the time to write. I'd like to spend some time seeing what I can make of this life and follow my own advice, instead of being bound to this digital page. It's strange how I started this almost a year ago, just as a coping mechanism while I was on my own, trying to keep my spirits up by being a bit of a dick. I'd take any laughs I could get, even if they were my own scribbles for my own amusement. Now, though, I realise it was a compulsion, the first steps on this journey that led me to this moment. Now it's strange, because I don't feel the need to write anymore. Now it feels like I have a choice, and for the moment, I think I'm going to choose making something of this life we're trying to build. Before I put this journal aside, though, for now at least, because never say never, right? There's a couple of things I should catch you up on. As the sun came upon the third, the question remained as to what we should do with the dead outside the gate. Even though they had shredded Maddock, they were still there, and the people still feared the dead. Facing fears, gaining victory over them, was the first natural step for these people. There were enough guns in Ascension on our team now, and plenty of ammo to get the job done thanks to their stores. However, I needed to set the tone for our new friends going forward and introduce them to the real Erin Locke. Forget the flame business and all this mysticism and chosen by a higher power bullshit. I wanted them to see who I really was. 
Everyone was just too in awe of what had happened to venture near me, and the last thing I wanted was being a figure of weird reverence like Maddock, placed on some pedestal and treated differently. I was still one of them, so I needed to lower their expectations of me. Basically, I had to show them what a dickhead I was. After making a request that got some weird looks, I was handed a battery-powered CD player and a selection of CDs for me to rifle through. This was a critical choice. What the fuck are you doing? queried Nate in a huff. We've got everyone ready with weapons for the gate to be opened. What's the delay? And is this really a time for music? I held up one finger. There's always time for music, Nate. If we're doing this, we're doing this right. Doing what? Aha! Perfecto! I slid the CD into the player, turned the volume up to max, selected the track number I wanted, and looked up at Nate. Flint and lock action heroes? I inquired, holding out a fist to be bumped. Naturally, Nate had no idea what I was talking about, but he shrugged, bumped my fist, and we both reeled back with the finger explosion, just as me and Charlie have done so many times. Laughing, I signalled for the gates to be opened as I pressed play on the CD. Some moments in life stay with you forever. Some are so perfect, they burrow deep into the marrow of your bones and forever become a part of who you are. As the gates of ascension opened to admit Team Evil into our killing ground, the people were liberated from Maddox's insanity by the joyful sound of Katrina and the waves filling the morning with walking on sunshine, while a whole bunch of us shredded the 300 undead in a screaming storm of lead, Maddox's undead husk in their ranks, and it felt like the perfect closing credits soundtrack to this part of our journey. This is the kind of ridiculous nonsense I've been missing, laughed Nate between reloads, as I danced and threw out some shapes while clicking in a new magazine. March 7th, 2011. Inkepto ne desistam. This is my last entry, I think. For now, at least. I'm not a detail-oriented person, as well you know, Freya. I won't be laying out every little thing that happens now, as we've got a big job on our hands. So this is me, closing the loop from where I began in June last year. So much has happened, and in such a relatively short space of time. But it feels like we can finally move forward. With two large communities to integrate and bridges to build between them, it was off to a good start as Ascension unanimously voted Tory as their new leader. I think many thought I intended to take up Maddox's mantle in some way, but I've never wanted to lead, and I'm still trying to get a handle on everyone looking at me like I'm some kind of second coming after the ghostly curtain call on stage. No. My place is at Crenshaw, and in the spirit of moving forward with new beginnings, we decided on a new name for the school. Something to reflect our identity and what we stand for. We all agreed on new hope. I think it's perfect. Also, it's a Star Wars reference that Nate has no idea I sneaked in. Wins all round. Tory's first decree, wholly supported by a new council, was also a renaming ceremony. Ascension felt wrong, holding all the dark connotations of Maddox rule and the cult built on a foundation of lies and deceit. Instead, they've opted for the name Unity. And I have to say, I bloody love it. New hope and unity. Our path forward through the uncertain days ahead. Probably the most important news I should share before signing off is this. I had a bacon and egg sandwich and a cup of fucking tea with milk, bread, butter, bacon, egg, and a brew with fucking milk. My northern English soul was lifted to new and magnificent heights, and I was whole again. 
I must have sounded like I was having multiple orgasms as I hummed and oohed my way through every bite and lip-smacking slurp. Unit is agriculture. Rules. Best day ever. The dead are still here, but no monstrous horde descended on us as Maddock threatened. The fight goes on, and we'll continue to hold the line for when this mystical trinity gets their chance to pull our asses out the fire. Frey said something about how the front of the battle would move, which I take to mean that they're bollocks deep somewhere worse than here. Fogley is still out there with some of the nomad escapees as well. I'm sure we'll come across them again one day, or they'll get chewed up by the dead. Whichever way it goes, Fogley will get what's coming to him, no doubt. I discovered something eerie today from Graham. Do you know what Crenshaw's school motto is? Incepto ne desistam. Know what that means? May I not shrink from my purpose. Weird, huh? As you said, Freya, one journey ends and another begins. We don't know if and when this trinity will end the threat of the dead, so until that day comes, we'll carry on fighting the good fight, continuing to build and make something of this new world as best we can. Now at least, we have sanctuaries for any resourceful survivors still out there. This will be our first mission. Gathering what we can of humanity and build for a future we all hope for. Who knows, maybe this mystical trinity will swing by our way sometime in the future. You seem fairly certain that's likely. If that's the case, then we should be ready to help them however we can. If we can. We will not shrink from our purpose. Unity and hope. That's the key to it all. Without it, there's no point in living. If we can't dream of a better life, a better way to take our second chance on this earth, then we may as well give up now. The saying goes that those things that don't kill you only make you stronger. I don't think that's completely true. The things that don't kill you tend to give you a twisted sense of gallows humour and temper you in the heat of whatever crucible it is you endure. You have to let in whatever slivers of light remain, or all you'll do is weep in the shadows. Laughing through situations that make normal folk weep is the only way to make it through. Things that don't kill you don't necessarily make you stronger. I think that's the wrong word. They can make you... harder. Those things that fail to break you can add piecemeal layers of armour around your heart, so the real challenge in this new world is ensuring there are just enough chinks in that armour to let those slivers of light in. Let the cracks fill with light, not shadow. I'm going to try. I'll see where this thing with Elijah goes, even though I wonder if any man can genuinely love me for the spectacular walking disaster I am. But these days we need to take life one what the fuck at a time and see where it leads us. This might not be the party we hoped for, but while we're here, we've got to dance like no one is watching. As each story ends, a new one begins. So for now, I think I'm finished with my tale of bardic magnificence. I may write again, I may not. It's all about what life lays in our path. I might even let someone else read my insane ramblings, though that notion makes my stomach flip with anxiety. Letting someone take a peek inside this disastrous chaos of a mind is a big step. It's pulling back the curtains from the window of my soul and letting someone have a nosy inside the private room of my head. I'll think on that one. There's a lot of work ahead of us all, as we hope this trinity have the courage and will to endure their crucible. They might just drag humanity's burning butthole out of this rotten fire and give us a real second chance. May they not shrink from their purpose. Peace and love, Freya. I hope we do get to speak again one day, now that I know all things are possible. Keep walking on sunshine. Bitches. April 13th. 
2011. You cheeky scamp. Planet head. Conversational desire of a brick. The Grim Reaper's unfriendly kind of threatening dad. Wrinkly old scrotum face. I'm not as dumb as Nate looks. I think you and I need to have words, young lady. Nate. This has been The Devil's Due, an Adrian's Undead Diary novel. Loki vs. the Apocalypse, Book 3. Written by Carl Meadows. Narrated by Danielle Cohen. Copyright 2021 by Carl Meadows. Production copyright by Carl Meadows. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.
he snorted and shook his head. No, while I was sleeping. It's probably your age, Nate. Incontinence in the old is fairly common, so you shouldn't be ashamed. No judgment here. He snorted again and seemed to relax. No, you dickhead, he chuckled before turning serious again. I had a dream last night. Of Freya. Well, that stopped my smart mouth. Nate knows I'd never joke about you. That wound is still too raw and fresh, even a couple of months on. It was just a dream, Nate. Have you dreamed of her? I thought about it and realised I haven't. Since your death, I haven't dreamed of you at all, Freya. Considering the lake of grief in which I'm forever treading water, I find that, in classic British understatement, a bit odd. I write this journal to you, so in many ways you're always on my mind. How is it that my subconscious sleeping brain doesn't conjure you at all? That seems... well, that just seems odd. Mind you, odd is something of a relative term these days, eh? Nor had I, until last night, continued Nate after I answered. Erin, it was so real. I remember every sight, every scent, every word we shared in conversation, like it happened just a minute ago. You're weirding me out, Nate. Well, it's going to get weirder. This time his gaze returned to those twin drills locking to mine. Erin, I'm sorry I ever doubted you. It was hard for me to get my head round, but now I'll back you 100%, no question. Doubted me? The words threw me a little, and I didn't register the apology straight away. Erin, you were right. About all of it. Captain Evil, as you lovingly refer to it, is a real thing. There is an agency behind the undead, and we are being judged for all the horrors we've inflicted on each other. Freya came to me as a messenger from, well, our team. He spread his hands and shrugged, unsure how to explain it. Said there's a way to end all this. The responsibility on some group of three called the Trinity but they need time to fix things and pass some test that'll determine whether we get our second chance. Mind blown. I was still recovering from that bombshell when he dropped another. Freya said you had a big part to play, Erin. Though the burden of all humanity didn't fall to you, there was still a role for you as part of another trio. Hey. She said everything is three, that the number has power. I went cold as Nate quoted Theodore's freaky statement of those exact words. Everything is three. Those tasked with bearing the flaming torch of hope against the darkness are many, but still come in threes. These torch bearers a people fighting the smaller battles all across the world to hold the line for this trinity and ensure humanity is still fighting, still existing, should they succeed in their task. To build shelter, safety and sanctuary for the living, paving the road to something better if the trinity succeeds. His fierce expression softened then, and his smile gentle. It was almost... Proud. And you're one of those flames, Erin. I've sat and pondered this all night long. Because, let's face it, it's quite a lot to take in. Firstly, I don't doubt a word of what he says. I've been the one advocating a supernatural or divine force behind this whole thing pretty much from the outset, so I'd be a bit of a dick to now turn around and tell Nate he was going mental. Nate believed the power of this dream, 
and for such a practical man to be swept away in this sudden change of direction and opinion, that dream must have punched home pretty hard. He told me it was in his old backyard, from a house twenty years ago, the garden filled with flowers. And when he woke from the dream, a white gardenia was next to his pillow. That is some freaky shit right there. Apparently, you also told him why the undead went all weird after your death. They wanted to break me in the wake of your passing, terrify me into hiding from the world in case I got any more of my friends killed, much like I mused when it all started. And, by hiding away, I couldn't be the person that our team needs me to be. When Captain Evil tried to mess things up at the builder's yard, I came anyway, and that apparently pissed on the celestial fucktard's chips a little when we all got away. The dead are crude tools, as Nate put it, and Captain Evil has countless battles to fight against humanity to ensure our destruction, so it doesn't put all its efforts into me. Small mercies, I guess. I'm still a target, but now Captain Evil is likely to change tack and try some different angle. It's extremely satisfying to know my big middle finger to Captain Evil poked it in the eye and pissed it off. But what I really can't get my head around is the question I was asking regarding the shift in undead behaviour. That question hasn't changed, even though it's now confirmed that, yes, I am indeed a personal target for the evil force directing this shit show. And that question is, why me? Nate being chosen, now that I understand. He's a warrior, and if you're getting into a fight for the fate of humanity, he's your team's first pick without any hesitation. But Nate kept saying I was the flame, and he was my shield, like he's in some backup support role. No idea who the third one is. Would have been nice for you to drop that little bombshell as well, Freya. I'm no leader. The very thought is laughable. I struggle with crippling indecision about what to have for breakfast, so don't put the fate of swathes of people in my little hands. I will drop that fucking ball and blow the championship game. By all means, I'll fight the good fight, and I've said from the beginning that we have to be better, that we have to fight back against the dead, and we should ensure safety and security where we can. That's just being a decent human being, which is something humanity has been sorely lacking. It was that lack of care for each other that caused this whole fucking mess in the first place. But shit, don't make me lead anyone. We've got wiser heads here. Nate and Dean are experienced peacekeepers, and Dean is the calmest, most compassionate head there ever was. We have Maria and Nora as well, two intelligent older women with wisdom and heart. Real inspirational types. What the hell is our team doing choosing me to lead this little slice of the apocalypse rebellion? Bloody hell, talk about handicapping your team's chances. We're starting five shots behind the enemy if you put me in the captain's role. No thanks. This coming right after Theodore speaking about the dreams, saying everything is three, just like Nate did, and drawing a picture of me holding a flaming torch. I feel like I'm suddenly going nuts. It's one thing jumping around, telling everyone your theory about Captain Evil and the Dark Force running the show. Having all these freak occurrences, like Theodore's drawing and weird statements, immediately followed by Nate's complete conviction after a dream talk with our dead friend, then finding a flower from his garden 20 years in the past beside him when he wakes up, well, it's all just so sudden. It's a lot to swallow being told that, yes, Lucky, all your theories were right, so well done for being so spot on. Having a theory is one thing, but finding out your wacky theory is right, that's a lot to digest. And then to get an, oh, by the way, you're also a pivotal figure in your own little way, so get right with that. Well, what the hell am I supposed to do with this kind of revelation? I filled him in on what happened with Theodore and showed him the drawing. Nate just nodded 
as if further confirmation of everything he'd just revealed. And I asked him to avoid telling anyone else just yet. I'm having trouble coming to terms with it, so it's going to be pretty difficult for everyone else, I think. I can just imagine dropping this little bombshell to our assembled community. Oh, hi everyone. Just a quick note that I'm now chosen by Team Light as special to lead our own little pocket of humanity, holding the line while we wait for someone out there to take the big test to see if our species is allowed to continue. So, Nate and I are like the Blues Brothers on a mission from God, okay? Hey, that kind of makes me like Joan of Arc, yeah? Pfft, they'll look at me like my nose has just transformed into a penis. Joan of Arc. Joan of Snark, maybe, but I'm no leader. And by the way, Freya, where the hell is my dream with you? I miss you like crazy. I sit here writing these journals to you and you leave me out. Not gonna lie. That stings. I thought we were BFF homegirls. Sigh. I'm all at sea here and need a little help. Nate had one other thing he wanted to talk about, which helped in bringing me back down to earth a bit. Weirdly, he wants to go back home, just me and him, as he says there's something I should know before we continue forward. I might be wrong, but Nate seemed more nervous about taking me to his house than he did about telling me about our divine selection for Team Light's frontline defence. Weird. Anyway, that's what we're doing tomorrow. We're not taking the Humvee, just me and him in the pickup. I've no idea what to expect, and not really sure why this is so significant. Nate is just Nate. His history is his own, and I've no need to ask him his personal business. He seems adamant in wanting to share it, though, while at the same time looking... scared. I mean, I'm not really sure what scared Nate looks like, because if the devil himself popped up in front of us, Nate would probably punch him in the balls and headbutt him as he folded over, calling him a bellend all the while. So much to take in. But the bottom line is that Captain Evil has a celestial hard-on for me, no matter what. It's a lot to digest and get right with, but I've never shied away from any fight in my life. So, great celestial darkness or not, I'll say this to the black-hearted Toss Fountain. Bring it, dickhead. December 5th, 2010 the guilty truth. I don't really know how to process this. I feel like punching Nate in the face and hugging him to death at the same time. The stupid thing is that the matter he thought I'd want to punch him for was not the thing that got my blood up. Okay, I'm being cryptic, so I'll just dive in. The garden from Nate's dream was not our destination. That dream abode was the house he shared 20 years ago with his ex-wife, Maggie. Nate being married was the first bombshell of the day, and when I pushed him on that, he just waved it off and said I'd have everything in good time. That house isn't up north anyway. It's apparently way down south near Plymouth, where he was based with 4-2 Commando back in the day. When he retired from his special forces stint after Sierra Leone, Nate moved up here to take a job with a company called Forge International, a private military and security contractor based somewhere in Cheshire. That explains what he's been doing since departing his run in the SAS a decade ago. He's got way too much skill and experience to just sit idle, and there's far more money in the private sector than the service. Nate owns a small flat in a tiny nearby village, just a few miles the other side of town, only a mile or two away from where he and I first met. It took a slow drive of about an hour to get there, as we had to take a number of back lanes to bypass main roads through town. Back as a power couple in our trusty pickup, the conversation died after Nate put a hold on questioning him any further, 
and the two of us rode in silence. I should note here a weird little factoid. In that entire journey, we didn't see a single undead. Not a sign, either in the roads or moving near isolated buildings. Nothing at all for the whole journey, like we were the only two living souls left on Earth. Eerie. Even when we trundled through the quaint little village, it was barren of both living and undead. A ghost town of silent phantoms, unseen and unheard, was all that greeted us. The only noise disturbing the picturesque stillness was the throaty rumble of our diesel engine, and once Nate killed the ignition, it was deathly silent. We parked behind a small row of local shops, with Nate's flat located above one of them. A small convenience store, a little local butcher, and a chippy. These little villages love having their own local butcher, it seems. It wasn't what I expected. For someone who must have been getting some serious bank from private security, it was a tiny place to call home. Nate's vast experience must have commanded a serious wedge of cash, especially with the long list of active service and combat experience he could reel off. But material possessions clearly weren't something high on his list of priorities. As we climbed out of the pickup, I could hear Nate sucking in breaths as if to calm his nerves. His discomfort made me nervous in turn, because I had no idea why he'd be so edgy when just coming to the tiny flat he called home. Walking up the steps, he stopped outside the first of four doors on the left and turned to me. He opened his mouth to say something, decided against it, then simply pushed down the handle and opened the door. It was as small as it looked, a single bedroom, small bathroom, and the living room and kitchen combined into a single open space. It was sparsely furnished, but immaculately kept, and the only sign of time's passage was the gathering dust from his absence. There was a single big armchair facing a modest-sized TV, with a small coffee table between the two, bare of any ornament. A narrow wooden bookshelf stood tall in one corner, laden with a variety of books, from military history and survival manuals to a selection of fiction novels, most of them appearing to be military in nature, or crime thrillers. Wouldn't you know it, the complete works of Tolkien too. I knew 